Never before has humanity faced such terrible creatures from other dimensions coming to invade. They came to occupy the human cities, and nuclear weapons exploded. An entire area was like a campfire for them to dance and wreak havoc. Humans called them disasters, and they were seen as hope that was fading away. When everyone left everything to fate, those appeared with the name 13 Zodiac Saints. Initially, 12 people were given power from the absolute gods to deal with the monster disasters. But suddenly one day, from nowhere, Another person appeared who awakened the 13th, but not by the blessing of any god. He just appeared and dominated like that, along with the other 12 saints to the demon tower to destroy the red-eyed demon, the leader of the inexhaustible disaster horde. But then, only 12 people left the tower, causing everyone to wonder where the 13th person was. Humanity regretted his sacrifice, and cried in front of the press. But that was all bullshit. He did sacrifice himself to kill the red-eyed demon, but it was because he was abandoned by those sons of bitches and ran outside. When he was at his weakest, suddenly a sword from behind of his teammate then fell straight into the abyss with no way to get up. The demons opened their eyes and stared at him in a state of his left hand was severed, his right hand was exhausted and could not be lifted. But he was not willing to die there, he reached for a knife and put it in his mouth. Biting down to stop the groans of pain, he stood up and refused to die. Hatred swelled in his heart, he fought, fought and fought to find a way to return to avenge the bastards who had left him alone in the demon tower. Will he get out of this place? One day before Lysian was abandoned by his teammates in the demon tower. He and Taksu had an appointment at a fried chicken restaurant. The food had just been served and was still hot. Taksu stared at his friend's face, uttered a sentence with a serious face as if saying goodbye to his family. You're going to die tomorrow. Hey, Taksu, do you wish I was dead? Oh, the other guy laughed out loud while holding two chicken thighs in his hands. You jealous that I'm eating two thighs at once? Under the hood, Lishan's scarred face was visible under the light. One of his eyes was completely blind. His hair didn't grow and the deep brown scar indicated the traces of a life or death battle. Hugo got really pissed off when he heard the name from his two friends, Taksu, he had said to call him by his stage name to make it sound cool, but the other guy just kept calling him Taksu. Oh, Zion was still happily eating chicken, clicking his tongue and saying, Hugo don't worry, I'm not going to die easily, my friend. The number of monster disasters that the 12 saints you guys killed is equal to, not yet, even a tenth of what has died by my hand, so drop that crazy thought. Hugo was worried but immediately shut up, with such a sure point. How could he argue? The demon tower is where the most dangerous monster beasts reign, and is also the greatest threat to the safety of mankind. The story began on the last day of the 20th century, when monster beasts unexpectedly appeared from nowhere, driving humanity to the brink of extinction with their evil power. At a time when humanity was sinking into the darkest shadows since the beginning of heaven and earth, 12 entities who called themselves the absolute gods appeared. They promised to give humanity the power to overcome the disasters, by giving 12 awakened ones the power to inherit their strength. Saying 12 people can be divided by 2 or 4 is not so beautiful. Finally there appeared the 13th awakened one that no one admitted to having given birth to. For humans, 13 is an unlucky number, and he was like a personification of Judas, the 13th apostle who betrayed Jesus at the Last Supper. Although he was not blessed by any absolute God, this awakened one was extremely strong, stronger than the 12 saints combined. He was so strong that he became a thorn in the eye, a threat to the other 12 zodiacs. Guess who that is? The guy with the scars in the beginning? Could it be the same person? Well, the blind left eye and the bald combo. Can't be mistaken, it's the main character Lysian. Hugo saw that his friend had taken down all the monster disasters, helping the group to easily advance inside, so he went over to thank him cheerfully. Zion sat down on the ground, looked up at his friend and told him to stop talking. Instead of saying all that nonsense, his friend could treat him to a meal, wouldn't that be more practical? Money was not a problem for Hugo, but the nickname Country Bumpkin was a problem. Only he called him by that name, and no matter how many times he told him to stop, he still didn't get it right. Anything can be changed, but Zion refused to change his nickname for his best friend. While these two were arguing fiercely, two of the twelve saints were laughing happily. Today if they could kill the scarred one, they would be rich. What else could it be? The fat one couldn't stop laughing. After all it was the strongest monster beast. Just by counting it, we can pocket a trillion bones. Lysian, who was sitting nearby, heard this and kindly gave them some advice. Instead of buying a mansion and a car, they should go to Hawaii and live it up. So many countries have spent all their wealth and assets just to kill the scarred one. But why do you keep going after money? You pretending to be smarter than a duck? The fat one's mouth curled into a vulgar smile. 
you don't have to teach a rich man how to spend money, okay? Then he sarcastically said that he also needed to make a lot of money, to fix his face and his body full of injuries, so don't pretend to be noble and look down on me. Lijian was insulted by them, but he thought to himself that he shouldn't waste his breath. On this scum, just let them go and the water will be clear. And yet they still turned their heads and laughed like crazy. Let me show you a way to make money, in the future don't be in such a hurry to run. Over when you're called, wait until the number of victims is a little higher before appearing. That way the sound of money will be a lot louder. Lijian sighed deeply. These bastards are really speechless. After dealing with the scarred one, he had to immediately make them log out of his life. The group walked to a cave with sharp stalactites pointing down. The three members of the saints were shocked and terrified. This. This is. Then they looked up and had to crane their necks to see it. The final boss of the demon tower, the scarred one. It was as big as a mountain with a bunch of horns sticking out, and the air around it was burning hot. Just looking at it, the pressure was so heavy that even someone as strong as Lysian had to be a little cautious. The demon suddenly let out a roar of challenge, and the cave shook violently, and a jet of lava shot up from the ground. Lysian was startled. He covered his face with his hands and jumped backwards. The crack broke apart, revealing a river of boiling lava beneath the ground. It pierced through the earth and rock above, and shot straight up into the sky. The saints couldn't take it either, screaming in pain from the intense heat of the lava. It pierced through the demon tower and shot straight up into the sky, illuminating a vast area. The lava shot out from the side of the tower like fireworks, welcoming the fools who dared to set foot in hell. The heat, smoke, and dust filled the air, and the explosion scared the saints. Trembling with fear, they could only stare at the boiling lava right at their feet. The earthquake had opened up a huge crater, separating the demon lord from the intruders. In the smoke, the scarred one sat calmly on his throne, his eyes gleaming with malice, and a triumphant smile on his face. Seeing the monster's powerful aura, the saints widened their eyes and trembled like leaves, waiting for someone to run, stuttering for a long time before finally screaming, run now. The whole group hurriedly ran in the opposite direction, shouting that they couldn't fight such a horrible thing. And yet these cowards dared to call themselves gods. Zion looked on with contempt as the saints ran away with their tails between their legs like dogs being chased. He could only sigh. His hand clenched tightly around the hilt of his sword. He was all alone but he was still okay, his whole body bursting with great power. Even if the sky were to fall, the one who would destroy the scarred one would definitely be me, Lysian. No sooner said than done, he charged forward with such force that the ground beneath his feet exploded, and he aimed straight for the demon lord to fight it out with him. That's the beginning of the story that the survivors told. Oh, how long has it been? I can't remember anymore. I wonder how the outside world has changed. Is time different inside and outside the tower? Give up. It gives me a headache just thinking about it. Right now, there's only one thought in my head, and that's to kill all the monsters in the demon tower. Because this is a special trap that will summon an infinite number of monsters. Those stupid saints thought that this would be enough to kill me. Forget it. Even though I've lost an arm and I'm covered in blood and I thought I was going to die, I'm definitely going to get out of here alive, and when I do, I swear I'll cut off the heads of every single one of you bastards. Just wait there, even if I have to bite down on this sword until my teeth break, I'll keep my eyes open and wait for the day I can take revenge on you fuckers. Time flies like a dog running through a field, and in the blink of an eye, 20 years have passed, a monster beast fell to the ground and cried out in panic, how? How did you get here? The deep voice of the man standing in front of it said, you're the last one. The two-horned monster was terrified and backed away, shouting, oh, someone save me. Oh my god, wake up, I told you it was the last one, so who's going to save you? So stupid, you deserve to go to hell. This viking looking guy lifted his foot and stomped down, there was a pop and blood gushed out, the monster lay motionless and dead, it's finally over. The tired middle-aged man, that's it, this bearded guy is Lizon. Thank goodness Myth still recognized him. I thought that once I killed all the demons I would be able to log out peacefully, but no, suddenly. The cave shook violently and rocks and earth fell like rain. I wonder if this is how I get out. A large rock shot straight at Lizion's head as if to answer that question. And he fell to the ground unconscious and was buried under the rocks and earth. The author is a bit cruel to the protagonist. He had just been hit in the face by a rock and was screaming, and then he was hit in the head by a rock and died. The real world outside was a scene of devastation under a clear blue sky. And under the rubble were screams, run away. The screams belonged to two young men who were running like mad, 
Today was supposed to be a safe day so they went out for a walk, but who would have thought that the crazy thing chasing them would not be a girl but three high-level monster wolves. Ha ha ha, it's over, Luam. Because he was so scared, the black-haired boy laughed and cried. Maybe he should have trusted his instincts, right? This psychic player had predicted that he would encounter a very powerful monster today, but he still went out anyway. Behind them, the wolf jumped up and charged straight into the middle of the two young men, scaring them so much that they screamed. Slamming his hand on the ground in frustration, the wet-haired boy exclaimed, damn it. The monster wolves had surrounded them from all sides. Now there was nothing they could do but die. The black-haired boy gritted his teeth in anger, if only Opa Legion had survived. Coming out of the demon tower, then these wolves would have been nothing but small fry. Psychic players are different, they get what they wish for. The door of the demon tower suddenly opened, and the two men and their grandson looked up in surprise to see. A blinding white light appear like a sudden flash of lightning. Immediately afterwards, there was a huge explosion with a force that shook the whole city. Black-haired and brown-haired boys had to hold on tight to keep from being blown away. Standing so close to the tower without being blown away was in order to witness the next moment. After the earthquake, only smoke and dust remained. The demon tower had disappeared, leaving behind a crater. And yet, these two young men were like snakes, they still didn't die. Now they were crawling out with difficulty, not understanding what had just happened. Suddenly, the brown-haired boy's mouth dropped open, and he called out to the person next to him, Chimin, there, there's someone. As he spoke, he pointed shakily towards the tower that had just collapsed, causing his friend to look in the same direction. A muscular arm appeared in the smoke, it was definitely not a monster. That's right, a tall figure was standing there, standing out in the middle of the desolate wasteland. The man punched his hand and cursed angrily, you motherfuckers. Your great-grandfather is back. Lizon returned to the real world in his former muscular form and immediately cursed, you bastard turtles tricked me into that damn trap years ago. The hatred of being deceived, combined with the physical and mental pain of being tortured in the demon tower, created a terrible rage, you fucking saints are going to die with me. Lizion's eyes blazed with hatred, and he roared, determined to make them taste the real despair. On the chaotic pile of wet rubble, something was making noises, causing the two people hiding underneath to wonder what was going on. They saw that the monster beasts were being beaten up badly. The man was punching one in the face and stomping on the head of another. Oh my god, they couldn't believe it. The old man and his grandson were so shocked that their mouths dropped open. Even a high-level awakener would have trouble defeating high-level monsters, but he was able to do it so easily, it was amazing. Holding the head of one of the monster beasts in his hand and standing on a pile of its dead comrades, Lizon laughed happily, and then he happened to glance to the side and saw a figure hiding. He jumped up and disappeared from the sight of the two men, causing them to ask aloud, what the hell is that? Less than a few seconds later, he suddenly jumped down from somewhere and broke into a hiding place of the old man and his grandson, scaring the living daylights out of them. Why? Why are you attacking us? Chimmy asked in fear, and the brown-haired boy sitting next to him started to cry. So, you're human? They thought he was a monster. They turned around and blamed the situation on him, it seemed that he had wiped out everything. Seeing this, the two men breathed a sigh of relief, and then immediately started to talk excitedly about the man in front of them. They had thought he was a monster. And they turned around and blamed the situation on him, it seemed that he had wiped out everything.11, 19596-00. 11 to 21,700. The black-haired Chimmy wanted to sell the news of his escape from the tower to the tabloids, but the brown-haired boy stopped him immediately. You're talking nonsense, people will think you're crazy. Seeing the young men whispering to each other, he was about to approach them to start a conversation, when they suddenly fell backwards in terror. It turned out that right behind him was the last remaining monster beast, its eyes were red, with blood and saliva dripping from its mouth, its jaws open as it looked at the man who had just slaughtered its entire pack. Wolf, Alpha Wolf. The two men screamed in terror, tears and snot flying everywhere. At the same time, the wolf's eyes lit up with energy. That seemed to be about to burst from its mouth, and it opened its mouth in anger and breathed fire at the group of people. Hastily raising their hands to cover their heads, Chimmy and his companions were terrified, and gritted their teeth at the unexpected attack from the Alpha Wolf. The terrifying energy beam was fired straight at the heads of the foolish humans. The powerful flames descended, 
burning everything in their path. The entire area lit up with the terrifying flames. A long time later, the smoke and flames gradually dissipated, they were still alive. These two had narrowly escaped death again, living long enough to become a legend. What caught their eyes was a sturdy back end, hair fluttering in the thick smoke. It was Lizon who had used his skill to protect the group from the wolf's attack, he had protected them. The two men's eyes widened in surprise, one of them laughed, out loud, suddenly sounding like a stupid idiot. Lizion's whole body burst with energy as he jumped high into the air, to the astonishment of both the monster and the two men. His hands clenched into a fist as he plunged back down. If you're just a stupid dog, then die with honor. As if he had rockets strapped to his butt, he flew towards the beast, delivering a devastating punch to its head. The ground shattered into a thousand pieces from the impact, causing the two men to gasp in horror. Lizon landed softly on the ground, smiling happily. As the alpha wolf collapsed behind him, its huge body lay sprawled on the ground, regretting that it had picked a fight with the wrong person. Now it's really over. He coughed, because of the dust, and then looked behind him. Hey, you two, you almost scared me to death. Get going. A dangerous aura emanated from Lizon, he slowly turned, his head back, making the two men freeze and ask in trembling voices. Go, where can we go? Of course, we'll go buy you some food. Lizon smiled happily, the scary look from before had completely disappeared, leaving an awkward silence between the three of them. Scratching his head and hands, he said with a silly smile, and closed too, making the two young men look at each other in confusion. What do you mean? Why didn't you say so in the first place? You scared the hell out of us. A few hours later at a restaurant, the young man in the blue shirt slammed a bowl as big as a toilet on the table. All the two men next to him looked at the bill and turned pale. They wanted to log out of life. Are you kidding me? This is enough food for 120 people. The young man in the blue shirt ate until his belly was sticking out like Chai En, sitting behind the pile plates was Lizon, our protagonist. Doesn't he look awesome? Seeing the pained expressions on the faces of the two men, he said, I know. You don't have much money. I've already eaten less. Who told them to promise to buy him everything to repay him for saving their lives? They were already complaining after a little bit of pressure. They had to order another bowl of noodles to finish off the meal. Seeing him order more food, the brown-haired man jumped up in anger. Hey, there's a limit to human endurance. I'm sorry, I've been locked in the tower for 20 years and I don't know what else to eat. The black-haired Chimin calmed down and asked Hammond's identity. He had suddenly appeared around the tower and could only be an apostle or a captain of the holy guard. Apostle and holy guard? I came out of the tower. Zeon happily and calmly changed the subject, asking who these two people were. He could sense the magic power from Chimin, he must not be an ordinary person, because he was an apostle. The brown-haired man next to him helped him answer the questions. All the time, while Chimin was sniffing his nose with pride, aren't I also an awakened person, who has been blessed by the gods? Just as he was about to take a bite of rice, he heard about the saints and the holy guard and Zeon was immediately furious, why should I serve those assholes? But suddenly he saw his reflection in the plate, what the hell is this? Whose smooth face and firm, rosy skin is this? Jumping up like a spring, he shouted at the mirror, where is the mirror? Frightening the waitress, she just pointed to the other side. Zeon hurriedly took off his shirt, knowing that he was a handsome and muscular man. But why take off his clothes in the middle of someone else's restaurant? He was very angry when he saw his plump face, and a body with 16 abs and not a single scar in the mirror. My wounds were extremely difficult to heal. I needed it for a while before I was sure that I had returned to my original form, and I was even more handsome. Even my left arm, which had been severed, had been healed, and I was admiring my new arm when I noticed a faint mark. Suddenly, the mark began to emerge more clearly, and within a few seconds, the tiny snake had fully materialized. As soon as I saw the shape of the snake, my whole arm hurt so much that I had to clench it and endure it. A surge of power surged through me and out of nowhere the system panel suddenly appeared with the word you have just experienced death, and have achieved an impossible achievement. My previous abilities will be transferred to my new body, all achievements in. The tower will also be converted into experience points, and I will receive the zodiac skill. Furthermore, I can use the power of the serpent star. I painfully received the power from that energy source, and then slowly closed my eyes. My body seemed to sink into an indefinite space. When I opened my eyes, I saw myself flying in the middle of the galaxy, facing the blood-red eyes of a pseudo-star that was very close to me. A giant serpent coiled around its waist and then moved its head towards me. 
my face showing a clear expression of shock. My hand seemed to be pulled by an invisible energy to touch the head of the pseudo star, where the skin contact lit up magically, as if the entire universe was blessing me. But only a second later, all the images suddenly disappeared. I was sitting on the ground with a shocked expression on my face. My face was slightly sweaty, I still hadn't recovered. Not sure if what I had just seen was real or a dream. Hey, are you okay? Jimin suddenly appeared in front of me, pulling my soul back to reality. I asked Jimin if he had seen a snake this big. I didn't see any snakes, but I saw you taking off your clothes and jumping around in front of the mirror. Jimin stood up to explain, but I didn't want to hear it anymore. Why didn't anyone see that pseudo star? Seeing me talking to my hand again, the other two were a little concerned about the mind of the one who had just saved them. He must have been a little crazy. I was feeling very depressed and confused, and then a message popped up again, congratulating me on becoming the master of the Safu constellation, along with a bunch of other information it came and went, really crazy. Lizon presided over the Safu Palace, and the skills were constantly being activated. Among them, the super regeneration skill was the one that caught his attention the most. This skill allowed all injuries on the body to be healed, but the resistance would be reduced by 50% within 1032 hours. Only now did he understand that this new body was the result of that skill, but why? Had he never heard the saints mention this before? Moreover, he could not feel the presence of any god, but let it go. As long as his body was healed, he did not have to worry about anything else. The only thing he wanted to do most at this moment was to kill all the bastards who had stabbed him. In the back, along with the hypocritical saints who had left him in the demon tower. Just thinking about the scene of being promoted, Lizon became unusually excited. Again, and the murderous aura that emanated from him made the other two, Jun, tremble. Made the other two, Jun, tremble. At the sight of the collapsed demon tower, the police were swarming, and an investigation team was sent to find out what had caused this inviolable place to disappear. The priests thought that this would only make the world more chaotic, perhaps it was the people in Lizion's fan club, or perhaps it was the apostles who hated him. Apostles? Mr. Khan, the thin one, looked suspiciously at these wolves, even the high-ranking saints had a hard time holding them back, let alone the unknown, which proves that the one who caused all this is extremely powerful. Mr. Khan, the fat one, was a little scared when he heard this, could it be that Lizon had really come back? God knows. My friend, Mr. Khan, the thin one, sighed, just wait a little longer and everything will be clear soon. In the green city, where the dozen story buildings stood tall, the cameras were running at full capacity. The journalists were frantically asking questions about the collapse of the demon tower, constantly wondering if the 13th saint, Lizon, had returned. The rotating teeth, the saint's artery, the spokesperson who answered the interview today was clearly not happy with these questions. He put the microphone up and said, hello, hello, I have nothing to say about this? Then he hurriedly left in the angry clamor of the reporters, what the hell, bah, and then answered what? The dragon snake swooped down the road, damn it. Rang Ki angrily smashed his glasses, what's so great about that bastard Lizon that those fangirls are so interested in? It turned out that this old man was furious because he had been robbed of all the spotlight, no one paid any attention to him, so he went crazy. As for that crooked-faced bastard, they said he was still alive? After being abandoned in that tower for 20 years, there was no way that could be true. Rang Ki gritted his teeth and reassured himself that there were tens of thousands of demons in there and they were all of a high level. To have killed the branded eye was a miracle in itself, he could not have survived after so many injuries. Most importantly, that bastard had not received the blessing of the gods like himself. But what if Lizon had really survived? Rang Ki frowned and exhaled a puff of smoke in a daze, then went mad again, at worst he would kill him again. At the same time, Lizon was full and excited, looking at his phone and mumbling, should I kill this bastard or not? Also under the blue sky, at the airport Safed, England to be exact, a private jet had just landed, new leather shoes appeared on the stairs going down, and the greetings had been endless. It is our honor to welcome one of the twelve saints of the Zodiac. The airport staff respectfully greeted the man at 90 degrees, the blonde guy was Hugo, the saint of the constellation Sagittarius. Hugo, with his hands in his pockets, leisurely walked down and was immediately shown the way to the car by the staff to go to the prime minister's office. As soon as he left, the guards immediately turned on their fanboy mode, praising him from head to toe. The supercar sped to the prime minister's office, Hugo sat in the car, his eyes looking into the distance. Far away, his phone vibrated, interrupting his thoughts. 
Those damn journalists. Hugo frowned in annoyance. They had been bothering him for days now, just because of the ridiculous rumor that Lizon was still alive. Looking at the strange number that kept calling, Hugo angrily slammed his hand down. It had been over 20 years, how could he still be alive? Hugo turned off the phone to avoid hearing the ringing, then looked out the window again in a daze, remembering the day he reported. The death of his close friends, but he still smiled confidently and ate chicken, death was nothing to be afraid of. Throughout the journey to conquer the demon tower, Hugo had been outside dealing with the disasters under the direction of Lizon. At that time, he secretly prayed that his prophecy was wrong, so that his close friends would return safely. But the saints had abandoned Lizon, and happily returned to the palace of the Branded Eye, where they were hailed as heroes by the people, worshipped as saints. From then on, power and money came flooding in like a flood. In the following days, Hugo was still in the hospital, unable to believe that Lizon was dead, and repeatedly asked to open a search, but to no avail. So he just said, if you're worried about Lizon, you can go find him yourself. And he threatened to strip Hugo of his sainthood. Hugo still remembers his hypocritical expression vividly. Although he was very distressed, Hugo had to grit his teeth and endure it. Twenty years have passed without any news, perhaps the mole is right, it is impossible and it is too late now. Already. But from Hugo's eyes full of emotion, one can tell that he still remembers the indomitable spirit of his close friend. Just then, the driver announced that the prime minister was calling, and he hurriedly put aside his thoughts and answered the phone. What do you want me for, sir? As soon as he picked up the phone, he asked Hugo about the collapse of the tower, which made him discouraged. From journalists to him, it was too tiring. Already, thinking that the prime minister would ask him to find Lizon, he refused immediately, insisting that he was dead. The demon tower incident was nothing more than the work of the fan club of his friend. Angrily thinking that the prime minister just wanted to use this to increase his re-election rate, he was about to scold the old man when he immediately denied it. The prime minister's face was full of tension as he announced a strange call. What was the call? Asked. Don't say it, don't finish the sentence, just let people wait. It's Lizion's exclusive line. The answer was like a slap in the face. Hugo couldn't control his excitement and panic, and frantically slammed his two hands on the chair and shouted, stop the car. It wasn't until the new fan kit car that he calmed down temporarily. He hurriedly grabbed the phone, don't tell me Lizon just called. As soon as the screen opened, it showed 30 missed calls and a voicemail, oh shit. Hugo gasped and anxiously clicked on the voicemail, slowly bringing it to his ear, his heart in turmoil. Hey otaku, a familiar voice rang out, I'll find you and kill you. Good luck. Hugo completely finished listening to the message, his body stiffening in shock, his eyes staring blankly into space. Lizon, Idazio. Immediately afterwards, he ordered the driver to return to the airport, never mind the business trip. What's the prime minister? I have to go find my close friend. Back at the restaurant in Korea, Lizon grinned and stared at the phone. This little otaku has grown up, dares to ignore his call. Now, if he catches him, he's dead for sure, looking at the smartphone with delight. Lizon also has a bit of a problem, drooling and drooling. He was thrown into the tower in 2005, now it's 2025. The world has changed so much that he still hasn't adapted. Jimin happily explained to the savage in front of him that he could connect to the internet to watch the news. Is it that cool? I have to quickly search for my name to see if there is anything interesting. He showed him where to see the trending topics, and a lot of information related to Lizon was being discussed in the top positions, which made both the owner and the young Jimin widen their eyes in amazement. The joy didn't last long before the pile of grass that was throwing stones hit him in the face. They scolded him for being useless, and then the saints had to carry him on their backs. Doesn't it look hot-blooded and ignorant? Lizon clenched the phone in his hand in anger, causing the young brother Jimin to be shocked and said, Hey, be gentle with your phone. Brother, I'm the one who killed the branded eye, you idiots. Lizon was furious, but he calmed down immediately, not bothering to argue with the fools. After reading a few more articles, he suddenly saw a news article with a headline about his will. He remembered that back then, Lizon had agreed to donate all his property to the orphanage and the fund for education. He happily clicked on it, hoping that this last wish would be fulfilled properly. But to his surprise, all of his property had been occupied by the saints except Hugo. Completely, and they also distorted the information that he had written his will to leave it to them. What the hell are you guys doing? Lizon flew into a rage and squeezed. Crushed the phone. I'll cut you guys into a hundred pieces. Jimin fell to the ground in pain, looking at the new smartphone that was now just a pile of scrap metal, crying over the tragic death of his beloved phone. After reading the news articles, Lizon was speechless, sitting there thinking about what to do next. 
although he really wanted to show off his spectacular comeback. But now he looked so different from 20 years ago, he was afraid that no one would believe him if he said it, and he would be sent to a mental hospital. Lizon decided to keep quiet and secretly punish each of the saints before deciding what to do next. Jimin and his grandfather were still crying and weeping over the phone. It turned out that he hadn't finished paying off the installments before Lizon destroyed it. As the brown-haired boy patted his friend on the back to comfort him, he felt a strange energy from behind him. The warning system indicated that someone was following him, and the stench was also familiar. Thinking about this, Lizon hurriedly went out to breathe the fresh air to investigate the surroundings. His eyes stopped at that place, a group of goatheads were floating towards him. Isn't this the patron saint of Ares? Aren't they controlled by the supreme gods to do their bidding? What are they doing here? Lizon didn't know, but the system knew that the patron saints were showing off to him, demanding delicious food because the power of the supreme gods had been greatly reduced. Damn it. You fucking bastards, what the hell are you doing? Lizon immediately flew into a rage, he hated this kind of robbery the most. A surge of angry energy rose up, today I will teach you a lesson you will never forget. As he was striding towards the goats, he suddenly heard a burst of cursing. Damn, it's that madman Lizon again. Just as he was about to fight, he heard someone else cursing his name, and he turned to see a couple cursing the legendary Lizon. In recent days, the news about him had been all over Newfit, which made them uncomfortable. He was already dead, so why did everyone keep paying attention to him? The sunlight shone on the shiny badge on their chests, and Jimin immediately recognized it as the symbol of the Gemini society. I don't know why, but his eyes showed a bit of fear. Seeing Lizon standing in the way of the couple, Jimin shouted anxiously, Hey, come here quickly, don't mess with those people. But he just stood there without any emotion, which made the fat man angry. What are you looking at? Get out of my way. What? Seeing this, the two young men became anxious and started to cry. Stop talking. This time, we're going to die. Seeing that he didn't react, the fat man took a puff of his cigarette and blew it straight into Zion's face. What? Are you angry? The guy didn't know that he had just turned on the destruction mode inside him, and he even provocatively bumped his head. If you're angry, hit me. Darling, her boyfriend hurriedly stopped her, not because he was afraid of the guy fighting, but because he was afraid that the young man with the bruises would pee his pants. Then they turned around and left, not forgetting to leave a sentence bullshit. They kept saying that he belonged to the loser association that supported Lee Zion. Even though they were far away, their sarcastic words kept ringing in his ears. Chi Min saw that Zion had restrained his anger and ran over to remind him. Those two belong to the Gemini constellation. If you get out of sync, it will be difficult to survive. Before he could finish his sentence, Zion seemed to have a seizure. Hey, you damn bugs. Chi Min burst into tears again secretly thinking in his heart that this time, it's definitely over. Not believing that the loser would dare to talk back to them, the two turned back angrily and asked in a loud voice, who did you just say? Who? Only to see Zion with a surge of anger, I'm calling you guys, it's nice to have a pair. The fat man hurriedly stomped over and put his face close to his face and growled, if you're so good, then tell me again. At this point, it was wrong for the guy to continue to challenge Zion. He slowly raised his hand and flicked it lightly, and the fat man was thrown dozens of meters away, no different from a flying trash bag. His fat body slammed into the ground, crushing a block into a pile of rubble, causing the short-haired girl to scream in fear, and the other two bastards were also so scared that their jaws dropped. Zion was laughing triumphantly at the fat man's beautiful fall, not caring about the hateful eyes of his lover. He was looking at him. After a while, he suddenly laughed out loud. Do you think I don't know you're behind me? Oh, the short-haired girl took advantage of the fact that he was not paying attention to her and tried to sneak around to attack him, but she didn't expect to be caught so easily. Another snap was fired, and she was shot far away just like her boyfriend, just like a beautiful couple being flattened. Looking at her falling to the ground, he just coldly said, so weak and still so windy. Kai Min's gang asked him nervously why he dared to use his powers in the street like that? Aren't you afraid that the police will come and arrest you? These guys are really funny, how could his power be so weak? If I had really used my skills, that couple would have been selling salt a long time ago. Oh my god, did he crush the A-class artifact with just a snap? Today, the two of them have gone. From one surprise to another, their mouths wide open, not paying attention to the overreaction of the idiots. Zion's eyes were drawn to something else. He sat down where the fat man was, picked up his pendant, and yanked it off. Isn't this a sacred object? Ever since he fought with the guy, he had noticed it. Why did such a complete hooligan have such a valuable item? He remembered that in the past, only 13 saints were allowed to wear this thing, 
but now it is so widely circulated. What's the point of being limited anymore? Only I was surprised that this god didn't know anything, so I had to use brainwashing to explain it to him. The human race was almost extinct after the disasters appeared decades ago, and the human beings who survived until now are thanks to the gods and the saints they chose. But twelve people can't protect the whole world, so they had to gather people together and establish holy societies. Those who have the ability to awaken will be given power by the saints and are called apostles, just like you and me. Please forgive me for letting him show off a little. From then on, a ranking system was created to divide the ranks, with the saints at the top, then the sulfur monosulfide level commanders. Below the S class commanders are the 10 stars, and from A class and below are all collectively known as apostles. The gods are above all, their power comes from the absolute faith of the apostles, so they put on a lot of contests to increase the number of people joining the holy society, and those who are chosen will be given gifts of all kinds. Jimin just summarized it very briefly, if you understand it, you understand it, and if you don't, you don't. Damn, I've only been away for 20 years, and the world has gone crazy. That old-fashioned system doesn't make any sense to you, my friend. Look, look. Jimin pointed his finger at the sky, but not with infinite hatred, but at the guardian gods who were surrounding Jayan in front of him. The system told him that among the crowd in front of him were the patron gods of prosperity and greed, and they wanted him to kill the couple just to see blood. In return, Jayan would receive a gift as a kind of quid pro quo. The young man was tired just looking at it, there was nothing like attracting the attention of the guardian gods. If they spoke up and didn't follow, it would be like rejecting the words of the gods and incurring their wrath. Just as he was about to advise the man to do as they said, Jayan let out a terrible laugh. He looked up and saw that he was not happy at all, but that his eyes seemed to be annoyed. Just now he was wondering why the hounds of the tooth were surrounding him. Now he understood that everyone on the side of the bed wanted to drink the delicious food into their stomachs. Picking up a pair of slippers from someone's bathroom, Jayan muttered a few words that sounded like curses, and he stomped hard on the sidewalk, creating a continuous swirling shockwave that blew away all the guardian gods above. These guys must have been all bark and no bite, they couldn't even resist this powerful flash of bright moonlight. Jayan's single stomp blew away all the guardian gods in the city, restoring the clear blue sky. Jimin opened his eyes in bewilderment and saw Jayan's familiar smile. Up above, the guardian gods had all disappeared. The sky was clear of guardian gods and barriers, the original colors were now visible, and from this, Jimin realized that this young man was not ordinary at all. Of guardian gods and barriers, and the original colors were now visible, and from this Jimin realized that this young man was not ordinary at all. Suddenly he called Han Jimin by his name and pointed at the fat man foaming at the mouth, asking if he had just said that this was the Gemini apostle. No, that's right, that group is both large and dangerous. Many members are also big shots that no one wants to mess with. Suddenly hearing Jayan ask a question out of the blue, they are very rich, aren't they? Jimin was about to ask again when he saw him smile slyly. Look at the pile of stuff this guy was carrying, it was all designer stuff. Fashionable to fashionable, Jayan sat down and grabbed the cardigan first, singing Lala to save money on clothes. Twenty years in the demon waterfall living no different than a hairy ape in an abandoned zoo. Now that he has just cut his hair, Jimin liked it for him, praising him for looking quite handsome, which made Jayan really embarrassed. Plus, back in the day, even though he was the 13th saint, his power kept betraying him. Every gust of wind that blew through was no different than blowing through a field of dandelions, blowing his hair all over the place, looking no different than the neighbor's uncle who has thick hair in some places and thin hair in others. Now with the gift of beautiful idol hair, how could Jayan not be happy? Suddenly there was a buzzing sound beside him that caught Jayan's attention, and he looked over in annoyance to find a hybrid insect nearby. With no electricity, we use our hands. Jayan hates these insects so he just put his hand up and crushed it, then dropped the remains in front of Jimin's admiring eyes. He had just killed one when more came buzzing, and Jayan's hands, which were more sensitive than a dog's, became increasingly irritable. Jimin saw him like this and asked curiously, do you know the phrase Rui be you? Could it be you? Could you be calling yourself Rui? Jayan strongly rejected Jimin's hypothesis and looked around to find what was attracting these insects. His eyes fell on the colorful trinkets on the shelf, telling him straight away that the cause was those things. That statue of a goddess that Jayan said was an evil object. Attracting misfortune, Jimin couldn't cry. Picked that up in the trash at the beginning. 
I got it directly from the airy saint. That's it, his face was very proud to introduce the blessed object of the saint. Human, a gust of wind blew through and two parts of the statue went straight to Dalat. Dayan also pretended that he had just touched something. Dirty, but he didn't care about Jimin's broken heart. The item that he had cherished like a wildflower in his hand, Jayan, with a cold expression, said that this mask was to monitor the person who bought it, boy. It was very clear that he had searched every nook and cranny, this music box was for stealing. Information, this watch was to attract the evil hand to come here. The more dirty things he found in the house, the more Jayan realized that the bastards had not only stolen his money, but had also sold evil objects to unsuspecting people in order to pick their pockets. Just thinking about it made his face twitch. No matter how sorry Jimin was, he didn't dare go near him to stop him. From outside the house, Jayan could be heard roaring, throw it all away for me. Suddenly the door opened, and the noise made Jayan, who was about to crush, the evil watch, freeze for about two seconds. The man who came in with the red head was very up upset, Jayan was, at someone else's house and was surprised to ask, who are you and why are you here? Jimin tried to put on a conciliatory face and called him Sung Che to come back, but Sung Che didn't listen, he only heard Jayan's rude question. He asked back with a sullen face, you're asking me who I am, I'm the owner of this house. Sung Che's whole body glowed with a blue power, his face darkened as he prepared to defend his house. Jayan just ahead, as if he had just discovered that, it was perfectly normal for the owner to come into his own house. All around the three people, there was a lot of broken stuff. It suddenly felt like they were caught cheating. At the Ares Sanctuary of Gang Ki, from the outside, you could hear the hoarse voice of the fat man. Gang Ki's face turned pale when he heard that the guardian spirit in Hansung had disappeared. His subordinates confirmed it again, adding that the branch of the Ares Sanctuary in South Korea was in a panic over this. Gang Ki also felt that something was wrong because he had never heard of this happening before. Guardian spirits are subordinates of the supreme gods, and no one should ever dare to chase them away. Who would dare to act so boldly? Pointing down at his subordinate, he ordered him to contact the other saints to see what the situation was. Like, Gang Ki was about to leave when he heard that Sagittarius was not responding. That Hugo is now a mercenary in England. It's not uncommon to lose contact with him. Gang Ki didn't pay much attention, but his subordinate hesitated and then also said that Hugo had just arrived in England and had left the country immediately. Where did he go? This made Gang Ki take notice, and when he heard Hugo's destination was also South Korea, he immediately turned back and thought for a long time. Is there a reason for such a coincidence? From the beginning, Hugo was Lyrian's best friend, after Lyrian went into hiding in the Demon Tower, he rarely returned to South Korea. Could it be because of the rumors that Lyrian is still alive that have been circulating lately? If it's just a rumor and Hugo went there to verify it, then it's fine, but if that long-haired, crooked-faced guy really came back alive, what would Gang Ki do? He grabbed a nearby candle holder and threw it straight at his subordinate below, who luckily managed to dodge it. Investigate this matter thoroughly and tell me what else is going on. Seeing that his boss Boss was impatient when he heard about Xeon, the subordinate was cautious but still had a matter to report that an Ares apostle had been found unconscious near where the guardian spirit had disappeared. He was left on the road half conscious with only his underwear on, and, according to witnesses, he had a conflict with a handsome man. No one knew how handsome he was, so the eyes of Gang Ki just stared at the broken candle holder on the ground. He denied it outright, it was definitely not Lysian, because he was a crooked-faced, squinting guy with a big bald spot. But anyway, all these things Things were too coincidental. Things are too coincidental. More rumors of Lizion's return and Gang Ki's failed conquest of the Spider Queen could shake his political standing. Not allowing that to happen, Gang Ki ordered his private jet to pick him up right away. His subordinate looked up, somewhat puzzled. Was the saint going there himself? Yes, now that he had handed over the work to his minions, Gang Ki was not at ease. He had to go to South Korea himself to see what was new. He threw on his coat and added a cigar to make him look like a busy man and took a few of his men with him to witness the events in South Korea firsthand. That night in the Myoyang hospital, the sound of a machine connected to a motionless person on. A bed beeped steadily, and the sound of a respirator made the old man roar with indignation. Who did this? Who did this to my grandson? Beat my grandson to a pulp, and stripped him naked, and he still hasn't woken up and we don't know who the culprit is. He pointed at a man in white leaning against the wall, demanding an answer. 
the wise answer from the Aries Apostle. Rank F, spoken by Myung Ying Hoon, was not to worry, the Aries Sanctuary had sent him here to take care of this matter. Sung Che thought he had just heard the funniest joke in the world, but he couldn't laugh. Joke in the world, but he couldn't laugh. Just ask him how he met this guy in the Demon Tower? Then this guy cleared out a whole bunch of monsters with his bare hands? And then he defeated an A-class apostle. A. Chi Min knew that the story he was telling sounded like a legend, but he didn't know what to do but nod his head repeatedly to add credibility. But even if he believed the story, Zeng Che was pissed off that this guy had broken into someone's house and trashed it for an extremely ridiculous reason, that the furniture in the house was all evil, fake stuff. Which guild do you belong to that you dare to say such a thing? Did Dion look like he needed to join a guild? He smiled a silly smile that made Zeng Che want to throttle him, but he still dared to ask, which supreme god do you follow? Those guys should be following me, right? No matter what question Zeng Che asked, Dion answered as stupidly as if he had just fallen from the sky. Zeng Che was at his wit's end, and patiently asked one last question, what is your name? If he said something stupid to this, he would probably punch him. My name is Lysian, he said his name calmly, as if it were a perfectly normal thing. But Zeng Che burst into a flame of rage, furious at his answer. Then he released all his power, roaring, how dare you call yourself my lord Lysian. Chi Min was scared to death, and quickly reminded him that he was still in the house, grandpa, it's a rented house, don't go crazy. But Zeng Che was in a fit of rage and didn't care, he just released all the power of an Ares apostle, causing the system board to pop up and warn Dion. It looked pretty cool, but, it would just burn this house down. Dion kindly reminded him and then activated the mind freeze skill, seeing that Zeng Che's strength was at level A with the title of Punisher. What caught his attention most was that Zeng Che's eyes were blazing with the blue flames of an S-level skill, a fire mage, the eternal ice with an A-rank seal. Paying even more attention, Dion could also read this little brother's personality as someone who was stubborn about his idols and a genius at learning. He smiled, this little brother was so young, but was able to use high-level summoning spells because he was a genius at learning? Excellent, he was now casting two eyes on the statue behind him that was about to blow up this apartment building. Chi Min almost twisted his guts, shouting loudly, brother, run away quickly. Zeng Che is a high-level Ares apostle, touching the idol Li Dian will cause trouble. Zeng Che tilted his head and warned Chi Min, hurry up and get out of here or you will die. You can touch anyone but you can't be sensitive to the idol's name. Dion suddenly appeared right behind Zeng Che with his hand in a hip-hop never die style, smiling slyly, making him jump, and as soon as he turned around, Chi Min didn't care about the house anymore, now he just hoped that Zeng Che wouldn't die. Dion still hadn't taken the silly smile off his lips, which only made Chi Min twice as worried. Why did he say it was okay, but Zeng Che was having a seizure like that? Dion let the messy red hair fall back on Chi Min, while he yawned and went straight into a nearby room to sleep. But as soon as the door opened, what hit his eyes was a room full of statues and models. A vivid chibi version of the legendary Li Zion had been restored in color and healed of scars. Chi Min carried Zeng Che in and explained that his brother was just addicted to Li Zion. It was nothing. But he was Li Zion. Looking at his own intact head, he was not familiar with it, and broke it off in Zeng Che's horrified scream. Chi Min was afraid that he would go crazy and bite Zion, and quickly dragged Zeng Che out, leaving him inside to cut off all the heads of the statues. Zeng Che's soul was severely traumatized that day, and there was nothing but a scream echoing through the heavens. The afternoon news in the city could not ignore the story of the Ares faction being stripped naked on the street by a suspicious person. Hugo knew that, perverted style of Lee Zeon, he sighed sadly that as soon as he returned to South Korea he had to hear this news that made his head hurt. While he was still annoyed, someone came up to ask him if he wanted a drink, Hugo snapped, stop talking nonsense and get lost, you crazy tooth. The waitress, laughed, her eyes changed unusually and her voice changed to a man's, greeting Hugo without any restraint, long time no see. The crazy tooth still kept the appearance of a waitress, and hugged his neck to get information from Hugo, but only made him, more furious. There was a reason why I didn't like this fat guy from the beginning, and he was groping around me, which was disgusting. Seeing that Hugo was not happy, Hugo was angry, and the crazy tooth was appearing right in the mind of the female employee, making her panic and wonder why she was here next to a male customer like this. Hugo was furious at the crazy tooth's meanness but couldn't punch anyone, just swallowed it down, determined to find Lizon before the other dogs sniffed out this place. Over there in Bashan, in the commercial district, Sungchi's soul had accepted the truth and returned to his body, 
and was now shopping in the supermarket with Chimin. As soon as he got out here, he was screaming, Lizon is the hero of all mankind, and what's that guy at home like? Maybe he didn't believe it either, but Chimin's two eyes saw him coming out of the demon tower, that was the most convincing detail. Robbery, robbery, the two of them were still frozen in place, not understanding what was going on, when they saw a white light flash by and blow everything away. On the road, the robber wearing a mask like blue underpants was running like crazy with a few bills in his hand. At this speed, it could only be a cancer apostle using his power to steal. It crashed into everything in the supermarket, taking both goods and money so fast that it couldn't be seen with the naked eye. Secretly rejoicing that the saints had managed to keep their belts, he was about to rush to the next location to steal when someone's arm grabbed and held him back. Got you, little boy. However, this grab was so strong that it went straight into the robber's stomach, causing him to lie on the ground in pain. Until Jimin realized that the person who had just caught him was Zion. Suddenly, from behind the counter, someone's voice praised Zion's way of doing things, saying that it was very impressive, that it was not easy to catch a cancer apostle normally. But in my opinion, you are just an ordinary apostle, next time you should not catch it with your hands, but call the police instead. Zion looked at the silver-haired man in front of him, wondering what the hell the idiot was talking about. The conversation was cut short before it could even start by a strange clucking sound. That went all the way from the top to the bottom of the supermarket. The sound grew louder and louder, as if it was coming from both the ground and the ceiling, and everything shook in a strange way. The cancer apostle thief lying on the ground thought it was an earthquake, and took advantage of this opportunity to rush away with his proud speed. I almost got punched in the mouth by an idiot, now I'm going to open a non-stop party and dance my ass off. The party was so much fun that someone got hooked, it does out of the ground and came up right in front of the robber, then wriggled its giant, leggy body, and said, brother, let me party with you, I have Vinahau music here. The appearance of the mirror-eared monster in the green area was enough to make the robber's face turn pale, now he even wants to dance with it. The robber backed away gradually, not wanting to dance with the monster, but also not wanting to slow down and get caught by the police. He jumped up high to avoid the centipede, confident that with his speed, it wouldn't be able to catch up with him even with a hundred legs. Unexpectedly, the centipede didn't bother to chase him, but a huge mouth full of fangs opened right in the robber's path. The jaws snapped shut decisively, and the spider hybrid devoured its target right before the eyes of hundreds of people in the supermarket. The spider queen on the top of the person was all scales, and she glanced at the crowd below with bright eyes, as if she was choosing ingredients for her main course. Warning, warning, this is not a drill. The Spider Queen monster disaster has appeared in the supermarket. All residents are requested to evacuate as quickly as possible. Before the introduction was over, the spider spewed out a swarm of insects of all kinds that rushed towards the people in sight. Whoever had a seat closest to the target and didn't buy a ticket, well, you might as well give your life to me. In a moment, the whole supermarket was in chaos with people screaming and running for their lives. To add to the drama, the loudspeaker kept ringing out, saying that the area had turned red. Everyone knew it, why not put on some music to complete the set? While so many people were running for their lives and still dying, a high school boy was so terrified by the unstable situation that he stood there crying, oblivious to the spider's mouth full of fangs rushing towards him. And yet, just like the character saved by the male lead, Lee Zeon punched the spider in the head so hard that it almost got hemorrhoids, and even told the boy to stand in the kitchen if he was going to cry. He was afraid of the spider one, and he was afraid of the guy who had just punched the spider ten. He put his hand out in front of him, scaring the boy so much that his soul entered his body, and he ran away quickly. He was trying to play the good guy, but in a minute he went from being a hero to a country bumpkin. Zeon had to switch his target to the monsters to play the hero, wondering why they were in the green zone. But anyway, why not, it was just in time for his snake to separate its power. Lee Zeon looked at the swarm of insects excitedly, a smile on his face as he started his mid-session exercise program. The shiny black car sped down the highway, having been given priority. Inside was the colonel, who had just returned to Korea and received news of the monster attack on the supermarket in Buchian. Sweat pouring down his face, he asked again what kind of monster it was, and it turned out to be the female, spider queen that he had met not long ago. Oh my god, guys. The last time the colonel tried to catch that scourge, he failed, and could only seal it away. Who would have thought that it would escape, and now it was tearing up the supermarket in the green zone. The colonel was furious that P had just been thinking, oh self for too much and should have to go kill monsters alone, but alone he couldn't do that. Blue is where high-ranking people like saints or governments live. Green is a safe area. 
for humanity to live in. Yellow is still habitable, but people have to live in hiding because it has reached the alert level. Above that is orange, where danger lurks everywhere with a large number of monsters. To the red zone end, even yellow villages are just bait for high-level beasts, and the black zone is nowhere to be found. The Spider Queen appeared in the Buchian supermarket, officially turning the blue zone red. So, the subordinate asked Zhang Gui what to do with the supermarket. Tell them to let Chan bury the place. Zhang Gui clenched his fists, he could not let the news leak out that the saints had lost a lot of resources only. To fail to destroy the Spider Queen, knowing that he was being reckless, but he had no ability other than to give orders. Zhang Gui ordered the relevant authorities to announce that the people there were dead, and to send reinforcements to demolish the building. Inside the supermarket, there was now the sound of creaking and crunching as hundreds of large insects ran in the same direction, where the silver-haired man looked like he had just been pulled out of a freezer. With smoke coming out of his mouth, Trung Hung slammed his hand on the ground, freezing it in a long line, cursing the damn bugs. Mouth spitting out smoke, Trung Hung slammed his hand on the ground, freezing it for a long way, cursing the damn bugs. For an S rank like Trung Hung, a move that could immobilize the whole group was already a great success. But, before he could celebrate for more than 10 seconds, the ice shattered and the disgusting insects rushed out to take revenge. Trung Hung had just created the ice, but now, sweat was pouring down his head, and he had no more strength to resist. Suddenly, Zion appeared in front of him with a pile of soda cans on his hand, saying calmly, Go, boy, snowflake, I'm here. He looked around for a while but still didn't see where Lyrian had appeared from, but the stage was his now, so he had to let him perform. He threw a can of Coca-Cola, but the author hid the label, and Zion asked, how about a drink to cool down, guys? His hand holding the can of water shot out with terrifying power, and then all the cans were thrown out at once. Everyone got a can of water, so they could drink as much as they wanted. The insect standing behind didn't get a share, and was about to scream for its can when a can of water came from right to left, blocking the scream in its throat. And he was giving out water, but his teeth looked so creepy, Zion flicked. Each of them a flick to shut their mouths to avoid arguing. The more he fought, the more excited he became his eyes wide open and his flight mode activated. He fought harder and harder, his eyes wide open and his flight mode activated. After one round, the tip of the knife was covered in blood, making Sung gasp and open his mouth wide enough to fit a bun. Hello, young man, the system has popped up a message to process the successful handling of the scourge. Experience points have increased and a component has been obtained. What component is it? Can you be more specific? The system summoned something that looked like a sparkling stone on Lishan's hand letting him know that he could create new skills and relics with these components. He clenched the glowing thing in his hand so that he could check it out later. At the moment, his body's movements were still meeting his requirements, and Lysian was in an extremely comfortable state. Now, let's pay attention to the little snowflake behind him, whose eyes are fixed on his performance. He was so relaxed that he even gave the knife back to Sung. T, saying that he had brought it from home, and now he was returning it. That's great, bro. Now that you've returned the knife, who dares to cut it again? Lishan's nonchalant expression made the bald head think hard, it looked so familiar. Finally, as if remembering something, he shouted, causing Leon to turn around and look, eating his finger in his face. Are you the one who attacked our two comrades? Damn, that fat guy who played with me and my son is a horse-faced buffalo head, isn't it enough to meet him once? Lishan panicked, and somehow he lunged over and punched the bald head, sending his jaw out of place. His mouth uttered a sentence full of villainous overtones, you already know too much how can you find me if you don't want people to know don't do it I was talking to you properly but you came over and punched me you son of a bitch the clothes you're wearing were stolen from someone else and you're wearing the badge of an s rank apostle and you're showing it off everywhere so how can people not know vision was accused of being a thief but he didn't feel ashamed at all he reached out and tore off the badge wondering What's this trouble? I'm wearing it all over the place in the countryside? Completely ignoring the little snowflake, making him mad with anger, wanting to jump over and grab his hair. Lysian squeezed the night market stove right in front of the Ares Apostle, his mouth muttering that the witch had cheated several people with these three things for 20k at the market. Hey, what about me? I'm still in this section, don't block my way. Lysian was happy, but suddenly became angry because the stinky thing interrupted him. Recognizing it before he did, Chimin trembled, 
pointed, and backed away, because it was the spider queen who had been herding the chickens from the other end of the supermarket and had found her way here. The bald head didn't bother with Dion anymore, standing there, muttering nonsense and wasting his time with his underworld gun. Luckily for him, he was standing next to Lijian, whose body emitted a wave of cool mint energy, and his hair shot straight forward, his mouth wide open. Hey, 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 spider girl. He shot straight up to where the spider queen was standing, preparing to. Camarako, you've got the guts to eat your father's fist, get out of here. Damn, he told me to get lost, and the whole floor and tiles collapsed. The crowd that was running like hell suddenly stopped running, opening their eyes and looking towards the place where the stinky mouth had just pressed them. Chimin and Sungchi had seen Dion in action several times but still weren't used to it. Not to mention the little snowflake, who had only three words in his head, run away quickly. Who is this guy who can face the spider queen head on without any relics, and has a perverted smile on his face that looks like a clown? While he was in a daze, he heard the voice of a man, calling all Ares apostles inside the supermarket. Out of the whole group, only Sung Chi and the bald head Kwa Trung Hun heard it, because this was the voice of the commander of the Holy Assembly, Choi Hai Yuk, transmitting to the Ares apostle. He was nearby, ordering both of them to get their asses out of the super. Market immediately, the Ares apostle would soon bury the whole building. Outside the supermarket, a red curtain had somehow appeared with a radius of about 10 meters, perhaps the two of them also noticed the strangeness in the air. Choi Hai Yuk is not like an apostle, he always says this is the directive of the Fang Fence, so he can't disobey. He wants the Ares apostle to hide the fact that he can't control the Spider Queen. Min Trung Hun, you can teleport, take Sung Chi out. The bald head looked calm, asking again if the commander wanted only two people to escape? Because before his terrified eyes, many people were very lucky to have escaped the massacre, but now they're saying to leave them to die here? Below the crack, countless arthropods were still crawling out in the name of the young. The perverted man was still jumping over to fight the spider queen. That fact made Trung Hung struggle mentally, choosing to do the right thing but. Commander Hai Yuk didn't give him much time, urging him, is there a problem? Choosing between living alone and dying together, Trung Hung very quickly made a choice. Of course he did not object to the superior's order. Besides, the sound of the gunshots was getting closer, he knew what was going on here, so why give such a reckless order? And that Trung Hung guy, how dare he open his mouth to say that the people here will be buried with him? Does that matter more than your own life? Trung Hung's head was spinning constantly coming up with all sorts of reasons to convince himself that this, this would make people think of us, the Ares Apostles? I, Sung Che, opened my eyes wide in amazement, now is the time, when to talk about being afraid of what others think. Yes, Trung Hung had figured it out. If news of the Spider Queen gets out, the power and faith in the Absolute, gods will surely diminish, affecting the protection of the gods. Ignoring Sung Che's irritability, Trung Hung told him to hurry up and come, here with him, the last teleportation could only take two people. But Sister Min is still here, how can he leave her? Not to mention that there are still many people around who need help. The more Trung Hung talked, the more impatient he became. The number of people left behind was buried. Together with the building, what was there to wonder about asking over and over again? If so, he would not hesitate to leave Sung Che here. To die with these unknown people. Looking at Trung Hung's arm that was growing ice, he knew he wasn't joking. There were many reasons to obey orders, and if Sung Che had already attached the people here like that, killing them would be painless, wouldn't it? Trung Hung's evil made Sung Che furious, he roared and summoned the sacred fire of the plateau to surround him only to be met with Trung Hung's laughter. Sao is on a completely different level than you, think carefully. Before he could finish his advice to the apostle, Trung Hung was sucked from behind and fell face down on the ground. It was the giant body of a centipede that was pressing him down on the tiles. Legion's Gucci-clad foot appeared, immediately, asking the kids what they were still doing here. The knife he had brought from Sung Che's house was probably a good one from a sushi shop. He had been slashing and cutting for a while now and it hadn't chipped, now he just wanted to get these kids out of here. Sung Che told him that the door was blocked so they were stuck here. The only way to get out was to use the instant teleportation of Trung Hung, who was currently face down on the ground. Or to think more boldly, it was to destroy all the dead beasts. Here and then find another way out that was not blocked. There were so many wounded people here that they couldn't even walk, let alone escape together. Time was running out, the Ares apostles were blockading the place to bury everyone. Talking about it again and again was getting nowhere, 
even Xian had to say a few curses. Behind him, Trung Hung struggled to his feet from the rubble and still, had the strength to blast away the things that had crushed him to the floor. Oh, you guys wanna run away from here and leave everyone else behind? Talking for a while without killing anyone, staying here would only lead to more bruises, Trung Hung stared. At the phone, gritting his teeth and saying that he would leave this place on his own. The spider spirit must have had a special feeling for Trung Hung, because as soon as those words left his mouth, it shot out a web stronger than dog glue, holding Trung Hung here with it. His eyes widened, he didn't expect that when he wanted to leave. The most, he would receive this kind of affection from the spider. She sucked Trung Hung into her mouth, keeping him, as her own for good, to avoid any more noisy arguments. The phone used for instant teleportation fell to the ground with a thud, as if, to call everyone back to reality, there was still a spider queen in the supermarket. Gion opened his mouth to say the first kind words of the day, asking the two young men to take care of. The wounded, he would take care of these disgusting things. Probably afraid that his younger brothers wouldn't believe him, Gion's whole body radiated a faint glow, reminding them that I will finish this quickly. At that time, outside, the Ares apostles were trying to reconnect the roof of the barrier outside the supermarket. Jiang Qi just arrived and saw that things were not finished, so he asked why the progress was so slow, making his subordinates sweat profusely. Because we've been working hard all this time, we didn't dare to rush, but this, this ceiling layer is so weird, boss. Obviously something was blocking it. Just as the words were uttered from inside the supermarket, a blue-white light bound their eyes, causing the Ares apostles to dodge quickly to avoid going blind. The image of a giant blue and white snake writhing and shooting out of the roof of the supermarket released a terrifying energy that knocked the people sitting on the ground. Jiang Qi couldn't believe his eyes, it was a snake. And then, just a second later, everyone in the supermarket rushed out screaming and hugging the guards outside. They panicked and pulled, telling of the situation inside where someone was killing too many spiders, and they wanted to be released, but for the time being, no one had escaped outside. Jiang Qi's face turned pale when he heard those words, there was no way that a spider queen that he couldn't even catch could be killed by someone else. He had to check it out for himself to be sure. Jiang Qi told his subordinates to let him in, but they kept blocking him, so tired that Jiang Qi flew into the air and into the building. At a broken glass aisle, he had just stepped inside. Vision appeared out of nowhere, laughing hello, long time no see. Why aren't you happy? Why are you so flustered? Jiang Qi almost threw up. Is there any way to say hello more abruptly? He's 40 years old. Middle-aged people tend to get scared easily. Thanks to Jiang Qi's departure, the area outside was filled with the sound of ambulance sirens. The rescue team quickly arrived at the scene, taking the injured to the hospital. Among them were Sung Che and Chi Min, who were sitting in a corner wrapped in blankets, silent. Sung Che wasn't physically injured, but he was mentally traumatized. He kept thinking about it, was that tough guy Lijian? His appearance was completely different, but his way of moving was extremely similar. Sung Che suddenly heard a familiar voice calling his name, coming from his father Hugo, who had just run over to ask why he was still here. Sung Che turned his back to his father as soon as he saw him, and pretended to ignore him. He was being immature and rebellious, while Chi Min gaped at him, almost wanting to rush over and ask for the saint's autograph. Sung Che didn't even know that he had come and gone like an immortal riding a cloud. Now he was being ignored by his son, who wouldn't answer any of his questions. Hugo was thinking of a way to get his son to talk. A moment later he took a deep breath and asked about his health first. Then he got down to business, asking about the person who had destroyed the monsters inside the supermarket, but Sung Che still didn't answer. Hugo had punched so many monstrous disasters, but he had never punched his son. Chi Min must have known that his Sagittarius uncle was more hot-tempered, so he opened his mouth and asked Sung Che, is Li Jian okay? Hearing that sensitive name, Chi Min was immediately grabbed. Hugo grimaced and snapped, ha, huh, what did you just say about Jian? Where? Where is he? Chi Min's brain disconnected from the server for a few seconds. Then, the Jian he was talking about was Jian the glutton, not the saint that Uncle Hugo was talking about. But if it's the guy with the knife, then he is in the supermarket killing the spider queen. The story was simple, but hearing it from Kai Min's mouth, it seemed a little silly. Hugo grabbed the boy by the shoulders and asked again to make sure the two were one and the same. Suddenly, the upper floor of the supermarket exploded with a loud bang. The walls turned to dust, carrying with them a lot of smoke. From the rubble came the sound of a man running. It was Jiang Qi, now regretting all the meat he had eaten and not going to the gym. Running a few more steps, he was still faced with Li Jian laughing. It had been over 20 years since they had seen each other, but why was he so dizzy, Ari's friend? At this point, 
Jiang Qi still hadn't figured out who the guy in front of him was, he still had to ask, who are you? The feeling that the guy in front of him gave Jiang Qi was very similar to Li Jian, but that guy didn't have a scar on his face, and his head was bald, and not transplanted, not to mention his voice was different, and most importantly, there was no way Li Jian could be this young. Jiang Qi must have thought that the guy in front of him was the old Li Ryan trying to scare him, so he started cursing. Li Jian was suddenly cursed at for no reason, he muttered, and asked back, I'm that guy, why are you calling me a liar? Jiang Qi kept thinking that some madman was pretending to be Jian, and gathered his strength to punch him. Unexpectedly, Jian lunged forward and punched him in the stomach, trying to knock all the fat out of him, knocking the Ares saint to the ground, and he pressed down on him for good measure. From the air, Jian added another punch to the overweight body, down to the ground below, and then calmly sat down next to it. Jian's lips still didn't stop smiling when he asked, My dear friend, have you been eating too well lately, and forgotten that you have to get beaten up before you listen to others? That day you killed me in the demon tower, did you find life more enjoyable? Every step closer to Jiang Qi was a reminder, the saints had taken all of his wealth, and they wouldn't let go of anything. But that's okay, my dear friend, I'm here today to kill you all, so money doesn't matter. He clenched his fists with a crack, whispering his plans to beat up Jiang Qi and then go to the family, friends, and other scum of the holy order, everyone would get a piece of it. The image of the entire Ares church collapsing at Jian's threat drove Jiang Qi mad, more or less, he wouldn't let him do those things so easily. Trying to endure the pain, Jiang Qi stared at the guy in front of him, knowing for the time being that he wasn't in a joking mood and was acting too fast, he hadn't been able to stand up properly yet. So the guy in front of him was really Li Jian who had come back to life and escaped from that demon tower with a completely different appearance. Suddenly Jiang Qi stood up, his expensive coat fluttering as he finally met, and repeated, if you are Li Jian then you have to prove to me that you are telling the truth. Jiang Qi's whole body flew up with a lot of energy that violently moved the air. He opened up many spaces behind him, his eyes like fire, wanting to resolve all doubts with force. The surrounding space swirled and was covered in red light. Below Jiang Qi's feet appeared a magic formation in the shape of the Ares head. Very quickly he summoned the transformation spell. On his head appeared an ancient style hat, modeled after the Ares's god of the rampart. The first saint of this zodiac sign, with seven swords of various kinds flying around it. Damn, I missed the real feeling. Each of those official hats on his head shows that this fat guy has only summoned part of his power, not all of it. Jiang Qi didn't reply. He just pointed his finger forward. The ground beneath. Xeon was suddenly covered with a bunch of chains that wrapped tightly around him, holding him down to the ground. His fat face broke into a smile of a superior being, and he asked Xeon again, do you still think I'm weak? From the air appeared hundreds of thousands of sharp swords of all kinds, merging together like fish in a school, eager to strike and form the secret technique of the Ares god of the rampart, the god of the rampart punishing the opponent. The giant stream of swords from Jiang Qi's side stretched out and flew towards Ryan, blowing away all the earth and air in its path. 2. His eyes narrowed in the true manner of an opa who underestimated, despised, and ignored the expensive effect. Shut up, you dog. Jiang Qi used his skills but still didn't forget to curse Xeon to relieve his anger. This battle would turn him into a ragged human-shaped teddy bear. Boom, boom, boom. The sound of the earth and rocks being pierced by hundreds of thousands of swords exploded with a terrible sound. When the smoke cleared and the light from the supermarket chandeliers shone down, the pile of swords stacked up like a tower revealed a magnificent scene. Jiang Qi didn't know if Xeon was dead or not, but first he had to breathe. Being so fat and fighting for so long, this old man was also getting tired. He would have to go and eat two buckets of fried chicken to regain his strength later. When he didn't see any movement for a while, Jiang Qi landed on the ground and reveled in the feeling of a victorious warrior. Finally the arrogant guy had died when faced with an experienced guy. This mountain of swords had buried Lizian easily, 20 years had passed and this guy still thought he was the 13th saint. Jiang Qi was laughing happily, when suddenly from the bottom of the pile of swords came a familiar blue light as if it didn't want him to wait too long. No, it couldn't be. Jiang Qi's eyes suddenly opened wide, he could only stand and wait for the power of blue and white inside to blow away all the swords he had stabbed into the ground. Lizian rushed out of the pile of swords, his whole body covered in blood, but he still had enough strength to punch Jiang Qi's fat face, no pain, no gain. His tattered coat fluttered in the wind, slamming the fat guy into the wall behind him, punching away all his arrogance. Jiang Qi's lips trembled, covering his teeth that were more than half broken 
both scared and shocked, not understanding how he could have survived that blow. Was Lizian really not a fake? Hee <laughs> hee, do you realize it now? Your right eye, now it's full of scars, my friend, take a good look. Li Xion's eyes flashed with blue light as he kicked Jiang Qi in the chest. I'm back, and I'm better than ever, my boy. Suddenly Lizian stood up straight, covering his nose with his hand, he complained. That these monkey swords smelled terrible, they must have been left in the trash for ages. Jiang Qi didn't reply, his eyes fixed on his muscular body. Ignoring the blood dripping from his nose, it wasn't that this fat guy was a gay guy who was crazy about men, but his recovery speed was amazing. Even the Aquarius recovery master couldn't do it. But what Jiang Qi didn't expect was that it wasn't his wounds that were recovering, but the system had just upgraded Lizian from the brink of death, giving him the 13th sensory skill. Now that you're done chatting, Hen, it's time for business. He stepped on. Jiang Qi, tell me, how can I make my beloved remember me forever? Normally, the god of the rampart would only appear when the saint transformed. But thanks to the system, Lizian saw the god of the rampart pointing at Jiang Qi and scolding him for letting him live until now. How did he know? He had no choice but to keep his mouth shut and not answer the god of the rampart. In an instant, the god of the rampart disappeared, leaving a curse on Jiang Qi. He screamed, why did the god of the rampart disappear? Lizian pretended not to know anything, and said with a smile that maybe the old man knew that these things were not useful, so he gave up. Even the god of the rampart ran away, now Lizian would be very happy. To let Jiang Qi know what it was like to be buried in the devil's tower. He was easy going, and immediately shared what he had received received with Jiang Qi. A moment later, his subordinates and Hugo entered, only to see a pile of ruins as if a titan had just fallen down here. In the corner of what used to be the supermarket, all the mirrors were shattered, clearly the result of a fierce battle. Hugo stood there in silence for a moment, suddenly realizing that the energy surrounding him seemed familiar. Was it Jiang Qi? He was lying beneath their feet, radiating an energy that showed he had been badly beaten. Their feet, radiating an energy that showed he had been badly beaten. Hugo felt bored, he was no different from a teacher scolding his son. It must have been Lizion's doing, no one else. The apostles of the white poplar could not see as well as Hugo, they only felt. The energy coming from beneath him was clearly weak. Not knowing how to dig this pile up, Hugo used his golden power in his hand, and ordered the people to retreat quickly. Who would dare to stand there? The apostles retreated immediately for Hugo. To punch the ground, this place was already ruined and it was ruined even more. Hugo flew down from the hole he had just created, and as soon as he landed, he started to adjust his clothes. I don't know if he was looking for Jiang Qi who was dying. Coming to see an old friend after 20 years. But he didn't see anyone. Hugo only saw something that was pure Lysian. He found a piece of paper somewhere, wrote four words, crossed out the first word, and stuck it on Jiang Qi's chest as if it was just right, and then disappeared. He went to fulfill his promise to Jiang Qi. If he was finished, he would go to his family and friends, the holy society and the holy relic. That Jiang Qi had stolen from him must be inside. Outside there was a grand white poplar badge, inside. There were many people taking pictures and visiting the exhibits. There was also a statue of Jiang Qi looking ugly and out of place in the middle of the hall. It was true that the rich man with too much money had a delusion of power, looking like he was constipated and still showing his face for everyone to see. Zion walked around for a while, feeling that there was a path where his relic was calling him. But when he got there, he only saw some of the clothes he had worn, the weapons, were all shoppy knockoffs and they dared to put them in a glass case for people to see. What a clown zodiac sign. Finally he found what he had been looking for all this time. Something long and thin placed on a velvet cloth with a sign. In front of it, a toothpick used by Lizian. Oh, I didn't expect to find something. With my enzymes here among all the shoppy stuff, how could he not be happy? The people visiting the white poplar mansion suddenly heard the loud crash of a large glass pane falling down. The alarm was blaring from the ceiling, announcing that a thief had come and surrounded him. In the corridor, the apostles ran in a panic, each one looking very tense, all because of a guy in a dragon robe taking away a toothpick. High-powered lights shone down on him, hundreds of guards rushed forward to form a circle around him, looking like an audience at a concert. And the artist picked up his prop and hummed. A little, I won't put it down. How can I do that? His two fingers held the toothpick, 
waving it up and down gently. But every time he flicked his hand, he could hear the crowd screaming in horror as if something had just cut across them. The hundreds of people there were soon blown away by Zion's power, leaving him alone to walk happily down the corridor and out. It was true that using something you were familiar with was the best, he still hadn't stopped flicking it back and forth with delight, only making the screams behind him even more pathetic. The toothpick in his hand had somehow turned into a shape half like a bun, half like a peach, smiling happily at him. As soon as he found his relic, the system reported that it belonged to the production system with the characteristic of transformation. From now on, the creative skill was unlocked, giving Zion a bright halo a meter and a half wide. From now on, Zion had the additional skill to produce, repair, and disassemble the artifacts he wanted. This strange relic grew larger and crawled up to his cheek, lovingly, caressing him like a dog that had finally found its owner after a long time. Just as he was about to go out, Zion's eyes were drawn to a door, with a white poplar symbol emitting a strong golden light. Suddenly he got excited and disappeared. He had come all this way and couldn't just leave empty-handed. He was going to be caught stealing anyway, so why not take everything instead of just one thing and make them laugh at him? By the time Hugo arrived panting, the mansion was on fire and black smoke filled the air. The people who had come to visit for a day were now running for their lives. Unlucky for them, they had become victims of a fire and their families would have to bury them. They chased him like a dog, but they couldn't catch up with their perverted friend who was always playing strange tricks. Hugo couldn't hold back his tears, now he just wanted to find Zeon. People were running around in chaos. Zeon walked alone through a side door, carrying a huge bag of loot and dragging it on the ground, complaining that he was hungry. Finally Hugo found him and screamed, but Zeon was not surprised to see him, and calmly asked, is it Taksu? Hello, friend. Twenty years ago, my friend, it was just yesterday, not there. Hello, come here with me. That's fine. Let Zeon stand still and wait for Hugo's hug. Unexpectedly, he ran headfirst towards the guy, who was standing there wondering what was going on, and Hugo grabbed him by the shoulders and shook him so hard his brain almost fell out. He heard a nagging voice beside his ear asking about a guy, who no one understood what was going on. After this incident, the young man will definitely have to get a haircut. It was a little too long past his shoulders, and he was mistaken for the main character, making Zeon very tall. He kicked Hugo straight in the face to remind him what his friend looked like, and his eyes finally stopped and asked the young man if his legs were okay. Fortunately, the long-haired guy wasn't affected, and now he's still standing. They're wondering how Zeon managed to hit his handsome face. Seeing the family arguing, the young man limped away, leaving Zeon looking at his friend lying on the ground, still cursing his friend like a bitch. Many people also made the same mistake. Hugo was so traumatized by the kick that he didn't hear Zeon's curses. His eyes only stared at the relic on his shoulder, and realized that it was the holy relic of his friend Zeon. If his eyes had gone up from his shoulder, they would have met Zeon's face full of veins, gritting his teeth and asking if he needed a few more blows to his brain, which was not blocked. Ah, Ryan, he ran straight up to hug the person in front of him, finally, realizing that his friend was not the monster from earlier. Tears and snot flowed, the touching reunion scene, of two close friends who had been together for 20 years was very dramatic, when Hugo received a punch in the stomach from his friend, damn it, I've been in the devil's tower for 20 years and I'm still a, straight man, hugging a fat thigh in broad daylight, this punch was of good quality, it was definitely Zeon, Hugo didn't dare to argue at all, just as he was about to continue cursing, the system jumped out of nowhere, in front of him, announcing that Apollo, the centaur god, had appeared, what the hell, why didn't the centaur god jump over Hugo and tell him to do it, suddenly, a golden light blinded his eyes, Apollo, suddenly appeared magnificently behind Hugo, another scene of closing his eyes and opening them like Sailor Moon transforming, both Hugo and Ryan stared in amazement at the god in front of them, although he was very handsome with the effect of light filters, who could tell these two gods why Apollo had appeared here, Apollo appeared and looked down at the two, below with a puzzled expression, saying nothing. Hugo seemed visibly confused as to why his god had come out at this time, and looked at his friend Ryan, who had just returned from the dead, with the same expression. Only the system knew before the centaur god spoke, that Apollo had many doubts about his survival. Full of bewilderment, Apollo whispered to Hugo to check if this was the real Ryan or a fake. Damn it, the god wanted to test him by putting an arrow in his ass to see what would happen. Ryan hadn't said anything until now, 
the centaur god wasn't the god of love Cupid, but he kept seeing him draw his bow and arrow and aim it at people's asses. Hugo stood in the middle trying to hold back his anger, so Ryan decided to switch targets to his friend. Remember what he said on the phone? I'll come and kill you, good luck. Now was the time for Ryan to fulfill his promise. As soon as he left the tower, he heard that his house had been sold, his aunt had been urinated on, and all the antiques were gone. Was he angry or not? They were both saints, but why did his friend look so strange now? Ryan looked extremely sinister, and insisted on giving his friend a punch that would make him feel better, and then he would talk. A loud bang sounded like a heavy object had fallen to the ground, not just a bony fist. Hugo was punched in the head and still had to smile, thanking God for giving his irritable friend back to him. If he hadn't hit him, he probably wouldn't have been him. Before he could deal with Apollo, a lot of people rushed out of the Ares mansion, in the sky, pointing at Ryan and accusing him of stealing antiques. As a saint, he went into someone's house and took things without asking permission. Hugo asked him what he had taken that so many people had come to see. He pointed to a sack like an old man's, Santa Claus, saying that he had only taken this much, and no more. How much is this? Half of the Ares family's belongings are in here. Ryan rested his hand on his waist with pride and asked his friend if he thought he was cool. Hugo had been annoyed with the fat man for a long time and now that he saw Ryan only taking things from the Ares family, he was happy and didn't pretend that stealing was wrong. The Ares mansion security guards were about to, to rush in, but the captain raised his hand to stop them. That guy is not an ordinary person like us, to deal with. Him I have invited a more capable person. As soon as he finished speaking, suddenly a strong wind blew up, and even, Hugo looked around in surprise to see what was going on. A black shadow jumped down from the roof of the Ares mansion. Below, it was the person the security team had invited. A giant feet slammed down on the stone floor below, it was the guardian god. Of Ares, the representative of prosperity who came to break Ryan's neck. The huge creature, half lion and half goat, looked like it was roaring with all its might instead of greeting. Its shadow covered the two people below, Hugo saw at a glance that the point of the fight was just a moment ago. He advised Ryan to throw away all the things he had taken. When the opportunity arose, he could figure out what to do. But he wasn't as panicked as his friend, and even gave a confident smile, reaffirming that he was a man with a plan. He wasn't some incompetent fool who would just jump into someone else's house, to rob them, and then run away when he couldn't beat them. Isn't that right, Leamy? Give me a sword. His antique laughed with delight, the nasty temper of its master was not too much. The first two eyes lit up, hundreds of images of weapons ran like a lottery. Until he found what he needed, his whole body emitted a lovely pink light. His curved mouth spat out a sword hilt for Ryan to reach out and grab and pull out right away. His mouth broke into a sly smile, and he swung his hand to reveal the sword in his palm. Unexpectedly, in such a sharp movement, the sword was no different from a fruit knife. Ryan himself found the size insufficient. He held it horizontally and muttered, show me the real power of the walker. His whole body emitted the familiar blue light of the serpent. The air moved vigorously as if it were gathering around Ryan, making Hugo stand next to him, not understanding this familiar energy. Suddenly, from nowhere, there was a loud bang on the ground and Ryan appeared. The sword that had been completely transformed in an extremely powerful way. Looking at the blue aura around it, one could tell that this ancient sword had been transformed. Energy from the serpent constellation, receiving a critical element point. For prestige, the hilt of the sword also featured a snake wrapped around the solid black blade, its jagged shape as if lightning was passing through it. Furthermore, before entering the battle, the system reminded Ryan that the 13th sensory skill allowed him to see the enemy's deadly weaknesses. To show off, and not to use it would be stupid. Ryan activated the skill, and clearly saw the weakness of the Ares guardian deity was at the joints of its fore and hind legs. Such an obvious weakness was too convenient, Ryan held his sword and rushed over to the giant beast. Seeing this scene reminded Hugo of the old days, his friend didn't know what fear was and would always rush into the face of his opponent and fight head on. Speak of the devil, the way he fought was so reckless and reckless, that only Ryan could do it, and today Hugo was very happy to see it again. Oh, the Pichu's forelegs slapped down on Ryan as he flew, over to it like swatting a fly. Oh my friend, before you could even get a single blow in, it slapped you away like that, what bones and flesh are left for me to bury. Take it easy, don't be so noisy, under the guardian god's feet. Suddenly came the impatient voice of Ryan. He bent his arm to lift the creature's foreleg, cursing and scolding, that the Ares had eaten too much instead of suffocating him to death. After the scolding, it was time to fight, 
Ryan's smile spread across his lips. Before he could see it, he made his move, and the guardian god experienced the pain that spread through his entire body. The foreleg that had just pressed down on Ryan was now flying, the joint was broken, gone, and he was back in position after launching his attack. The Ares guardian god roared, the heavens and the earth shook, mourning the loss of its limb. The system jumped out to remind him that Pichu was using another ability to retaliate. The creature roared as if calling for something, and it turned out to be absorbing. All the prosperity around it to power itself up. Damn it, the guardian god of prosperity sucks up all the prosperity when needed, to its own place, and it also creates such a loud strong wind, Ryan doesn't like it at all. He might as well lend a hand if he sat still, so it seemed he had chosen death. He activated the trait, of the Safu constellation's high melee on the sword, and once again carried it on his shoulder. Before swinging down, he didn't forget to whisper, oh, let's weaken each other. His Safu greeting slashed a very wide path on the ground, but it wasn't because he missed his target, but from Ryan's sword appeared. Long black line just like a snake shot forward, lashing into Pichu and making it cry out in misery. The entire courtyard and the mansion behind it were lashed at the same time, like a carpet bombing that sent all the earth and rocks and houses flying. The bodyguards turned into warblers, the lightest ones were just facially injured. The heaviest ones were injured because Sukana was standing close and got hit. The dust was so thick that Hugo was shocked and couldn't help but open his mouth, just standing there looking at the scene of his friend who was just like a villain, suffering the consequences of the destruction he had created. As soon as the smoke cleared, he saw the blue-green canal that Ryan had dug starting from where he was standing, destroying the entire Ares mansion behind it, stretching for hundreds of meters. Oh, that magical blue energy was so destructive, it reminded Hugo of the golden age when Ryan had reached his peak, when his hair had not yet fallen out and his eyes had not yet gone blind. The guardian Pichu lay in a heap like it had been dried up in the sun, logging out before it could say anything. In addition to the experience points that the system gave him, it also asked Ryan if he wanted to keep Pichu as his guardian god of prosperity. He walked over to Pichu's body, slowly, in disbelief, and in disbelief. Although he also bore the name of a saint, Ryan was not blessed by the supreme gods, and he had never had the power to control guardian gods like the twelve saints of the zodiac. Now that he had suddenly been given that skill, he would be a fool not to accept it. His hand just touched Pichu's fur, and its entire body was immediately immediately enveloped in his power. The drooping wings now spread wide, and it successfully became the guardian god of the constellation Ophiuchus with a cute and showy appearance. Now it looked more like a shaggy mongrel with angel wings than the fierce flag bearer it had been just now. Moreover, it voluntarily reduced its size so that Ryan could put it on and watch over it, and its master gave it the job of guarding its belongings. Good little baby, as a guardian god of prosperity, it could definitely hold all my belongings. Ryan was so happy that he hugged Pichu as if his mother had just given it to him leaving Hugo standing in the distance with a puzzled expression on his face. After all, before he returned, what had happened? That his friend had such a terrifying ability, and the ability to turn other people's guardian gods into his own? Suddenly Ryan stopped when the system asked him to give a new name, to Pichu because it had become his own guardian god. The piggy bank, Ryan was excited about the quality name he had just come up with, making Hugo try to hold back his laughter. The gangster piggy bank didn't hold money, it only held weapons. Under the fiery red sunset, Hugo's two-story house heard the three words, you traitor, that Ryan had given to his best friend. Hugo was so angry that he wanted to curse, but he waited, his mouth constantly telling the sins of his treacherous friend who was struggling to survive in the tower. May is out here getting married and enjoying everything more than a super stadium. It's been 20 years since we met again and you didn't recognize me, it's been a living hell in the demon tower, are you sleeping well at night? Making Hugo have to hold back a lot from running up and punching him. Still acting all pouty and innocent, Ryan pretended to say that he didn't dare to stay at his friend's house anymore. But when he heard Hugo say that he lived alone, he changed his tone to a comforting one, with a wife but living alone in this place must be lonely. Hugo was speechless, stammering, not yet divorced, but, that was a long story that he didn't know how to tell. He kicked the ball back to Ryan, asking what had happened in the demon tower that year. At that time, I listened to you and took care of those vultures, outside, so I didn't know what was going on inside. Why did they bring the head of the red-eyed griffin, outside but said they couldn't bring you out? He raised his eyebrows, if you're kind enough to ask, I'll be kind enough to answer. Still with a mocking expression on his face, Ryan glanced at Hugo and said simply, that day I was stabbed in the back, and pushed into a trap they had set. Under that pit were hundreds of thousands of monsters waiting, 
plus the resurrected red-eyed griffin, just kidding my friend. Knowing that Hugo would be furious and disbelieving, Ryan continued, the red-eyed griffin, that we saw was not its real entity. Its true form lies deep within the tower, Ryan witnessed with his own eyes, the terrifying power of that monstrous beast when he fell into that pit. He spoke in a roundabout way until near the end, when he said that he had managed to defeat the monster himself. But the real problem was not the red-eyed griffin, but someone behind the scenes who controlled the tower and possessed the ability to resurrect the dead calamities so that they could torment Ryan. The deeper he went, the narrower the path out seemed to become, but he kept going until he killed the final boss. Then he died a ridiculous death with a kick to the head, and Ryan was sure that he had already logged out of the server since then. He could still remember the pain of that kick to the head. When I woke up, there were no monsters around me, but I also didn't understand why I suddenly had a de 2 run on my hand. He clenched his hand, trying to control the anger that was rising in his chest, clinging to the fact that the person who had stabbed him in the back that day knew the structure of the demon tower very well so he pushed Ryan down as if he had planned for him to be torn to death. But when I find out who it is, I'll let their whole family end. Relatives enjoy that bastard special eye-gouging spectacle. Hugo didn't really understand what he wanted to do, but he went along with it, and the first step of the plan was for Ryan to build a tool to beat the crap out of the bad guys. He raised his hand to summon the level 1 workshop, letting the system know that he wanted to build a fancy weapon. He glanced at the screen, he needed to know what materials he could use. The eyeball-like sphere secretly observed for 10 years, believing that this was the origin of the spider queen that Ryan had punched at the supermarket. Next to it was the stinky relic from the Ares mansion, along with the eagle's ear fragment that increased the success rate of mana absorption. In general, Ryan was not a good cook, he just thought that if he threw everything into the pot and stirred it for a while, if it didn't turn out delicious, it would at least be a good quality pig food. Pouring all his magic power into the toy horse, the system emitted a faint light that made Ryan hunch over, and then transformed it into a strange beast, called the Holy Beast of Travel, with a function that was better than water. When a name was written on the horse, the owner of the name would be able to absorb up to 10% of the magic power from the person they touched. Apart from its appearance and versatility, what Ryan liked most was that the horse statue was loyal to its owner. Hugo must have thought that it was too easy for him to make a sacred relic, so he asked again. Why does the interior look so unexpectedly comfortable while the exterior is so desolate? Before the horse could curse, Ryan cursed for it. Do you know how many precious materials I put in here? I was going to make you another one, but if you don't like it, forget it. Hitting the nail on the head, Hugo switched to the role of the protagonist in a face-slapping movie, shooting out armor oh my friend, the design is superb, the creator has done a great job, I have given it my absolute respect, can you hear my heart? Ryan didn't listen anymore, he would deal with that later, now he put the things into his three-foot bag, and prepared to go find those shallow saints and teach them a lesson, he took out a golden box, and said that if the saints were in the territory and didn't come out, there was only one way to lure them out. Hugo saw the Ares head on the outside of the box and screamed in horror, isn't that the relic of storage? In addition to the ability to store anything you want, if you pay a suitable price, the user can also develop what was put into it. Hugo looked at it with a little greed, although this was also a relic in the top 10, but the important question was why Ryan carried it with him, while it belonged to Ares, and only Ares saints could use it. I heard that the centaur saints are poor, so I brought you a sword, what else could it be? Hugo was surprised and said that he had money and heard Ryan continue. The higher the level of the relic, the more expensive and difficult it is to find the materials to make it. Ryan wanted to use this to find the necessary materials, and also make the high-level saints rush into some self-destructive moves. But Hugo still didn't understand how to use this method if no one could activate it. Hearing his friend ask a stupid question, why can't you activate it? He wanted to jump up and grab his hair right away. I'm a centaur saint. My child, am I an Ares? Only then did Ryan realize his stupidity and sighed. It's useless. To use it, we have to think of another way. My friend, if you can't open it, how can you stuff it? Putting an end to it seemed easy, but Ryan made it more difficult. He said that he had sent a challenge letter and lost it. Challenge letter and it was gone. Hugo's face turned pale, and he asked again, where did the challenge letter go? Looking at Ryan's face, he knew that his friend had done something unusual again. The challenge letter must have gone somewhere it shouldn't have, right? Amidst the brilliant sunset sky, far from Hugo's house, Han Sang's blue house was holding an important meeting, which began with a loud scolding of the useless people, who couldn't even kill a spider monster and instead humiliated themselves. The commander of the Lion's Order, Oliver, put his feet up on the table, expressing his contempt. 
for the group of officials who couldn't even handle a small matter. On the other side, someone spoke up and told him to watch his language, and was immediately brushed aside. Is the rumor that an unknown person killed the Spider Queen true or false? Or is the story that Team 1 of Lizon is alive again true? The item on the conference table exploded with a loud bang, cutting off the argument. The commander of the Gemini Order, Sui Shu, smiled, but one could tell that he was not happy. Talk less about Lizon, I have it here. But, Oliver kept his playful expression and asked again, didn't you see that fat guy with buck teeth, getting beaten like a dog with mange in the video that people are spreading all over the internet? Sui Shu tried to direct Oliver's thoughts to the fact that the chili was given to him by the saint, so he was not that strong. He was immediately met with contempt from the other man, who said that it was easy to say. Why didn't Gemini just go and kill the Spider Queen themselves? Hey, watch your words, I have evidence that Ares and Gemini contributed to the killing of the Spider Queen, and there was also an S-class apostle who sacrificed himself. Oliver refused to give up, and a golden power surged up behind him, he asked. Again, isn't that S-class guy already in the belly of the Spider Queen? Choi Sui Shu said no more, he silently suppressed his anger, but the aura that erupted to confront Oliver's golden light made the leaders sitting above sweat profusely. The old man was furious with these two, and even more furious that the Blue House had turned from a place for political discussion into a market for two thugs to argue. Suddenly, a staff member pushed the door open and invited the president to watch the latest news. The brothers looked as if someone had put a gun to their heads and forced them to speak. The information from the receiving station had just received. A mysterious package full of pictures of Zhang Wei being tortured and a piece of blood red paper, haunting. What? The handwriting on it was confirmed to be 99% identical to the deceased Lizon. Hugo screamed, questioning his friend who was lying on the bed. What? Was the result of announcing to the world that he had returned? Killing Zhang Wei was enough to make the world boil. How come? You're not afraid that the whole world will come looking for you? Hugo didn't understand why his friend chose such a strange way to get revenge. What are you talking about? Lai Zan heard this and raised his neck to correct him. Zhang Wei is not dead. He sat up straight, smiled and rummaged through his bag, saying something that made no sense, not quite alive, but not dead either. What does this guy mean? If he's not alive, then he's dead, but how can he not be dead if he's still alive but not quite alive? Here, here's Zhang Wei, my friend. In Ziyun's hand was a yellow teddy bear with its two ears cut off. Although it could not speak, if one paid attention, one could hear Zhang Wei's screams coming from inside. You son of a bitch Lizon, oh 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 oh. Don't tell me this is Zhang Wei. Hugo stepped back slightly, just wanting to fall, and quickly avoided the strange teddy bear, while Ziyun picked up the two ears and twisted them with delight. His ability had now become so strong that he could completely control the souls of other saints. His hand twitched more and more violently, knowing that the teddy bear could not open its mouth to speak, but he kept ordering, introduce yourself, slave number two. Suddenly he remembered something more important, Ziyun handed him something and told him to look at it. It's the knife that was stabbed in my back and pushed me into that trap, my friend. Damn, you're talking about a horrible experience of being killed, but why is your face so excited when you're talking about ghost stories? Grasping the knife tightly, Hugo carefully examined the carved pattern, here proving that it was not an ordinary knife. But Hugo knew that he wouldn't dare to stab Ziyun. In the back, he didn't have the guts to do that. He knew that, so he twisted and tortured his soul, saying that this time, he wouldn't kill him, he must know who did it. Carrying the teddy bear on his back, Ziyun said that he would go to the relic shop for a while, because the fat bald man had said that he had seen the carving on the knife in the shop. By the way, before he went, he borrowed some clothes from his friend who was known for being dirty, of course Hugo didn't object. Going upstairs to shop around, Ziyun put his hands in his pockets and said goodbye to slave number two. As if he knew his friend would wonder who slave number one was, he stupidly turned his arm without looking back. I'll be home soon, slave number one, and then he left, ignoring Hugo's curses. It was already dark, in the courtyard of the Ares mansion that Ziyun had destroyed, a group of people in smart black suits appeared. Everyone was busy examining the damage, led by a girl, who called to report that Saint Ares was not there. The person on the other end of the line smiled and gently rapped. The sound of water in his hand to play with, it was Sophie Maddie. Saint Ares asked her subordinate again, where do you think that fat man has gone? She reported that all of Ares' wealth had disappeared, making Sophie worry that the bald man had escaped and joined forces with other saints to make things more complicated. As she was frowning and thinking, her subordinate spoke out his doubts. Could it be that Lysian has returned and taken him away? In the luxurious bathroom filled with steam, 
Sophie's laughter rang out. After laughing enough, she muttered, that's not funny. With a flick of her hand, the water in the bathroom curled up and grabbed the head of a nearby maid, lifting her up and spinning her around as if to bully her. A chuckle came from the phone. The subordinate in black knew that his words had caused serious consequences, so he hurriedly apologized. Only then was the maid released, and, just then another subordinate ran over with bad news. Another saint has registered to participate in the Gagmar auction. That night, many distant cities also had a lot of noise in the Gimlian room. The Gimmers looked in the same direction, slowly exclaimed. The man carrying a ton of weights against the wall. The subordinate walked over softly and whispered that there was a rumor that the relic of Lyrian would appear in the upcoming Gagmar auction. He glared behind him, highlighting the long scar on his cheek, full of ferocity, and then dropped the weight to the ground with a bang, as if the news had just annoyed him. But there was a smile on his lips, Stephen Marker turned his curly brown hair back with excitement. Finally it has appeared, it must belong to us. The teleportation door shot out a strange blue light, gradually revealing two figures, one tall and one short. Today, Zion didn't wear the slippers he picked up in the toilet anymore probably because he had picked up this pair of shoes at Hugo's house. Next to him was Sung Che, the son of his friend who took him from place to place, using the free teleportation service reserved for Gemini apostles. The two walked along the busy street, Zion thanked Sung Che for his enthusiasm in taking him to meet the sulfur monosulfide level appraiser as soon as he needed it. On the surface, he forced a genuine smile, but on the inside he just wanted to scream with excitement for having helped, and witnessed the person who had defeated the Spider Queen, and he wasn't greedy at all. Sung Che's phone was full of reminder messages from the commander of the Gemini. Holy order, although he didn't say it, Zion knew all about his nephew's predicament. He said goodbye and handed over a knife that had been sheathed in a simple leather case, saying that this was what he had used to fight the monsters in the Demon Tower. The A-class knife allowed the summoning of warriors and activation of random skills. But in Sung Che's eyes, it was just an old and rusty thing. If someone gives it to you, just accept it, just as he had finished speaking. Zion realized that they had arrived in front of a building with an ancient architecture, the residence of the sulfur monosulfide level appraiser. The pedestrians who were walking on the street suddenly became noisy, pointing at someone who had just appeared, causing the whole street to become chaotic. It was the Aquarius saint who suddenly appeared in her characteristic zodiac outfit, leading a group of female subordinates walking confidently on the street. In the eyes of all the people, the Saint Sophie Mahdi was the kind of person who represented all that was good and beautiful in the world, like a lost angel who made people who accidentally looked into her eyes forget their way home. But there was a subordinate of the appraiser who was still awake, he hurriedly ran out to confuse and ask the saint to stop, the appraiser currently has an appointment with someone else. On the surface, Sophie played the role of a gentle and understanding saint, but inside she cursed the appraiser, for not knowing how to make her wait. Who on earth is inside at this hour? The person inside curiously looked at all kinds of items displayed on the shelves of the appraiser, exclaiming that the prices of these things were indeed sky high worthy of being sulfur monosulfide level items. He looked intently at the relic that Sung Che had brought, and asked who had made it. Zimming, and sulfur monosulfide level appraiser for many years, was considered one of the most experienced. In the profession, broke out in a cold sweat when he said that this thing could very well be related to Lord Lizon. Sung Che didn't want to scare the old man, he just pointed at Leon and said he was the one who made it, but he was just a fan of the 13th saint. Sung Che, you go out. I have something important to talk to this person. As soon as he turned around, the appraiser immediately asked him what his relationship with Lord Lizon was. Because of his superior fighting ability, few people pay attention, but to me, it is a legendary manufacturer. I have seen countless Lizon fakes, this thing I just need to scan through. I already know that there is a real presence, so he asked him to find out. Someone who is specialized in recognizing the genuine products I make, Lizon likes it very much, but did not tell the truth, just praised the old man for his discerning eyes. Suddenly his face flushed, shy as if talking about something, bad, ashamed. To tell you the truth, I am the most favored disciple of Lord Lizon in the world. Lizon was not surprised that he suddenly had a disciple, but he did not understand why he had such a shy expression like a girl confessing her love. He stood up with a face full of incomprehension. Jiming had returned with the 
work to be appraised, muttering that this person could not possibly be related to Lizon. Just as he was about to punch him for being a fake gay, Jiming took out a book and gave it to him, saying that this was what he had received when he became a disciple of the saint. At a glance, he realized that it was the notebook he had lost. Lizon finally realized that this new appraiser was the guy who had been wandering around China with him for more than 20 years, begging him to change his profession but to no avail. Time flies, from a young man one day to became a middle-aged uncle with many feelings, no wonder Lizon remembered it. Jiming now holds the book, crying and remembering the day Lizon left. Believe the only memento I have engraved in my heart. The plot is extremely touching, but for Jiming it is no different from a cold, thinking that he had lost it, it turned out that this guy was in the book. Jiming turned a few pages, muttering and recalling that he could not read the contents because the handwriting was too bad, and he wanted to follow the crafting ideas in it but could not. He thought to himself that those were blacklists of items he didn't want to drop to. He closed the book, his face lit up with a gentle expression as he handed it to Jiming, saying that if he was so passionate about the 13th saint, he should take it back and study it. He took it right away, remembering that he had conveniently written down some of his own designs in it, which would be good to have now. As soon as his hand touched the book, the skill of concentrating on the mind allowed him to infuse magic power into the book immediately. Deming was shocked to see the light gradually seep into the cover, thinking that the young man in front of him had the skill to read the relics. Storing memories, was about to ask him for the information in it, when outside came the hasty call of the servant. He pointed out there, reporting that the saint had arrived outside. Jiming didn't care. At all, come when you come, what does it have to do with me that everyone is making such a fuss about it? Sophie had been waiting patiently outside for a while. The place where she was standing quickly turned into a red carpet for people to take pictures and film. No, different from an event. She lowered her head, cursing in her heart that the people were annoying. Every time she went out in this outfit, they would make a big fuss. Zheng Che stood in the excited crowd, not very interested, only hearing that every time Sophie came out of the temple, she always brought trouble to others. After waiting for more than half an hour, she still did not see the member invited in, and the noisy crowd flashing lights constantly made Sophie completely impatient. She rushed inside, ignoring the guard at the door who was trying to stop her. Sophie walked in decisively, wanting to see who the guest was that. Jin Myung valued more than a saint. Unexpectedly, looking at the person in front of her, she gave a few seconds. Oh, my attention has fallen on this guy's handsome face. Suddenly, flowers bloomed in Sophie's heart. Even as a saint, she still liked handsome opas very much. She blinked and was about to move closer to get a better look, when suddenly from somewhere came the image of a serpent spirit opening its mouth ferociously and rushing towards Sophie causing her to turn pale and fall to the ground. What was that? Sophie felt sweat dripping from her armpits, wondering why it felt like hundreds of giant pythons were wrapping around her and threatening to squeeze her. It wasn't good at all. Sophie ran out frantically, with a look of panic, leaving her subordinates who didn't know what to do and had to follow behind. The two people in the shop didn't know why they acted so strangely, and Lizon didn't care much either. Just as he was about to return to the appraisal item, the system informed him that someone had just approached the snake charmer, and his divine power was now at 35%. Knowing that he was wondering what divine power was, the system immediately reported that it was a kind of power bestowed in the form of a god, which must be used. Use. Another thing that suits Zeon's personality is that he can take divine power from others to increase his own divine power. If it is left at 0% for too long, he will lose his power. Pointing to the outside, Lizon wondered who the girl who had just run away was. Shin M I asked him again with a puzzled voice, why don't you even know the saint who appears frequently in the Apostles newspaper, General? When he heard that it was the Aquarius saint, Sophie Maddie, Lizon froze for a second and then burst out laughing, wanting to shed tears. Damn, I thought the saint was some kind of devil that everyone mentioned with such caution. It turned out to be that woman? Just three magic tricks, but her appearance is not like that, no wonder Lizon didn't recognize her. She used to be pretty, but between that face was a rotten shepherd's heart, so that beauty never shook Lizon. And in the list of things he hated the most, besides fog fish, flies and garbage, Sophie was the most disgusting crawling insect that he found disgusting. Her skincare routine was more important than human life. Lizon turned his head and sneered at Jin Myung listening to him wondering why people worshipped her as a representative of sincerity and altruism, when she was clearly a selfish and ruthless person. From that conversation, he heard from Jin Myung that Sophie used the title of the 13th saint to make illegal profits, and that the government had to intervene for it to stop. Seeing Lizion's face wrinkled up as if he was constipated, Jin Myung wondered if his attitude seemed familiar to the saint. How could he have known her well? 
tell him that he was an old friend of hers. Sophie ran all the way to a small, deserted alley before slowing down. Her subordinates ran after her and asked her anxiously for a long time, but she was still too flustered to answer. The incident in the appraisal shop just now reminded Sophie of Lizion's sharp gaze when he looked at her that year, asking fiercely if she wanted to die. She thought she had buried the memory of the year in the depths, but this time she was threatened by Lizion's ugly, scarred face. All because that young man somehow made Sophie so terrified that she ordered her subordinates to go back and investigate the brown-haired guy in the appraisal shop. When? When she wanted to kill both of them, her subordinates forbade her to keep zimming, but Sophie brushed it off, both of them deserved to die. She showed her subordinates the necklace around her neck, smiled gently and said that she would lend them the relic and the power of the gods. Kneeling on one leg, she raised her hands respectfully to receive the ring that Sophie gave her. She repeated to herself that the will of the saint is the will of heaven, and the apostle must carry it out. Sophie was finally satisfied and smiled gently. Only then did she withdraw the image of the divine covering the light behind her back. If she was childish again, she might as well let this little subordinate log out. Lyrian was sitting in the shop talking to Xinming at the time. Suddenly felt wet on his head, water was dripping from somewhere. Outside the city center, the lights of shops and houses twinkled. Sung Chi left Lion alone in the appraisal shop, walking around town until he was done. Suddenly he looked down at his feet and saw something. Strange, so he stopped and stared at it. The puddle at his feet came from nowhere, and it kept getting bigger even though it wasn't raining. Sung Chi bent down to take a closer look, because he detected magic power in it. Suddenly the shadow in the water turned into a strange white color. Two human figures glowed and raised their hands to grab Sung Chi. The coffee and iced milk fell down immediately because of the gruesome scene in front of him. The water solidified into the shape of a human being crawling towards. Sung Chi liked the crawling ghosts in horror movies. It made his face turn pale. How could there be ghosts in a brightly lit place in the middle of the street? Suddenly a scream came from behind him. Sung Chi turned his head and found that everyone around him saw the water ghost just like him. It was rising from the ground, staring at its own body. The person who caused the scene stood on top of the building looking down. None other than Sophie Marinthi, the mirror of human cloning. Although the clones only had the power of a level apostles, but many of them could also kill an elephant. Moreover, in that appraisal shop, there were only two people, one old and one young. Sung Chi ran back to the appraisal shop, and when he saw the back of the saint's guardian, he shouted, Why are you using combat skills in the neutral zone? Like this? Cancel it right now. She turned around and looked at Sung Chi calmly, holding an elaborately carved cup in her hand. She said that this was the order of the saint, so stop nagging. This is the will of the superior. She suddenly put the holy grail on the ground, activating the relic and making it glow brightly. Sung Chi was horrified and rushed over to stop it, but it was too late. The pillar of light shot straight up into the night sky, as if a big bang concert was being held there. Dozens of streams of water rose from the ground, swirling into large circles, surrounding everyone in the neighborhood, replicating that many ghost images. The crowd and the female guard ordered them to go and solve it together, while the young man who was a guest in the shop would be dealt with by her personally. The ghost images obeyed and rushed away immediately, forming the pile of soggy water on top of his head that Jayan had seen earlier. Sung Chi was swimming in the water sphere, panicking and not understanding since when they had planned to attack. His palms tried to summon his power, he had to get out of here quickly before he passed out. Sung Chi's vision gradually blurred and wanted to close, all around him was water, his body was covered in water. At that time, Jayan in the shop had discovered that this water containing magic power was not caused by rain seeping in. He silently watched them rise more and more. Jim Young also felt the magic power around him and was looking around not understanding what was going on when the water gathered together like a rope and lifted him high into the air. Something sharp came from behind and stabbed Jayan in the neck, but he didn't seem surprised. The female guardian whispered, don't move, she doesn't want to kill him yet, and explained that this was because he had made the saintess unhappy. She didn't forget to threaten him, don't be stupid and resist. The saintess ordered me to kill you too, but if you too admit your mistakes too. The saintess and Myung is willing to buy the relic at a high price, I will speak up for you in front of Sophie. What a kind female guardian putting a knife to someone's neck and attacking them while offering conditions for negotiation, was too good, to the point that the old appraiser wanted to fall asleep, and didn't bother to answer. Suddenly he heard Jayan ask in disgust, is it normal nowadays to walk around in the street with a knife in your hand? Myung opened his eyes wide at the sight of him breaking the handle of the knife into several pieces with two fingers. Maybe he's too old, in his time no one dared to carry weapons around. 
Jayan dropped the knife on the ground, smiled and said Jin Myung should calculate how much damage was done here so that they could pay less. Seeing Jayan break the holy relic knife with a snap and looking like he was about to hit him, Jin Myung still didn't dare to make a sound. What kind of person could do that with their bare hands? A little subordinate must understand that I am 30 years old this year and have never encountered this situation. Before, she asked me angrily didn't I tell you not to move? The water ghosts behind Myung gathered into a pile and rushed towards Jayan wanting to cover his mouth, but when they got there, they were like a pile of water splashed out of a basin by Jayan's punch, which scattered them all over the floor. With the same punch, he smiled kindly and asked, Hey, do you have any more? Call them out, it's quite fun to punch them. The female guardian took a few steps back, cautiously, looking at the young man in front of her. He was just as the saintess had predicted, being able to punch a level water ghosts with his bare hands was definitely not ordinary. In that case, she had to eliminate him to avoid endangering the saintess. That indifferent expression when asking Jin Myung was also very annoying. She pulled out from her bosom the necklace Sophie had given her, and released a pile of water with pure magic power that Sophie herself had put into it. The pools of water gradually took the form of a pack of wolves, which according to the guardian's mouth were a level water wolves, using a level to try to do something with Jayan, making him laugh, that deep-seated devil Sophie had a rather grand way of welcoming him. I don't know where he pulled out two daggers from, and asked Jin Myung can I borrow this pair of daggers for a while. Whether I'll return them or not later depends on my mood. Not. He asked to borrow them without waiting for Myung to reply, and Jayan rushed forward like a shooting star, confronting the pack of water wolves alone. He slashed wherever he went, and even howled with delight this knife is so sharp. I love it, let's have another go. His knife touched the water wolves and immediately retrieved the magic information of the treasure wall, and he immediately turned into a butcher. Jayan rushed in to slash these a level creatures with great pleasure, laughing why is it so much fun to just appraise things. Wherever his slashing path went, Jayan would gain something. He received fragments of the cloning mirror, experience points, and everything related to the water wolves. The saintess's subordinate didn't know what level of strategy she had, but now she was standing there in disbelief. The saintess's summoned creatures were being killed so easily. Hey, surround him. Jayan's call made her so scared that she wanted to cry. This must be the end of some villain story. Why is the male lead so strange? Jayan was excited about the scene of stabbing and killing and asked her is there anything else? If not, I'll be going. His eyes were like those of a ferocious beast staring at her, and the guardian couldn't even take a step, let alone answer. Knowing that she couldn't do anything, she turned around and ran away. Jayan didn't bother to chase after her. Only those who were tough would waste his energy, he would ignore these cowards. Jin am I, eh? He looked at him and silently judged him, when suddenly a roar came from the door of Sung Tre. His whole body was drenched, and he ran in to warn that the apostle of the treasure wall had just attacked indiscriminately. Unexpectedly, inside the appraisal shop, there were all sorts of things after Jayan's battle. Wasn't this the saint's summoned beast, of the treasure wall? Oh, that's what it was in the eyes of others, but, in Jayan's eyes, these were just pieces of raw materials that he could pick up. Sung Trey urged him to leave, or else the guards would bring more people and it would be annoying. Just as he was about to leave, Jin M.I. suddenly spoke up. When the two of them turned around to look, he hesitated again. Twenty years ago, I followed Lee Jayan to learn his methods of crafting, so I remember very clearly how he fought monsters and collected materials. So he used all his courage and asked loudly, the battle. Just now, are you, are you Lee Jayan? He didn't answer, but put his index finger to his lips and made a shish gesture. But that expression said it all, and he still pretended to be mysterious. Jin Mi's dreamy and melancholic soul caught the signal immediately, and he was so moved that he cried. Jayan must have been afraid of having to wipe away his tears, so he turned and left, promising to talk next time. That was enough to make Jin M.I. overjoyed, and he bowed to the man and shouted, hoping to see him again next time. He nodded slightly and left, leaving the ruined room to the old man, which was an effective way to avoid cleaning the house. Leaving the appraisal shop, the two uncles and nephews Sung Chai found a very reasonable place to avoid being hunted down. A brightly lit coffee shop, selling all kinds of tea, cakes, and ice cream. This guy was already 40 years old, but he was still eating spoonfuls of ice cream and tea cakes with great pleasure. Sung Chai, it's so delicious, eat up, eat lots. Looking at Jayan's expression, he seemed determined to finish all the food on the table. Sung Chai asked hesitantly, it's delicious, but you don't have any money to pay for it, do you, big brother? Of course Jayan didn't have any money, but his stealing skills were top-notch. He said that he had looked at it for a while and thought it was wrong, 
so he took back what the female guard had dropped. The golden thing with the logo of a water bottle pouring out, it seemed to be the emblem of the treasure wall, used like a credit card and containing some of those people's skills. Sung Chai leaned over to take a closer look, and realized that this thing was like a personal credit card, and he was afraid that if they used it, they would be able to track them down here. Jayan didn't care about that much, he was just happy to have something sweet to eat. Ignoring his nephew who was in no mood to eat, he kept kicking this glass over to the other cup until he got drunk and greeted people. Looking at the expressions of these two uncles and nephews, it was clear that no one expected the twin commanders to appear here. He greeted Sung Chai but asked for a seat at this table to talk to Jayan. Realizing that the drunkard was the boss who had been harassing Sung Chai for the past few days, but he didn't chase him away and let him sit down. He started by asking if he was the one who had killed the spider queen that Sung Chai had told him about. He seemed to ignore Jayan's unwillingness to answer and said that the spider had come to harass him but couldn't do anything, but a young man like him had killed it, which was really impressive. So what, what are you going to do about it? He heard him say that he was here to look for outstanding talents. It was obvious that he wanted to invite Jayan to his holy meeting, so he asked him what he had to offer. One of the eight holy relics of Livian will be auctioned soon, if you're not busy, can you discuss it with me for a bit? Finally, Livian's attention was caught, and he put down the ice cream spoon on the table, put on an indifferent expression, and said that they were auctioning off his antiques. With ice cream all over his face, Jayan stopped and said, Okay, I'll go to the auction right away. Instead of laughing at his country bumpkin look, Chu was very friendly, and said that Livian's antiques would be auctioned off in a place of comparable class, quite far from their location. It was the top auction house in the sky, with the name of the prosperous fortress city, Gagmar. The fortress city was not large, but it was built, on a floating island in the sky, which made it different. It was luxuriously decorated, and the Gagmar auction house was also given an entire skyscraper to host the auction of unique items in the world. In the waiting room of Gagmar, Sophie was sitting, on a chair, hugging her neck and trying to breathe. She was wearing the beautiful saint's costume, but her whole body was trembling, and she was as wet as if she was sitting in the snow. Until a deep voice rang out, it was Stephen Markle, telling her to stop acting like that, or it would ruin the fun down here. Sophie glanced at Shadowcon and cursed in her heart that he was a real retard, but for the time being, she had to hold back to avoid disaster. This was the man who had surpassed even Lizon, and only when he was with Stephen. Markle did Sophie feel safe. He stood up abruptly and left, not forgetting to remind her of the familiar fact that all of Lizion's weapons in this auction were his, and she shouldn't think about it and then regret it. She called out to him anxiously, but the holy lion man didn't answer, and just walked straight ahead. Left alone in the hall, Sophie took a deep breath and tried to calm herself down. After all, this place was a guard. Tower. Whether it was real or fake, the person she was always afraid of couldn't possibly appear. But the person on the other side of the glass door suddenly made Sophie notice that Hugo Arthur was standing alone in the aisle. Her mood suddenly changed, and she was happy to feel that this guy had come at the right time, and there was going to be some fun to watch. Hugo came to this place not because of the antiques, but because he had been walking around for a long time and still hadn't seen his friend Lizon. He thought that a place with so many expensive holy relics would attract the attention of his friend, so he came, but only Sophie came to find him and cause trouble. She took a light breath on Hugo's shoulder from behind, and said with a smile that it had been a long time since they had seen each other. Sophie's smiling face under the hood made him feel cold. He met anyone but Sophie at this time. She pretended to be old friends who hadn't seen each other for a long time and said that it was hard to meet him. It seemed that even Hugo Arthur couldn't defeat time, remembering that he used to be a representative of the Twelve Saints. Whenever there was an opening, Sophie would kick him, and she wouldn't let go of the fact that the Holy Society was less important than the others, so Hugo's position was lower than the rest. Hugo was busy looking for his friend, so he didn't want to talk anymore, and waved his hand to chase her away, but Sophie knew everything, except for the fact that she didn't know what to do. With a face full of arrogance, she uttered a sentence that successfully made Hugo stiffen. Be careful that you don't lose your child, just like you lost your wife. Sophie's fake face smiled as she continued to dwell on the subject, asking over and over again if he thought his wife was dead. Hugo's silence made her even more aggressive, even if he was a holy centaur, 
He would have to watch his family fall apart, wouldn't he? Sophie succeeded in driving Hugo, who was usually calm, crazy, and his whole body was filled with flames of anger. The place where the two of them were standing just now exploded, and after the black smoke, Hugo was covered in flames. His eyes full of anger, I'm talking to you, get lost. Sophie didn't get lost so easily. She raised her hand to her mouth and chuckled, using water to put out the fire on Hugo's arm reminding us not to forget that we have a 10-year truce. But in fact, seeing Hugo so mad, Sophie was delighted, and she walked up to Hugo and asked, don't you realize that you're just a demigod? Not letting Sophie have time to transfer the water that had just gathered, there was a call from behind and a white light flashed. Zion called out, hey bitch, and flicked Sophie's forehead with two fingers, enlightening her right away. Zion just called out, hey bitch, and he flicked Sophie's forehead with two fingers, helping her to be enlightened right away. Where the mark of the water drop on Sophie's forehead was red and sore, her eyes were all white, and it was unclear whether she had been enlightened or had logged out. Zion looked at Sophie's body as it collapsed to the ground with disgust, while his friend turned around to look at him. Oh, my friend, why did you come at such a critical time? Hearing Hugo worry that he was doing something stupid, he went to look for him. Zion crossed his arms in confusion and asked, are you a three-year-old, or do you like me? Seeing that the atmosphere was too gay, Zion closed his two buttocks to keep away from Hugo. But he didn't forget to show a look of disgust at Sophie's body writhing on the ground. Why do I meet this bitch everywhere I go? Don't tell me this little girl likes me. Hugo didn't say anything. Did this guy take a few pills before he came here? To Zion, in the eyes of the nobles and his friends, he might be a guy who has been pumped with too much power, and has become a pervert, but in Sophie's eyes, he is not only that. Sophie thought she hated Zion, but in fact she was afraid of him. Afraid of his face full of deep scars and his aggressive personality. He never forgave anyone who teased him, and those white eyes always threw a sharp, contemptuous look at Sophie, which she could never forget. On a day of heavy rain and strong wind more than 20 years ago, the Temple of Biping was filled with the noise of a group of people from the agency trying to stop Zion from entering. The housekeeper of the Biping mansion ran out and spread her arms, determined not to let him go any further. She only caught a glimpse of his terrible face in the flashing light of the inspection beam, and uttered only one word, get lost. What's going on here? Sophie's voice made him turn his head and see her, in her nightgown, angrily crossing her arms and asking him what the hell he thought he was doing barging into this place. In one shot, Zion threw his bandaged hand into the wall behind Sophie, scaring her, almost to death. His eyes showed anger and the dark brown scars were clearly visible, and he asked in a gruff voice, do you really want to die? Biping tried her best to be tough and asked, what the hell are you doing? All you're doing is pissing Zion off, and he asked me if I had sent her to the rear to treat the people who had been attacked by the mirror beasts, so why is she still hanging around the temple? He squeezed her hand tightly, growling, do you know that their limbs were severed trying to protect you, huh? Don't say any more, he grabbed her wrist and dragged her away, forcing Sophie to save people no matter what. Don't, no one cares if those guys die. It's an honor to die protecting me and humanity. How can you look down on a saint like that? I've had enough of being cursed by humanity, and I won't clean up that mess. Zion stood still at her stubborn words, and he turned his bandaged face towards her and asked, what did you just say? She put her hand up to her nose and sniffed at Zion like an owl. Sophie insisted that she would definitely not go to the aid of the wounded. Now go and have a nap. Tomorrow get up and put on some makeup for the interview in time. Sophie pulled her hand out of Zion's grip and was rubbing the swollen spot where he had squeezed it hard with a look of disgust. Zion's hand had already reached out to slap Biping in the face, making her want to spit her mouth out. He shouted straight out with an angry voice that echoed through the temple and then dragged her to treat him until she passed out from exhaustion. So to Sophie, Zion is a fucking asshole. While cursing him extremely fiercely, Zion's face appeared, asking did you sleep well, you demon? Sophie's eyes dimmed, and she realized that she had just woken up, and her whole body was stiff. In the chair. In front of her was Zion, with his familiar disdainful face, and Hugo Arthur standing beside him. Realizing that she was in the hands of the man she feared most, Viping let out a scream that echoed through the building. After screaming, she said, who do you think you are to do this to a saint? Untie me now. I really want to slap her again. Viping's mouth is like this. Whether it's 20 years or 200 years, it probably won't be any different. Sophie's mind was racing 
telling herself that she was no longer afraid of him like she was 20 years ago. Today, she was going to settle the score with him. Her hand lit up with the light of acid to melt the ropes. Sophie's plan was to escape from here and then find Stephen Marker and give these guys a good beating, and then take another slap and sweat, trembling and bowing her head in anger and pain. Zion's index finger was still smoking, reminding her not to let anything she was thinking about show on her face. And what was that smoking on his middle finger? Biping stopped laughing and showed off that it was a self-defense skill. The acid, which was activated whenever someone used violence on her. Letting out a scream of pleasure, Sophie's head was filled with images of pain. Zion was corroded by acid all over his body and had to kneel down and beg her to forgive him. Oh, the strongest skill, I have something very strong too. He raised his middle finger to show her that the acid had disappeared, but he was not stupid enough to show off his super fast self-healing ability. That's what made Biping tighten her intestines and scream, not believing her eyes. Then ha, huh, the fun is over, right? Let Zion settle the accounts of what happened between us. I heard you claim to be my doctor? Close with a first punch. Those terrorists in the appraisal shop were sent by you, right? Almost ten of them, but close with five punches to get to know each other. And what the hell did you say to Taksu just now? Close with fifty more punches. Looking at her distorted face, Zion kept his hand in the shape of a Buddha's hand, and asked, What, do you have anything else to say? After waiting for a while and not hearing anything, he thrust his hand forward, Well, wait with us. If you don't admit defeat, you'll get beaten up too. Her screams of protest were endless, and Hugo didn't bother to interrupt. That's what his cold-hearted friend is like, beating up both men and women as usual. Even though Lee Zion had every reason to do so, Hugo would never hit a woman, and at most he would just put up a wall like he did just now. But wait, is there something wrong with my eyes? How come I feel like Zeon's divine power is increasing with each of his friends? Hugo was not wrong. With each punch he threw at Biping, he was able to absorb her divine power. The invincible saintly friend was getting excited. Sophie suddenly collapsed in a strange way. Her face was swollen and her mouth was foaming, which were signs that she had fainted. Zeon stopped, and the system panel suddenly jumped in front of him, congratulating him that his current divine power had reached 50% and that he had successfully unlocked the state of divine power. What is this new term? Why don't you check it out on Google? For me, what is holy divine power? Just because he was a bastard who was not blessed by any zodiac sign, he didn't know that it was the power to maintain the state of divine power. It's good to know late, because the system tells him that if he doesn't have it, he has to go and rob it. Even though, whether it's divine power or a state of divine power, in the end you still have to go and rob it to get it. Good system. Zeon rubbed his confused head. Just a few snaps and he had already taken 20% of Biping's divine power. Why didn't he get it when he was beaten up before? Was it because he hadn't unlocked the skill at that time? But now that he has received the news that his strength can still be increased, Zeon is happy and not angry. The way to increase strength is generally easy, just go and punch others to rob them. Hugo stood behind him and reminded him to ask this cow biping about the knife, but Zeon brushed it off. Ah this is definitely not someone who would dare to stab him in the back. Besides, he had already found someone who could investigate for him. Hugo nodded as if he understood, but in his mind he was complaining that his friend had only been looking for an excuse to torture Biping. Suddenly, the phone in his pants pocket vibrated, and Hugo leaned over curiously to ask him where he had gotten the phone. Zeon replied casually that he had borrowed it from an acquaintance, then quickly left, probably feeling good. He told him to go to the lobby and come here, Hugo, could throw Biping anywhere he wanted. As soon as he finished speaking, he ran away, just like he was asking someone else to clean up. He was left with her and the girl who had just woken up from being knocked out, when suddenly the door opened again. Hugo thought his friend had forgotten something, so he turned back. But the newcomer made him very nervous, so now there are 8 billion people, why do they keep staring at this guy? In front of Hugo was Stephen Markleulu, who appeared just like the male lead of the story. His eyes glanced over and immediately recognized Biping behind Hugo, who was being thrown into a chair unconscious. Hugo had no intention of explaining. He just stared at Stephen, who suddenly became angry, and a lot of golden electricity flashed around him. Ask this. Hugo, what are you doing here? It's just a question, but why does it sound so threatening? Or is Biping actually Stephen's daughter? He took off his expensive gold glasses and sat down like a toilet bowl with an appearance that reminded Hugo that he hadn't seen him in a long time but he didn't have the time or energy to waste. Oh my god, who has the time? Who would be happy to see this muscular guy? Steven looked at Biping as if she was a dog that had been poisoned, 
and said that he and she were in an alliance. An alliance between you and me. What the hell, there are only two people. So, that's it, now tell me why you're here, Hugo? I guess he thought that if he asked this question, Hugo would tell him, where he goes is his own business, why ask? Stephen stuffed his glasses into the chest of his tight-fitting shirt, and asked with a sigh why he had come here for. Zion's relic? Ah, probably not, because even if you did, you wouldn't have the money to buy it, would you? Damn, I know Hugo is poor, but this guy and that girl must have been made for each other. Every time they open their mouths, they talk about the poverty of the centaurs. With a grin, Hugo asked Stephen if he was still collecting the relics that Zeon had made. Back then? Ever since the old days when Zeon was still one of the 13 saints, Stephen had always felt inferior to him. Taking Zeon as a benchmark to try to surpass, he had always tried to collect all the relics related to him. Hey, don't tell me, do you think that by continuing to do so, you will become as strong as Zeon? Stephen blew up the ground under his feet without saying a word. Hugo's words had indeed hit a sore spot. He had intended to tease him a little, but Stephen had blown up the floor. Hugo cautiously summoned a flame to surround him, having seen that Stephen's hands were full of electricity. He didn't attack Hugo, but grabbed his wrist and squeezed the flame away. Hugo's face turned pale as he felt the strength in Stephen's hand growing stronger and stronger. His eyes were fierce, warning him not to be reckless. With each word Stephen spoke, the sinewy fingers tightened a little more, reminding Hugo that he was just a fool, so don't mention Zeon in front of me. As soon as he finished speaking, he twisted Hugo's arm, and a vision of the Supreme God appeared behind him, to prove that his strength far surpassed that of that damn Zeon. Saint, something has happened. A subordinate came to report that the twins had collected all of Zeon's items. He jerked himself around and shouted at Hugo, pushing him away with great force, no longer showing off to him, but leading his subordinates away immediately. Hugo called out for Stephen to take this damn woman away, but he didn't pay much attention, and told Hugo to do whatever he wanted. The top priority now was the auction, and this woman would be dealt with later. Before he left, he didn't forget to kindly remind him to be careful and control his temper if he wanted to live. Hugo curled his lips in mockery. His words were so touching that his cold heart followed. After such a fierce battle, he left snoring. When Stephen was far away, Hugo dared to look down at his badly burnt hand from the electric shock of the lion saint. A feeling of inferiority surged through Hugo's heart. He knew that he was not doing well. Because he was always the weakest of the twelve blessed zodiac signs. The auction hall was brightly lit, like a paradise, through the corridor glass window, he saw the VIP room with its doors closed and bolted. In the auction area, the female MC excitedly hammered down on an item for the twins, and now they were taking a break to prepare for the second round. As soon as they got the chance, the young man in the room shouted out excitedly. Lillian had won another cool item. Hoy sat excitedly beside him and congratulated him on getting the item he wanted, and Zion scratched his head and hands in gratitude, looking embarrassed. Thanks to his invitation to the VIP room and his permission to shop freely, Zion was able to get his hands on this pile of stuff. Choi was most interested in the glasses, and said again that the whole point was to recruit him for the Gemini Saints, not to mention that Sung Che, who was sitting next to him, had already spent billions of dollars. He glanced at Sung Che and asked him to help him pay for the wine, as he had forgotten to bring his card. Not daring to disobey his boss, Sung Che was about to search his pockets for money, when Zion took out a black card and said casually, as if he was treating everyone. Choi Soo Hyuk reached into his empty pocket, wondering when this guy had gotten a black card without him knowing. Zion waved the card in his hand, reminding him that it was true, no matter what you do. Don't ask your subordinates to pay for you. Choi Soo Hyuk did not dare to protest when he was told this to his face. He kept saying okay on the surface, but he gradually realized that this guy looked immature, but he liked to sit on other people's heads. Even so, he had successfully killed the Spider Queen, and Choi Soo Hyuk's mission was to make use of this talent to work for his own saintly society. After waiting a while, when Zion had drunk a lot of wine, Choi Soo Hyuk began to get to the main topic of the day. With a long string of compliments about his potential as a class S or SS, if he were to be blessed by the Ares Society, he would definitely be very powerful. Zion took a sip of wine and realized that the faint purple mist that Choi Su Hyuk had just released had the effect of manipulating the minds of others, like a multi-level marketer talking about how you can earn a thousand dollars a day by joining their company, 
Choi Soo Hyuk used all his smooth talking skills to impress Zion. He talked about money, wealth, and glory, and how you could have it all if you just joined the Ares Society. It was all free, 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 and you would also receive power that was even greater than his. Come on, brother, take my hand, and together we will conquer the path to the top of the Ares multi-level marketing scheme. It sounded impressive and convincing, but suddenly Zion burst out laughing as if he had just heard the funniest joke ever. This is great. That was a great speech. Suddenly his expression changed, and he asked slowly, so you mean that you want me, Zion, to become the lapdog of that bald pig? Choi Soo Hyuk suddenly felt his forehead covered in sweat. The person in front of him had just been a relaxed country boy, so why did he suddenly feel like he was angry? Just as he was about to change the subject to lighten the mood, a voice came from outside the door of the auction hall, asking permission to enter to deliver a newly purchased item. He looked at the crap that the employee had just brought out, thinking that his own stuff had been taken and that they would have to give him a power of attorney later. It was only then that Choi Soo Hyuk realized that he had just bought an item that belonged to the young man Lee Zion. He smiled and picked up the necklace with the number 8 on it, saying that this would be quite useful to him. Choi Soo Hyuk thought to himself that he had been a fool to let this young man buy Steven's stuff. If he had punched him in the nose and made it bleed, it would have been a disaster. Just as he was about to tell Zion to give it back, the door of the VIP room was kicked open by I Channel. Smoke and dust filled the air, causing all four people to turn around and see. Steven storming in, cursing under his breath. His face was more tense than that of a new owner who had just had his beloved dog stolen. And he growled, who touched my stuff? It turned out to be someone he knew. Zion turned his head to look at the thug who had dared to kick open the door, half surprised, and half not, when he realized that this was the man who was hunting for his fortune. Choi Soo Hyuk stepped forward to act as the smooth-talking diplomat, the foreign relations expert, apologizing profusely and blaming it all on the ignorant newcomer. Steven saw that the commander's attitude was less aggressive, and that he would be okay as long as he returned the item. Feeling unlucky, Choi Soo Hyuk suggested that Steven go down to the reception desk to pay for it and then collect it. Unexpectedly, the guy who had broken down the door grabbed Choi Soo Hyuk by the head and asked him if he was planning to take his stuff and run. He trembled under the large hand, not daring to resist, and just cursed silently to himself that this big guy was just looking for an excuse to take his stuff without paying for it. Hey, keep it down, will you? Zion's voice came from the sofa, causing both of them to turn their heads and look. Hey, I won the auction, so I bought it. Why are you trying to take it from me? If you like it so much, I'll sell it to you for 200 billion won, plus a protection fee. What do you say? Steven had no idea who the idiot in front of him was, but he started laughing out loud a few seconds later, never having expected to meet someone so arrogant from the Aries Saints. Choi Su Hyuk felt like collapsing. Did this brat want to commit suicide? How dare he provoke even the lion saint? That's the way men are supposed to be. What the hell are you talking to me for? Steven pushed Choi Su Hyuk aside and walked threateningly towards Zion. His hands were shaking, but he still managed to suggest that they introduce themselves first. And then I will announce my name with the most prestigious title, one that reeks of electricity. Zion smirked provocatively and asked him what all the fuss was about. He thought to himself that this guy was probably capable of fighting, much stronger than before. It was indeed a zodiac sign that was very suitable for fighting, always ready to attack and always hitting the target. The lord of the forest was bloodthirsty, and although his fighting spirit was not as tenacious and persistent as that of Ares or Aquarius, but with this level of progress, he could not help but praise the great lion. Once he entered the realm of strength, no matter what anyone said, he would have to tear that person to pieces to feel satisfied, wouldn't he? Zion wanted to see what would happen if a lion scratched its claws on a snake. If you're hot-tempered, you'll get diarrhea, you know? He wanted to give Stephen a piece of advice like that, but he didn't say anything. He just let the other man's overbearing hand rush towards him. As soon as his thick fingers touched Zion's shoulder, electricity filled the air, making the people around them jump in fear and want to run away. This guy was going to get cold feet, but he still managed to cry out, Oh, my God. Meanwhile, Choi Su Hyuk was begging for mercy, saying goodbye to him in his head. Steven had no intention of killing him, just breaking his legs so that he would have to use a wheelchair. But strangely enough, the young man in front of him smiled, comfortably and yelled, Hey, are you dusting off my clothes? Steven did not understand what had just happened, because the move he had just used had definitely hit him directly. Did he use teleportation to redirect my attack? Geminis were the best at this, but Zion wasn't one. He shook Steven's hand off and continued to scold him, 
saying that he was a typical example of someone with a big brain and small muscles. Aha, your stone wall has been neutralized by me. Do you have any other skills that can affect me? I remember that you begged me to teach you how to save humanity, and now you're showing off your strength like a clown? Not to mention the murderous aura emanating from Zion. Of course, only. The 13th saint and Stephen knew about that, so he was afraid that he didn't know who this guy was. Suddenly, the auction hall echoed with a voice welcoming everyone back to the second round. Stephen immediately turned his attention to it and ignored Zion. He turned around, pointed at Zion, and said that the auction was more important and that he should hold on to the necklace until he came back for it. As soon as Stephen left, Sung rushed over to him to check if he was injured anywhere. Only his shoulder was torn as if it had been bitten. Sui Hung saw it but did not dare to ask him about it. Earlier, how had he dodged it when a saint-level attack from Stephen could not be redirected? Even an S-class commander like Sui Hung could not do that. This strange composure only made Sui Hung more curious. Who the hell was this young man? In the second round of the auction, the host immediately introduced a sacred relic that everyone had been waiting to see. Surely you all remember the Berlin incident 24 years ago, on an island in Germany. A strange fog hung over the area, melting all weapons and towers. It was so terrifying that the twelve saints could not enter the area, except for the hero Lizon. We will now reveal the sacred relic that Lizon used to subdue the divine power. Stephen couldn't help but smile. He had finally waited for that item to arrive. He still remembered that day 24 years ago, on the impenetrable island in Germany. Helicopters hovered over the island, constantly updating the news. It had been four days since. Lizon had entered, but no one knew what was inside because he had not come out yet. Many saints, including Stephen, had tried to enter, but they could only reach the edge of the central area. Stephen was not satisfied that Lizon could go in alone while he could not, even though he was fully equipped and had an army escorting him. He sat there thinking for a long time, trying to find out what the difference was between him and the bastard with the crooked face that made their strength so different. Suddenly, his subordinate pointed to the right and reported that Lizon had come out and was carrying a something that Stephen was sure was the answer he had been looking for for so long. The reporters watched as Lizon emerged, looking imposing. He had returned unscathed, holding an extra piece of bone in his hand. At that time, Lizon always wore a mask when he went out to avoid scaring old ladies and children. Lizon had taken another glory, but this time Stephen was not angry. He seemed to have realized something important and simply ordered his troops to retreat. When his subordinate saw the saint throw away the weapon in his hand, he was surprised and asked him about it. Stephen told him that he had something better. As soon as he saw Lizon come out, Stephen looked at him and knew the answer. The thing that would put him on equal footing with Lizon was a weapon. So now, in the auction hall, when they opened up the thing that Lizon had used as his strongest weapon, in the Battle of Berlin that year, everyone turned their attention to it. Lizon also looked at it to see what it was. As soon as the cloth was pulled away, Stephen couldn't help but smile. It was what he had been waiting for all this time to become the best in the world. The giant bone that Lizon had carried when he left the foggy island. Outside the Darkman Tower, where the grand auction was taking place, a strange creature fell from the sky. It was clearly a disaster, and it silently dug its claws into the top of the tower. It also came here for Lizion's relic but had no money to buy it, so it planned to eat it directly. It was the Bin Duong dog bone. The camera zoomed in on the giant bone, and the audience gasped. In amazement at something they had only seen in history books and never expected to see with their own eyes. Does that mean that the textbooks say that this is Lizion's classic weapon? That's too much of a highlight. MC turned this thing to the luxurious side, the crowd roared, and Lizon stood there remembering the event 24 years ago. Yes, he had used that bone to fight the demon, but was it really that sacred? Just. As he was about to call Sung Che to tell him the truth, he turned around and yelled, I'm busy. What do you want? Then both Sung Che and Sui Hung held their heads in despair, because the Gemini saints would not be able to get this item back. The Bin Duong dog bone opened with a bid of $1 million, and the entire auditorium went from $5 to $10, then jumped to $30, $50 million. As the price was shouted out, the system kept reporting Xeon's reputation and experience points increasing to the point where he wanted to collapse and die. Stupid, he was about to ask what was so great about the Bin Duong dog bone that they had to argue about it. Did they buy it to lick it? He immediately ate Sung Che's scolding, thinking that he was a country bumpkin who didn't understand anything, but all the things that hero Lee Xeon had ever used, even a toothpick or a pair of flip-flops used to walk on the national highway, as long as they were created by Lee Xeon, would drive people crazy. He pointed to Stephen Marker, 
an antique collector who specialized in collecting Li Zian's divine weapons all over the world. Because the Lion Saint was a fighter with overwhelming power, everyone tried to avoid provoking him when there was an auction for divine weapons. The Saint of the Lion was a fighter with overwhelming power, so everyone tried to avoid provoking him when there was an auction for divine weapons. Thinking that most of Li Zian's divine weapons went into Stephen's cabinet made me very angry. I just tried to comfort myself that all. The profits from the auction would go into Li Zian's account, which was managed by the government. Wait. Stop for about 5 seconds. Does that mean that no matter who buys it, the money will go into my pocket? Okay, whoever buys it, buy. It, bid it up. Zeon will never wonder why the audience loves to spend money on dog bones. He enjoyed the feeling of 70 million, 90 million, and then 100 million dollars pouring into his pocket. Suddenly, a loud roar came from the audience, 1 billion. He was chewing corn, and his teeth suddenly got stuck. Sung Che stared, Sui Hung stared, and everyone else was stunned, looking in the direction of the person who had just called out that number. Who else could it be but Stephen? He put his hands in his pockets and walked down, repeating with a look on his face that said, mine, mine. One. Billion, sell me the bone now. The MC up there was so surprised that he stuttered, one, 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 one billion. The audience could sell all their hair and pawn their entire house and still not have enough money. No one could beat, Stephen. Sung Che was not convinced, Sui Hung was not convinced, and Xeon was suffocating with excitement. Finally, the hammer slammed down, sealing the deal. The Bin Duong dog bone was officially sold for $1 billion. On the way home, a few janitors were pushing a cart to clean up and were talking about how someone had bought a dog bone for a billion dollars. One of them clicked his tongue, saying that people like him would never dream of, even a tenth of that amount. I wish something big would change in life. As soon as he finished speaking, they both heard a noise. Outside the glass door of the security guard's house was the face of the monster looking in. Don't tell me it heard my prayer and showed up here. This move was a mistake. I would like to withdraw my previous statement. Inside the auction hall, Stephen had successfully touched the weapon of his dreams. The new owner of the Bin Duong dog bone was revealed to the greedy eyes of everyone in the auditorium. While they were cheering, suddenly the entire ceiling collapsed, burying a pile of people, who were screaming. Stephen went over to see what it was, not forgetting to take the billion dollar bone with him. Where the giant hole appeared, a mass of black hair like a doll in a shampoo commercial emerged, but this model looked too strong, with eyes brighter than headlights. The audience screamed and ran away, leaving the monster paralyzed, its horse-like face scanning for Lizion's relic. Is there anything more annoying than winning an auction for your favorite item and then having someone come and ask for it? The monster opened its long, fanged mouth and determined the landing coordinates to be Stephen, who was holding the Bin Duong bone, and swooped down. Of course, Stephen was not afraid of anyone's father or son. His eyes lit up as he grabbed one end of the bone and swung the monster away. Backwards, just like a baseball player hitting a huge ball that smashed two buildings in a row. Stephen's laughter echoed through the chaos. This was the first time I had to thank the monsters for coming. Out, ha ha ha. The Bin Duong dog bone, without a glass case, appeared next to Stephen, looking extremely cool. He had just experienced the power of the relic he had been craving for so long, so he was excited and couldn't help himself. Even if another group of monsters attacked, it would be okay. After only two laughs, Stephen stopped immediately. The tower opposite, where the giant monster was, was collapsing uncontrollably. It was the tower of the teleportation zone. Once it fell, it would blow away the entire island below. Sure enough, the contractor who took on this tower must have made a lot of money. As soon as the top exploded, the bottom also boomed, and rocks and dirt fell on the heads of the people walking below. Today is the National Day holiday in September, but what's going on with the flags when you go for a walk, Grandpa? In the crowd, a girl screamed, saying that if all the debris fell, the island would collapse. All the saints, let's gather our strength to stop them. People from nearby sanctuaries heard the SOS signal and immediately joined forces to help. Hundreds of people below joined forces to form a ball pouring all their energy into it, creating a magnificent spectacle. Just hold on Taksu, get up and fight back, that guy. What are you talking about? I'm doing my best. While they were arguing intensely, suddenly a loud shout rang out, cutting off the debate between the two close friends. Lijian and Taksu turned their heads towards the sound and saw Stephen, holding the white bone and rushing over, his whole body covered in sparks of electricity. Stephen opened his mouth wide and yelled, how dare you interrupt my experience with the relic? Stephen shouted so loudly that even the monster that was hiding had to raise its head and howl in response. Oh my god, I just realized there's another crazy saint here. Electric light began to radiate all around. 
Lijian and Taksu turned their faces, to look at Stephen, who was charging towards the two monsters like a madman. Once again, he yelled, get the hell out of here, don't. Get in the way of the Great Bones performance. Lijian was stunned and didn't understand what was going on. But Taksu seemed to realize the reason. The closer he got, the angrier Stephen looked. He raised his hand and activated a skill, deploying a golden curtain that covered the entire sky completely separating the inside from the outside, standing proudly outside the curtain with one of the two monsters, Stephen smiled confidently. This stage is mine. He was very excited to try out the new weapon he had bought for a billion. People often say that you get what you pay for, and he thought that this bone was a once in a millennium treasure. With one hand in his pocket and the other carrying the giant bone, Stephen boldly faced the monster without any fear or trepidation. The crowd, who were struggling with the monster, were overjoyed to see him appear. Oh my god, it's Stephen the strongest saint who has surpassed Lysian. The cheers grew louder and louder, encouraging Stephen as he stepped towards the blue monster, dragging the white bone behind him and muttering, now it's time to pay for your arrogance, and brace yourself for this. His two muscular arms swung the white bone high with a ferocious momentum and slammed it down, creating a whistling sound. The atmosphere seemed to freeze for a moment. He realized that something was wrong. The crowd around him also felt that something was wrong, and even the monster felt that something was not right. He had hit it, but something was strange. Stephen lifted the bone from the monster's head and moved it to the right and then to the left, examining it from top to bottom. The monster was kind enough to help him, scratching its head in confusion and then returning to its fighting stance. Stephen swung the bone at the monster's head again. One swing, two swings, three swings. As he swung, he shouted in a voice. That was standard in superhero monster fighting scripts. But each attack was no different from an itch to the monster. It roared in frustration and kicked Stephen in the face, causing his face to deform and his entire body to fly like a volleyball across the court. He wondered why Lishan's weapon wasn't working. He had clearly used all his strength. Lizon lightly touched the barrier that Stephen had created, knowing that he could not get out for the time being because the idiot had used it to such a degree. Cracking his knuckles, Lizon cursed. If he could get out of this place today, he would kill that son of a bitch Stephen. Even a saint dared to use his degree. He was sure to die this way. There was another thing to worry about. There were two monsters. One was with Stephen, so the other one must be with. The people trapped in the degree. Before they could punch that damn red monster in the face, the two of them had to deal with the people stumbling around at their feet. Their minds were being controlled by the monster to act as its puppets. It seemed like it would be difficult to remove those annoying things. Taksu gritted his teeth and tried to think of a solution that would not kill the civilians but would still free them from the monster's control. As their footsteps came closer, Taksu saw his friend suddenly turn to him with a confident smile and say, we have to put an end to this. What are you talking about? Speak clearly. Who can understand you like this? Lijian lost his patience and yawned as he walked forward. Let's finish this and go to sleep. Oh, Taksu ran over to stop him. This guy was going in the wrong direction, because Lijian had entered the range of a zombie. Looking completely emotionless, he reached out and grabbed the head of the controlled man, his eyes dangerous, and with his other hand, he grabbed the black gooey substance that was covering the man's body and tore it off like tissue paper. Taksu was terrified, thinking that his friend was tearing a man apart in broad daylight. And the eagle-eyed man also stared at Lijian, not understanding what he was doing. He lowered his hand and smiled triumphantly at the unconscious man who had no idea what was going on. Taksu looked at the goo that he had thrown to the ground and that was now crawling around as if looking for a new host. He didn't understand how he could grab it like that. Lijian proudly explained his reasoning, uttering three words that left Taksu speechless, with strength. Is there an easier way to do it, my friend? You know that you're strong, but do you have to brag about it? He turned and pointed at his friend's face, laughing at him. I told you that you were weak, but you didn't believe me. No more stalling. Taksu, my friend, if you understand the problem, then join me in the game. Taksu and Lijian were full of enthusiasm. Taksu said, you're still going to charge in, aren't you? Then I'll be happy to provide support. Lijian exclaimed, oh, Taksu, you're still the same as ever. Both of them became extremely excited, not only because they were fighting the monster, but also because they had taken one of its shadows. It had been a long time since they had last teamed up, and now they had the opportunity to fight side by side once again. One was a dual wielder, and the other was a support. It had been a long time since they had teamed up, and it felt great. 
Taksu raised the sun god Apollo's bow of fire, aiming it at the monster and the people it was controlling. Lysian reminded him, remember not to be reckless. Finish them off quickly and neatly. With that, he kicked off the ground and flew into the air, landing in the middle of a group of people who were being controlled by the monster. As soon as his feet touched the ground, a bright blue light burst forth, covering the ground where he stood with a large membrane, directly blasting the monsters out of the innocent people, not giving them a chance to reattach themselves to the people. Lysian grabbed them and crushed them. The monster roared and continued to release a swarm of black monsters towards Lysian. With lightning speed, he dashed forward, and the black monsters were blasted away wherever they attacked. They stuck to him like glue, but he didn't seem to be affected at all. Suddenly, the monsters stopped attacking Lysian, and changed their target to the civilians in the distance. But their plan was quickly discovered, and an arrow from Taksu flew out and burned all the black monsters. In the smoke, in the form of a demigod with blazing aura, he told them not to even think about harming anyone. While charging at the monster on the other side, Lysian still managed to praise his friend for doing a good job. He dropped down to the ground, out of the monster's reach, and arrogantly told it not to try to do anything stupid. Lysian acted so quickly that the monster was caught off guard and turned around to see Lysian land a bright punch straight into its stomach. He sent it flying high into the air in a deformed state, along with a loud roar. The ground shook, and rocks were thrown up by the large creature. The monster screamed in pain as the bones in its body cracked, and its entire body quickly disintegrated into pieces. Meanwhile, Lysian stood there in a cool pose, showing off his masculine six-pack abs. Taksu ran over to him, excited that he had been able to defeat it so quickly. He knew that his friend was always bragging, but that last move was so good that he had to praise him. The excitement he was feeling, above him were several people lying around. The fact that they hadn't been taken over by the goo meant that they would probably wake up soon. Lysian's palm suddenly began to glow, or rather, the image of a snake in the palm of his hand began to glow and then a series of information panels flew down from the sky and appeared in front of him. You have taken away the monster's life force with your bare hands, accumulating more divine power. Absorbing divine power, current divine power is 81%, total absorbed divine power has exceeded 70%. Do you accept to consume divine power to use the level 1 1 0 oh war god ability? Please select yes or cancel. Oh, oh, war god ability? So I have to accumulate a lot of divine power before I can use this skill? He sighed in relief. That's good too. I'll try it out and see what happens. It must be something good if it costs so much divine power, right? Lysian had finished eight games, while Steven was still fighting the monster with his white bone. Seeing himself struggling with a monster like that, he frowned slightly and cursed under his breath. He never expected things to turn out like this, and he didn't know why. His giant bone wasn't working on the monster. Was it because he wasn't using the true power of the giant bone? Or was it because he was weaker than it? Looking at the situation between Steven and the monster at the moment, outsiders could see that he was at a disadvantage. The people around him began to worry about what to do. If they tried to save him, the monster would turn around and attack them, and they would all be killed. Suddenly, one of them shouted, Hey, wait a minute, look over there. From the white screen came bolts of blue and black lightning, forming a powerful ball of energy. From within, Lysian gradually tore through the white screen created by Steven's secret zodiac technique. He looked even more terrifying than a mad bull looking for an enemy. Steven was blunt, unable to believe his eyes. He never expected Lysian to become so terrifying. The monster sensed the powerful aura emanating from the newcomer, and unleashed a terrifying force that could crush it. So, in order to avoid ending up in the ground, it opened its mouth wide and recklessly charged. At Lysian, Hoping to take advantage of his distraction to launch a sneak attack, Lysian looked up at the arrogant monster, his eyes gleaming with killing intent. He opened his mouth and shouted at it to shut its mouth. The powerful magic source suppressed all creatures, and even the monster was pressed hard into the ground, screaming miserably. The people who had been cheering for Steven from a distance were also affected to some extent. As the spell seemed to blow everyone away within a 100-meter radius, Steven knelt down, trying to steady himself on his feet but he still slid a long way. The monster had been pushed down to the ground, and could only cry out in pain until Lysian stepped in front of the monster's large body. At this moment, he was whispering, why do you have the right to this power? Could it be, could it be that you are not human? Lysian looked at him with a face of contempt. What nonsense are you talking about? The terrifying power blew the talkative monster into hundreds of large and small pieces right before Steven's astonished eyes. Opening his eyes wide to look at the scene before him, he couldn't believe that this could have happened. 
Such a terrifying power should only be possessed by that red-minded guy. Could it be, he wondered, not daring to utter the words, but at this moment he knew that the person standing in front of him was the Lijian. Of years past, now that you remember each other, why don't you say hello? Lijian came forward with a mischievous smile on his face, his veins bulging. Long time no see, you deadbeat golden-haired climber. I see you've been having a lot of fun stepping on my name all this time, haven't you? Stephen's whole body trembled uncontrollably as he fell to the ground, his mouth stammering, it can't be you. With that, he swung the bone in his hand at him, but his attempt was unsuccessful, as the billion dollar bone was, blocked by Lijian with one hand. His voice was now contemptuous, oh my, it's really fun to watch you play with this bone. Strangely enough, Stephen, who was known as the strongest saint, couldn't escape the hands of a man who was shorter than him, even though he had used all his strength. Lijian clenched his fist and crushed the bone with a simple snap before his eyes. What can I do now, since this is just a slightly larger bone than usual, my friend? Oh my god, my billion dollar bone. Seeing Stephen's shock, his mouth wide open and his eyes wide open, Lijian laughed with pleasure and punched him hard. In the face. You're all out of energy now, aren't you? It's my turn to return the favor. He only had time to utter the words wait a minute before he was met with all the pain. Lishan's punch sent him flying through the island, dirt and rocks flying everywhere. Stephen's small figure flew through the air as if the obstacle had just been air, and he had just enough time to curse before disappearing. In the auction house, the saintess of Aquarius had just woken up, wondering why she was lying, asleep on the floor, as if she had completely lost her memory of what had happened before she passed out. The necklace glowed with a magical green light and then returned to normal when she didn't notice anything. The place where Stephen had been punched was a long, deep hole like a well. The culprit of all this was still laughing gleefully, reminding him that the fun was far from over, and that he would punch him whenever he saw him. Ozeksu ran out to see if Steven could climb back up, but he didn't care about that, he just knew that the big guy couldn't die. That's enough for now. Zeon finally had the energy to turn to his friend and ask him if everyone in the barrier was. Okay. He nodded and said, look, you can see they're cheering over there. Lee Zeon had nothing else to worry about, so he snapped his fingers and called the Divine Beast of Ares and ordered it to pick up all the valuables before leaving. While the Divine Beast was busy stealing, Zeon told his friend about his second teammate, who had lent him the phone. Ozeksu was very excited to know who it was, and when he heard the name Sungja, Ozeksu felt like lightning had struck out of the blue, and he had to ask again to be sure. Sungja, the Sung on Sungja I'm thinking of, I think he's a member of the Gemini Guild, and his magic power is more than enough to be the guild master. Not to mention that the kid is smart, quick, and gets things done. In short, he's a good guy. Ozeksu scratched his head and pulled his hair as he listened to his friend praise his son, wondering how his precious son had gotten involved with this troublemaker. Ozeksu had been very careful not to let his son and his best friend meet. 2. Fanatics meeting their idol would surely tear his beloved family apart. Just as he was about to suggest calling the Gemini Guildmaster, who could teleport here, Ozeksu suddenly raised his voice to stop him. His mind was working very quickly, and there was another reason why the Geminis didn't have anything to do with him. Lee Zeon agreed, as memories of the Gemini Guild flashed through his mind like a movie. He had to admit that every time they met, they got angry with him. Ozeksu added fuel to the fire to prevent Lee Zeon from meeting the Gemini Guild. As he held him back, he silently apologized to his beloved son, but his idol was just too much. He just had to stop him, and he just had to apologize to his son, but his idol was just too much. He patted his friend on the shoulder, trying to manipulate his mind into forgetting about the Geminis. Before he could say anything, a loud cry of father made him freeze. Well, it was all in God's hands. The two of them turned around, and Ozeksu still couldn't believe that the voice belonged to his son. His good-for-nothing son stood there, looking at him with doubt, asking if this was the Zeon his father had mentioned. Ozeksu's face was as hard as a statue when he saw Sung Zhe, wondering what the hell he was doing here. At this time, he wanted to deny this son of his, but he was too excited and urged him to answer quickly. Before he could even think of how to explain it satisfactorily, he heard a roar behind him. A mass of black water crawled up to the group of people and suddenly flew straight at Lizon, trying to attack him. Suddenly, the treasure from under his armpit floated up and opened its mouth wide, swallowing the thing into its mouth. It looked very excited, as if it had eaten something delicious. A message appeared in front of Lizion's eyes. The Holy Spirit's sacred object has received resistance to poison. The range of the skill invulnerable to all poisons has been increased, and the resistance to poison will be effective when creating the sacred object. Not only were the father and son wide-eyed, 
but Lizon was also speechless. He was both shocked and cursed the black thing. Are you out of food? Why did you eat that? Throw it up for me right now. Throw it up for me right now. Even after death, he was still so annoying. Sung Jia looked at the first treasure for a long time, realizing that lime was Lizion's sacred object that he had seen in books. Combined with the great ability and the terrible magic power that Sung Jia had seen with his own eyes throughout the time, the only close friend, who was willing to play with his fatherless friend, plus the lime that was shaking, it was 100% certain that this person was the idol Lizon. Sung Jia was so excited that he jumped up and cried tears of happiness, so that Ozeksu couldn't hide the truth even though he had planned it in advance. He had been defeated by his son's reasoning, and he couldn't argue or stop the unexpected meeting of the idol and his loyal fan. The father and son each yelled in their own way, and Collision also yelled, forcing the new lime to swallow but failing. The whole island shook with the three people's nonsense screams, and at the headquarters of the Lion's Guild of Flowers, Chi in a large, chaotic building. In the high-level meeting room, the Lion's Guild master Oliver spoke up. The news that the master had been missing since yesterday and had not been found yet, we must ask the people with the ability to search for the Gemini intelligence. First, a member of the guild spoke up, wondering if they would be willing to help, since Oliver had recently had a conflict with them. Furthermore, the other person said hesitantly, there was a rumor that Lizon was the one who made Stephen disappear. Before he could finish, Oliver frowned, and retorted that even if Lizon had come back to life, he would still be someone who had been defeated by the guild master. Before he could finish his praise, everyone fell silent when they heard the sound of a phone ringing, with someone cursing the centaurs and the lions. Only Lizon was the best and most lovable. They all looked in the direction of the sound, and the atmosphere backstage suddenly became unusually quiet. The girl picked up her phone and turned off the ringer, saying, Excuse me, I forgot to switch it to silent mode. Doha apologized, but she didn't look like she was apologizing at all, which made everyone yell, the boss is missing, so please be a little more serious. Everyone's words gave Doha a headache. She was annoyed, why do we have to look for that bastard? Seeing the speechless looks on everyone's faces in the meeting room, Doha hurriedly corrected herself with an apology for her slip of the tongue calling that bastard sir out of respect, and asked everyone what they were looking for, a guy like that will survive and come back anyway. The other members looked at her helplessly, their faces showing the words you're dead. They all thought the same thing, do you think? We'll believe you just because you apologized for your slip of the tongue? Oliver has had this little girl for a long time, so why is the deputy guild master pushing her aside and ignoring her? Doha didn't even bother to listen to him. She stared at her phone screen, reading a message from her brother, saying, the uncle has finally appeared, so go home to your father right away. The legend is back. Oliver roared, but Doha ignored him. Who is this uncle that my brother is so excited about? I'm tired of these boring meetings. Doha stood up abruptly and left, leaving behind an apology and the words please take care of things, leaving everyone helpless and wondering what to do. They could only gasp and watch her leave the room. Oliver was driven mad by her. He hugged his head and screamed like a madman. Damn it, the boss is missing, and the deputy guild master is no better than a fool. Why is everything falling on my bald head? In the holy land of Aquarius, where Sophia Maria lived, hundreds of reporters were gathered outside the Saintess's castle to ask questions. They all wanted to know if she had anything to do with the recent events, what the truth was 20 years ago, and who the kidnapper was. The guards standing at the gate of the castle refused to answer, saying that the Saintess was resting. The reporters were finally relieved to hear someone speak, so they swarmed around like flies trying to get a scoop, but they still only got the answer no comment from the Saintess. Sophia covered herself with a blanket and stood on the top floor or looking down at the noisy crowd below, cursing, Turtle, I don't know what this Lyrian is trying to do, but he's going to cause trouble for me. As angry as she was, she was still concerned about her beauty first and foremost, and she raised her hand to bite her nails, no matter what trouble he's causing, don't let it leave any consequences. She recalled the time a few days ago when she had just escaped from the auction house. In front of the Aquarius Palace, the sound of Sophia's guards escorting her, covered in a blanket, could be heard. The people on both sides whispered about her being kidnapped, when suddenly, the necklace around Sophia's neck lit up, causing everyone to panic and fear that it was a bomb. It wasn't a person, and everyone was talking about it. A notice board appeared with several questions written on it. Who killed Lyrian? Please clarify everything that happened 20 years ago for everyone. After scratching her head and pulling her hair, she didn't know what to do. If she clarified the truth, the other zodiac signs would kill her. But if she kept it silent, Lyrian wouldn't let it go either, and there was no way to remove the necklace. She lost control and shouted, It's all that bastard Lyrian's fault. Did someone call me? My ears are itching. 
Dang Yan was silently planning to go to bed, but who was talking bad about me? The news reported that Saintess Sophia still had not expressed her opinion. The Saintess also did not leave the sanctuary, and experts predicted that there would be a series of events following this one. In the darkness, a man stared at the TV screen, and suddenly opened his mouth to say something that was not clear. If that's the case, then it won't do. At the sanctuary of the centaur, Hugo's house, Otakusu shot an arrow that hit the bullseye. I heard my friend next door praising it, just asking if I liked this bow. It's awesome, the stuff that the Capricorn guy made is nothing compared to this. With a whoosh, Lizion's arrow split Otakusu's arrow in half and hit the bullseye. Hearing Zion shout 10 points, Otakusu looked over in confusion and said unsteadily, that's too much, it's a mess. He gave Otakusu his fancy bow and used a wooden one with a blindfold on. This guy was showing off, so why didn't he shoot at his own target and instead shoot at someone else's? Lizon was scolded but laughed slyly, saying, it's just a joke, why are you so uptight? Lizon was scolded but laughed slyly, saying, it's just a joke, why are you so uptight? Suddenly, a glass of ice water was brought to Lizion's face, carried by Sung Che, who knelt down in worship and handed him a tray with both water and a towel. He was not polite, and just took it and laughed with the little boy, ignoring Otakusu, who was getting angry and wanted to give him a piece of his mind for bringing water and a towel to someone else's son. No one cared about using force, so he pretended to run to Sung Che and said that he wanted to drink too. The water is in the fridge, you can get it yourself, father. The cold words made Otakusu angry, and he stomped his feet in frustration, but still had to watch bitterly as his friend gulped down the water. Ignoring the two of them having fun, he opened the system panel and said to himself that his abilities had increased after the Dagmar incident, so he could see if there was anything interesting to invest in. He realized that the sanctuary of the serpent bearer, the serpent audience palace, had been formed, but it was of a low level, so the area was only a little bigger than a coffin, but Zeon didn't care much. The sanctuary is like a temple of the zodiac, where the saints live and maintain their power. Lizon didn't have one before, but now he does. The system allowed him to manage the sanctuary from now on, by moving his subordinates and strengthening human authority. Another confusing word, what is human authority? Sung Chai suddenly interrupted. Uncle, do you want to go out? Let's go together? Otakusu stopped stomping and looked up to ask his friend if he had an appointment with someone. With a confident smile, Zeon just said, it's a secret, there are many people I need to meet today. He went to a fried chicken restaurant called Pacoma and sat opposite the president of the Gemini, dressed smartly, with hair that was no different from a pyramid scheme. He smiled again and looked over the chicken tray as if he was feeding the whole village, looking at the person opposite him, ignoring the waitress who gasped when she saw that this guy could eat the chicken of 50 people. Lee Zeon chatted while eating, I heard that you're very busy. Sway Hup kept the smile on his face like a machine. Even if I'm busy with thousands of things, I have to take the time to recruit talent. This talent was a bit stubborn, so Sui Xing had to switch to a psychological attack, his sharp eyes piercing the person opposite him, and asked. You used several billion won from the Gemini to participate in the auction. You're not planning to just cry and run away, are you? Who knows about a few billion, a few billion fried chicken thighs, then let's talk. Seeing him finish chewing and then stuffing his mouth again, Sui Xing felt really defeated. Did he really think money was like leaves? Although he was a bit annoying at first, he seemed to be quite capable. So Zion came to see Sui Xing today. Now that he had finished dealing with the feces, insects, and the yellow-haired cat, the next target would be that rude saintess. With a serious expression and a chicken thigh in his hand, Li Zion replied, All right, I'll join the Gemini Association. Sui Xing seized the opportunity to inform him of the baptism day, but Zion immediately interrupted him. Pointing the chicken thigh at the upper part of his shirt, Zion made it a condition that he had to have the badge that he was wearing. The two bodyguards on both sides immediately reacted violently. You're going too far. This badge is a gift from the Star Master to the President. Li Zion pretended not to care and continued to eat chicken. If you don't sing, then hurry up and carve it for me, you fatherless bastard. He lowered his voice and told Sui Xing that he knew that the badge allowed the wearer to use all the privileges of the Gemini Association. So before joining Sui Xing's sanctuary, he had to hold something valuable in his hand to feel at ease. Recalling what Sui Xing had just said about investing everything in talent, Zion held the chicken thigh and forced him to answer. As soon as Sui Xing asked for time to think, the two bodyguards immediately got excited and wanted to stop him. If so, Zion, just sit here and wait for the result. Don't forget to make a quick decision. 
I still have another appointment. He sounded like a busy person, but he took out a message and told his nephew that he was stuck here and couldn't leave yet. Sung Che immediately texted his sister that he would be late, and he smiled and waited for Zion at an ice cream shop that he was sure his uncle would love. Thinking about how his sister's eyes would widen in surprise when she realized that her idol was standing in front of her, Sung Che was so happy. This outdated rusty sword was actually given to him by a legend, and he suddenly felt that it was so cute. When his uncle came, he would ask him to engrave his name on it. While he was happy, someone's hand suddenly grabbed the sword in his hand and laughed mockingly. Why are you playing with the sword like an idiot? Let me confiscate it. Sung Che stood up and questioned the blonde guy. May, what are you doing? The blonde guy, Ion Shi Hu, led the two guys and smiled happily. Because he was a level a Gemini apostle, he didn't take Sung Che seriously. Seeing his arrogant attitude, he sneered. How dare you talk to your senior like that? Damn it, this lonely guy always talks about age. Sung Che wanted to stab him, but Shi Hu was the son of the Libra star spirit, so he couldn't touch him casually. The bastard knew that, so he was always arrogant. Thinking about how he had received the sword from Li Xian himself, Sung Che excitedly demanded it back. He was immediately pressed down on the table by Shi Hu's two subordinates and held down, despite the curious stares of the people around him. The more agitated Sung Che became, the happier Shi Hu was, and the more provocative his words became. Every time you get caught, your mouth works at full capacity. I wonder what this is that Sung Che dares to talk so much about. Could it be something that your beloved Li Xian made, or is it a relic left by your mother? Hearing this, Sung Che couldn't control himself anymore, his face full of blue veins and his eyes turning blue. He burst out with energy and tried to grab the bastard in front of him. Unexpectedly, the sacred object in Shi Hu's hand sensed that its master was in danger and activated a random skill. The light emitted from the sacred sword startled everyone, and Shi Hu was blinded and thought he was going to go blind. Suddenly, a black head appeared from it and shot straight up to hit the leader's nose. Needless to say, the people in the ice cream shop were terrified. A man's head came out of the sword and ate betel nut. Moreover, the scene of Zeon leaning out of the sacred sword looked like a mummy that had been sealed away. When his whole body was fully revealed, Chi Hu was so scared that he fell back and hit his head. Oh, oh, an acquaintance, Sung Che saw his uncle, his eyes sparkling with hope as he called out to him rubbing his head, which had just hit something. Zeon turned around and recognized his nephew behind him. Sung Che was overjoyed. Why did you come when you knew I was here? Li Zeon scratched his head in confusion. Oh, I was at the chicken shop. It seems that the summoning skill that I added to the sword last time has just been activated. Mentioning that, Li Zeon put his hands in his pockets and looked around. The fact that he had been summoned here meant that these guys had threatened Sung Che. Guy with the nose ring and the two guys who flattered him. Come to this table. You dare to touch his nephew. Of him, of course you will be rewarded with a smile. Trademark blooming on the lips and a heart to heart. Sincere and dedicated. Just hearing it gave me goosebumps all over. A few minutes ago, Li Zian was sitting with the president of the Gemini Association, who had agreed to give him this badge on the condition that Zian join immediately. Seeing that he agreed, Sui Hung was very happy but did not dare to say it out loud. After all, this young man had already spent several billion of the Gemini's money, and later he would use the terms of the special contract to get it back. The badge was done. That's why Sui Hung was confident. He put the precious badge in his hand. Sui Hung had just received the contract from his subordinate and was excitedly turning to ask him to sign it. Zeon had disappeared right before his eyes, leaving behind a pile of fried chicken for the president, the Gemini Association and the two bodyguards who were frozen stiff on the spot. Damn, you ate and ran away? The contract hasn't been signed, the person has run away, but the bill for the chicken, which is almost 800,000, still has to be paid. Sui Hung felt like he was going to faint. It looked normal from the outside, but the scene inside the cafe could now be described with two words desolate. Broken objects were scattered everywhere, and the soil from the broken flower pots was splattered everywhere. On the floor were two unconscious men. Zeon punched Sui Hung in the face, his hand around his neck, lifting his knee and hitting him in the stomach without mercy. Even though he said he was a level a apostle of the twin star association, the second generation heir of a wealthy family, the son of the saint of the heavenly Libra association, but he was still beaten to a pulp. Zeon completely ignored what he said, not even bothering to listen to a word. Moreover, the more he talked, the more he beat him up. Sui Hung was beaten so badly that his face was swollen and deformed. Looking at the blonde boy kneeling on the ground, Li Zian cracked his knuckles and said, Get up, you bastard. I'm just getting started. 
What the hell have you been babbling about all this time? Sway Hung gasped for breath, not knowing what to do next when all his defensive spells had been shattered by him. It's not Sway Hung's fault for being weak, after all, Li Xian is also someone who can go through the red zone like it's a walk in the park. However, there was something Sui Hung didn't know, so he clenched his fists, thinking that he wouldn't let him continue to be complacent. A stream of blue magic power emanated from Sui Hung, and a bull wearing blue armor appeared behind him. Sui Hung unleashed his power towards Li Xian, using every trick he had up his sleeve, not caring about anything else. The people around him were terrified, he used magic on others in the residential area, run away and get caught up in it all now. Sui Hung laughed triumphantly, revealing his missing tooth, and shouted, this is the price you pay for being so arrogant. But after all of Sui Hung's struggles, Li Xian was still unscathed. His voice was full of annoyance, saying what are you making such a fuss about? The flames created from Sui Hung's magic power were all gathered by Li Xian, in the palm of his hand into a thin spinning ball. Not even enough to fix his butt. Li Xian's system panel appeared, it had suppressed the opponent's skill, you have received S-grade Phanaris Eastern Cow data. Sui Hung couldn't believe he had controlled his mood so easily, and shouted, who are you? Are you a mage? No, I'm just a blacksmith. The system panel appeared again, indicating that Li Xian could now use the data of the skill that had been collected, but using it too much will cause wear and tear. If you want to use the skill permanently, you need to collect materials to make a holy item. For now, just use it while it's hot. Li Xian compressed the entire ball into a crystal in his hand and a blue flame burst forth strongly. The image of the Phanaris cow appeared behind him in a majestic way. He shouted the exact same words to summon the eastern cow of Phanaris. Sui Hung screamed and was blown away, eating the entire huge energy beam and hitting the wall. Creating a large crater, the smoke cleared, and you could clearly see his head and butt facing the other way. Before Sui Hung could get up, Li Xian warned them, if you dare to touch Sung Che again, then you'll be in for a beating. With that, Li Xian turned to the old man and grandson who looked bewildered, and told them that if they met these people in the future, they could just beat them up, the bull will protect them. Was even more impressed, his face looked like a young girl meeting her first love, the male god of the school. After beating up the Sung Che's older sister, Doha, ran over. Why does this kid look so different in a cafe than he does at school? As soon as she saw her younger brother, she immediately asked Sung Che if he was hurt. Like that? He was hurt, but he was more hurt in his heart than anything else. Sung Che eagerly rushed to his sister's side and pulled her back to his place and introduced them. This one is here. This one is here. He pointed to Li Xian and said, this is the hero who has eradicated countless disasters, the hero who has disguised himself to save mankind. The main character in the video we've watched over and over again, this is Li Xian. Li Xian has fought thousands of battles, but his long scar face is nowhere to be seen, only to see his younger brother pointing at a man who is taller than two of them, who is only a few years old. Li Xian turned to look at Doha and smiled to show his prestige. She couldn't believe it, her mouth was wide open and she even raised her hand to pinch her cheek. Realizing that she was awake, the air around her suddenly turned a rosy pink, because Doha didn't understand how Li Xian could be so handsome. Twenty years ago, he had many scars, and he had to stay in the tower for twenty years, so she thought he must be in a terrible state. But then Doha realized that looks didn't matter, Li Xian was safe. Coming back was lucky enough for them. Her appearance was more like a 17-year-old girl who had just fallen in love than Sung Che. Just now, her little heart was about to fly out. Seeing his niece's lovely reaction, Li Xian smiled kindly and began to greet her, but Doha kept bowing. Her head, her face still as red as a ripe persimmon. Looking at him smiling and laughing, she told him to relax. Hugo's daughter called him an uncle sweetly. The uncle is the one who calls you by the name of the child. Doha couldn't say a word. Her eyes were still full of tears, making her younger brother look sly, and asked her if she felt very happy. But Doha didn't care about him, her tearful eyes looked straight at Li Xian and then bowed her head and whispered to ask him for a favor. He thought the little girl was going to ask for an autograph, of course. He agreed, but it seemed like it was something hard to say, so Doha stammered for a long time. Before she could say anything, the floor tiles of the cafe shook and a red-brown monster rose from the ground, screaming, drowning out Doha's voice, but Li Xian could still hear it faintly. He wondered what his niece had just said, damn it, she's expressing her feelings but it sounds like something like get the hell out of here. Doha's spear cut through it in one blow, 
Cutting the monster in half, her demeanor changed from a sweet young girl to a vengeful demon. Doha said, please wait for me for a while because after I kill these monsters, I will propose to you immediately. With that, she charged forward with her spear, leaving Li Zian standing, motionless with a stiff body. He asked again to confirm that what Doha said was correct. She had already given the signal when she stood in front of him. After hearing this, he couldn't believe it even more, and asked again, what did the little girl ask for? At present, dark clouds are gathering over the entire city, street. The city's loudspeakers are constantly broadcasting that monsters have appeared, and people should quickly go to the shelter. On the streets and in the sky, there are monsters with strange shapes, killing and destroying people, causing people to panic and flee. The attacks, like Doha's storm are tearing apart monsters one by one. She accelerated faster and faster, standing in front of a group of monsters. Giants, she twirled her spear, creating a powerful force that made the ground beneath her feet crack open. Her eyes flashed with electricity, determined not to let these guys ruin my marriage proposal. Looking up, she saw that the sky and the ground were covered in monsters. Doha waved her fan with her spear, so that it spun so fast that it made her dizzy. She stomped her foot hard, cracking the ground wide open. Doha held the spear in the air, her eyes blazing, with electricity and full of destructive power, and then threw it like a javelin thrower. The terrifying energy spread out into a pillar of light that pierced through the clouds. There, the sky was filled with dark clouds. This lotus fire buffalo move of hers killed almost all the monsters, looking no different from the fire of hell falling on them. Lijian breathed a sigh of relief. It seemed that he had worried too much when he came here. Doha is even stronger than Taksu, just kidding. Hey, that guy, seeing Lijian, she turned on the baby mode again. As soon as she lost her guard, the monster immediately took the opportunity to rush up and try to bite her to death. But Lijian was faster, pulling both Sungchi and Doha out of the way. In the midst of the flames of the monsters, a female voice appeared. Monster is laughing with glee. I didn't expect you to be able to dodge that attack just now. A strange woman appeared on the body of the monster, smiling slyly with pleasure. I didn't expect this human to be able to dodge the attack. I like you already. The smile on her face grew wider and wider, and she pulled hard on the rope of thorns. Next, she will turn the name. A human being into a new pet. Oh Lala, Lishan's voice rang out right in front of the monster's snout. What day is it today that you guys are challenging the fire? And it just so happens that I need a furnace to make more sacred objects. He stepped in front of the monster and roared with delight. You will become my number one furnace. The monster woman was not angry at all, but felt a sense of pleasure in her heart. This guy will be interesting to train. A few minutes ago, Doha looked at the monster woman in surprise when it was a phantom monster. She was thinking that she had to stop it right away. Lijian gently touched her foot with his finger as if he was wearing clogs in his stomach. This serious look means you're going to try to deal with them yourself, right? If so, then wait a minute. I will deal with the monster and the two of you will keep everyone around you safe. I know. Sung Che and Doha are very strong. So I trust you with them, so you should trust me to deal with it. Of course, Doha smiled slightly and her younger brother agreed with Lijian right away. So the three of them together, at the moment of releasing their strength, they entered a state of battle and decided to fight the monster with a show of force. Especially Lijian had his eyes on the alchemy furnace, so he would definitely be more aggressive. The monster woman swung the whip of thorns, her hand frantically towards Lijian, her mouth constantly saying more, more, more with each whip that came down. But Lijian was not phased at all. He put his hands in his pockets and calmly dodged each attack. That was thrown at him with incredible speed. She screamed, struggle more. The female monster's whip wrapped around Lijian, but he didn't react with any surprise. The strange woman became even more excited, laughing with satisfaction and saying, this is what training is all about. She continued to whip him hard, causing Lijian to be dragged along and repeatedly slammed into the surrounding buildings, smashing the ground and rocks into pieces. With a loud bang, the extremely strong impact created a force that pushed everything around it away. From within the thick dust, Lijian was still in a state of shock, kneeling on one knee, his clothes torn to shreds. But he stood up abruptly with a look of disgust, and with a jerk of his body, the rope immediately snapped, as easily as tearing the flesh of a boiled chicken. He said with contempt, is this all you've got? You're all talk and no action, not interesting at all. The monster woman's face quickly turned pale, unable to believe what had just happened. The monster below the woman opened its wide mouth and breathed out a fierce flame towards Lijian. There was a loud explosion, smoke and fire filled the sky, and the scene looked like a nuclear bomb had been dropped. The giant created from Sung Che's magic was straining to hold back the rocks falling from the buildings. While controlling him, he urged the people to evacuate to the shelter. 
After evacuating the last of the people, he brushed his hands and ran to his sister, who was staring at her uncle's battlefield in the distance. Doha was a little worried. Although Lijian was very strong, the phantom monster was also the most dangerous kind of monster. The monster must be at least level D or above. I'm afraid my uncle won't be able to beat it, who knows. But the after effects will be after leaving the ghost tower. So without thinking, Doha ran to Lijian, despite Sung Che's armor blocking her way. The scene of the battle where Lijian was now was no different. From a gate leading to hell, devastated and burning. That's it, Lijian laughed with excitement. If it's fire, it has to burn like this, your fire is hotter than that kid named Gemini Star just now. From within the smoke, Lishan's figure gradually became clear, his eyes glowing a faint green color. With a sly smile, Lishan condensed the flames in his hand into a burning fireball, and laughed with glee. I've got my eye on you, you're number one in training. The system panel popped up again, indicating that it had collected a flame that could be used in creating space. Oh, the monster was startled and exclaimed because Lishan was still able to survive within his ring of fire. But basically, his fire had never made him afraid. Raising his hand to summon a creation staff, as soon as the system panel once again popped up to say that he could use the newly acquired fire in the creation space. He opened his mouth with glee and began to strengthen it right away. It was really unexpected when the system asked him to choose the object to be strengthened. Lijian raised his staff in one hand and held the fireball in the other, ready to smash them together, strengthening nothing other than himself. He slammed the staff down, and the magic circle that appeared under his feet caused the wind to blow up, and the blue light emitted from the circle was very striking. The strange woman became wary and worried because she didn't know what Lijian was going to do. She shouted excitedly that she would not let Lijian do anything, and continued to maintain the flame on her hand to attack him. Unexpectedly, behind her, a girl holding a magic spear had appeared and used her thunder shock skill. Very quickly, a reddish-pink lightning bolt appeared, and the monster roared. Right in the palm of her hand, she furiously threw her straight into a building not far away. The impact was so great that her body slammed into the wall and shattered it. Behind, her mouth spewing out fresh blood, which pleased the monster woman quite a bit. She urged her monster hand to pounce without, knowing that there was a black shadow leaping up behind her. The monster hand opened its mouth, which was as big as several stories of a building, just to swallow a girl, but it still couldn't. Its whole body was jerked backwards, to Doha's surprise. It stubbornly pounced forward and opened its mouth again, but it couldn't, because Lijian had grabbed its tail and threw it ha ha ha. Where are you going? Let me play with you first. What a strange game. Lijian just like that, the monster was thrown straight to the ground, causing the ground to shatter and dust to fly everywhere. After the throw, the monster lay motionless, leaving her phantom monster hand unable to believe her eyes. How could a human being catch a hell lizard with his bare hands and throw it away so easily? Lishan's whole body was filled with murderous intent. His eyes were full of contempt as he threatened the female monster. If you touch Doha again, I will chop you into a thousand pieces. This made her feel like she was lost in the eyes of a danger snake that could eat her at any time. Sweat poured down like rain, and she was so scared that she put her hands over her face in panic. Could it be that a legend like her would be threatened by humanity? She didn't want that, so she burst into a dazzling purple light, causing the wind to blow violently, making Doha panic. Lijian didn't understand what this hag was trying to do. He still maintained his indifferent look, watching her body transform into a jet black color with wings of a hellish creature. Her already ugly appearance only got worse. Burning with anger, she warned that this one blow would send that bastard back to his motherland. As fast as the wind, she closed her wings and cast the judgment of hell, flying wherever she went, and the ground was torn apart and shattered. He quickly approached Lijian, and the two of them struck at the same time, causing the magic power to erupt violently. Doha was so panicked that she cried out to Aiko C, only to see a beam of light, emitted, followed by an explosion of magic power that lifted the entire city. It was terrifying, but the truth was even more disappointing to her. In her hand, she was holding the fist of an elf, a glove that was, called the fireproof gloves, enhanced by the fire of hell. Fire resistance attribute, with random luck, making the attribute increase by one point after eating spicy food. There's just one thing he hasn't tried, the spicy level 7, because this thing is so good, it can only be used once. She stared in disbelief at the glove and at Lishan's scarred face, which was instantly healed by the system's activated regeneration. You will burn in my forge for the rest of your life. To pay for daring to play with fire in a residential area, she couldn't believe that the thing in her hand could stop her. Oh, you think my stuff is bad? Lijian laughed triumphantly, but his eyes showed a dangerous look, 
my gloves are very convenient for tearing monsters apart. With the system popping up at just the right time, the brain reported that the fire of the hellish creature had an evil aura, too strong to be purified and needed to be cleansed to become part of the serpent's essence. He clenched his fist, purification is a cleansing punch, right? Lysian didn't say much, he just rushed in and beat the monster woman mercilessly. The monster's nose fell to the floor, but there was still no sign of purification. The tail was out of water, it turned out that punching this woman was not the way to purify her, and he had already punched her to death. Well, there's no other way. If the two-legged stove is dead, then we can switch to a four-legged stove. The lizard saw Lysian beat its master to death, and hurriedly put its white body out of the first. Hell Lizard has now become a prisoner of the serpent essence. Lysian listed a bunch of new names for the Hell Lizard, but the names he came up with didn't sound like anything. The lizard just chose the cutest name, Fire. The two sisters Doha and Sungchi also ran over. Looking at the uncle who was a little haggard but still very healthy, he must be fine, Doha said that there was something urgent to tell him. Recalling that Doha had said she would propose to him, Lijian thought to himself, oh no. Hesitating and stammering, he was about to remind Doha when he realized that what she wanted to ask was about the information. Related to the story that Lijian had sacrificed himself in the Demon Tower 20 years ago. Oh, it's not a proposal? I've always been suspicious, although the Zodiacs always said that you sacrificed yourself to protect humanity, but it's very strange that you were the only one who died. Holding Doha's hand tightly when mentioning his suspicions, but couldn't do anything always kept it in his heart until today. Seeing your strength with my own eyes, I can be sure that you didn't sacrifice yourself, but were murdered by someone. After listening to Doha's sharp argument, Lijian paused for a while and then sighed. Doha, aren't you the daughter of Otak Sudden? You're not very sensitive, are you? If she was so smart, Lijian didn't need to hide anything, he told the truth. Twenty years ago, he was betrayed in the tower by one of the twelve saints. The memory of that day's stabbing came to mind. Lijian, he put on a face of unwillingness. Hearing this, the two sisters couldn't believe their ears. Aren't the Zodiac Kai stars and Lijian born to protect the world? Sung Che couldn't understand why those people could do that. To Lijian, the great hero who sacrificed to protect this world. Lijian agreed with that. That's the problem, my dear. Because he was too strong, stronger than all the saints of the twelve zodiac signs. He alone could have killed the red eye, so they plotted to kill him. Once the leader of the calamity was dead, the twelve zodiac signs would have no calamity to extract money and power from the world. Then Lijian, who killed the leader of the calamity, would be their biggest obstacle. That was his hypothesis, but just by hearing that, the two daughters of Otak Sudden were so angry that their whole bodies trembled. Sung Che lowered her head, muttering that the person who saved this world was her uncle. But he had to find a way to survive in that very tower. While his name and reputation were stolen by those despicable people, seeing that both of them suddenly burst into tears, Lijian sighed, and put his hands on their shoulders to comfort the two girls. Don't cry like that, because I will definitely make them pay back a hundred times more. Speaking of which, Lijian opened his phone to check some news about the saintess Sophia Mari, saying that this was his last schedule of the day. In South Korea, countless reporters and journalists are gathered in a conference room. Because the truth about 20 years ago will be revealed today, the reporters are wondering if it has anything to do with the message that appeared in the Dakma incident last time. Or maybe it's related to the recent Lijian as a live scandal. Although there are many possible stories that could be mentioned, they know for sure that the story that is about to be revealed will be shocking. The camera flashes continuously as Sophia finally also appears on the podium, smiling on the surface, but inside she was sweating, not knowing how to open her mouth. Because in the beginning, she only had one thought, could she just run away and ignore the press conference? But she couldn't run because she was being controlled by Lishan's artifact. She didn't know what the thing around her neck could do if she resisted. So now she could only accept being a puppet for Lishan. To control and say the nonsense words she didn't want to. I don't know about the other Zodiac Kai stars. But Lishan alone would kill her. And finally Sophia spoke. I am here today to clarify. An incident that occurred 20 years ago at the Demon Cataract event. Although it has been a long time since that incident. It was a sensation at the time when 13 of them stormed into the Red Eye and then had special privileges for the heroes until now. Sophia finally continued to say that in fact, the hero who actually destroyed the Red Eye that day was. He frowned and let out an unwanted sigh. 
finally saying the name Lijian. At first, everyone didn't care much, but some reporters suddenly paused for a moment when they realized that something was wrong, and then they all exclaimed in surprise. A series of questions came in disbelief. Lijian was the one who actually took down the red eye, not Stephen Marker. So the 12 Kai stars have been lying for 20 years? The most important question is, is Lijian still alive? Hearing each question, Sophia's face darkened, just as she opened her mouth to confirm that Lijian was still alive. A black aura suddenly came over her, making her shiver. A very dangerous man appeared right behind her, suppressing her words, causing Sophia to turn around in panic. He was Trang Loi Min, the former saint. Sophia was obviously terrified when she saw Mulan appear here, and let him laugh at the reporters. The saintess is unwell. It seems that this press conference cannot continue, right Sophia? His eyes turned red, and his face showed obvious ferocity. He approached and reached out to turn off the microphone as Sophia trembled and asked why he had come at this time. He leaned close to her ear and whispered, Shut up, what were you going to say when you turned on that microphone? I think you're starting to get out of hand. You've been given the title of saintess and lived in luxury for so long, and it's still not enough? If you don't want to see the scene of yourself being torn apart broadcast all over the world, then shut up for me. Mulan turned the microphone back on, calmly informing everyone that he had just confirmed that the saintess had been threatened by someone else, which was why she had been speaking so incoherently. His face said as if he was the one protecting the saintess, so there was nothing to worry about. The entire hall fell, silent when they heard Mulan announce that the press conference was ending here, and then someone suddenly asked again, what about Lijian? Before he could finish speaking, a black aura struck. Mulan, with his hands in his pockets, stood looking down with a menacing look. Lijian died 20 years ago in the demon. Power, do you need me to explain further? The reporter was scared, but he still asked, then who threatened the saintess? Why did that person drag Lijian into this matter? His question drew the curiosity of all the journalists and reporters at the scene. Hundreds of questions continued to come at Mulan, making him angry, harassers have emerged. The aura radiated more and more thickly secretly cursing. These flies don't know their place. His aura gathered right in the palm of his hand, preparing to kill everyone here to shut them up. A foot flew over just as Lijian spoke, I can tell you're going to cut down a circle of reporters here. Mulan ate a kick from Lijian and flew straight into the big holes in Sophia's back, causing her to hold her head and scream in terror. Oh my god, that guy is here. Mulan was kicked before he could see clearly, and then Lijian rushed up with the tail of a hell lizard in his hand. Greetings. Mulan is very magnificent. Stinky crab. Long time no see. Your broken face is still the same as before. Meeting gift. He whipped the lizard's tail straight at the evil man, causing the ground to shatter. Sophia was surprised to realize that it was a tail. On this side, the hell lizard was sitting huddled in a corner like an exhibit in front of the public, looking no different from an animal in a zoo. Sung Che also found a sign. Please don't feed, it's easy to get a stomachache, so everyone who passed by looked back at it once. Lijian stood in front of Mulan's fallen body and cursed, are you trying to interrupt the press conference? But at some point, Mulan had run behind him and stood defiantly. Just a few minutes ago, I heard someone beat up the hell lizard, so it was you? Looking at the black aura gathering at the person behind him, Lijian was not happy, are you playing the clone trick again? Mulan of course, did not recognize who was in front of him, he just looked at him boredly. I wonder who this guy is who knows my abilities. Every time I introduce myself, I always do it in a grand way. This time is the same, Lijian is me, who else could it be? The reporters were surprised when they heard the name of the man who had been dead for 20 years. The atmosphere suddenly fell silent, and then one of them burst out laughing, followed by everyone else laughing along. Simply because Lijian could not possibly appear in such a sloppy manner, if he was still alive this year, he must be nearly 60 years old. Even Mulan laughed, a man with real power but a little delusional. If you want to impersonate someone, you have to choose the right target, he said, and ate the tail of the hell lizard straight in the face, falling over. Again, Lijian held the tail of the hell lizard and turned it around, and as he turned it he said, well, let's just beat him until he wakes up. He whispered to the reporters, what are you standing there for, go do your job. Which one of you laughed at me just now? Come, to do the work. The reporters ran away in disarray, and Sophia, who was afraid that she was going to be thrown off the stage, also found a way to leave quickly. The lizard's tail slammed straight into the wall behind, blocking Sophia's escape. Behind her, Lijian leaned, against his hand, with a wicked smile on his face, his eyes gleaming. Hey bug, where are you going? You have to tell the truth. He shouted, exposing all the truth that 20 years ago the Zodiac stars ran away when they saw the red eye that they had taken advantage of, his reputation to polish their own. 
Then the face of the Aquarius Saintess had been rebuilt, but her nature could not be changed. You have to make clear all your sins, he said, pressing down on Sophia's foot, who did not dare to speak back, but cursed to herself, this crazy dog has already said everything himself. Suddenly, a black smoke enveloped the entire space, as thick as the early morning fog in Da. Lat. The system reappeared, noting that the aura of the darkest star was bringing danger. Mulan's jet black aura was released fiercely, as if it wanted to swallow everything, including both of Trang Lu's clones. The power released caused the lights on the ceiling to explode one after another, only the reporters below covered their heads and it was over. Sophia was blunt, her eyes wide, what is this? Lizon thought she was calling him, but unexpectedly she shouted at him. The situation is very critical now, don't you see? I can feel the aura of the zodiac stars. Inside the black smoke, Mulan was standing with his head bowed, and behind him appeared a huge figure in the shape of a human. But it was terrifying, dark with tentacles and glowing eyes without eyelashes. He smiled cruelly and spoke in a fierce tone. I really didn't expect you to be Lizon. Well, even though I don't know why you were able to survive leaving the devil's waterfall, but now I'm throwing a party to welcome you back. Lizion's face grimaced as Sophia behind him was so scared that she was about to faint. Obviously both of them felt the fierce energy of the former champion, and everyone was especially alert. The man flew up without hesitation, and he faced Lizion's gaze, emitting black aura from his body, confronting his green aura. The two sides were like two opposing schools, heralding a bloody battle to come. At the sanctuary of the Sagittarius star, which was also his home, Otaku was cooking a pot of fragrant noodles. He sighed, happily. Because Doha and Ryan were not at home, so he had to eat noodles tonight, so he sat down with the remote control and turned on the news. The TV was showing a live broadcast of the battle between Lizon and Chong Lui. The reporter kept updating the current situation like a sports commentary. In the middle of the press conference of the saint is Sophia, a man who called himself Lijian broke in. As you can see, he is fighting a very fierce close combat. With the former champion, to be honest, the battle is very exciting. The instant noodles in Otakasu's mouth were no longer tasty, why did he say he was going to meet his two children, but instead appeared on TV to fight the former champion? Mu Ling's hand accumulated a black aura ball, and then he pressed it hard on the ground to let the aura run in a straight line, destroying the ground and causing the earth and rocks to fly everywhere. The reporters there ran away in disarray, but Lijian was not at all flustered, and jumped up to dodge the simple blow. Hearing Lijian howling with contempt, these three attacks did not have any effect, Mu Ling laughed again fiercely, you're trapped. As his hand lifted, the black power that had just splashed to the ground in an instant, reached Lijian, crawling up like vines and stabbing straight into him. Mu Ling was surprised to see him pull out a halberd, straight into the attack of the former champion. He spun around in the air while the two pieces of the halberd fell out, as beautiful as a painting. The reporters applauded incessantly. He landed on the ground with great satisfaction and grandeur, not forgetting to keep a big smile on his face. Without waiting a second longer, his whole body was enveloped in blue sparks. Of electricity, no different from Florida, and then he teleported at high speed towards Mu Ling. Mu Ling was not to be outdone, and continued to accumulate the aura ball in his hand. Humph. With a contemptuous nose, have you only learned this trick in the past 20 years? His two arms just lowered, and the black power once again tore through the ground to attack Lijian directly. This time he did not dodge, but swung the halberd in. His hand, cutting the aura as if it were chopping vegetables. Dodging, he howled. You only say that you are good at your own tricks, huh? In a flash, the halberd split Mu Ling's body in two. However, the feeling of slashing into the man made Lijian feel something was wrong. Then, it turned out that the person in front of him was just a part of his body that was dissipating into strands of smoke. Damn it, are you kidding me? Zion roared, 20. Years have passed, and you've only learned one clone trick? Mu Ling's sly voice came from behind Lijian as he was gathering the black smoke, then I will take that as a compliment. Strange, blowing away everything, blowing Sophia's hair bald. Who was hiding behind a wooden table? It looked like a black tornado, but it sucked. All the black air from the mouths of the reporters. With his hand gripping the halberd, Lijian felt clearly, this madman. How was he going to take responsibility for daring to do this? Mu Ling landed on the ground and responded comfortably, as if nothing had happened, with his two hands holding. The surging aura after extracting it from the lives of the reporters. Taking responsibility is for later. I'm a bit tired by myself, but if I have a chance, I have to deal with you first. Deal with you first. Lijian turned around, as if he had realized something, 
his eyes wide open. Towards Mu Ling, was it you who stabbed me in the ghost waterfall? Mu Ling did not answer, but instead mocked him again. Are you playing that game of finding the culprit? A. Hero saving the world is immersed in a petty feud. If others saw it, they would mistake you for a street thug. Whether it is right or not, Lijin now only feels that this. Guy's every breath is unbearable. Hiding in that clone is really good, but what's the point? Yu Ling just told him that this is not an ordinary clone, but clones created from the life force of the journalists who were just sucked away. He extended his warning, if Lijin kills the clone, their life force will also, will also be broken, and of course he cannot guarantee their lives. Damn it, using other people's lives to hold him back, he laughed foolishly in his throat, cursing the dirty trick as stinky as the face of this former champion dog. All the mewlings stood together, each of them laughing strangely, the sound, overlapping each other, I will be there as your last wish, and now die. The clones rushed in at the same time, taking turns punching Lijin, but after only a few seconds, they all showed an expression of disbelief, because for some reason they were aiming at Lijin, but what they were actually hitting was the tail of the hell dragon. Lijin jumped from somewhere behind the baby dragon's legs, a skill. I just learned how to master it, you little red devil. He clenched his fist and slammed it into the nearest Mu Ling, while the system displayed the skill Take My Attack, allows the user to summon a desired object to use as a shield of the essence of the coolie, and can summon one of the three objects that have been in close contact recently. Mu Ling who was punched was in so much pain that he couldn't understand how Lijin had found the right one. This was a clone that used part of Mu Ling, because using the skill 13th sense to capture the opponent's weakness. But he was far from explaining, and smiled triumphantly again. Get rid of you, you smell so bad, you can't escape, boy. Then from the body of the superior clone, he pulled out a purple crystal stone right at the heart, making the superior clone scream in pain. Can't the sensing ability of Gemini's essence find me, can you? His snake spirit swallowed the nuclear fragment of the former champion containing 33% of the soul and 20% of the power of the former champion's zodiac, causing a huge crack to appear in the power of this constellation. Only by the system jumping out continuously, he knew that the patron saint of the former champion was extremely frightened when he saw this scene, the dark star magic power that was surrounding him was disappearing. The crazy magic vortex just now has disappeared, leaving a desolate space, full of smoke and debris everywhere. The reporters who were sucked away just now have woken up, not knowing what happened, only knowing that they were still alive. Lizon looked at Muling's superior clone with the nucleus in his hand, and heard the clone try to awkwardly ask him what he had experienced in the ghost tower, but I could feel the power of the gods in you. Lizon will probably answer, he just smiled and said he would use the block. The nucleus had just been extracted from his body, and he was careful to do so. The black smoke gradually dissipated the clone, this time losing, but Mulling still smiled slyly, saying that he would come back and bring a gift for Lizon to play with. He didn't care much about that nonsense, but Muling's character didn't have. There is no such thing as a silent retreat. Whether or not there is advance notice, the son of a bitch will come back. Suddenly Lizion's pocket rang. He took out his phone to see Taksu calling, just answered. Heard Taksu say as if shouting in his ear, Hey, what the hell did that bastard of yours do again? Never mind, no need to explain, you run away. I don't understand anything yet, Taksu has already said a guy. I'm watching the news and I see you just destroyed the superior clone of Trang Lui, right? So there is a missile about to fall on your place. Lizon heard the scare, before he could figure it out. The satellite in space really aimed at the place where Lizon was standing and a missile was about to be launched. The missile launch system has been launched from the satellite and is flying at a breakneck speed towards Earth. It is called the Guinea Pig Missile. It is a weapon of destruction that Samarkand's essence and immortal essence have joined forces to create in order to deal with the great darkness after Lizon disappears. This missile is the ultimate weapon of mankind, capable of burning down an entire land where a disaster appears that humans cannot withstand. The attack trajectory has been programmed. Lizon heard about the missile, he said, so they created that thing? It's really useless, but it's based on Mulan's signal to activate it. This must be the surprise gift he said to give to Lizon. This missile is the ultimate weapon of mankind, capable of burning down an entire land where a disaster appears that humans cannot withstand. The attack trajectory has been programmed. This must be the surprise gift he said to give to Lizon. It's really useless, said, but based on Mulan's signal to activate it, this must be the surprise gift he said to give to Lizon. 
It's really useless, but based on Mulan's signal to activate it. This must be the surprise gift he said to give to Lizon. Also go to the nearest shelter to prepare, this is an emergency. The people were so scared when they heard this, they told each other to flee in panic. What the hell is a weapon against the scourge falling into the center of Seoul? Screams and cries rang out, and people fled in all directions. Sung Che and Doha in. The crowd was not notified, nor did they know where their uncle was. There was a loud bang, and a blue light flashed across the sky with a speed. So fast it was hard to believe. But Sung Che still realized that it was Lizon. Lizon. He was carrying Sophia on his shoulders, using magic power to fly straight towards the missile, leaving her screaming in fear. He used the authority of the Gemini Council president to initiate the skill, wandering and teleporting, in order to teleport in front of the guinea pig missile. Then thanks to the support of the skill, the two moved in, blink of an eye in front of the missile, despite Sophia screaming in terror. That bug, as long as you're determined, you can melt anything, right? I brought you here to melt this missile. Just as he turned his head, Sophia was grabbed by Lizon and swung around. If you can't do it, then you, me, and those innocent people down there will all die, you know? Now is the time for you to pay for living a leisurely life for the past 20 years. Angrily, he threw her at the missile. Sophia was so scared that she lost control. No, you madman, oh my god don't throw it, that's all. Sophia was thrown by him without mercy. He told her to go create the miracle of the saintess, but all Sophia could say was to call Lizon a son of a bitch in the sky. The guardian of Aquarius was suddenly summoned, facing the missile. Tyrant, plus the saintess's mother looked like she was about to wrap her skin around the stage. Before acting, the guardian of Aquarius used all words to scold Lizon as a madman, but there was no time. That's it, Sophia also wanted to scold, but she was in. Too late, just let the guardian figure out a way soon. Not wanting his own zodiac essence to die, the guardian. Aquarius used all the power he had to help Sophia. Looking at the missile in front of her, she shouted after that she couldn't help but cry in panic. Suddenly, she saw that her tears activated the goddess's tears skill. A magic circle was discovered, and then Sophia's tears turned into waves that pushed back the missile. The two sides clashed fiercely, but the goddess's tears skill quickly defeated the missile, tearing it into hundreds of pieces. Sophia's mind was spinning, she muttered I succeeded, but suddenly woke up, realizing that she was in free fall in the air. What's more, the dog Lizon didn't even bother to help, he just stood aside. Laughing slyly, you've been strengthened, so it doesn't matter if you fall. Looking above, the explosion caused by the waves and missile fragments colliding, with each other left pieces still falling to the ground. Lizon had to find a way quickly, the debris falling down was enough to crush several areas, and the people below could also see the explosion. They talked about how the missile had broken up in the air, but the debris falling down was enough to horrify people. Suddenly remembering that the missile was made by the Gemini Council, he decided to send a grand greeting to that fruit. Hugo was at home when he suddenly heard Lizion's voice. Who who my friend, can you hear me? He was surprised but realized it was Lizion's voice, so he looked up at the ceiling and asked, Hello, have you finished with that missile? The situation is urgent, I don't have time to explain. To you, let me borrow your absolute coordinate skill. The absolute coordinate skill of the Sagittarius Council is used to move accurately to a designated object, and the overall power will be enhanced when combined with various weapons. Upon hearing this, Otaksu thought the situation was really dangerous, so he hurriedly sent him the absolute coordinate skill. Without any doubt, the fool took the bait and Lizon smiled with satisfaction. Thank you slave number one. Very quickly, he received the absolute coordinate skill of the Sagittarius Council with 238 skill uses available. With another sly smile, Lizon combined the absolute coordinate skill of the Sagittarius Council with the teleportation skill by the authority of the Gemini Council president. He teleported all the debris from the guinea pig missile as a gift to the Gemini Council saint. The overlapping magic circles made all the debris disappear. The people were overjoyed, and Sung Che and Doha were also happy for Uncle Lizion's successful interception. Sui Hut was also in the midst of the cheering crowd, but he saw something was wrong. How could the debris disappear so easily? Suddenly, the sound from the Yin Yang Palace, also the holy place of the Gemini Council, called Sui Hut. As soon as he heard his voice, the other end of the line yelled, You stupid idiot. What are you doing with the authority of the Holy President? He leaned close to the glass and looked outside, seeing the debris of the missile. Guinea pig falling down on the gloomy Yin Yang Palace like in a science fiction movie. After the press conference in South Korea became a trend, everywhere. We're talking about the news of Lizion's return after 20 years. The Blue House, the office of the Secretary of the President, 
senior South Korean officials were discussing the rumor that Lizon had returned and defeated the former saint, and had also successfully intercepted the guinea pig missile. While they were talking, suddenly a blue light appeared, piercing through the ceiling of the office, causing everyone to scream in fear. Lizon suddenly landed on the conference table from somewhere, holding a book called Sui Hut, his face still not awake, and his other hand holding O Taksu who was still wearing the yellow apron with the cute bear coughing. What are you little mice whispering about that looks so tense? I'll take this opportunity to settle things with. You guys. I'm here to get my money back. You guys are holding the account with the money from selling my stuff, right? He provoked the ghost officials in the corner of the room, but he still couldn't stop the gossips, isn't this the lies on on? TV? He questioned the crowd, why didn't O Taksu, who he had given the representative status, still not have access to his account? Sitting in front, staring at the crowd threateningly, explain it to him properly or there will be trouble. One of the counselors stood up and explained that the reason was because Hugo was a foreigner. Lizon frowned in confusion. The other explained that since Lizon died in North Korea, there was no more Zodiac Council, so they did not trust giving it to a saint of another country. Moreover, the power of the Sagittarius Council had gradually weakened with each event, and in the end, they had to entrust it to someone more trustworthy, Hugo. Why explain the past, before he could finish speaking, the other was punched by Lizon. Why are you guys doing such absurd things? If you don't choose anyone, you choose that cheap wizard. What are you guys? How dare you look down on Otaksu? He became more and more violent, constantly raising his hand as if he wanted to punch the others, looking no different from some gangster. The more Lizon talked, the more agitated he became. His nostrils flared as he asked, How dare you look down on Otaksu? He was about to say something to defend the crowd that he didn't care, when he heard his friend stab him in the back, only I, Lizon, have the right to despise Otaksu because he is my slave, not you fucking dogs. The arrogant words that had just been uttered shocked Otaksu, who was so shocked that he froze, and couldn't believe his ears that he asked him again and again what he had just said. Continuing to point at Otaksu, this guy is nothing special except for being handsome. Even if he was as poor as a beggar, he is not someone you can treat like this. Otaksu was standing there like a statue, begging the madman to stop. The officials were surprised. When did anyone dare to insult the saint of Sagittarius other than Lizon? But no one dared to speak up, afraid of losing their teeth like the smart guy just now. The sound of Lizion scolding became clearer and clearer, even someone as easygoing as Otaksu turned dark. The more he talked, the angrier he got. He turned to scold Otaksu for being an idiot. Why? Didn't he naturalize to enjoy such treatment? Otaksu was now stuck like glue, and could only helplessly apologize and take all the blame on himself. Seeing this, Lizon magnanimously patted his shoulder, encouraging him to work hard and live well, while Otaksu could only swallow his tears. Is there any friend who would defend you like this and scold you like this? Anyway, after all that, Lizon changed his attitude, cracking his knuckles, his eyes filled with murderous intent. Before the crowd could speak, a high-pitched female scream suddenly came from the sky, sobbing and chilling to hear that he knew who was speaking. Oh my god, purple lips, purple dreams, step on it and make. Lizon looked at the brand with a disgusted face. Hey Lizon, the saint of Gemini of the Zodiac Council just came and cursed. They have already accessed it, it's not your turn to worry about it. Her eyes were sharp as fire when she mentioned that the money would be used to repair the Yin Yang Palace. Did you do it? Did you send the fragments of the guinea pig missile to the Yin Yang Palace? That's why. The Yin Yang Palace was completely destroyed. Do you know how much I have lost? Atta pointed at Lizion's face with murderous intent, only to make. Lizon looked confused. He raised his head, rubbed his chin and asked suddenly, Who are you? Damn it, I cursed for so long but I can't remember who I am. Hazy was furious, biting her lip. Deciding to raise her hand high and call out the battle formation, wiping out the rag under her nose right in front of her. The people in the office were terrified, they were going to stand and wait to see the show, but it would be tiring if they were clumsy. Only the decadent one was amused by the scene of the Gemini Council's ultimate secret technique being summoned, calling out the soul of the elf queen Larry Quinn. An elf with red braided hair and two long horns appeared, behind Hazy, adding the effect of touching the water with her feet, sparkling and shimmering. She opened her eyes wide, revealing giant wings that looked like a giant fly from Hue. This dark witch is the sole equivalent of a god, protector, confident that the ragged Lizon is appearing right now. Before his sleeves could be lowered, Lizon flew straight up and grabbed the witch's belt. His mouth roared, you're dead, demon, 
Lizon quickly grabbed the dark and flew like a rocket through the hole in the ceiling he had created earlier. The woman shot straight up into the sky. The sound of Oa seemed distant, as if it came from somewhere. Needless to say, how decadent, he ran to the bottom, the hole and roared. O oh Star Master, O oh Star Master. The remaining elf queen was separated from the Star Master, her power divided in two ways. This elf seemed to be smarter, intending to silently play a card to return to her lair before it was too late. But how could he escape Lizion's eyes, before she could change and disappear? He quickly grabbed her head and pulled it back up. It seemed that catching an elf was easier than he thought. Just grabbing her hair and pulling it up like a bunch of onions was enough. The demon cried and wailed sadly in all sorts of ways, then suddenly Suddenly, something collapsed so fast that only a pillar of light could be seen. On the ground, no one else or anything else landed back in the room unconscious after a long flight. She had lost consciousness, causing her ability to control her magic to be reversed, and the power to transform that she had borrowed from the Pisces Council had also disappeared. The magic of Queen Enchantus disappeared, revealing a strange woman. It was no wonder that Lizon did not recognize the person in front of him. He thought he would win because of the Elf Queen. Here, now everyone can see it clearly. Lizon looked at the counselors while grabbing the Elf Queen's hair, causing her to scream. The transformation into a strange abandoned house made the crowd gasp. It turned out that Lizon was now calling a pepper instead of a star master. All right, the power is shown. Where is my money? You better bring it out right now and don't make me mad. A moment later, Lizon and Hugo walked out of the greenhouse with a pile of things in their hands. He asked for cash but didn't give it. He gave a bunch of documents. But with money, you can buy something delicious to eat. Hey, don't you think there's something wrong? Why isn't the witch Hazy here? Isn't Hazy the one who would go crazy in the middle of the street if she saw a lot of money? He seemed to have planned it for sure, and even smiled smugly that the yin and yang had already collapsed, so it was obvious that Hazy would not appear. That nasty little thing is trying to hold back from exploding, but he probably already knows where Hazy is, so he'll find her soon. Next day, at Sung Che's house, the four uncles and nephews were sitting and eating as usual. Lillian took a hamburger out of her bag for Sung Che. For some reason, she held it in her hand for a while and then gave it back to Ryan. He didn't ask, he just searched his pockets for some other things, asking Doha and Jimin what they wanted to eat. Doha was hesitating to choose a dish, when out of nowhere, Ryan had already spit the cake out. He had only teased him a little bit, and he had already taken the bait, making an old man like him so easily teased. Today, Taksu was asked by him to do some errands. If he saw this scene, he would punch his friends. After eating and drinking, let's get down to business. The three of them gathered around to look down at a box. That looked like a mica plastic with an eye-catching golden pattern. It was actually a super hard display box, a relic of the Ares Council that was holding. The elf queen Larry Quinn inside, looking like a tiny bug. As soon as she heard Ryan's warning to answer correctly, the elf knelt down and obeyed, nodding and saying yes like a puppy. He still didn't stop, now the holy book containing everything in. The form of letters threatened, if you don't listen, I'll lock you in here. Larry Quinn nodded faster than a chicken pecking at rice. The first question was also the most important, that rude and bitchy witch. Didn't have to show up, but was it because she couldn't show up? Larry Quinn just said one thing, and Ryan had already put on a face like I knew it. He knocked on the floor, is the bitch locked up here? The bamboo stilt house, the two sisters were surprised when they saw the elf nod. Then let's close the deal, I'll give you a chance to see where that bitch is. Seeing that the elf was stuttering and didn't dare to speak, Lizian went on. Now, do you want to say it yourself or do you want me to say it for you? The elf trembled violently, her face pale as a ghost, she raised her hand and pointed to a direction. In the corner of the room, it was the statue of the relic that was given in the bamboo stilt house. She pointed but she didn't dare to look. Pointing wrong would mean death by Ryan. And pointing right would mean death by Heisen. Either way she would die. Jimin remembered that this statue had been smashed last time, right? Lizian was very satisfied. He took the statue and laughed hee hee hee. Last time, he had already smelled something suspicious. He turned to Jimin and asked, that bitch Heisen still, says that I kissed this thing, right? That's that bitch's positioning magic. When Jimin heard this, he suddenly remembered that he had indeed said, that, he just didn't expect that it was a kind of magic. Then Lizian activated his 13th sense skill and, intervened in the soul space in the statue. Sure enough, the statue let out a cry of a child, yelling, how dare you Larry Quinn betray me like this? Doha was surprised for the most part, 
but the most unexpected thing was that his uncle was right. That was the voice of the Gemini Saint Heisen in her soul state. Inside the statue, she was disappointed, holding her head in frustration, wondering why things had turned out like this, why had she been exposed in front of this bastard. It was all because the devil's tower had collapsed, causing Xeon's aura to spread out everywhere. Even Heisen in the Yin and Yang palace trembled and dropped her cup. She was the first one to immediately sense the familiar aura, emitting from the direction of the tower, something that made others skin crawl. It was Li Tsion's, he was actually still alive, and so Heisen left immediately when she learned that Lizian had returned. Moreover, the place Heisen went to was the house of her best friend's son, Sung Che. At first, Heisen thought it was good because Sung Che's men were already there, but in order to confirm. Again, Heisen immediately used teleportation to enter the soul of this angel statue. Entering the soul and seeing the idiot Xeon was fun until he threw the statue of the goddess, and it shattered on the floor. Only then did she realize that if the possessed object was destroyed in the moment of possession, Heisen's soul would not be able to escape. Though Heisen's way back was locked in the statue without anyone knowing. When Jimin came to fix the statue because of his fervent worship of the Gemini saint, Heisen was overjoyed. At that time, all it would take was a little bit of cheap healing magic to restore this statue to its original state. But all expectations were dashed when in the hands of the Jimin was a bottle of super glue. Nothing more, nothing less. Each drop of glue that fell carried with it each of Heisen's small hopes, disappearing into thin air. Heisen cried out loud, but Jimin had no idea that this guy had turned a healthy pig into a lame pig. So from then on, Heisen was stuck in the statue until this day. Seeing Lizian so smugly thinking about how he was, bullying her made Heisen even more resentful. Heisen shouted out loud, signaling to Larry Quinn to quickly escape from the display box. But instead of obeying the order, Larry Quinn reluctantly said that he didn't want to, couldn't, and wouldn't do it. Because even if he could escape, Heisen would be caught by Lizian again. Anyway, so please don't ask me to do something useless anymore. Unexpectedly, the small, short guy was so sensible. On the contrary, Harry's soul was so angry at the moment that he wished he could fly over and tear the traitor's clothes apart. But then his eyes fell on Sung Che, and he immediately ordered him, as the holy master of the Gemini Kai Xing, to force Sung Che to attack Lizian immediately. Huh? Why should I do that? Heisen couldn't understand that double-faced look. But it was simply because Heisen had not seen Li Tsion's mini museum, and could not understand why he was so reluctant to fight his uncle, who was also his great idol. But you are the saint of the Gemini Kai Sheng. Fighting Lizian is a matter of course. Sung Che roared, but he didn't think it was right, so he just kept scratching his hair. Heisen was about to rush over and do some ideological work. Unexpectedly, Sung Che let out a sentence, so I can leave the Gemini Kai Xing, right? Well, Heisen froze for about five seconds, floating in the room and asking, what? I am indeed the saint of the Gemini Kai Xing, but Uncle Lizian is a hero in my eyes. If the people of the Gemini Kai Xing are the reason why you two have become enemies, then forget about it now. Sung Che quickly took the holy emblem from his pocket and returned it to Heisen before her astonished gaze. At the same time that the badge fell to the ground, the whole building shook violently as if there was an earthquake. Heisen screamed out loud, this is the punishment of the Gemini patron god because the apostle is turning to the serpent constellation, so the traitor will suffer wrath and punishment. Immediately, Sung Che was knocked down by the magic power of the patron god, his eye sockets, nose and mouth all bleeding, causing him to collapse on the floor. Needless to say, Doha and Jimin were panic-stricken. Seeing his younger brother fall unconscious and hit his head on the floor, Doha was horrified, and Heisen also roared anxiously. Quickly pray to the patron god, that you were wrong. You are a candidate for the next successor, so the god will forgive you, as long as you attack Lizian. Sung Che hobbled on the floor, and his voice criticizing Lizian as an untrustworthy bastard echoed throughout the room. Oh come on, leave it alone. Sung Che roared as he recalled the time when he collapsed and asked him to leave Jimin and the others behind and run. And then, a buck-toothed guy couldn't handle the request and even threatened to tear down the entire supermarket. No one has a heart, they just abandon others when they encounter something disadvantageous. Oh, stop it, that's enough. Stop and think about it calmly. Only brother Lizon is really worried about others, always ready to put himself in danger to save people or even his own life. So there is only one hero in Sung Che's eyes, and that is brother Lizon. And don't use your eyes to judge others anymore, you guys. Sung Che roared with anger, his whole body emitting a blue light despite the moist black blood flowing from his eye sockets, nose, and mouth. His words caused the patron god of the Gemini Kai Xing to appear in the purple, hazy space. She will punish the saint Sung Che to the highest degree. By the way, 
Let's send Lizon, the cause of this rebellion, away as well. But it seems that she has forgotten who is here. Lizion's mouth slowly tore open, deep, sharp cuts following Lizion's hand as he slashed at the Gemini patron god. But this time, he didn't smile, leaving only terror in the eyes of the Gemini patron god. At the same time, in the Yin Forest Palace, the Gemini apostle was struggling to control the destruction of the missile fragments that had fallen. One hand can't do it, the holy guardian called another water mage to control it, but it was strange. Suddenly, the power in his hand disappeared, and so did the others on the other side. All the saints of the Gemini were unable to use their magic power, or to be more precise, they could no longer feel any power. He signaled to contact the apostles elsewhere before losing control, but he also received similar answers. Neither telepathy nor teleportation could be used anymore. The patron god's power disappeared right before their eyes. He smiled faintly, almost letting his nephew, an aluminum get into danger because of his uncle. He walked up to Sung Chi and gave him his trademark smile. He gently thanked Sung Chi for always trusting him. I'm really glad, kid. It's hard to hear Lizion's kind words. Sung Chi stopped and was moved to tears. Less than two seconds later, Heisen's scream was heard. What did you do to me, you bastard? Her face was confused, asking the guy in front of her what he had just done to make her powerless. It was as if she had been completely cut off from the Gemini patron goddess, her phrase That's right. To talk about the source from the beginning, the gods have consumed a lot of resources and taken great risks when intervening in this world. That's why the gods usually choose a saint and give power to their representative. That is called the Tristar Zodiac. The representative will continue to share his power with the apostles under his command. In short, the gods are the power plants, and the Tristar Zodiacs are the substations and power stations. The rest of the apostles will be countless sources of electricity. So the reason for the immediate loss of power is only that they can no longer connect to the god. He slammed his hand on the ground, startling Hei Jin and then sneered. It's no different from being an ordinary person because there's no power left, right? Huh? Confidently introducing it is always good. Using Breakthrough the Abyss to cut off the main links is the game that the former crossover guy likes to play the most. Breakthrough the Abyss is an ultimate sulfur monosulfide level skill of the former crossover to cut off all desires even if they cannot be seen with the naked eye. But Lijian upgraded it to another level. He wagged his finger to show off that he can now cut the contract between the representative and the patron god. Hei Jin seemed to want to curse him right away, because cutting off the link between the representative and the gods is a taboo. Oh, afraid of getting angry when the emperor finds out, but Lijian doesn't care. Leaning close to her face with a murderous look, pointing up to the sky with a widening smile like a villain. He said that he always wanted to do this to destroy those damn patron gods. Hey Yijinder clenched his jaw. This guy is crazy, do you know what you just said? Before he could speak, a bolt of lightning struck between the two. The sky was suddenly filled with lightning, striking down with countless thunderclaps. The clouds swirled with large lightning bolts, soon sucking in the wind to create a tornado that blew away everything in its path. The Gemini patron god was furious at the loss of the link between her and the saints, so she used her power directly in the human city. The fury caused a blinding light, accompanied by a loud noise that shook the heavens and the earth. The swirling mist in front of the crowd cleared, and from it emerged the figure of Gemini goddess Freza, who was growling at Lizon. But as a perverted protagonist, he put his hands in his pockets, panting with laughter, the sky not yet dark but already lit up like daylight. The whole whirlwind retracted to a purple magic circle, and soon the old woman Freza appeared with a sullen face and her hair flying like Medusa, appearing first, with a full string. She was so angry that she waved her hand to summon a surge of power so great that the system had to pop up a warning. Putting away his sarcasm for the moment, Lizon took out an item from his inventory. Oh, Freza didn't know what the brat was doing, she just wanted to hit the ground hard, and only then did she realize that something was wrong. It looked like a flashlight, but it turned out to be a fragment of a crystal, long bow that he used to absorb Freza's power. Needless to say, the old woman's face turned ugly when she saw it. Each zodiac sign always has something that can restrain each other. It sucks in the power of Gemini into a cool breeze that makes him smile again. It's a pity that my dear Zemi is no longer with me, if I could still hold that sword. In my hand, I would have killed any god who came to him. By the way, summoning the creation workshop is always bloody. Things like long crystal fragments, thunder and lightning, and Gemini's tornadoes, he has them all in his hands. Although it's a pity that this limited edition crystal fragment, but it had to be used to make something better. Lijin went straight to the crystal fragment, and pulled out a brand new, cool looking scythe. It looked awesome 
but Zion's workshop was just a thatched hut, lacking crafting skills, so this was just a disposable item, but that was enough to make him smile slyly. Activating his fighting instinct, Zion looked like nothing more than the embodiment of a bloodthirsty wolf. He stomped his foot hard and made a decisive cut from top to bottom, making the goddess Freyza let out a cry. She held her aching face, which would need dozens of stitches, and her humiliation and shame made her roar and unable to attack for the moment. The children and Heisen were wide-eyed at the female zodiac god, whom he had also chopped up like firewood. Was he still human? The scythe broke into pieces in Zion's hand after the last attack. Freyza looked like she was having a fit, her face full of veins that showed her peak anger that made her lose her mind. Dozens of black holes swirled in the sky, which the system explained, was the power of the old woman who wanted to vent her hatred on the world. From it, one could see hundreds of thousands of soldiers and monsters waiting for orders. The beautiful goddess of the zodiac looked so beautiful, but the types that she summoned were so ugly that they were unbearable to look at. The entire sky of the city was full of large holes of various sizes, from which came the howling sounds of an army about to go on a bloodbath. Then, suddenly, from the opposite side of the sky, a giant fireball shot straight towards Freyza. Lysian saw that the thing that had just landed had fire. But it wasn't a Kakino Chutsu from any Uchiha. But the Sagittarius saint in his battlesuit had just appeared, making the two children scream. Right behind Hugo was the Sagittarius Zodiac God, who crossed his arms and looked visibly unhappy. Speaking for the taciturn Sagittarius, Hugo raised his voice to tell Cody Fraser to stop her invasion. If she took one more step, she would be breaking the rules. Hugo's face was so tense that it was clear he wasn't joking. But in Fraser's eyes, Apollo was just a weak god, which made her even more furious. The bailiff mocked that they would not be able to do anything. But it was all in Hugo's calculations, only. Sagittarius pure power would not do anything. However, they were not the only ones who objected. The other true gods looked on with disapproval at Fraser's direct intervention in life. To consolidate their territory, they sent a warning, forcing the Gemini forces to keep their troops stationed. The child was confused by being stoned. A summoning array lit up in the sky. From it emerged a chain that shot out, down at Fraser, who was stunned, and wrapped itself tightly around her. This was the punishment for the other true god's violation of the law. Through the chain, most of the old woman's energy was taken away so that she would stop making trouble. If she continued with such warnings, Freyza would have to face the extreme hostility of the other supreme gods. The scene stirred up the dusty atmosphere, except for the young grandchildren who stood and watched up close. The adults found it amusing. Of course, except for Heisen, who was not amused when she saw the true god being chained like a criminal. Only by doing so would the old woman stand still and listen to Hugo's criticism, reminding Freyza and the other supreme gods gods that they would not sit idly by. He asked her in a harsh voice if she dared to make more trouble and receive a greater punishment. Freyza gritted her teeth and glared at Hugo, then let out a roar that shattered the glass, pierced the eardrums, and traumatized the people present. She pointed her finger fiercely at Hugo's siblings, meaning that she would never forget what happened today, and to wait and see. Vision didn't have anything to worry about, he happily gave her the finger back and even climbed up, and added that next time she should remember to bring her brother along. Freyza was furious, but she knew there was nothing she could do, so she turned into long purple pieces that scattered in the air and gradually disappeared before the eyes of the crowd. With the work done, it was time to collect the rewards. The system announced that Lysian had added a reward for trampling on the pride of the Gemini Supreme God, which was recognized by the entities observing this world. He also received a large amount of royal experience, and when he reached level 10, he would face a special challenge. After reading the message happily, Lysian turned to his close friend Otaku, who was saying goodbye to Apollo and the children, as if they had just come back from doing hard work somewhere. He put his arm around his friend's shoulder and praised him for being so accurate. The job was done, but he was still angry, because thinking about Fraser torturing his son Sunjay made him gnash his teeth, wishing he could pierce her head with an arrow. Seeing that his friend was feeling down, Lysian assured him that it would be soon, just be patient and they would crush his siblings to the point where not even a bone would be left. That confident look warmed Hugo's heart, and he thanked him silently, but then suddenly remembered something and reached into his pocket for the item that Lysian had asked him to bring back from the Yin Yang Palace. As soon as he saw the spirit book, he burst out laughing, as he was just about to record the soul contract with Gemini. Heisen of course recognized his item, and even screamed at Hugo about how he had managed to get something that was guarded at the highest level of security. That was 
just in theory, because the skill of infiltrating and hiding was a basic skill for archers like Hugo, not to mention the Gemini badge that Lysian had given him. Lysian ignored the two people arguing on the other side and turned to open the spirit book. In the list of bound souls were several powerful characters, such as the one-eyed berserk, or the former human king Zotal, and even the war king who had reached the legendary level. Without hesitation, all three had surrendered to the Afiyukas star, allowing Zeon to accept them as members of his clan or as his prisoners. Another soul, the commander, who was sealed at the bottom of the abyss of the Yin-Yang Sea, also expressed his surrender. This sealed soul was very likely to reach the mythological level, which was why he was imprisoned like that. It was nice to have so many followers, but Zeon didn't accept them right away. He asked them in return to prove their loyalty if they wanted to join his side. The capitalized letters on the spirit book lit up and then flew up into the sky above his head. They swirled around like a blender, and then, a girl appeared upside down and fell to the ground. Everyone who glanced at Lyzon was shocked, but, the most surprised was Heisen. Because even if she was nearsighted, she could see that it was her own body that, had been given to Lyzon as a gift by the souls who had surrendered to him. Oh my, that's hilarious, Lyzon laughed as if he was high. He never thought they would be so funny, so he accepted them all. The souls bound to Gemini quickly submitted to the Ophiuchus. The system informed Lyzon that he had to give them names, but his nature was lazy. And he didn't want to bother, so he just called his subordinates one, two, three, and so on. Aaron's soul shouted from behind him, intending to scold that dog Lyzon. He immediately grabbed it by the neck, reminding it that the Gemini Supreme God had run away to save his own skin, so it was completely alone. If it knew what was good for it, it would answer, whether or not, it was the one who had stabbed him in the back in the demon waterfall. Heisen's voice caught in her throat, showing no sign of wanting to confess, which only made Lyzon even more angry. He gently pressed the magic power from the tips of his two fingers into its leg, which was enough to torture it. Hey, demon, I'm using the broken piece of the scythe to touch your head, and if you don't confess, you'll feel what it's like to have your soul torn to pieces. Heisen was in so much pain that tears streamed down her face, but Lyzon didn't stop, the magic power from him was so strong that the children didn't dare to come near. The light that emanated from him was so bright that even Larry Queen and Hugo had to keep their distance. Unable to bear it any longer, Heisen threw her head back and roared like a lion being tortured. She added a prestigious sentence to her roar, because the lion was being punished by the heavens. Lysion's eyes widened when he heard the answer. The bang, the magic power on Heisen's head shattered. Lyzon finally let her go, but the pain made it impossible for her to utter a word. He smirked and said, you should have said it sooner, then you wouldn't have had to suffer so much pain. To reward you for this very useful information, I will give your body back to you. Heisen thought she had gotten a good deal, as if she had been reborn, but something was slightly wrong. Why was her body able to stand up on its own? Larry Quinn in Heisen's body was screaming with joy, not wanting to be released, but releasing her soul like this was fine too. He kept apologizing for accidentally giving his body to Larry Quinn, but Lyzon was clearly laughing out loud. He happily accepted Larry Quinn's hug in Heisen's body, making the villain live right before the real owner's eyes. The next day at Sung Jae's house, Zhang Wei and Larry Quinn argued about the places that needed to be fixed in the pile of S-class soul contracts that the Holy Maiden Society had created exclusively. It seemed that ever since Larry Quinn had been given this form, he had become Lizion's right-hand man. In his body, he worked hard and even asked him for a list of souls so that she could make them all stronger, maybe even reaching SS level. But in contrast to this side, in the exhibition box, was a statue containing the soul of Heisen, who was crying and begging to be released. But even if she was released now, there was nothing she could do because there was no body for her to enter. Suddenly, there was a new announcement that Lyzon could now learn a new skill, the Safu contract. While he was still contemplating how to use it, the gods he had just acquired were noisily flattering him like a bunch of clowns. Their souls lingered in the house, and whenever Lyzon looked at them, they would howl, oh my, he's looking at me. It was really funny. Lyzon turned to talk to Taksu next to him. He thought that the gods would be arrogant, but who would have thought that they would become like this? Taksu was interested in joking around some more, but the ice god cursed like a fishwife, saying, hey, you, you're Sir Lyzion's servant, how dare you talk back? But who did he call a servant? Taksu was petrified waiting for his friend to open his mouth and help him. But who would have thought that that evil thing would wave his hand at Taksu and correct him, saying that he was his number one slave, not a servant? From each ice god, the three gods now pointed at the general. And the slave Taksu, who dared to stand in front of his master, since he had started chatting, 
Lizon asked why the three of them had turned around and left their own Death Stars to come to him. Before, they had said in unison that they couldn't stand that beautiful but violent mother f asterisk cker phrase. Xeonton was the one who had spoken like that, but the other two had agreed with him. The real reason was that they had all felt very satisfied when they saw Lizon beat the shit out of that Death Star. Where there's a strong leader, there will be followers. These gods had all switched sides. It's not just the gods, master. The other gods and the legion commanders have also decided to surrender. It's just a pity that they are being held in the holy temple, so they can't be here. Currently, humanity has lost more than half of the earth to the unidentified eagles. Although at a glance, the zodiac stars are still maintaining a balance with them. But in reality, they don't even dare to reclaim the territories that the eagles have taken, but are huddled together trying to fend off their invasion of the rest of humanity. The sanctuary that is holding the other gods at the bottom of the Yin Yang Palace is near the Pacific Ocean, which is also quite close to the area where those unidentified eagles are. It's so dangerous that he has to go and check it out himself. Voices of the three of them interrupted his train of thought. When he turned around, they were already kneeling on the ground, vowing to dedicate their lives to Lizon. Oh, these three look quite prestigious. Lizon smiled his trademark smile, and called the group of three gods to prepare to go and do something for him. Seeing the gods being ordered around with his own eyes, Sung. Che exclaimed that they were really cool. After saying that her younger brother was right, Zohar suddenly lowered her head and smiled a sinister smile, saying, it's good that you proposed to him. The girl's casual words pierced the minds of her uncle, biological father, and the three gods, causing everyone to fall silent. Zion still had his head bowed, but he knew that he was in shock. His friend's cold gaze was fixed on his back, and he pressed his face close to his to ask, is it true, Zohar? Zion bit his lower lip and trembled before his friend's provocative words. He asked, again, did you propose or did you propose? So Hugo is going to be Lizion's third wife? The golden rabbit seemed to think that the fire wasn't big enough yet, so he asked, innocently, congratulations on your happy family. The big mouth that had eaten salty and spicy food was now facing a huge fire that was burning fiercely. The gossipy father hugged his beloved son and quickly dodged out of the way. Putting on a funny face, Zion sarcastically advised his friend who loved the color green to calm down. His friend roared with anger, his eyes blazing. I've never even heard the girl say anything loving on Father's Day, you dog. Haksu had lost control and was shooting everywhere, leaving everyone to fend for themselves. He jumped and dodged, yelling at his friend to calm down, but his mouth kept apologizing, saying, you're going to die here today, my dear. Taking that back, Taksu used his invisibility spell to hide himself from his friend, who was about to shoot him with a fatal blow. Leon realized that he was being serious and not joking. His eyes glowing, Zion also had to use his skill to sense the magic power of the centaur star. Waving his hands left and right with his eyes still closed, Zion caught the arrows that were aimed at him and rushed forward. In his subconscious, he could also see several bright spots appearing one after another, indicating that Taksu was also jumping in the direction of his friend to avoid his attacks and find an opening to shoot his arrows. Hundreds of flaming arrows flew towards Zion at once, but he didn't flinch. He caught all the arrows with his bare hands and broke them into hundreds of pieces. He started to get really pissed off, complaining that the arrows were not even his, and that they were just a bunch of junk. Unexpectedly, this remark offended the centaur star, causing him to erupt in a blaze of anger and roar above his head. Taksu used the zodiac secret technique, the chains of the tie, Yang God, Yang Gong, to create a large ring of fire. The wind sucked into the fire, and using his flying skill, Zion flew up, revealing his belly. He thought that this guy was getting more and more unreasonable. Apollo chimed in, asking Taksu in a whisper if he was sure he wanted to play with chains in the house. You've already lent all your savings to Sung Che. Money is now just a shrimp on the tip of a fly's mouth. Taksu drew his bow and shouted defiantly. This arrogant image made Zion realize that Sung Che was just like him, and that he wouldn't hesitate to burn down the house. It's true that the children of a family resemble each other, even if they don't look alike. The two children below shouted to stop their father. Taksu thought that Zion was worried about him, but unexpectedly, they said in unison, Father, you can't beat Uncle Zion. The image of a strong father who deserved to be loved and respected by his children shattered in an instant. Taksu let himself fall freely, and the mass of fire chains did not bother to gather. Seizing the opportunity while his friend was frozen like a wax statue, Zion 
kicked him in the head, knocking him unconscious. Taksu woke up with a huge bump on his head. Before he could find Zion, to continue settling the score, he was startled by his voice. You're awake? Why were you so foolish as to believe the children? Look at my face. Do I look like someone who would marry my friend's daughter? As someone who doesn't have a family, I can explain to you, a father of two. That children rarely show their emotions to their father because they are too shy. But they think about you a lot. They're buying you a present right now. As soon as he finished speaking, the two children came over with coffee and Taksu's favorite strawberry cake. That was enough to make father Taksu cry like a child, and he tried to rush over to his son and hug him tightly, saying, my dear children. But the son seemed to have grown a tail and rushed over to his uncle to show off his victory to Zion. This kid listens to everything Uncle Zion says, and he even dared to send a video of the fight to the reporters, just like his angry uncle. The moment of fatherly love was extinguished before it even began. Taksu looked dejectedly at his son, who was cheering happily after being praised by his idol, and even gave Zion his own piece of cake. Suddenly, he looked up and saw that his cake was missing a piece. When his friend asked why there was so much cream on the cake, Taksu knew that his cake was missing the delicious piece of cream on top. Trying to salvage the situation, he pointed at his daughter and asked where the piece of cream was. Unexpectedly, Rohan smiled broadly and replied, Father, I ate it and gave it to Uncle Zion. Taksu was furious, and tears streamed down his face as he ran over to Zion to get his share of the strawberries, but with his speed, there was no way he could stop him. Taksu continued to rage, and it was a shame that the house was never peaceful. If this continued, the whole family would have to live on the streets because there would be no more money to repair the house. Rang Kwop, who had been punched in the face, sat obediently in the corner, hoping Larry would forget to stitch him up. He only dared to mutter that Hugo didn't dare to wake up his son, let alone talk back like he did before, for fear of being punched again and sent to the afterlife. While watching his big boss act like a child, being jealous of his uncle over a few strawberries. The girl who had been in the news received a new text message. It was not very welcome news. On the screen, which had a picture of Lillian as the wallpaper, was a message saying that the twin saint had called an emergency meeting because a red-level disaster was looming over the thousand-mile bridge. In the sky above High and Beach near the Philippine capital of Manila, dark clouds gathered, flickering and flashing as if they were trying to tear apart the sky. Below, on the sandy beach, Groups of soldiers stood in neat rows, facing the sea and waiting. The cancer general clenched his fists and shouted with great intensity. Now, that the saint is absent, we must take his place and deal with this red-level disaster that is approaching. This is the opportunity for us, the cancer lions, to once again stand at the top of the world. Hearing the general's encouragement, the entire army of this zodiac sign roared with enthusiasm. Only Zohar stood there, rubbing his head and feeling tired. He just wanted to go home. Outside the Cancer Corps command post, a crowd of people waited for instructions from an old man with silver hair, who was muttering curses. He was fiddling with an unknown object that was emitting a seductive blue light, and he smiled, as if he understood something that no one else did. He had made a mistake, but he was sure that it would reach the right person. While the world was facing a monster, Lizon used Taksu's super cute bear-shaped apron to focus on making new weapons, even though this was already his nth failure. The interior was still fine for Lizon to use, but the house of the Sagittarius Saint looked like an abandoned building with a sign that said under repair. Outside, what's more, part of the roof had been burnt and was gone. Taksu was working hard like a construction worker, and he opened the door and greeted the newcomer. The secretary of the cancer Sagittarius, Aul Yarin, was carrying a suitcase in one hand and a cardboard box in the other. After not seeing each other for a long time, she had to ask, what happened to your house? Taksu didn't want to explain, so he just told her to come in first. The TV screen was showing the news about the red-level disaster caused by the thousand-legged monster. Taksu quickly explained that his daughter, Zohar, was on a mission there, so as a father, he had to keep an eye on it. Taksu must have noticed the box in Yaren's hand, and he wondered what was inside. I just saw it at the door. When I came in, so I brought it in. There was a scratching sound coming from the box, hinting at Lizion's presence, and they both dropped it in surprise. In the room, Lizon had broken something again because the level of the crafting tool was too low, so the material had been ruined. Looking at the broken sword on the crafting table, he muttered that he had failed again. He knew that he needed higher level equipment if he wanted to craft items of the desired level, but the highest level he had was just the makeshift hammer. Thinking of his real and fancy hammer, Lizon couldn't help but feel sorry. It had been 20 years since he had felt its spirit, and he could only assume that it was lost. Lime and Heldeth were also high level, 
but they alone were not enough for him to craft a common or higher level artifact. But Lizon couldn't give up because he had to be prepared before facing the evil spirit. Suddenly, the door opened and told him that there was another zodiac spirit nearby, other than his own and Taxu's. He quickly glanced out the door and decided to go and see what was going on. Inside the box was a noisy voice message. It solemnly asked if this was the house of the Sagittarius spirit, Hugo Arthurs? Long time no see, I'm Sekerit X Neku. Taxu looked at the statue with displeasure, not happy to see it at all. Lizon had just come out and heard his friend say that, and he put the makeshift hammer on his shoulder to look cool. He thought that someone had dared to hide in this sanctuary, but it turned out to be the esteemed goat number 35. As soon as he saw the young man, the statue roared, as if to say, Hello, Lizon, you look well. Ignoring Yaren's surprise, it introduced itself again as Sekerit X Vladimir Ivan, the Capricorn Saint. When someone introduced themselves with their full name, Lizon stepped out and said, Serbas, the shepherd? The statue roared, my name is Sekerit X. In addition to his own power, the Zodiac cheating market, Sekerit X is also a special crafter like Lizon. After he disappeared into the Demon Tower 20 years ago, all the ultimate weapons in the world were created by him. From gloves, helmets, and belts to offensive and defensive weapons, as well as medicinal herbs, there are signs that Sekerit X has reached out. He was about to explain why he had come to the Sagittarius house and talk to Lizon because he had something to apologize for. But before he could finish, he reached out and grabbed the head of the statue. Lizon tossed it around in his hand as Sekerit X tried to smooth things over, hoping to get his cooperation. Lizon smashed the statue with his hammer, as excited as if it were a toy. Hey, you didn't even wait to hear what I had to say. No, his face looked more trustworthy to convince his friend. That old goat had nothing to say but nonsense. Besides, what kind of cooperation could he have with a goat who was as stingy as an elephant? Had he ever given him any materials? The connection was cut off as soon as the statue was smashed, but Sekerit X just sat in the room and laughed to himself, as if there was no light to guide him. It wasn't until his subordinates came in to report that it was time for him to go that Sekerit X lifted the curtain and stepped outside. The scene of the thousand-legged disaster that had not been seen in 20 years would not be complete without the old goat's face. Hello, dear viewers. I am currently in Manila, Philippines, where the red-level thousand-legged disaster is about to attack. This is the same type of disaster that was wiped out by the hero Lizon 20 years ago. Now, on the coast of Manila, Philippines, a similar creature will appear. Many powerful saint guildmasters have gathered here to deal with the disaster. Standing out next to the Leo Star Spirit are the Vice Guildmaster Chion Roja and the Guildmaster Oliver. To increase their strength, the Pisces magic users have gathered in full force. Next are the masters responsible for defense on the front lines, the Taurus Star Spirit. Behind them are the saintesses from Aquarius, who specialize in dealing with damage by melting. Even the market star spirit, who is responsible for crafting and enhancing the weapons needed for the battle, has joined the fight. It should be emphasized that the market zodiac star spirit is in direct command. The cameraman zooms in on the Jet X car, which Leon openly disapproves of. The demon aristocrat appears as if he were real. He suddenly raises his hand high, and the wind brings him a hammer with a green light and the symbol of the Ophiuchus star spirit on its face. But surprisingly, the reporter says that it is the artifact, the market zodiac star spirit, the reality granting hammer. Even Taxu asks, Hey, isn't that your thing? Zion, how could he not know? The two tiny humans stared at each other, their confusion evident. They continued to watch the market saint reinforce his troops with his sacred hammer just before the battle began. Zion roared, you sons of bitches are messing with the wrong guy, that's my stuff. The female reporter, who was holding up the X on the screen, raised her reality hammer high and accepted the cheers of the crowd. Zion continued to curse, that damn goat should have his neck snapped before he dares to call himself a virgin. Carrying his goat like fruit, he ran off to find it, while it was still hot. I've been putting up with you for too long. But the reporter's voice managed to stop him when it hit, something rising from the bottom of the sea, pushing the water up slowly. At this point, the sky began to storm, and the water that had just flowed down left behind a monster that looked like an octopus but was much more terrifying, with many eyes and tentacles. Its body was incredibly large, and each wave could cause the water to fluctuate violently. The reporter exclaimed, the thousand-legged disaster, the thousand-legged disaster, everyone. She was not fighting, so she cheered as if it were New Year's Day, but everyone else present felt a mixture of fear and awe. Underneath the giant tentacles that were raised high above the water were countless sharp, small legs. This half-octopus, half-centipede creature was red-level, 
powerful enough to wreak havoc on an entire region. Just as they were about to rush into battle, their vision was blocked by something that was being tightly wrapped by the tentacles. It was gasping for air while its entire body was being constricted. Pointing at the figure in disbelief, they couldn't believe that Stephen Marker, the saint of the Leo constellation, was struggling to pull a giant bone out of the thousand-legged disaster's constricting tentacles. In the eyes of the soldiers, this tug of war was Stephen bravely fighting the disaster with a giant bone. A billion dollars for a giant bone, and it's going to be lost to this monster. What a waste, sir. Only the members of the Leo Star Spirit were panicking uncontrollably. They couldn't believe that their saint was still crazy about that stupid bone. Tredek's car had arrived behind Oliver at some point, causing him to stop calling out to the Star Spirit in surprise. The old goat's face clearly showed no good intentions. He opened his mouth to provoke his uncle, as if he were lying because he had seen both the Star Spirit and the disaster. Why don't I take command of the main force? But Oliver was well aware of his desire to command the Leo forces. He regained his composure and prepared to give his orders immediately, so that the old goat wouldn't steal his thunder. First, he ordered all of the Leo Star Spirit's disciples to drink the physical enhancement potions provided by the Market Star Spirit. Next, he ordered the Gemini Star Spirit to use their magic on the ocean so that the disciples could fight as comfortably as they would on land. The Libra Star Spirit was tasked with enhancing physical strength, mobility, and defense. Finally, the Pisces Star Spirit was tasked with setting up a defensive line, in case of an emergency and dealing with any disasters that appeared on the shore. After distributing the tasks to the various legions, the Leo Star Spirit Guild Master Oliver jumped down to join the battle. The Leo Star Spirit Army, as if stimulated by the potion, immediately became as wild and frenzied as lions in the jungle. Oliver roared, ordering them to begin their assault immediately, and was followed by hundreds of Leo Star Spirit members who charged towards the monster. Surfing on the water like a wave, Oliver ordered them to use their bestialization skill immediately. A golden light flashed and enveloped the entire group, and the skin of the Leo army changed. To be more precise, they had actually transformed into dark-colored beasts with thick fur and sharp claws. At the forefront, Zohar shouted to announce the arrival of the second wave. All of the Aquarius disciples silently unleashed their full magic power. They gradually flew up and gathered in the sky, forming a giant ball of magic power, in the shape of a lion with five four-pointed stars, which was truly majestic. The night beast charged towards the thousand-legged monster like a real beast, opening its wide, fanged mouth and biting down hard on it. The two of them seemed to be stuck in a stalemate, neither of them able to move. The Saint Guild Master Oliver roared that it was time, and all of the Leo. Star Spirit Disciples charged forward in the form of various powerful beasts. They released their magic power and brandished their weapons with great intensity, intent on destroying the octopus immediately. In terms of numbers and ferocity, they were certainly superior, even though they were not as large in size. The beastmen jumped onto the monster and clung to it everywhere, from head to toe, attacking and stabbing it, causing it to thrash around in pain. Stephen held onto the giant bone tightly, and was shaken so hard that his brain felt like it was going to come loose. He couldn't help but yell that. These idiots wouldn't leave him alone until he had freed his giant bone. He was already struggling to attack, and now they wouldn't let him rest. Oliver ignored the fact that Stephen was a star spirit and yelled back at him to calm down and help Depali. The Leo Saint naturally refused, and the two of them argued back and forth, completely ignoring the battle situation. The Aquarius Saintess watched from afar as the Leo Star Spirit became like a headless snake. She was afraid that there would be very few survivors returning from this mission. Zohar's feet were planted on the ground, but her words reached the Saintess's ears first. She agreed that the two men were idiots. She had originally not wanted to intervene to save Stephen. But seeing this, she could no longer sit still. She finished speaking and lowered herself into a running stance. She didn't need to use any saintess enhancement. Her eyes lit up and she shot forward at incredible speed. She aimed straight for the Zodiac Master who was being shaken around like crazy. Stephen quickly realized that something was wrong. Zohar's sword flashed past, severing the giant bone and the ferocious tentacle, dropping both it and the wretched Zodiac Master into the sea. Stephen had gone mad from the shaking, but he quickly regained his senses. Zohar's sword had cut through the giant bone and the ferocious tentacle, dropping both it and the wretched Zodiac Master into the sea. Mission accomplished. 
the indifferent girl looked down at Stephen and the cracked staff that had fallen into the sea with a thud. He had just stubbornly raised his head and spat out a mouthful of water when Zohar's foot mercilessly stomped down on his face. The soldiers were all stunned. The entire legion of a hundred people had fought together and could only manage to scratch an itch, but Vice Commander Zohar had jumped out to sea in a single step and cut off the tentacle of the thousand-legged disaster. Zohar stood there defiantly, observing the situation with calm eyes. Only Stephen was yelling at her to get off his face. Her saint had been saved, and the Leo Star Spirit Army had nothing to worry about anymore. Their morale soared as they rushed to deal with the disasters. The other legions also charged forward like wildfire, not wanting to let the Leo Star Spirit take all the credit for destroying the monster. Some used physical force, while others used magic power to target its weak points and attack. The storm waves grew larger and larger, and the sea was rough due to the movements of the giant disaster. But everyone could see that it was gradually slowing down so they shouted to each other to press on. Suddenly, several pairs of red eyes with tiny pupils lit up in the deep sea. The seawater covering the disaster suddenly receded by more than half, and, within seconds, it surged up tens of meters and poured towards the shore. The Pisces Legion joined forces to erect a barrier of steel walls to block the flood. It worked for the time being, but inside there was panic and chaos. No one understood why there was a tsunami at this time. The light above their heads suddenly dimmed, and when they looked up, they saw many giant tentacles with sharp weapons falling down on them before they could react. Even though he was busy as hell, Oliver still had to look back and exclaim, Oh my god, there's another thousand-legged disaster. It was still a red-level disaster, but this monster was terrifyingly large and had ten thousand legs. Its shadow fell over the beach, threatening to cover the entire sky, and bringing terror to all the legions present. Standing in front of his command tent, Tredex shouted again as if something exciting was happening. If we could eat a thousand-legged disaster, then we might as well become humans when it comes to a ten thousand-legged one. After saying this softly, he opened the lid of something with a knob in the middle. Someone behind him asked what he was holding, and Tredex reflexively replied that it was the detonation device for the rat missile that was being installed near the shore. Wait a minute, who dared to ask such a stupid question? The old goat turned around and asked, who is it? A harpoon shot out from somewhere and pierced Tread X's hand, shattering the detonation device. Before he could figure out what was going on, Limer rushed forward and swallowed him whole, as if he were eating something delicious. Following the first harpoon was a purplish-pink vortex. It was unclear what it was, but Lizion's disdainful voice could be heard praising Tread X's maggot pumping skills. Don't you think it's a bit too much when your comrades are out at sea, fighting hard against the disasters, and you're trying to blow them all up with bombs? On the other side of the time-space gate was still Hugo's home. Lizon, alone, wearing a hat and carrying a sword, appeared like a gangster demanding that Tread X repent. Planting the tip of his sword in the ground, he smirked at Tread X and said that this would be a makeup lesson after 20 years of teaching the proper method of making octopus sashimi. On the sea, the waves and whirlpools were raging. At this moment, Zohar was fighting hard against the disaster to reduce the burden on her comrades. She had been invited to face the thousand-legged disaster, but most of them were already exhausted, so she thought she would deal with the lower-level ones, and the most important thing was to deal with the strongest one first. With that in mind, Zohar activated her divine speed skill and dashed straight towards the monster. In her mind, she recalled the hundreds of times she had watched and re-watched the video of Lizion's attack on the thousand-legged disaster in the past. Back then, because so many people were jealous of Lizion's strength, they stood by and watched as he fought the monster alone. It was also thanks to this that Zohar now had some knowledge of how to attack it alone. This monster often used its small tentacles to stab its prey, so Lizon used his altar speed to rush straight into the center before the sharp ones could stab him. Today, Zohar imitated her uncle's path, sticking close to the water's surface and gliding along at high speed, avoiding all of the tentacle stabs. The way Lizon had done it that year was deeply ingrained in the young girl's mind. Her uncle had decisively leapt up and cut off all the tentacles in a single move. So Zohar swung her spear in a circle so fast that it emitted a red light. She gathered her strength and launched her weapon at the thousand-legged monster, using the meteor swarm technique to compensate for her speed. She succeeded in cutting the disaster's tentacles into hundreds of pieces that fell into the sea, landing directly on a large tentacle that was closer to the main body to avoid the debris. Falling from them, Zohar wanted to approach the disaster's body, so she stomped her foot down right in front of the monster's wide open eyes. Concentrating fully, 
Zohar gathered all the strength she could into her spear while in midair, confidently performing the exact same posture and technique as her scarred uncle had all those years ago. The spear shot out, carrying all of the young girl's strength, emitting light like a small sun above the monster's head. However, Zohar immediately realized that a small tentacle with a faster speed had wrapped itself around the spear with ease before it even had a chance to make contact with the monster. Tightening its grip on the weapon it had just caught, its eyes flashed with malice as it slammed the large tentacle into the head of the young girl who was trying to assassinate it. Zohar was unable to dodge in time, but that muscular arm managed to wrap itself around her neck and push her back instantly. Stephen threw himself forward and used his back to shield the young girl, taking the full force of the blow, causing both of them to grit their teeth in pain. They were both thrown dozens of meters away, and Zohar's vision was becoming increasingly blurry, making it difficult to resist. Seeing the two of them get knocked away, the soldiers struggled to swim and fight the tentacles, shouting, in confusion. The saint and the vice captain, their only hope, had been blown away like that. Oliver was also struggling to hold on. Zohar's gaze towards the human race gradually faded. Even a few small monsters could easily crush them. She wondered if her brother Zeon was here. He would fly into the air with his greatsword, right? In her days, she thought so, but when she saw a figure that looked like her brother, soaring up like that, Roha shouted and asked if it was him. With so many eyes, the monster's gaze easily caught sight of Lizon, rushing towards it, so it pushed a small monster out to block his path. Unexpectedly, Lizon did not slow down. With a swing of his sword, he happily cut the octopus in half. After stabbing it in the head, he smiled as if he had pierced through Mount Tai without any difficulty. The arm that had launched his sword pierced through the monster's head, creating a large hole. It swirled through the water and shot towards the shore, to the horror of both the monsters and the humans. Because the power he left behind was truly terrifying. The smoke that rose up and remained was only a small effect of the sword that had been planted on the shore, making a crackling sound that had not yet stopped. Lizon had just landed on a piece of tentacle belonging to the monster that he had just killed. Cha asked him why he had shown up here. Why are you so surprised? You're only seeing one octopus. You guys were making such a fuss, so I came to give you a demonstration. That arrogant look made the soldiers point at him and argue that there were a hundred people here who were capable of handling that thousand-legged monster, so he shouldn't act so superior. Ah, that foul mouth of his stopped cursing when he was suddenly grabbed by a tentacle and lifted up. He looked back and realized that it was the 10,000-legged monster that was lifting him up. On the other tentacle, there was something red that looked very familiar. As soon as he realized that it was his family's unique spear, both he and the spear were stuffed into the monster's mouth full of jagged fangs and swallowed. Oh my god, he screamed to the heavens, and that was when the soldiers stopped cursing at Lizon. They had been cursing him out of love, but now the only person who could possibly capture this monster had been taken by it. What could they do? The 10,000-legged monster thought that this time it would be able to digest the delicious package of human flesh. Unexpectedly, a familiar blue energy shot up from its stomach, startling it. The blue light that flashed like thunder was the lotus skill of the monster, striking the monster's head directly. It charged forward like a pig that had been stabbed. But what surprised the Legion even more was that the monster's lotus skill, which was originally the ultimate skill of Vice Captain Du Ha, was not red but a magical blue. The spear pierced through the monster's skin and absorbed its power, more and more. Then, it pierced through the monster's body and emerged. It was Lizon who grabbed it tightly and shouted, holy shit. The monster let out a few soft cries and its whole body shook as if it were giving birth. The monsters with legs nearby also started twitching. The entire sea was filled with monsters twitching and going crazy, following the rhythm of Lizion's spinning spear. After spinning to his heart's content, he plunged the spear straight into the monster's head, using the baptism of fire skill, officially setting off fireworks from its head to its butt, making it feel all warm and fuzzy. The full range of effects, from light to sound, made the audience stare wide-eyed and open-mouthed, unable to speak. They watched as Lizon delivered the final blow, sending everything flying up into the air before it came crashing down like rain. He laughed again. It had been a long time since he had had such a satisfying fight. He smiled with satisfaction as he looked at his work of art, 
a barrel with a perfectly round hole. Whether it was a thousand-legged or ten thousand-legged monster, in Lysion's eyes, it was nothing more than an octopus. Standing in the rain of seawater and octopus flesh, he arrogantly waited to see if the remaining monsters knew how to retreat on their own. He was ready to force feed the stubborn ones. From above, one could see that the body of the ten thousand-legged monster had been cut into pieces. It was floating dead on the waves. The atmosphere suddenly became calm. It was unbelievable that he had single-handedly destroyed the monster. Lysion's reputation was truly well-deserved. The window of the broadcasting station showed him that those who had never met him before were now expressing their amazement and respect for Lysion. Even the guys who had been cursing him earlier had fallen silent. The female reporter's trembling hand held the microphone as she explained to the audience. She said that this was the man who had been talked about for so long. The heroic Lysan had just returned and had immediately defeated the 10,000-legged monster. In the crowded places, the people who had been waiting anxiously for news broke out in cheers. The return of the hero Lysan had ignited a great flame of hope. In no time at all, this event became a legend that was passed down, giving birth to the holy scripture of the serpent constellation, which was revered by all. It recorded the entire history of this constellation, enough to make the other zodiac signs panic. This was completely new to Lysan. He flipped through the pages of the book in his hand, looking at it and realizing that his power would increase if more believers read it. Zohar's voice happily shouted, Uncle. From the shore, that little girl looked so happy and excited. He took a step and appeared in front of the little girl to ask her about it. Oh, wait, what's that white thing? I know it's my giant spear, but Lysan still asked, and the little girl kept changing the subject. Hesitantly, Lysan opened his hand and showed the little girl the broken shaft. Well, let me make you a new weapon. Zohar's eyes lit up when she heard that her uncle was going to make her a weapon. But the loudest cheers came from that guy Stephen, as if it were being made for him. The atmosphere suddenly became awkward. Who had said anything about making a weapon for that lion guy? In addition to being generous, Stephen was also shameless. He pointed at Zohar and said, this little girl is my close subordinate. Waving his hand at himself, Stephen emphasized the important point, if you make a weapon for her, that means I can use it, right? No wonder I'm so happy. Hearing the words 20 years ago, you were also the creator who created sacred objects for the zodiacs was enough. Then he continued to ramble on, conveniently coming to the giant. Lysan was getting increasingly irritated. When Stephen laughed and said he would let Zohar go for stealing the giant, he couldn't take it anymore and pointed at Zohar's face and cursed her. Before he could finish his sentence, a loud bang erupted somewhere, and a cloud of smoke in the shape of an old goat appeared from nowhere. Stephen asked in shock, does this guy have the ability to create explosions with just a shout? Not knowing what it was and asking useless questions, Lysan cursed again. Who made that thing? He doesn't know. The smoke covered everything in a thick fog, blowing directly into the crowd at the front lines and then quickly spreading into the interior with the wind. Confused, they didn't know whether to run or what to do. The Golden Fish Legion suddenly realized that the growling sound was coming from the beastman of the lion team who had been fighting alongside them just now. Now, he was no different from a ferocious beast waiting for its prey. Anyone who stood nearby was attacked with a blow that hurt like hell. No one could understand why the entire army of the Leo Zodiac were now screaming and going crazy, turning around to fight the people from the other legions. Zohar stood at a distance and watched the two sides fight each other in chaos. In addition to the explosion that had just happened, the reason for which was still unknown, she heard an explanation behind her about the rat bomb explosion that she had caused. She clicked her tongue in regret that the explosion she had created was not big enough to make all three of them turn around. She saw something slam into the ground with a thud. Stephen, like a girl taking a bath who had been spied on, groaned, who is it? Who are you? That trap X guy in his huge armor, as if he had stepped out of a Transformers movie, came stomping over. In his left hand, he carried the first bomb. Lime had long since fainted, causing that stinky mouth Zeon to curse loudly. If it was Trap X, Stephen had to ask him why he had to set off the rat bomb. His subordinates were still fighting on that side, you idiot. Trap X looked down at the three of them from above and snorted. That's just the opening act, my friends. Zeon waved his hand dismissively and said casually, those crazy lion knights are your doing, aren't they? You're right, but you're still talking to me. You're just provoking this old man and then laughing with delight. He brought something like a small whistle to his hand, expecting it to make a pew pew sound. But no, it squealed like two pots clanging together. The sound reached the smoke and caused the Lion Legion to become confused. They seemed to hear the sound of their own kind and turned their heads to look. Temporarily abandoning their succulent Taurus prey, the entire group charged back towards the shore. 
The Westerners, carrying the battle hammers prepared to meet the beastmen in battle, passing by the zodiac stars like a gust of wind. Whoever was in command didn't care. Several of them crushed Zohar, making the little girl fall flat on her face. The rest jumped at Zeon and knocked him over backwards. Having just gotten rid of the little brat, Zeon was extremely exhausted after his fight with the calamity. Z Tread could not help but laugh with glee when he saw the beastmen pressing Zeon's face into the sand. The two on either side were crushed, leaving only Steven, standing and not understanding why he was not being attacked. That's why he opened his mouth and cursed. What the hell is that dog doing to my followers? That they're not listening to anything? It's because they drank the elixir I gave them. A little bit of chemical reaction based on the smoke they inhaled and the drug, and that's it. Now they don't listen to anyone but my whistle. Hearing the old goat's plan, Stephen cursed no less than the fishwives. It was not until Z Tread Jr. threw the Afiyuka sword down onto the ground that he fell silent and looked at Zeon's hundred weapons. Like many others, Z Tread Jr. also believed that the STVN marker could not resist the allure of the 13th Saint's weapon. The old man wanted it to be simple. Take it, and kill Lizon, and it would be yours. Stephen was not so easy to order around. He folded his arms and asked Marker why he should listen to him and kill that guy for no reason. Z Tread Jr. raised his huge robot foot and wagged it provocatively in front of the Lion Saint, sarcastically asking if he didn't feel sorry for his followers. But that's okay. Z Tread Jr.'s smile widened on his lips as he said he understood what they had in common. Stephen's eyes widened as if he had been told he was heartless. I know. We're both made more confident by Lizion's existence. Ignoring Stephen's protest, Marker calmly said that was not why he was so interested in Lizion's weapon. That was the clearest evidence that he was doing it to overcome his own insecurities. In your eyes, Lizion's strength is like a tall city wall that you can never climb over. But to me, that guy has superior manufacturing skills. And he always produces cooler stuff. But let's get to the point, that guy is like a tall and sturdy wall that cannot be overcome. No matter how high Steven climbs, he will never reach it. That's why Z Trap X wants to talk some sense into Steven and kill Zeon together. Then we won't have to breathe down his neck like that guy. I will build you the ultimate weapon, one that is second to none in the world. Z Trap X wasted no time, constantly influencing Steven's mind, trying to get him to join forces to defeat Lizon. Once he is killed, you will become the supreme Zodiac star. So take that sword and finish off Lizon, O oh Lion. Steven suddenly pulled out the sword that was still attached to the tip of the spear, and heard Rohar, the wise general, say, Oh my dear boy, it's just sweet talk. Don't trust him. Steven did not reply, but only glanced at Warian, who was looking down at the ground, making the little girl even more terrified and screaming hysterically. Unable to stop him, he had to resort to pleading and threatening, saying that if he dared to touch Lord Zeon, he would not let him off. The large, bare foot stepped in front of Lizon, and Steven raised the Afiyuka's sword as if to stab him, which made Z Trap X very excited. He stood behind him and shouted, go to hell. But with a bang, the tip of the sword plunged straight into the robot's belly, pushing it backwards, to Rohar's astonishment. Marker also did not understand what was wrong with this lion, who had once again passed up such a golden opportunity. Shut the hell up, Steven growled, do you think I would listen to the one who turned my spell into this? I've been training hard to surpass Lizon, where would I have time to be self-deprecating? Flicking his middle finger at Marker, Steven concluded, I have no intention of killing Lizon to take his place like you always wanted. Well, well, Lizon had to look at this guy with different eyes now. Suddenly hearing the arrogant words I'm stronger than Lizon now. He felt a little relieved and didn't bother to argue. Steven ran towards Z Trap X like a hairy ape, but his mouth did not stop moving. You said you would make me a super cool weapon? Right. From the start, you weren't even thinking about surpassing Lizon, so what are you comparing yourself to? Z Trap X's face fell, seeing the obvious lie. This guy was too arrogant. He had to show him what his gun-filled hand was all about. When words failed, it was time for violence. Steven threw a straight punch, and the robot's heavy gun arm exploded like a large flower. Before Z Trap X could figure out what was going on, the lion had already jumped out from behind him, intending to strike again. The old goat was both scared and angry, and roared, don't even think about it, and then activated all the functions on his body, pulling his body back to avoid the attack. Planting his feet firmly on the ground, he jumped up and fired a barrage of heavy missiles at the spot where Steven had just been standing. The place shook with a huge shockwave, accompanied by heavy light effects. The old goat laughed with glee, expecting the famous lion, Zodiac to die before this attack. But no, 
Stephen had transformed into a muscular beast, his mouth clamped around a missile, and his claws emerged from the thick smoke. His strong teeth bit down on the missile, crushing it. Stephen secretly recalled 20 years ago, it was true that he had been as self-deprecating as the old man said. But after persevering for many years, even though he had stumbled, he had picked himself up, challenging his limits. Stephen had found his own way to surpass Lizon. He crouched down, mustering the strength of a real lion, and activated the thunderstorm skill, slashing the space in front of him. The entire area lit up as the thunderstorm passed, cutting the robot. Z tread X into several pieces, but it was not enough to satisfy Steven. He stomped hard on the chest of the armor, exclaiming, this thing is pretty tough. But a leaf in Steven's hand was different. He grabbed it, pulled it out, and threw it up into the air. After tearing it apart, he opened his mouth and cursed again. Even a treasure for fighting. Like buying things did not use protective gear, but this old man was hiding in armor. Get the hell out of here. On Z Tread X's side, there was a brief shout of awe, and on Steven's side, there was a loud oh. Suddenly, Li Zion's bored face appeared, and he asked, What are you guys doing? How long are you going to fight? The other two turned to look at him, then asked with wide eyes, Allo, how did you get out so easily? Well, you guys made me lose my patience, otherwise the humans are so weak. Look at Zohar, he also found his way out. Come on, stop making noise, it's my turn to perform. Zeon kicked Steven away with ease, smiled his signature smile, and looked down at Z Tread X as if he were talking to an acquaintance. That look sent chills down his spine. If this guy knew how to talk properly, no one would be afraid of him. Twenty years ago, Z Tread X sat in front of a smiling man, listening to the prophecy that Li Zeon would die in the Demon Tower. At that time, Market Doja did not understand. Everyone had heard that prophecy, but what the man had called him for was not to gossip, but to carry out that plan the plan that made him use himself. Lost in old memories, Z Tread X said that since then he had planned to kill Li Zion, but he did not care about such past events. Furious, he shouted, Tone Hai Fong has no mercy. I'm just asking you who killed me, understand? I understand, but I have to tell you the whole story so that Z Tread X can claim his important right, and he will tell who it is, on the condition that Li Zion guarantees his safety. He stuck his thumb in Market's mouth, causing him to cry out in pain. By the way, he pulled the old man's face close to his own, so that he could understand the situation better, since when did he think that Li Zion was here to negotiate? Losing patience, he repeated, spit out the name, no more nonsense or I'll pull out your tongue. The painfully squeezed mouth managed to get out a few words, the female historian waits for the essence of the spirit. Li Zion frowned unhappily. The day before, the Gemini demon had also mentioned the female historian. Was it really the essence of the female historian that had done this, and was the azure cloud sword that had stabbed him in the demon waterfall still there? Li Zion remembered that he needed to go back to Jin Ming's appraisal shop to see what the results were before he could conclude. So he didn't pursue the matter any further, but instead asked for the hammer, his authentic gift. As soon as he saw the unwilling look on Zarian's face, he roared, What do you mean? You don't want to give it back? Making him terrified. Who would dare not give it back? Finally, Zeon was holding the hammer he had longed for for years. He knew that Z trap. X was extremely angry because he had been robbed of several hammers, but Zeon didn't care. He summoned three gods and handed this old fool over to them. He also kindly instructed them, if he resists, just break off a leg or an arm, one or two will do. Not caring much about the punishment, as soon as he saw the three gods, Z trap X roared. How could you summon the guardian gods? Being sucked into the teleportation portal, Market's bitter voice still echoed, you are not the essence of the zodiac, but he didn't care what people said about him at all. Now let this old goat go ahead and question his conscience, behind him. The group of beastmen, no longer under control, got up and rubbed their aching heads. The surrounding beach was full of traces of a chaotic battle, but no one explained it. They whispered to each other, to the delight of Stephen and Zohar, and to the worry of the other armies. You awake yet? Don't go crazy anymore, I'm scared. The market crowd was in an uproar, the Star Lord was taken away. Right before our eyes, what should we do? What should we do? What else could we do? The commander pulled out his head, pressed the activation button, gritted his teeth and said, let's do it to the end, my men. The armor of the other legions suddenly lit up before the eyes of horror, and they fell down with a bang. 
looking like a cluster of grenades. The commander was tall and thin, just like his market master. You've got a lot of nerve, using my zodiacal essences stuff? Prepare a grave to go back to your dust. Don't let them say, sensational headline. The other guy glared at his subordinates. The Bayoka guinea pigs targeted the one who had taken their star lord away. Li Zian looked at the toy that was flying towards him and asked, why do these three little brats also name this guinea pig? It's so tiring to listen to. As soon as he held the hammer in his hand, the status window popped up continuously, saying that the authentic hammer could transform the target. With a smile on his face, Zeon immediately identified the guinea pig bomb and knocked it away with a hammer. The guinea pig bomb exploded into a cloud of fireworks, flying up into the sky. Damn, is this guy crazy, turning this kind of high-quality bomb into fireworks for fun? But that's not all. The huge beastman's foot stomped down on the ground, and Steven and his herd of powerful beasts roared and went mad. Let's see who's stronger, the market guys who play dirty with the beasts. Just as he was about to say something elegant, they ran away, so fast that no one dared to stop Steven from beating them to a pulp. So the big guy turned to Ryan and asked him to find him a big, sturdy toy that would fit his hand and make it easy to punch the cowards to death. Just as he was about to refuse, his eyes caught sight of Steven, and he realized that Steven was also big and strong and would fit his hand well and be easy to throw. He smiled a partly credible, partly sinister smile at Stephen, who felt something was wrong but couldn't tell what it was. His entire muscular body was jerked away, and a mighty scream echoed through the sky as Ryan sent Stephen flying. Two circles in the air before slamming him hard into the ground, rolling him right up to the feet of the ghouls who were huddled together and running. A powerful throw sent the crowd flying, but the owner of the throw didn't know what to say, why didn't he go bowling? He grabbed the god's ankle again and asked with a smile, what do you think, kid? His eyes met a dirty, muddy foot pointed straight at his face, and Ryan suddenly felt disgusted. He stared at the powerful leg as if assessing it, then decided to let go and leave him alone. The outskirts of the western defense zone of the European Union, which is part of the red zone, have been invaded by a disaster. The cityscape looked desolate, the tentacles of the disaster wrapped around the tall buildings like tree roots, full of garbage in the middle of the ruins. The air was filled with an extreme stench, and the red fog permeated the space, bringing with it a gruesome sense of death. Following Zen, the captain of the Virgo Constellation search team were members of the same mission to search for missing persons in the temporary settlement on the outskirts. As soon as they gathered, some members began to talk about the news that Lysian had defeated the octopus disaster in the Philippines. Mainly, praising Lysian as extraordinary, while those who had officially participated in the investigation to the end had not accomplished much. Plus the big fight between the lion and Marked, both of whom looked like losers to the name of the 13th saint. Zen turned around unhappily, wondering if they were on a mission or just chatting. The group immediately stood up straight behind him and took orders, beginning to track down the missing persons in the area in order to quickly give them out. The red fog came suddenly, along with a cry for help from afar, making the group feel nauseous. Zen looked towards the direction of the sound, and from the darkness where the fog was spreading rapidly, he led the team of six straight ahead. As they went deeper, the cries for help became more frequent, but after running for a while, Zen began to realize that something was wrong. All those screams were coming from the same area in the city center. It felt like a machine repeating itself, or rather like a tape recording. He slammed on the brakes and turned around to order everyone to stop, but by now everyone behind him had disappeared without a trace, leaving only a gloomy space filled with menacing tentacles. Hiding in the sound of Zen's desperate calls for his comrades, the tentacles now began to move everywhere, moving from the tops of buildings and from the streets towards Zen. Standing there in confusion, suddenly behind him came a cry for help identical to the one that had led him to here. Zen turned his head to look, his eyes filled with horror as he realized that it was not a human voice crying for help. It became more and more bizarre, accompanied by the giggling of terrifying faces. Zen's throat was wrapped tightly, and then his whole body sank into the mass of tentacles, and he and his entire team were swallowed up by the belly of the disaster-level monster that had been missing for so long. At the Sagittarius Constellation Sanctuary, there was still a crack in the roof that had not been patched up. Lysian was sitting with his feet up on the table, reading the newspapers full of his recent exploits. As soon as he heard his name mentioned on TV, 
he glanced over to watch, still nothing, other than the salvage of the disaster in the Philippine Sea. Listening to the praise of himself over and over again, he turned back to his Bible. Because he was tired of killing only some colored octopus for days, he had no intention of holding a meeting like the other zodiacs, but basically through this Bible, would make what Lysian did a hot topic for people to talk about. He had seen enough, now it was time to get to work on the backlog. As soon as he closed the hymn book, the system displayed a new message. Bored with two options, test 6 and upgrade skill 1. His current strength was more than enough. Lysian casually reached into the test 6 box to see what would happen. A long, serrated table with the title The Awakening of Orpheus appeared before his eyes, informing him that the three trials would begin when Safuchi reached level 10. The rewards included Orpheus' unique nemesis, increased physical abilities and awakening skills, plus Orpheus' relics as a gift. The total time to complete was 10 days, and failure would result in punishment. While Lysian was pondering, the system had already begun. To detail the three trials he needed to do, the first was a test of strength, requiring Lysian to destroy a demon on the condition that he could not use his war god instinct. Although he was a little disappointed that he could not use his ultimate skill, on second thought, as long as he did not confront a god or disaster level head-on, it would be fine. The real problem that caught his attention was the requirements of the two remaining trials. The intelligence test required Lysian to recruit a secretary to record Orpheus' execution orders. The other was to take a human servant as a disciple. Rubbing his feelings, Lysian was more used to fighting mirror hands than working with people. Where could he find a disciple and a secretary? Putting this aside for the moment, he clicked on upgrade skill 1 to see if there was anything good. Before he knew it, a beam of light shot out of his eyes like a projector. Because the skill of divine gaze had increased significantly, Elnorin was holding her neck and brushing her teeth, the sound of Lysian's voice made her stop and look over. This thirteenth zodiac had suddenly appeared and asked her to stop for a moment so that he could look at her. Blue light shone on both objects in front of him, revealing the part of the hundred faiths in different constellations was truly awesome. The kind system reminded Lysian to find a disciple, who had 100% faith in his constellation of Ophiuchus. If not, his strength would decrease, so don't blame Aya. Counting the people who were likely to have 100% faith in him, he found Sung Che, Zoha and their father. Tak Su would definitely be shocked if he heard about being asked to be a disciple. In contrast to Lysian's eagerness, the Sagittarius secretary said that all three of them had gone out early in the morning. He had no choice but to think about it later, intending to find something to do when his phone rang repeatedly. Seeing the name of the caller, his face broke into a sinister smile. Xin Ming really knew how to pick his timing, right? When he needed to talk, he didn't call. The old scene was filled with the sound of screams for help echoing through the space. People were lying around, some trying to help, making everything chaotic. Sung Che's mother tried to comfort her son from the screams outside, the important thing. To remember was to stay in the car until his father came back at noon. Sung Che was just a scared little boy then, tears streaming down his face, his throat tight. As he listened to his mother's instructions that when his father arrived, he would surely give the monster a blow. His mother's smile bloomed on her lips, and she held out her little finger, telling her son to be brave. But she didn't know that a tentacle had already wrapped itself around her neck. A scream of mother that had been silent for ten years came back to life. In that moment, bringing back Sung Che's terror. Opening his eyes, he saw that the outside was full of warm sunshine, but the pain still made him gasp for breath, his trembling hands gripping the armrest of the chair. Zohar put both hands on him to comfort him, pulling his younger brother back to reality with a gentle smile. Haksu looked through the rearview mirror and asked his son, who looked tired, he hadn't slept last night. Zohar knew it was a side effect of the divine punishment, but his younger brother kept saying that it was okay. He still looked lost in his old sadness, plus, the tiredness made him fall silent for a long moment. Suddenly Zohar remembered that he had something to give, so he reached into his bag and took out the birthday present he had prepared in advance. The glittering bracelet was a relic containing the magic power of Gemini that Sung Che had wanted for a long time, and it certainly brought his younger brother Zohar back to a happy state. Smiling kindly, Zohar was glad that his younger brother liked it because every time it was his birthday, Sung Che looked as haggard as if he was addicted to drugs. Hearing the birthday greeting, he smiled with delight, after all, today was also the day to visit his mother, and he had to keep a smile on his face. Haksu drove in silence, 
Listening to the two children talk, the feeling of excitement made his hands grip the steering wheel tightly. A moment later they arrived at the large hospital, in room 808 of the hospital. Chun Ji Hu's voice echoed with the stories of recent events. The whole family were avid fans of Lirio, so. Zohar knew his mother would love to hear stories about her idol. Ji Hu was lying there on the ventilator, motionless, only his hand, which Zohar was holding was still warm enough to know that there was still life there. Hugo hung his head outside the glass door, hiding his sadness. Alone, not wanting his two children to know. The familiar phone rang, he was surprised and unhappy. Stepping out of the hospital grounds, Hugo said that. Today was an important day so there was no work. But he didn't expect Zohar to call him directly, so he had to answer the phone. As soon as he heard the other end of the line saying that he needed to be commissioned to destroy the disaster, Hugo was puzzled, and asked why the female god of war in the east of the alliance didn't call back but called him instead. Sagittarius god of war, I wouldn't call you directly, if it was just a bunch of ordinary hawks. Besides, the female god has already declared that she will not intervene. This information really made it hard for Hugo to believe. Kevin Oza would actually give up a good lead, until he heard that it was a disaster-level eagle that had appeared in Hanshin 10 years ago, and destroyed the entire airport. Hugo realized that the person on the other end was talking about the bloodbath. It had caused a terrible obsession and made his wife a vegetable. For 10 years, and today Hugo heard its name again. In Belgium, a country in the European Union, under the jurisdiction of the female god, it had been raining heavily all day long. Li Zion held the glass, smiling tastelessly but not feeling any better. He took out his phone and asked his nephew Sung Jae if he wanted to be his disciple today. The message jumped three times, and finally Zeon was rejected in Sung Jae's remorse. He couldn't believe that the little guy who idolized him so much would refuse. But then again, there were still many things he didn't know about. The little guy, especially when he asked about Sung Jae's birthday. Secretary Aaron was embarrassed and didn't want to talk about it, which made Zeon wonder if something had happened on Sung Jae's birthday. The voice of the newcomer interrupted Zeon's train of thought. Thought. Jin Myung took off his hat, greeted him politely and sat down opposite him. He opened with a polite sentence that he had to go all the way to the far end. But in fact he had Larry Quinn's magic door, so, traveling across the globe was easier than playing. Glancing out at the scenery in the pouring rain, Zeon told him that this country was under the jurisdiction of the female god, who had been raining heavily all day long. But there were flags and logos everywhere, wasn't it a bit too much? This was nothing new to Myung, he said calmly. That Europe worshipped gods and lived like ghosts. Since the appearance of the gods, the whole of Europe had become a theocracy. Shaking his head in another direction, he could see the protective shield beneath the blue sky. Ming explained that. The people here always believed that they were being protected, so it was understandable that their faith was growing stronger. Is that so? Zeon said, laughing at the faucet. Zeon, Myung, while you use those flowery words to talk about the supreme gods, your own faith is actually waning quite a bit. The divine eye skill focused on Myung, easily seeing that his faith in the goddess had dropped from 92% to 87%, while his faith in his own constellation, the lady, was as high as 99.1%. Moreover, he could also see that the reason for the subjects faith was waning was because he felt betrayed. A fanatic like Xin Zhang had actually decreased, which made Li Jian guess that something very serious had happened. Thinking so, he went straight to the main point, probably. The reason for today's meeting, to talk about faith? Having guessed correctly, Xin Myung didn't hide it and snapped his fingers. A swirling stream of water above his head. The soundproof shield skill borrowed from Pisces could allow the two of them to talk freely without being detected. While Jian was admiring Chop's top-notch skill, the old man, searched through his pockets and placed the dagger he had given him on the table. He focused again when he heard Myung say that he had read the memory left inside the knife. The results showed that the culprit who stabbed Li Jian in the Devil's Falls was the saint of the historian, whom Shin Myung served, Kevin Eura. A few hours before leaving Hugo's house, Jian had instructed Larry Quinn to find out why the little guy Sung still insisted on being an apostle of the Gemini constellation. Last time, because he had lost his faith, he had been tortured by that bitch Fraser, so. There must have been a very big reason for the little guy to stay on this planet. He also asked Larry Quinn to find out more about the secretary's task on the planet before he left. The house was quiet and empty, only the elf queen was playing games, intending to ask her later about the secretary's business and find out about Sung herself. As if by fate, Sung came to Larry Quinn again to ask her for help with something. Inwardly, she wanted to jump for joy, but outwardly she pretended not to care 
playing games with her hands and asking him what was up. The little guy went straight to the point, saying that he needed a path from the Gemini Magic Library to the Secret Library. That was the top floor of the Gemini Magic Library, where many forbidden spells were kept, accessible only to high-ranking apostles. With his previous rank as a grade A apostle, Sung should have been able to enter the library, but that day he had thrown away his planet badge with his own hands. Furthermore, grade A was not high enough to access the secret library, so he had come to Larry Quinn again to ask her for help. With a wave of her hand, the girl opened a portal that immediately revealed the bookshelves of the Gemini library. It was not difficult to help Sung pass through the barrier and enter, but Larry Quinn had to take the opportunity to ask him why. He wanted to enter the secret library, where lost spells and forbidden spells were kept. After a few seconds of hesitation, Sung finally decided to say that he wanted to enter the library. To find the skill soul summoning, which allowed him to summon life from the other world. The man dressed in black sat motionless on a bench in the middle of the city that had been blurred out. His face was tense as he recalled Ming's words, that the records from a few years ago showed that similar daggers were always put up for public auction and were always appraised by his predecessor. Ming thought that his predecessor had sensed the dark energy on the knife and had tried to trace its origin before him. So Ming showed him an old photograph, saying that he thought that the exhibition and auction were nothing more than a way to gradually destroy the knife's trail in a discreet manner. If his predecessor had still been alive, Ming would have asked him, but he had been murdered, suddenly while investigating the origin of the knife, and had been stabbed by it. From his mission, Ming knew that someone had tried to erase the source of dark energy and create an extremely powerful curse. Although the curse was fading with the passing of Mei, it was clear that it had been created to counter the power of beings like Li Jian, strong enough to harm not only the saints, but also the supreme gods? He pondered that conclusion, having tried the insidious crab, Jin Lu, who rarely used curses, and had to dismiss it himself. No matter how many of those he had, he could not have made such supreme divine curses. The dark energy did not come from the gods, and the power of the old church was nothing compared to the energy on that knife. Thinking about the origin that was still a secret, Jian thought that the bastard who had stabbed him could be connected to the dark side of the earth. But that was just personal speculation, and he shrugged in resignation, turning his attention to the trial missions because they were time limited. After that, he would deal with the female person, for whom he had been preparing for a while now. The sound of a train pulling into the station brought Li Jian back to reality, and he looked in wonder as the old-fashioned steam train approached and came to a stop. The boots of the apostles stepped out of the first carriage door, and among the ordinary people, the uniforms of the hunters following the group made them stand out so that everyone turned to look at them. A group of more than a dozen apostles disembarked and lined up to wait for one last person to appear, amidst the excited chatter of the people around them. Li Jian was waiting for that person, and he smiled as soon as he saw him. The entire elite force of the centaurs was now present, and he was waiting for the blonde captain to have a little chat. Under the white and blue veil of the priestess, in the area that had been occupied by the vultures for many years, there was the deafening sound of all kinds of fire bullets being fired at the damn birds. The flames burned fiercely, bringing down several charred carcasses before them, and the group of people cheered as they finished off the rest and went their separate ways. The ground was covered in all kinds of obstacles, especially the roots of some kind of monster, that were clinging to the soldier's legs, which gave Xi'an a topic to start a conversation. He asked him where the priestess Kai Xing was, and why the centaur soldiers were there. The tall man replied that it was at the request of the priestess, as the Kai Xing centaurs always accepted commissions to exterminate vultures with their elite army, like mercenaries. The Star Lord had gone to meet with someone from the government of the European Union to get a more detailed explanation of the situation. Xi'an raised an eyebrow about to ask why they would accept a job without knowing all the details. The commander of the army turned back and told him that Taksu had accepted immediately when he heard the story because the subject was directly related to him. Looking at him seriously, he asked Xeon if he had ever heard of a monster that craved the power of the gods called Blood Mist. Taksu had gone to the European Union government's vulture response headquarters, where he was immediately introduced to Blood Mist, a creature that liked to spread a fog to devour the creatures and souls near it. It has been ten days since it appeared, why haven't you gathered the forces of the holy orders to deal with it, and instead are secretly looking for someone to deal with it privately? In response to Taksu, 
The other person replied that blood mist had been declared destroyed by the diplomatic agency, so how could they publicly announce its appearance? He asked silently if the government held the same view. Even though it had eaten more than 5,000 people, Taksu only received a helpless laugh for dozens of years. The total number of deaths was just a number, nothing more. Taksu wanted to know why the priestess star Lord Kevin Ulla had not shown her face, and he received a fairly reasonable answer. That the priestess had mobilized her forces several times, all of them high-ranking, but all of them had died. Because the blood-red fog caused by blood mist made everyone fall into a state of abnormality and unable to resist. For the Kai Xing priestess, who was focused on close combat, it was really no different from offering herself up to the monster. As an aside, it was a coincidence that Kevin was currently dealing the red level disaster in another area and could not return in time. After examining many Kai Xing horoscopes, they chose Sagittarius, which was famous for its mercenary army so that it would not be affected by issues such as interests or politics. Additionally, everyone knew that Sagittarius was very close to Jien, and after dealing with the 10,000 foot, but, disaster in the Philippine Sea, they persuaded them to invite Taksu to deal with this matter. That friendly smile in his eyes was nothing but a lie, it was all a script that the union had come up with to cover themselves. That arrogant old woman Kevin would rather die than ask other forces to solve the problems of her own holy land. But according to another hypothesis, could it be that the female Kai Sheng was planning to use the blood mist to deal with Jian and himself? Taksu was not happy that they were so blatantly setting a trap like this. However, the hand he had placed on the chair was clenched into a fist making the nearsighted man next to him nervous. When they tried to tell Kevin that they were afraid that Sagittarius and Jien would not play this game, he smiled mockingly and simply emphasized that blood mist was something that Hugo Arthurs would definitely not ignore, because that vulture had harmed his wife. In a distant country, the commander of the Sagittarius force explained the same answer that made Taksu accept this mission. Jien folded his arms and pushed with incomprehension. Who was the wife this guy was talking about? He slowly explained that it was Qian Ji Hu, the wife of the Star Lord and the mother of his two children. The two met after Jien was imprisoned in the Demon Tower, so he had never met his friend's wife. A little girl said that in order to protect the lady and her friend, the first saint of the Sagittarius Kai Xing also died. Jian knew that person, the little boy Li Zagan who had always followed behind him and his friend for the past 20 years. However, Jian himself had not expected the reason why his friend always kept it a secret when talking about his family. He had also never seen the blood mist, and did not know what that monster looked like. But he guessed that its appearance had made Taksu irritable. He was confident that he was the one who understood Taksu's strength the most, because he had personally taught him how to fight. Jian could not believe that his friend could be defeated so easily. In the past, when the two of them were still fighting, Taksu was the only one he allowed to fight back to back with him. In addition to trusting him absolutely, in the past when talking about the 12 Kai Xing horoscopes, Jian could confidently affirm that his friend was the strongest among them. So he asked the children to explain in more detail what had happened to Taksu. Fortunately, they agreed to tell him. If it had been someone else, they probably would not have said anything, because the sad memory from 10 years ago had occurred on Sung Che's seventh birthday. The little red-haired boy was dozing off as he waited for his mother, and he told his father over the phone that he was about to successfully build a weapon to destroy the great disaster. The great sorrows in the eyes of a child were just trivial matters. Only when Jian stroked the head of his son, who had just woken up and come to the airport to greet his mother, did Sung Che show a joyful expression. The Gan had gotten up early to take the young master to meet his wife, and was smiling and rubbing his head comfortably when Sung Che yawned and said he was hungry. Zagan took on the task of buying food for the young master, so Sung Che looked out behind him and saw two strangers trying to lower their voices and whispering. They were blaming each other for letting something out, and then they ran away together to escape death, but Sung Che was too young to understand, and did not tell his mother anything. The airport lights suddenly went out, making Zagan stand up in worry and look around. The entire power system of the large airport had been cut off, and the passengers were in a panic, and Zagan and his mother did not know what to do. The strange buzzing sound and the loss of light made Zagan, who was buying food, rush outside to find the lady and her son. His eyes immediately met the horrifying sight of the monster looking straight at Zagan, and not knowing what was happening, he smiled and asked Zagan if something big had happened. The bag of food he had just bought fell to the floor, and Zagan used all his strength to rush forward, wanting to save the lady and her son 
who had been thrown into the air when the monster broke through the door and lunged at them with its mouth full of teeth. With all his speed, Zagan successfully pushed the lady and her son out of the way. But in return, he fell towards the monster's wide open mouth. Sung Che witnessed with his own eyes the death of his close uncle, and he cried out in his mother's arms but could do nothing. His eyes could only see Domo Zagan and the image of his uncle, who had nothing but a smile on his face before, falling into the mouth full of teeth, becoming one of the most horrifying images of Sung Che's childhood. Zagan covered his son's eyes in pain, and through his tears tried to tell him not to look, but it was too late. The blood looked like a frog that had just been kicked out of a bowl of delicious noodles, and it made a loud, satisfying sound that terrified the passengers and everyone else in the airport. The sight of it swallowing a person officially opened the curtain for a massacre without end, seeing its tentacles wriggling as if it wanted to eat again. The guards shouted to each other to contact their superiors immediately. The lady and her son had just stepped out when they witnessed dozens of people being swept away by the tentacles. The entire space was filled with screams of misery that drowned out the reminder to her son that no matter what happened, he must not let go of her. Zagan hugged Sung Che, gathering all his remaining strength, to try to run out of range of the tentacles. Soon, the entire large airport was filled with a thick layer of dust and smoke, the sound of screams of misery, and motionless bodies from which the souls had been taken. Sung Che's memories from the age of 7 to 17 could never forget. His mother's instructions not to get out of the car until his father arrived. Tears streaming down his face, the young Sung Che could not move, and could only listen silently as his mother told him to wait for his father to come. His mother looked exhausted at that moment, but tears still fell. A second later, Sung Che screamed until his throat was hoarse, but the monster would not let his mother go. Filled with regret, Sung Che just wanted to take his mother home to celebrate his birthday. It had been a long time since the whole family had been together. The little boy cried and cried, and his mumbled apologies soon attracted the tentacles to the car. Suddenly, a golden light flashed from the gloomy sky, blinding everyone. An arrow filled with fire fell to the ground not far from the car, burning the tentacles and then igniting the entire body, and it roared, Sung Che, are you okay? The little boy grabbed onto the life-saving straw and leaned out to look at his father, who was still wearing his home clothes and had no shoes on. While the tentacles had not yet crawled over, the panicked father turned around to ask his son if he was hurt anywhere. Unexpectedly, when he heard the painful word mother come out of his mouth, his body stiffened and he tried to hold onto the bow so that it would not fall. Raising his helpless hand, he leaned against the glass door to comfort his son and his own heart, because even Raeguan had not survived. Ring of fire swirled on the ground where he stood, and any tentacle that reached out was burned away. His eyes blazing with fire, his teeth gritted with anger. The centaur turned and roared, how dare you? He jumped up high and saw the full view of the huge, ugly monster, carrying a giant tree on its back that was full of strange round lumps. Guessing that the people it had killed were all locked up here, he quickly glanced around and, sure enough, found Ji Hu collapsed among them. Rage burned in his heart, but he had to remind himself to stay calm and think of a way. Perhaps his wife was still alive, and as long as he could find a way to save her, there was still hope. Landing on the head of the ugly monster, he aimed straight for the place where Ji Hu was locked up and put all his strength into his bare hands, trying to separate the mass of stupid tree roots that were holding his wife. Flames erupted and enveloped the skin of his hands, which were burning with the desire to save his wife, and spread into the trees, gradually reaching the monster's brain, making it realize that someone was using a different energy on its head. Tentacles appeared again immediately afterwards to harass him. He angrily spat a ball of fire in that direction but suddenly stopped when he saw two faces crying miserably. From those mouths came human voices begging for help. They pressed close to him and whimpered, making him lose his guard for a second. The monster's tentacles could not be ignored. They struck hard at his ribs and wrapped around his arms and legs, laughing with delight. Its disgusting mouth broke into a gloating smile. You, you're the one who received the power of the gods, you're so delicious. It swallowed its saliva greedily and pierced dozens of tentacles into his body, trying to suck out the centaur's energy bit by bit. The pain of having his power drained caused him to scream in agony. Even his son, who witnessed it, could not bear to watch any longer. The little boy was helpless until a golden light appeared in the sky again, shining straight into the head of the shameless monster. The surrounding earth and rocks cracked and flew into the sky. That energy continued to pour down, burning away the tentacles that were holding him, and burning away the giant trees, revealing the balls that were holding the humans inside. Someone hovering above shouted at his son, Hey, centaur, 
what's with this pathetic state? Then a sphere floated up and began to rescue the people trapped in the tree. She had just landed with Stephen Marker and was standing around smoking a cigarette and observing the situation below. He weakly struggled to his feet on the ground, not understanding why these people were here. A woman's high-heeled foot stepped down hard, as if in answer. The saintess Haley looked down at him with a cold expression and asked, are you okay? Then he stood up. I heard there was a very strong monster, so I gathered everyone I could. They volunteered because no one wants that monster to appear in their territory. Standing before the two of them were three saints in battle mode, who wanted to fight quickly and go home to rest. Azen tossed up some dirt and rocks, which gathered into a ball of energy. Rangu used his bitching skills to summon a sharp sword beam, and Stevens. Thunder punches were all unleashed straight at the monster, who sat there unmoving. But the three of them lost their confidence as quickly as the monster swallowed their power. Even he hesitated for a long time after witnessing it himself. Its mouth closed, causing the three saints to retreat hastily, and they asked each other in panic, what the hell is this? Did it just swallow our attacks? And what's more, the wounds on its body were recovering at an alarming rate, as if thanks to the energy. The monster's eyes were bloodshot, and the force of it getting up shattered the ground. Stephen shouted at Hazen to cast a barrier immediately, and just in time, as several tentacles attacked them fiercely, she managed to do so. Hundreds of tentacles shot straight at the saints, accompanied by the monster's furious roar. It didn't care who or what they were, it used its tentacles to raise everything within reach. Hazen's eyes, nose, and mouth were bleeding profusely from overexertion. Her barrier was visibly weakening due to the monster's relentless attacks. She dropped the scales of justice, and at that moment, the skill of the golden rule was cast. A holy zodiac in the form of a saint strained to bear the weight of the two. Scales that appeared directly above the beast's head, temporarily subduing it. The saint who had just appeared asked the three hovering above in an unhappy tone. Gessel Lawrence of the scales, in her half-body form, reminded them not to be flustered by the monster. She was someone who rarely socialized. Why had Hazen called her? She said she didn't know, but she was sure the scales hadn't come here just for a stroll. The vines that had wrapped themselves around the monster struggled, pressing down to the ground and immobilizing it for a while. She turned and told Hyzamai to use his teleportation spell on the monster. Can't you see how it's swallowing our attacks? We can't beat it right now, and it's draining our power like it did to the centaur earlier. Hearing the sound of her vines being torn, Gessel quickly suggested, teleporting the monster underground or into a stream of hot lava. Gemini was still hesitant, saying that it would just reappear later, but Libra didn't care. Taxu shouted to stop it immediately. That monster was devouring human souls. The people were just empty shells. They had to defeat it and bring their souls back. Ezihu, more than anyone, was one of them. The centaur pleaded with everyone to help him defeat it. He was panting but still insisted that he could fight. His wife was waiting to meet their unborn child. He couldn't give up hope. Gessel watched in silence for a moment as if in thought, but within seconds, her red eyes flashed bloodshot, and she tore off a few more vines. She had reached her limit and could hardly hold on any longer, so she urged Heisen to use her teleportation spell immediately. The monster opened its mouth again and roared, preparing to attack again. Heisen had no choice but to use her instant teleportation skill, as Gessel had instructed. Oh, Taksu roared in pain, begging her to stop, hoping that his only hope to save his wife was still there. But Heisen did not withdraw her skill, the energy in her hand flashed bright white, successfully teleporting the monster away. That day, Hugo Arthurs was severely criticized. Only the saints who had sent the scourge to oblivion were praised. They answered the press as part of their daily duties, while the centaur, the intellectual protector of South Korea, was being heavily criticized by the public. Those interviewed openly attacked the centaur, who had not even been able to protect his own family. They labeled him incompetent and unworthy of trust. That day, Hugo Arthurs had to apologize publicly and visit visit the memorial for the victims. He stood in the rain all day, but the public continued to criticize him harshly. The curses and shouts of the victims' families echoed behind him. Their aggressive attitudes as if they wanted to tear him apart, but Hugo did not respond. Stephen cursed and turned off the TV in frustration. It was too unpleasant to watch. Jiang Ki chuckled. I think it's quite interesting to watch. Stephen and Sophie each rebutted the excessive suppression of the centaur. But in Jiang Ki's eyes, it was only natural. The people needed someone to take responsibility. And in his selfish mind, he only hoped that this scandal would grow bigger and bigger so that he could expand his power. Laughter echoed from the stairs as someone holding a glass of spirits sneered. Stephen Markle was all smiles in the photo yesterday, but today his conscience is starting to prick him. Ivan Kruger, the golden fish saint, 
laughed as if it were only natural for the poor centaur to be criticized. He was surprised, his face darkening as he laughed with glee. If that guy was capable enough, why would he need the help of other saints? From behind, it sounded like a correction, but Jiang Lu's words were only more severe. You have. To say it right, that centaur is a piece of trash. Now he's been written off and has lost half his power. The two of them roared with laughter, making Stephen and Sophie irritable. They dragged each other out, unable to listen any longer. After this incident, Hugo would definitely not be okay, and neither of them knew what to do. But more importantly, I thought you'd be happy. You're usually so jealous of Jihu. Why are you reacting so strangely? Pretending to be resentful, Sophie said that she still hated Rihu but didn't want such terrible things to happen to her. So the two of them fell into deep thought. What had just happened was terrible, but there was no turning back. And above all, Stephen knew that no one was more heartbroken than the children, especially Sungchi, who had had to witness his parents fall into this situation. In the heavy rain, the three members of the centaur zodiac walked between the two sides of the reporters waiting to get the latest news. They asked Hugo to share his thoughts, but every question was focused on whether he felt guilty. At the end of the meeting, he walked away, ignoring the microphones pointed at his face. Hugo did not respond to any of the questions, not even the rumor that all the victims had been taken to Heaven's Will Hospital in order to cover up the truth. The centaur leader simply announced that Hugo would explain everything at a press conference, and then the three of them disappeared behind the iron door. Still talking incessantly, Taksu asked where Yeren Leguan was. He had been taken to the hospital, but in the last group. Before the scourge had encountered him, it had vomited up the victims it had not been able to swallow. Hearing Yaren express his regret for saving the captain last, Taksu simply said to remember to transfer him to this hospital because Heaven's Will had lent it to them. He could no longer stand this indifferent attitude. Yaren cried out that he did not need to take all the blame upon himself. He himself had lost his family and fought to the end with the scourge. Why did he keep silent and not tell the world what had happened? He finally received Taksu's answer that there was indeed a way to save the victims of the blood incident. But how would their families react to hearing that their loved ones were not dead, but that their souls had been taken away? Saying that what needed to be done was to capture the blood incident was like making a distant promise. To torture them as well. But he himself had almost lost all his power to the blood incident and there was no other way than to let the saints send it to oblivion. Then he turned away. Of course, no saint would ever achieve the power and soul to reclaim the souls of the victims for their families. Yaren was unwilling to give up and tried to squeeze out more, heartbroken to see the centaur, being hated when he himself had done nothing wrong. When he started to tremble, Taksu said softly that they were right to hate me. It's because I was weak and couldn't protect them. I couldn't keep my promise to protect the country with Jien. Smiling like a dead man, Taksu thanked Yaren for worrying about him, but there was clearly no joy in it. Yaren wanted to say more, but the man's hand was already on her shoulder. The deputy centaur shook his head and told her not to follow Hugo anymore. The saint sent the victims to the hospital instead of holding a funeral, because he believed that they would wake up again at any moment. It's just that there is no other way now, but he has not given up. Because the moment he stops hoping is the moment he gives up on his wife and Captain Ziwan. He quietly came to the door of room 808 and read his wife's name. Taksu's hand was about to open the door, but he stopped when he heard his son's voice calling his mother from inside. The little boy's sobbing apologies seemed to pierce his heart, bowing his head in shame and blaming himself for asking for food in America. If all three of them had left the airport then, surely, his mother and uncle Ziwan would have been fine. The little boy hugged his pillow and said the words if only to himself, then cried, pitifully, his tears and snot flowing non-stop. His son's apologies and cries of mommy pierced Hugo's helpless heart. Finally, he gave in and could no longer contain the pent-up frustration and pain. He was suffering and wept bitterly outside the hospital room. In retrospect, he should have told Sungchi not to blame himself. It wasn't the little boy's fault at all. But as soon as he started to speak, he would cry, so he never opened his mouth. Taksu didn't want Sungchi to see his father's broken face. The Star Lord's tale by the campfire made the mercenaries cry their eyes out, but Jien just sat there with an indifferent face, so he hesitantly asked if he shouldn't have asked about that sad memory. It had been 10 years since it happened, so it didn't matter if he told the story. It was just that Taksu had said he was busy because he had been called back to work, and had to tell the story, 
not to mention that the deputy guild leader was crying as if it were real. In any case, now that the blood incident had returned, it was time to settle old debts. Taksu's eyes were full of determination, as if he had already made a plan in his head. This time, he would definitely destroy it once and for all. He looked at his friend and said confidently that he would do it. Inside the city, the east side was occupied by the scourge, the evil god placed its huge foot on the ground and looked around with its bulging eyes. It sniffed the power of the sun god and the snake god approaching, hugging, the tumor on its head for a long time. The blood incident was ready to wait for them to come and give up their lives. Its roots were everywhere, this time, it came back. Mankind and the city would certainly not be at peace. The centaur's elite force ended their campfire chat, and immediately dispersed to hunt down the scourge. Taksu was drinking a can of soda, and now someone came to call the saint. Here, have some chocolate, it will help you feel better. He had just put the candy in his mouth when someone else came to call. The saint, again offering him food like a fan giving a gift to their idol. In no time at all, Taksu's hands were full of candy and cakes. Did these kids feel sorry for him because of the hardship he had faced in the past, or something? But no matter how he asked, they said no, so he just had to take all the gifts, and leave any he couldn't eat for later. He popped a whole box of chocolates into his mouth at once, and suddenly, he heard Larry Quinn's voice calling his name, echoing in his ears. She was using telepathy to tell him the story of Sung Chi, and by the way reporting that, he had now used his teleportation gate to go to the secret library. Thanks to Larry Quinn's status as the Queen of the Elves, no one had yet discovered that an illegal intruder had entered. Earlier, in order to persuade Larry Quinn to help him, Sung Chi had been forced to reveal that what he wanted to find in the magical library was a skill to summon an existence from another world, called spirit summoning. He had decided to give up on Gemini, but for the time being Sung Chi would still stay in this holy order. Once he had the spirit summoning skill in his hands, he would be allowed to summon entities from other worlds. But more importantly, Sung Chi wanted to summon the human souls of his mother and uncle Ye Gun, who had been lying in bed for 10 years after protecting him, not to mention the innocent people who had lost their souls. That day, Sung Chi wanted to bring them all back. Larry Quinn listened in silence as the little boy explained his reasons for a while, then waved her hand to reopen the teleportation gate directly to the secret library. As soon as he saw the notice that he had successfully entered using Larry Quinn's identity, Sung Chi was overjoyed. Although she didn't ask much, only telling him not to try too hard, in his head, Sung Chi had already decided that he would definitely not waste this opportunity. As soon as he arrived, he reached out and grabbed the magic tome of the world, an sulfur monosulfide class item that required 187,000 contribution points. He currently had just over 157,000 points, so Sung Chi knew he was short on points. So he handed over the bracelet his sister had given him to the Holy Order, in order to exchange it for 30. 000 points, just enough to rent the magic book. As soon as he had successfully rented it, the knowledge of the book in his hand automatically flipped open and poured into his mind without him having to read it. He quickly reached out to read the spirit summoning page in more detail. The section on communicating with the dead, but after absorbing all that, he needed a little time to process the knowledge, and he didn't realize that someone was lurking behind him. The book in his hand was snatched away by a golden light, falling into the hands of someone who had been waiting for an opportunity for a long time. As soon as he saw the Libra boy's face, Sung Chi let out a cry of annoyance. Ion Si Hu smiled slyly, deliberately asking the Apostle who hadn't been seen when the Gemini incident happened why he had come now. With no time to argue, Sung Chi shouted at the bastard to return the book. But Si Hu wasn't a kind and gentle person. He played a trick by copying three different books and pretending to ask which one was the real one. Sung Chi was going crazy. This bastard didn't know what his limits were and kept making him lose his temper. The more pirated copies of the book he produced, the more. He grinned and asked if he was being so reckless because he had Lysian backing him up, but Si Hu certainly wouldn't have been lurking here without having the upper hand. He pulled out a necklace with a Libra scale pendant and declared that his father and uncle were about to be torn to pieces. The forest ranger's flare gun shot a bright beam of light into the night sky, signaling the troops to return. The indifferent soldiers, who had no desire to work in the middle of the night, immediately gathered together to take their leave. Team A reported that they were all present and accounted for. Team B also returned very quickly, only. T 
Team C remained forever silent amidst the tangled roots of the trees. Suddenly, the centaur commander heard the familiar sound of someone calling for help, and then the whole abandoned area was filled with the sound of crying, as if the whole atmosphere had been plunged into gloom. Lysian was not much affected, but he looked at his ranger friend, gritting his teeth, his hands clenched so tightly around his bow that his knuckles were turning white. Looking up again, he saw that the ranger's whole body was ablaze like a torch. He had to gently remind him, my friend, you're using too much power. Keeping a cool head is what's important. Realizing that he was overdoing it, the ranger ruffled his hair and tried to suppress the flames he was emitting. Lysian stood up, stretched, and left the place where he had been sitting, along with the centaur elite force, preparing for whatever was to come. Inside the city walls, which were lined with medals and historical logos, the people suddenly realized that a thin, bony screen had appeared out of nowhere, and the leaves of the trees had turned red as if it were autumn. But they were not in the wind for even a second, as roots burst out of the ground and thrashed and stomped, creating a loud noise that attracted the attention of the rangers. To their surprise, the roots were coming from inside the perimeter, and were also reaching out behind the rangers and Lysian. Then huge clusters of roots shot up at an angle, piercing the ground. They stirred everything up, and then a giant monstrosity jumped out of the ground like a giant frog. Everyone fired in a different direction to avoid its reach. Only Zian kicked up his leg and kicked the creature straight in the face. It was a rather blunt way of saying hello, but that's how he wanted it. Are you the bastard who made my friend and my nephew choke? Of course, the frog didn't answer, so Zian kicked it away again but suddenly he realized that the monster was not going to give up without a fight. It was grinning with the glee of someone who had caught someone else out. Lysian's right leg was wrapped tightly in a tentacle, which was crushing his blood vessels and causing blood to flow freely onto the ground. He didn't feel any pain, but instead asked in a mocking tone, so you're not so cheap after all, are you? Inside the secret library, the blonde boy had just raised his grandmother's relic, and it had flashed with a light that was so bright it made his eyes water. In the reverse image of the sun, he could not see clearly the image of the bloodthirsty monster opening its pink mouth to devour Zian. But the echoes of the past came flooding back to him, leaving him frozen in place like a statue, enduring. The laughter of Si Hung who was convinced that his father and uncle would surely die today. Meanwhile, Li Zian left his leg wrapped up, listening to the monster's rambling, either demanding his power or his energy. Zian smiled as if it were the funniest thing in the world, and the tentacles wrapped around him suddenly burned away. Glancing at his friend who had just fired an arrow from his bow, Zian laughed and said, Hey, look at this monster, it thinks it can eat anything that comes its way. Cracking the leg that had been twisted and deformed by the tentacles, Zian stomped his foot on the ground, activating his super regeneration skill. From his crushed bones to his scorched skin, there were clear signs of healing, only his pants had become nothing more than rags. He reached out and pulled the hammer of creation from his inventory, saying, let's see how many people it takes to hit it, it's not so easy to have a good meal here. Zian pointed at the bloodthirsty monster, growling like a villain about to be defeated. You better watch your stomach, or I'll cut you open and clean you out. Drawing his bow, he leapt high into the air, swinging a hammer that was emitting bolts of energy. The skill that he had equipped to his hand made the hammer grow dozens of times larger, making it the perfect size to smash the bloodthirsty monster's head in. But only its skin was pierced, and under the weight of the hammer, the bloodthirsty monster roared and threw both Zian and the hammer away. An arrow shot out of nowhere and pierced its eye, and then dozens of golden arrows rained down on the monster all at once. It was a support spell that had proved effective, and he immediately waved his hand for his subordinates behind him to prepare to draw their bows once more. The arrows they fired were not the kind created by the centaur skills. Because the bloodthirsty monster was a creature that absorbed the energy of the star gods, the centaur army had brought sacred arrows with them. From their weapon storage, each of them raised their bows, notched three arrows, and released them, sending them flying towards the bloodthirsty monster. The monster was in some pain from the hail of arrows, and it used its tentacles to dig up the dirt and rocks in front of it. As soon as it saw the group jump out of the way, its sharp tentacles shot out, trying to impale everyone from above. Zian had already realized that the tree roots were really annoying, so he darted forward. This time, instead of aiming at the bloodthirsty monster, he summoned Limi to play rock-paper-scissors with it. The little girl's eyes widened into the shape of scissors, which looked rather disgusting, but when she opened her mouth to show her master, he realized that this thing was incredibly cool. It looked like a knife, but it was actually two halves of a pair of scissors held by the gardener Li Jian who suddenly found that his job of pruning bonsai trees was a lot easier. The bloodthirsty monster jumped back when it saw someone trying to cut the roots that were sucking its nutrients, but Jian was too fast. 
He used both hands to cut through the roots with the two halves of the scissors, right before the monster's very eyes. Even Limi had a hard time keeping up with her master's speed. He did a backflip and used his whirlwind scissors skill, cutting the ugly frog with hundreds of slashes at once, and then landed gracefully on the ground. Limi couldn't swallow the monster's head and tail, and she was too dizzy to keep up with Jien's speed, so she gave up. He continued to dismember the ugly frog without rest, and soon it collapsed right in front of Jien and the group of centaurs, who were watching in amazement. Had they really defeated it? They knew that it was the hero Li Jien who had done it, but it seemed easier than they had thought, only Tak Su felt that something was wrong. This twelve-hold monster couldn't have been defeated so easily. The strange phenomenon in the city, specifically the trees that were wrapped around everything in sight, were still standing there, sucking up nutrients, so how could it be over? Sung Che in the library saw his uncle defeat the monster and couldn't help but cheer. His face flushed with pride, he had just lost his general and his advisor, so don't look down on his father and uncle. However, this brat had the upper hand, so it was no surprise to him that things had turned out this way, and he even announced that the battle had not yet begun. Hey, do you know why that monster is so obsessed with eating? He shook the chain in his hand, making Sung Che feel like something dangerous was coming, especially when the bastard emphasized that the monster could convert anything edible into power. The general's hand shook the chain of the balance of power, somehow lighting up the core of the monster, resurrecting all the parts that had been cut by Legion. The centaurs roared, damn it, it's regenerating. The bloodthirsty monster stuffed its horns back into its hideous face, but behind the group of people, there was something even more terrifying. Even Tak Su gasped when he saw it, because the historian's barrier was being eaten away by the bloodthirsty monster. With lime in his hand and his usual disregard for the world, Legion swung his hand and slashed through the dirt and rocks to reveal what was beneath the surface. As he had predicted, countless large, writhing vines were being used by the monster to indirectly enter the barrier. Its mournful cry was as horrifying as a pig being slaughtered, and the centaurs had no time to waste. They raised their weapons in a cautious stance as the frog stomped its foot down hard. It seemed to be driven mad by hunger, its mouth muttering, food, food, I need to eat more. Its dull eyes stared at the city in the distance, and the thought of all the human flesh there made the general laugh maniacally. Even the bloodthirsty monster would need time to eat an entire city, but without the barrier, it would only take a minute. Sung Che's face darkened, even an idiot could tell that the rotten frog was about to jump into the city full of people. The blonde-haired man was delighted, it was like the city was a buffet compared to the people at the airport. Stuttering through his words and laughing, Sung Che touched his face and asked why he was talking as if he had witnessed the incident at the airport. Memories from when he was seven suddenly flooded back to him when he looked across the seats and saw two strangers arguing at the airport because they had lost something, and then running away together. The man on the left was so familiar, but Sung Che couldn't place him, and then it dawned on him that it was this bastard. His face turned pale as he exclaimed, you caused the disaster that year? But in return, he got a belly laugh as if something was really funny. A blonde bastard laughed out loud, saying that he was slow for taking so long to figure it out. I'm so bored of having to hide it for 10 years. With an arrogant expression on his bastardly face, C1 laughed and congratulated him on landing on the jackpot. That's right, I'm the one who caused the incident at the airport. What are you going to do about it? Call the police and have me arrested, or do you want to touch yourself again while the whole world watches? Sung Che was speechless in the face of this madman, but he didn't stop. Mocking the Libra boy, claiming that no one would dare touch him. Get out of my house, Libra is the strongest zodiac sign, understand? He crowed with delight, who would dare to do anything to the son of the Libra saint? Hiding behind his mother's shadow to commit such heinous crimes, Sung Che was furious that this man could be so heartless as to kill innocent people. In the eyes of this rich kid, a thousand lives were nothing, so why should he be afraid? His arrogant words made Sung Che furious, and he drew the dagger that Ziners had given him, successfully scaring the blonde man out of his wits. Fortunately, he could still recognize the fear of his uncle's weapon, and he still remembered the horror of Lysian sticking her head out of it. A familiar light flashed before his eyes, and Shiwan closed them tight and screamed. When he saw a head full of hair sticking out from under his armpit, but the red hair didn't belong to Lysian, and it rammed straight into the bastard's nose, and by the time he realized it was Sung Che, it was too late. Sung Che had recognized the man who had caused the disaster years ago, and he would not forgive him. The kid's head was throbbing from the blow, and Shiwan's nose was bleeding. As he fell backwards and passed out, he laughed with delight, it was just a normal magic light, you coward. 
The caster had fainted, so the magic book fell to the ground, allowing Sung Che to take it. His eyes fell on the Libra necklace that the rich kid was holding in his hand, and he quickly snatched it without saying a word. His eyes lit up with determination, and he grabbed the book of ancient magic, wanting to borrow its power to teleport to the desired location. Without Sung Che's badge, it wouldn't work, so he used the power of the Zodiac Magic Book to activate the teleportation skill. In the city where the barrier had been removed, the centaurs were fighting with all their might to destroy the bloodthirsty monster. A single arrow shot out and turned into hundreds of arrows, covering the sky. A rain of arrows pierced the monster that was trying to use the roots of a tree to protect itself and prevent it from raising its head. Once again playing the role of a diligent gardener, Jien played the card of cutting like crazy, working as fast as he could. He kept getting close to the monster and cutting off whatever part he could, without saying a word. His cuts cracked houses and rocks, and only with great effort could they pierce the fat frog's skin. The entire area was affected, and it was about to collapse under the heavy attack, but, its owner seemed proud and praised himself for his beautiful attack. Suddenly, the ground beneath Jien's feet moved, and the monster's roots shot up, taking the gardener's left arm with them. His eyes stared down at the bleeding, shoulder, waiting for his super regeneration to restart. But the wound created by the bloodthirsty monster seemed to be the nemesis of Jien's ability, and he only had one more regeneration left. Jien stood there with his arm gradually being restored by the light, frowning as the hardened tentacles of the monster emerged from the ground. Just above, a golden light shone as Taksu threw his body into the space between his friend and the disaster, a move that scattered them all. As soon as his friend landed, Jien's left arm was fully recovered. He punched from behind Taksu, hitting the monster's buttocks, and the resulting blow blew away all the twitching roots and scattered the disaster. Both friends realized that the monster's black power source was gathering in the same way as the power inside the demon tower, when the Red Eye army would fight and then be resurrected. Twenty years ago, people said that the demon tower was the scariest place because it was invaded by the Red Eye army, which humans rumored to be the secret base of an unknown civilization. But one thing was clear to everyone, the danger of the disasters. Inside the tower was definitely much greater than the disasters outside. Unlike the Spider Queen or the Centipede disaster, which were classified as red, the ones in the tower were even higher than black because they were extremely difficult to completely destroy. At this moment, using her 13th sense to find the enemy's weakness, Lysian discovered three glowing nuclei in the monster's body, one in the middle of the tree on its back, one swirling violently, with fire in its belly, and the other smaller, like a stone. But the strongest core at the top was to imprison the souls and lives of those it had swallowed. His eyes could also see the long roots that were luring souls from somewhere to it, which he guessed was the central city where the bloodthirsty monster had just removed the barrier. Oh my god, Jian had to let Taksu know that the people there had fainted already, and he had to save the city before the monster absorbed its nutrients. He reached out to the centaurs, concentrating on everyone firing straight into the city to destroy the roots. But the bloodthirsty monster was a disaster with a brain, and it knew right away what the plan was, so it wrapped its roots tightly around the centaurs. On Taksu's side, he was using fire to burn them to save his subordinates, while on Lijian's side, he was busy tearing them apart with his bare hands. The bloodthirsty monster's terrifying scream was like a whistle, calling out. The reddish-purple spheres scattered on its roots. From them grew countless faces in the state of Genji, crying and begging for help. The screams and cries made the atmosphere chaotic, and the terror crept into the minds of the centaurs to the point where they could not resist at all. Please go away, the souls stuck to the walls of the centaur's bodies made people terrified. Taksu felt bitter in his heart, those were not real souls but a disguise of the damn monster. In the hazy, dreamy sky, everyone could clearly see the cruel scene, even Legion had to utter a curse. The frog's disgusting appearance made him angry, it really knew how to drive people crazy. He had decided that he had to tear this monster apart. Its smug face made Legion want to vomit. In the sky above the silent city, a Gemini space vortex suddenly appeared, dropping a dark red bullet that fell into the canopy of trees and crashed to the ground. The Libra necklace countered the Gemini's power, so it automatically redirected the little guy so that it couldn't land properly. It also suddenly emitted a strange light and crackling sound from the palm of the bamboo gun. He looked in the direction it was pointing, and found that the terrifying thing that had fallen was a large, deformed tree wrapped in hideous roots. A faint red mist emanated from its canopy, but the bamboo gun hadn't realized that it had landed in the right place because it thought the city was still protected. The Libra necklace lit up, 
creating an effect that blocked the bloodthirsty monster's influence. The bamboo gun looked around for a while and concluded that it had landed in the right place. The roots were still wrapped around many unconscious people. As long as they were still breathing, they could be saved, especially since it was only just beginning. Holding the magic book, the bamboo gun called upon the power of the grimoire, summoning the fire mage from his skill preparing to treat this tree as an enemy. Soon, the noise in the city west of the circle attracted people to bring the news, but when the camera panned to it, all that was left was a scene of devastation. The representative of the European Union was furious. The damn fool didn't know how to do things slowly. The problem that all of Europe wanted to hide was now out in the open. Sure enough, the reporter said that it was the bloodthirsty monster that had appeared in the past that was the suspect in this attack. The news reached all corners of the world, and the emotions of the viewers ran the gamut. The news was broadcast to all parts of the world, and the emotions of the viewers were mixed. From the Libra, he could see the bastard he had met a few years ago, so. Maureen happily kicked back a cup of coffee and smiled. Or Larry Quinn and Harry Jean at home watching TV in horror. It wasn't until the reporters sent a drone inside that they saw a leg in torn pants running away with a huge package in its hand. Lee Jien, in his familiar torn pants and old shirt, along with the centaurs, had spent hours cutting away the tangled mess. It followed him like a juicy prey that wouldn't let go. While Tox Su stood below shouting for his friend. It was so noisy that it ate an iron hand. Tox Su unexpectedly had to brace himself with all his might to resist. The spider silk relic of the 10th level of defense was broken in a moment. Tox Su lost his ability to resist and was crushed by the X, coughing up blood. Jian flew above and saw his friend being beaten up, so he got even more pissed off at the vines. He turned to look and immediately fell into a matrix of sensations, full of pain that the Eagle disaster broadcast live. In a moment of shock, he was immediately wrapped up by the vines. His face close to the vengeful soul simulation book, Jian cursed in his mind. Now he understood the disgust of those who had witnessed this abomination. The monster grabbed him and threw him from the top floor, smashing him to pieces on the ground. The centaurs had just escaped from the vines that had wrapped around them, and looked up, calling out, but they couldn't see him anywhere. They only saw the glowing red eyes of the bloodthirsty monster, satisfied, as it watched the weak humans waiting to be devoured. Without Li Jian and O Tak Su, the centaur army would have difficulty fighting the bloodthirsty monster. However, it suddenly felt a terrible pain shooting through its head, and it turned its eyes to the western part of the city where the food was stored and gritted its teeth. There was some bastard messing with the ancient tree. The pain became more and more intense, making it jerk repeatedly. Because Sung Che's mage was constantly attacking the disgusting tree, attacking it with all his hatred and resentment, Sung Che screamed because of these things, because of things like this, because of which his beloved mother could no longer smile. His father had lost half of his power and the whole world had turned their backs on him, and Chu Rai One had been devoured right before his eyes. All the helplessness he felt when he saw innocent people lying dead, all of it turned into a huge surge of power for Sung Che to direct, straight at the damn logo and the damn tree. Successfully destroying the ancient tree caused the frog to let out a terrifying roar. Its eyes bulged out as it cursed with all sorts of words and then ignored the centaurs, quickly jumping over their heads and heading towards the western part of the city. Each of its heavy footsteps splashed dirt, making the whole team realize that there was something unusual there that made it so hasty. Thanks to it changing direction, Taksu was able to crawl out of the sunken ground, stand up, and shout for everyone to get ready as he followed the bloodthirsty monster that was speeding towards the city. As soon as it touched the ground, it got an arrow straight in the head, the pain making its brain feel like it was going to explode. The pain paralyzed the bloodthirsty monster, it roared numbly, unable to turn its head to look at Taksu, who had just let go of the bow. Until now, he had been afraid of getting in the way of Jien's actions, so he hadn't touched the arsenal he had brought with him, but now he pulled out another spear as a gift for the monstrous frog. Taksu prepared the arrow repelling relic specifically for the bloodthirsty monster on the bow, and roared. Today I will pin your fat body to the ground and make you into frog on butter. Bang! The spear pierced the bloodthirsty monster's left thigh, and another. One pierced its right thigh, pinning it to the ground. The centaur seized the opportunity to open fire continuously, from both sides, raining down on the monster. All of them used relics, and each shot fired, released countless arrows with dazzling strings that tightened around it. It looked at the
the small people holding the ropes with hatred to keep it down, but for the time being, it couldn't do anything. They had to use all their skills to increase their physical strength, closing their eyes and holding the rope together. This damn monster would recover easily from any wound, so now, the only way was to imprison it and prevent it from wreaking havoc. It was like it was cursing its comrades or something, the divine strings. From the ancient tree transmitted an unbearable sense of pain. Powerless and imprisoned in this place while it was in its prime, it now put all its strength into its final attack, despite the notification that the energy of Libra and Gemini were cancelling each other out. Ten years of hatred were released in this one move by the boy. The overpowered fire mage used the power of both constellations to smash the, with its mouth wide open, pierced by the spear. The bloodthirsty monster roared in terror and unwillingness, the city that had continuously provided it with energy exploded with a loud bang, and without the red mist, where would it find souls to devour? The souls screaming on the roots of the tree disappeared with the passing breeze, returning peace to the minds of the centaur army. Sung Che, exhausted, collapsed amidst the chaos, and after a while, slowly opened his eyes to see the fire mage lying lifeless beside him. Having put all his strength into that last attack, his whole body now ached and he just wanted to lie down, but then he remembered the tree, the ancient tree that he had destroyed, and he lifted his head with difficulty. Only when he saw that it had been completely destroyed did he lie back down, his hand that had been holding the Libra relic felt as if it had been burned, charred and swollen as if it was paralyzed. Sung Che didn't know if it was because he had put all his strength into destroying the tree, or not, but he knew that the Libra relic was gone for good. Well, whatever he had been able to do, he had done it all, and now Sung Che could finally enjoy the view of the real sky after the dome had disappeared. He suddenly felt so happy, he had succeeded. He had been laughing happily for a few seconds, when Sung Che saw a reflection of a huge fire just outside the city, shooting straight up into the sky. It exploded with a terrifying bang, like a nuclear bomb had been dropped, and any apostle received a notification that the power of the sun god Apollo was being activated. It swept straight towards the city so fast that Sung Che braced himself, and thanks to the snakescale shield of the Janus relic that automatically activated in the face of danger, he was able to escape the terrifyingly hot stream of fire that swept across the city. Even inside the protective shield, Sung Che had to brace himself with all his might to stay standing, but it reached its limit and disappeared. The lingering heat left Sung Che completely exhausted, the feeling was like his father's fire, but also strangely different. The scene of devastation before Sung Che's eyes was unbelievable, all the buildings had absorbed the heat and melted as if they had been thrown into lava. The place where the centaur army was standing was also crackling with the sound of burning, and they trembled, thinking that their ancestors must have carried them on their backs to get through this ordeal. But it wasn't, it was the Zodiac Lord Hugo Arthurs who had exerted all his strength to protect the group, and was now in a state of disrepair. His arms were badly burned, but the most painful thing was that the bloodthirsty monster was using the power it had stolen from the centaurs as if it belonged to it. The fire followed the entire length of the relic's energy strings that Tok Su had had so much trouble removing. Luckily, their commander had survived but the others behind him were not as strong as Tok Su, so they were protecting their subordinates and no longer had the strength to fight, no longer having the energy to pay attention to the people around him. The bloodthirsty monster's eyes flashed with cruelty, and it focused its gaze on the city, searching for the human who had tricked it near the place where its ancient tree had been destroyed. Sung Che realized that it was foresight, a centaur skill that his father often used, but this energy source was completely different, it was strange and unfamiliar. The monster realized that Sung Che was the one who had destroyed the source of its power, and Tok Su also realized immediately that the conservative boy he had given birth to had somehow appeared here. Don't tell me he's the one who destroyed the dome. Mr. Bo was right and said it loud, the bloodthirsty monster, roared deafeningly, demanding to eat the boy alive. It slammed its limbs onto the ground, its mouth breathing fire, its eyes filled with rage, and it leapt towards Sung Che with a speed that was unreal for such a fat frog. He had only just turned his head to look in the direction of the noise when he saw the whole fighting horse frog charging towards him. Having used up all his strength after punching the ancient tree, Sung Che could only hold his head and scream like an ordinary person. Just when Sung Che thought he was going to die, Mr. Bo appeared and used his body to lock the beast's mouth and save his son. Just in time, Sung Che was overjoyed to see that his father had come to his rescue, 
and took the opportunity to provoke the bloodthirsty monster by opening its mouth wide. His strength was not enough to subdue the beast, and he could only listen to it insult the cheap, half-baked archer. It opened its mouth wider and wider, straining against Toxus' muscular thighs. Realizing that the situation was not good, he gritted his teeth and turned his head to look at his son, activating a fire shield that enveloped Sung Che, at least, keeping him safe for as long as possible. He himself was caught by the fat frog and swallowed into its stomach along with the dirt and rocks beneath his feet. Once again, Sung Che watched as a loved one was taken from him by the bloodthirsty monster, but the shield prevented him from doing anything. Tak Su slid into the interior along with the dirt and rocks, and felt like he was about to faint. The fat frog went mad, taking a few more bites at the concrete below to make sure, before stopping. Sung Che's eyes filled with despair, and he called out to his father in anguish, but there was nothing he could do. The fire shield activated automatically, even when its owner was not present, and as long as there was danger, it would not let Sung Che go out and risk his life. It seemed to laugh at him, as it had just swallowed the full power of the sun god, and Xeon's scissors flew towards it from the beginning. It was like a zombie that knew how to aim, and the two cuts of sorrow slapped the ugly frog in the face, sliding smoothly across its rough skin. It crashed into the tree above the disaster, trying to find the guy who had just changed, only to hear his triumphant laughter. Thirsting for more power from the constellation of Ophiuchus, the bloodthirsty monster charged straight towards Li Xeon, who was plowing through the dirt and rocks. He was furious, and used his 13th sense skill to see his friend falling into the monster's stomach, and he called out to him, but he couldn't hear him. Taksu's subconscious floated vaguely as his body fell freely inside the monster's stomach. Taksu always tormented himself for not being able to save his wife and subordinates, and the bloodthirsty monster was still alive and well. All he could do was expose his misery to. Sung Che and Zohar, did everything end like this? Suddenly, a light shone through and sprinkled Taksu's face, and he opened his eyes to see. Fragments of his power that had been stolen before being held captive here. His hand reached out towards the energy source, thinking that if he could get it, he would be able to fight the bloodthirsty monster comfortably once more. But his consciousness was fading, and his tired body seemed to be pulling Taksu away. In his mind, he wondered what he was trying to fight for. Was it because the memories of his family were fading in the mind of a dying man? The photo of the whole family taken at the park was more than just a memory for Zhiguang. Tak Su remembered his wife's excited voice and gentle smile, asking him how he felt. Our family looks beautiful, doesn't it? No. Tak Su gritted his teeth and opened his eyes, which had been tightly shut. Struggling to free himself from the plastic cords holding him, Tak Su refused to give up. He thrashed around, trying to reach it. He couldn't let it end like this. He couldn't die in shame. He couldn't face his family and Jian again. He couldn't let them see his weakness again. I have to, I have to reach it. The power within recognized the centaur fragment, and connected with it, starting with a small spark. Then the sun fragment recognized its master, and it swirled violently, like a fireball, wanting to return to being Toxus' source of power. A notification board repeatedly warned that the sun fragment, due to having been in contact with the evil energy for too long, would definitely cause a backlash. But it was Toxus' life-saving straw, so he tried to brace himself and receive it. His body couldn't take it anymore, his hand was burning, and could no longer absorb it, when suddenly the space above shattered. In a flash, a figure, who had passed by here, was familiar to the chief. Li Jian appeared and roared with great pride, Hugo Adders. His foul mouth shouted out, you have so many things to do at home, what the hell are you doing here? His friend's strong hand stretched out in front of him and told Tak Su to grab it quickly. His friend's trademark pride, made him laugh more happily than ever before. He struggled to grab the hand that had once held him in this way for more than 30 years, so that he could be thrown back out. 30 years ago, in the desert, there was a group of centipede-shaped swords that were wreaking havoc on the land. Wherever they punched, the blonde youth was torn to shreds. Marching through the desert had never been Toxus's favorite thing to do. He leaned over and vomited, and before he could get his two shoes on, he heard the sound of sand being kicked up. The centipede kicked its legs and threw the young man high into the sky, then swallowed him down in one bite. The way down the centipede's stomach was not as spacious as the bloodthirsty frogs. The centipede's stomach was not as spacious as the bloodthirsty frogs. Tak Su was immersed in the enzyme at that time, thinking about his bitter life, never having married a wife, and having withered away. Not to mention his poor life, which was no different from a beggar's. Suddenly, a force pulled him up. The blue sky suddenly opened up before his eyes, when someone poked their head into the centipede. Thirty years ago, Lysian was covered with scars. She muttered and asked why this human was not dead yet, and had given up on his life. Hey, 
man, take my hand, little brother. Seeing the blonde man looking at him, Jian looked at him with one eye clear and the other cloudy, and asked with a frown. What's wrong again? Don't you want to leave here? From then on, the image of Lysian in Taksu's eyes never changed. She was still the same arrogant, hands-on type. And she yelled at him, calling him a beautiful friend. She cursed and shouted, My God, why don't you come out anymore? What are you doing here? The nonchalance of his friends was what made Taksu smile. Because he always stood before him with such arrogance. But his hand was always there to pull him out of places where he thought he would die. This part is like a romance novel until Taksu is thrown out. No different from a dog thief being beaten up. In a panic, his father lost consciousness and no matter how much he washed him, he would not wake up. Jian activated his 13th sense and looked at his friend. He realized that he had absorbed a fragment of the polluted sun, but he was basically okay. Taksu's body was in the process of expelling and purifying. The contaminated power, which really surprised Jian. This fool had actually regained his strength while inside the bloodthirsty fog. So he stood up and breathed a sigh of relief, saying to the little boy, Your father has just eaten some dirty food, he'll be fine after a nap. Zung didn't understand what kind of dog shit his father had swallowed in his stomach, but his uncle didn't bother to explain any further. He just said that this level wouldn't kill Taksu, just be careful. And he picked up the gardening shears and looked at the bloodthirsty fog that he had pierced a hole in, and put the bowl in front of his chest. It was not dead yet, and he still had work to do. With a bang, Jian flew straight up like a rocket, and then he aimed at the monster's snout, put the shears in, and shot his power into it, which lit up the whole area. A move like that couldn't cut off the bloodthirsty fog's head, but it was easy to pin the shears in place. Li Jian laughed with glee, reminding the demon that it was because of him that the whole world laughed at his best friend. My grandson hasn't even had a decent birthday yet. As he spoke, he reached down with the shears in a cruel manner, determined to punish this unruly scourge. It gritted its teeth and tried to resist the attack, but Jian had already flown out of its head, leaving a pair of shears that had yet to pierce its skin. Summoning the forging hammer at this point was only logical and appropriate. Jian needed something stronger to hit the shears with, so he struck it with a bright light, the power of which wanted to enlighten the monster. The bloodthirsty fog howled in pain, unable to believe that it had been defeated by a human. It called the name of the saintly serpent as if it were a close friend, saying that it had lost this battle, but that it had another one ready. Its roots were in every corner of the city, and as long as they were still there, they would continue to bring people with them. It lashed out at the trees, trying to break free, causing the whole area to be destroyed. Its goal being to destroy the city, to bury everything so that the saintly serpent could escape, but not the others. It targeted all the archers hiding throughout the city, especially the half-baked blonde who was lying around here and making a mess. In the damp buildings, bringing down the wrath of the father and son. He was still a crane on top of the bloodthirsty fog. Yan shouted, Hey, are you really stupid? My half-baked friend may be very gentle, but he is not so easy going that you can do whatever you want. He let his poor grandson hug his father and cry, as if he thought this was the last time he would see him. But as Yan said, the half-baked golden eyes lit up, just before the damp building materials were slammed down on top of each other. A golden light gleamed from the darkness, and then suddenly turned. All the broken, unrecoverable materials into dust. The reporters waiting for news outside the scene, hundreds of kilometers away, were startled by the light and turned to look. The sky, which had been pitch black, swirled violently, and a fire, of unknown origin shot up from the ground or down from above. The counselor hugged the TV screen, looking helpless, but those who were experienced in fighting, like Maureen, must have seen what it was. In front of the TV screen, there was basically nothing to see except for the terrible light, but that was enough for those who were full of scheming to realize that something big was about to happen. In the middle of the night, the sky was as bright as day, which was a strange phenomenon, and, according to the reporter's notes that day, it was as if a sun had risen. Zohar's footsteps echoed through the hallway, and the little girl slammed the door or screamed to report the news. But inside the room of the Saint Tien Yi, she had been monitoring the situation since the beginning, without taking her eyes off it. She clicked her tongue and commented, speaking for all the saints who were watching. In the end, he still managed to regain his lost power. In the midst of the swirling sky, Tak Su was still wearing his tattered clothes, but he had the imposing air of a god riding a fire. Sung Che looked up at his father, who was puffed up, and was overjoyed because Bo had woken up just in time, and was still completely intact. The three-legged disc was furious, realizing that the power it had wanted for ten years had suddenly disappeared, so it was very angry. It either called out to add, 
releasing tentacles easily long enough to reach up and grab Tok Su from above. All of the demon's minions who had been burrowing through the ground and buildings shot up into the air, forming several writhing, disgusting piles. Such a wide range attack could only be handled by Tok Su. He no longer had the ad type artifact, but with his current power as the sun god, all he had to do was shine a little light on these annoying plants and they would retreat on their own. Wherever the blinding white light shone, the flammable plants evaporated instantly, while everything else remained completely undamaged. The sun god Apollo's magnificent burning skill seemed to be designed specifically for burning flammable plants to death, and soon the entire tower of plants that they had formed melted away and evaporated in the wind. The hard-working Li Jian switched to being a carpenter and carved a hole in the demon's head, laughing. Because the burning skill was meant to show the demon what was up. You said you could swallow everything, huh? The more Li Jian talked, the more excited he got, spreading his wings, even wider. If you want to steal anything from us, you'd better think again. It's time to finish this. Who has time to keep digging holes? Activating the ability to help in a fight, Li Jian switched positions with the person he was closest to. In an instant, the centaur saint stepped on the monster's head, taking the place of his close friend, Li. Jian floated in the sky, taking his place and shouting the familiar name Eo Tak Su E, finishing it off for his friend. He nodded in agreement with his friend, then lowered his hand and gripped the handle of the axe he had left behind, finishing the job of piercing the disaster's skull, ignoring its groans. With each swing of the axe, old memories surfaced of when Tak Su was afraid to touch. The doorknob, hearing his son crying and apologizing to him, he said that if only he hadn't been hungry then, if only the three of them had left the airport right away, then his mother and uncle Raiguan would still be alive and well. And his father too, his father would have been strong enough to suppress the disasters, and everything would have been the same, right? Tak Su's son had sobbed when he was only seven years old, taking all the blame on himself, which always made Eo Tak Su feel like there was a lump in his throat. Each of the sacred relics that flew out of the palace glowed with a terrible light, enveloped in a glorious fire that cleansed them of all their impure power. I don't know if it will make the bloodthirsty fog see the light, but this fan is already scared to death. The land went dark, revealing a large crater as if a bomb had fallen, and Eo Tak Su sat down to catch his breath for a few seconds, and his farmer friend walked over to him. He didn't expect things to end up in such a mess. Tak Su didn't know what to do now, all the cores had been destroyed, and his body had been cleansed and turned to dust, so there was nothing more he could do. Li Jian opened his mouth to curse the damn bloodthirsty fog, and his friend joined in. He sighed in relief again, and with his friend taking care of this disaster, he had nothing left to do but go back. He closed his eyes and said thank you to his dear friend, seeing his friend's hand in front of him, for the first time, but all he could do was thank him verbally. But wait, Li Jian rummaged around and said he had found something interesting while fighting the bloodthirsty fog. I swear, how did he pull out a huge orb that emitted a soft light from his tiny pocket? He explained that this was the core he had taken from the monster. Tak Su was surprised and didn't know what it was, and neither did Li Jian. Using his sixth sense and the eye of God, he realized that this was a soul-sealing orb used to imprison the souls of those who had been absorbed by the disaster. Transferring the power of the serpent constellation into it caused the orb to crack. Once it was no longer intact, it could no longer hold the souls, and soon beams of light shot out and into the night sky. Tak Su had guessed what it was, but he couldn't believe his eyes, and he asked his friend in astonishment, what is this? It's the release of the souls that the bloodthirsty fog swallowed, and one by one, your friends will wake up. The sound of cheering rang out, wasn't that great? The boy ran over, just in time to hear the good news, and asked breathlessly if it was true that they were waking up. Of course, the orb gradually disappeared in Li Jian's hand, and he said with certainty that his mother would wake up too. Needless to say, the little boy was so moved that the uncle asked him another question. Haven't you had a proper birthday in a long time? It's a little late now, but under the sky full of a thousand souls. Finding their way home, Li Jian smiled and congratulated his nephew on his birthday. Stephen Marker howled like a beast, I will never allow humans and giants to be threatened by anyone. That's when he howled and used his lightning storm skill to destroy the remaining monsters on the beach, causing the apostles to open their eyes wide and gasp as the lion saint landed on the pile of severed monster corpses, looking fierce enough to make even a toilet bowl blush. Standing before the waves splashing white foam, he raised his precious giant and howled, he had taken it back. 
In Stephen's mind, the precious giant was like his own child, carried heavily for nine months and ten days, he fed it, gave it water, and took it for walks on nice days. And when trouble came looking for a fight, Stephen and his giant would send them flying. They would fight together in battles so bright they would make their hair stand on end, and being together made them both happy. I have you, you have me, we have each other to make the world stare. Then one night Stephen was sleeping soundly next to his beloved giant, and it disappeared from his embrace. Tears welled up in his eyes, it was the monster. Zohar who had taken his giant, no one else. Stephen was crying and wailing when suddenly Lysian appeared from behind him, grabbed him, and swung him around and around in the sky. He threw Stephen's body to the ground with a thud that made him wake up as if he had been hit. Oh my dear swelling, don't go. But there was no swelling here, Stephen woke up in the intensive care unit with his head bandaged. He was surrounded by people trying to wake him up. Don't you remember anything? You were ambushed by Lysian while you were hunting and you were injured and stayed here. His subordinates were in an uproar, trying to explain what had happened while Stephen was unconscious. But the most important thing in his bandaged head was something he needed to tell everyone seriously. What was it? The crowd swallowed their saliva and focused on the strange behavior of their holy master. They thought of heroic phrases like leading the group to fight Lysian and avenge market. But all that came out of Stephen's mouth was, go get my swelling back for me. Can't that thing stop swelling anymore? His subordinates wanted to kneel down and beg him to go back to sleep so that the world could be at peace. What era is this? Still searching for fog and returning bones. The noise echoed out into the hallway. The subordinates knew that their holy master was as healthy as a horse when they heard that. They wondered if they should report it to Deputy Commander Roja. The person next to him immediately retorted. Didn't you see that girl rush out like a shot when they had a mission related to Lysian's eighth relic? Don't mention that girl, but worry about the danger at the holy land of heaven's edge and keep worrying. I'm speechless at this hot temper. A subordinate rushed over in a panic to panic and tell the blind people here? Those who had been in a coma for 10 years after the blood fog incident had all woken up. The Heaven's Edge Hospital housed all 1,000 victims of that shocking incident. So the fact that all 1,000 people woke up in a state of consciousness made the whole hospital bustle. The news quickly made this a hot topic. Incidentally, it connected to a live broadcast from Europe after the aftermath of the war that lasted for many days between the hero Lysian and the centaur saint who defeated the blood fog. The whole world was talking about the connection between these two events. As if by a miracle, everyone called this an unprecedented miracle. In a luxurious room, someone was watching TV, from all over the world with an unhappy expression, until the blonde appeared behind him. He still didn't turn around and continued to mutter. I can't believe it, your door went to catch Lysian and Hugo wasn't worth anything and lost to the blood fog. Shiwan listened in silence as the other person cursed about losing the necklace that his mother Libra Kai Xing had given him, and then let the blood fog become a noisy mess. Shiwan's older brother, Ion Tihu, turned back with a glass of spirits in his hand and continued to scold him about dropping the magic book and other important things into the hands of that brat Sung Che. He was furious that Shiwan had let a guy who used to be bullied steal the book right in front of him. He endured it in silence even when his older brother cursed him as a good-for-nothing fool who only made him mad enough to grab the bottle of spirits on the table and throw it straight at Shiwan's head, shattering it. Damn you, are you so proud of yourself that you're nodding your head? You've never done anything useful since the incident at the airport. I've learned my lesson. Ignoring his younger brother writhing in pain on the ground, Taiwi continued to insult him as a disappointment to his mother. So how are you going to deal with this mess, you idiot? He gritted his teeth at Shiwan, but he still didn't dare to fight back. Because he had come here to ask his older brother for help, to make sure they were on the same page because this had to do with Taiwi, and he had to help if he wanted to cover it up. His older brother was also disgusted by the whole reckless thing, and he held his head and said that they should follow Lysian now, follow him, and then erase all traces that were left. Seeing Taiwan calm down, Shiwan covered his face and crawled to his feet to ask what his older brother was going to do. Turning to look out the large glass window outside, Taiwan decided to go to Grace Hospital. At least he could cover up the airport incident if he took care of those who had died in Korea. While the brothers were scheming, on the outskirts of the European defense line was still shrouded in the smoke and dust of the collapsed buildings. The people were in disarray, but fortunately, the cell phone signal was still stable enough to hear news from afar. He had just hung up the phone when he happily announced that the hospital had called to say that Raewon and Jihu had woken up with everyone else. Jien wasn't in a hurry either, he knew that the longer the soul was imprisoned, the longer it would take to return to its original body. But when he had released the soul, he had infused it with a little bit of his own power, 
so he just had to wait. Looking at his nephew, Jian smiled and told him that he needed to go see his mother and uncle. Hesitating for a moment, Sung Chai opened his mouth to ask, What about you, uncle? And what about my father? Sung Chai's face flushed red and he didn't dare look at the person he was asking. But Taksu heard him loud and clear, and his eyes widened. Filled with emotion, he wondered if his son had just asked about him. In order to show that he was a father who knew how to respond to his son's feelings, Taksu bitterly selected a suitable role from his long list of emotions. There was just one thing. He opened with an indirect statement that his father and uncle still had things to take care of, and the little guy was fine, and he opened his magic power to prepare to teleport back to Korea. Jian opened his mouth and laughed as if he had just won the lottery, laughing at his friend who thought he hadn't, and frozen into a statue by the autumn wind blowing through the cracks in his hips for a second. He had no choice but to speak up and comfort the embarrassed little guy, saying, Oh, come on, what can your father do? Grace Hospital was Sung Che's destination, not his home. He was still wearing the tattered clothes from the fierce battle with the blood fog, and he was so nervous that his heart was pounding in his chest as he stuffed the book into his pocket. He was about to see his mother and uncle Ziwan again. But after taking only two steps, Sung Chai suddenly remembered that it would be embarrassing to go to the hospital without anything in his hand. So he turned left and ran out into the street to find some flowers to hold so he could feel more confident about visiting. The intersection in front of the hospital was deserted after Sung Chai left, not a single person in sight. And suddenly there was the sound of heavy boots and a voice cursing like a turtle. Taewon covered half of his face and ran towards the Thousand Grace Hospital. Ten years was nothing compared to his Libra Hospital. Standing there rubbing his forehead in frustration, Taewon wanted to find Sung Chai right away and slap him into silence, but for the time being, since he didn't know where he was, why didn't he go and cause a little trouble for his family? He would have to show up sooner or later. Sung Chai ran back to the hospital as fast as he could, carrying a bouquet of fresh flowers. Little did he know that a bastard was waiting for him. Day after the bloodbath, the dome area on the west side was being used for medical treatment and battlefield cleanup. The elite centaur force was considered to have made a significant contribution, and each and every one of them was interviewed for the first time, which made them very reserved and shy. Nearby, there was a loud noise as the wounded were brought into the field hospital, which consisted of a large building filled with mats and stretchers for the wounded, sitting alone at the counter inside, far away from the noise in the hall. Lee Jian was checking his system panels and tasks. Since he had successfully dealt with the bloodthirsty disaster, his power test was complete. The reward was increased power after a day, and the transformation of his human body into a divine body. In addition, Li Jian opened up a new achievement recorded in his holy book, that the centaurs had seen and admired the master of the serpent bearer. In addition to the story of how he had killed the demon and freed the human souls, which was also recorded here. The part that made Li Jian the happiest was that by opening achievement 2, he could borrow the power of the centaurs when the conditions were met. There were still a few days left to complete the tasks related to the secretary and disciple. But for the time being, they had to be put aside because there was something more important to do. It was the vague thing that had appeared on his desk and that he had been staring at intently since just now. It was a fragment very similar to that of the dagger, discovered to be from the mysterious civilization that Li Jian had found in the sealed heart of the blood fog. Before he died, the demon had roared something about needing those souls to offer to them, which made Li Jian quite certain that the person the demon had mentioned and the person who had stabbed him in the ghost waterfall were one and the same. Was it too much of a coincidence? Never mind, Li Jian flipped a coin high into the air and caught it again, full of excitement. He was the type of person who would skip over anything that was too difficult, and if he couldn't find an answer, he would just grab the person and beat them up until they told him what he wanted to know. Soon after, a glass of beer appeared next to his wine. Hugo looked rather disheveled, his burned arms bandaged up, but his spirits were quite good, and he had to advise his friend to rest a little longer and then it wouldn't be too late to find a virgin. Li Jian roared with a condescending air, scolding him that the young people of today were so pampered that they were weak, in his day there was no time to even breathe, his eagle's hand would always be down in the fight. He spoke as if Tak Su had not been born in that era, he was so skinny and tall that he had to be ashamed. So he changed the subject and asked his friend why he hadn't gone with him to visit his wife and subordinates. Well, I'm not confident about either of those people, and I'm not qualified to meet them, I need to prepare myself mentally. His brow furrowed, there was still much to be done, for sure. Looking at the fragment on the table, and the thing in his hand that had been broken, Tak Su knew that he himself needed to deal with both the Libra and the Virgin. Thinking of the old woman who liked to play with the yellow tree, who liked to choose the big chair like a throne, 
Tak Su knew right away that the incident was far from over. He had to find out the root cause of the incident, especially when he heard his son say that there was still someone behind the scenes. So what are you going to do about that person? Jian glanced over and asked for his friend's glass of crispy clams. He said to stab that guy's clam, making Jian laugh out loud. Just as he was having fun, he suddenly saw the centaurs with their equine eyes and Jian had to open his foul mouth and chase the brats away fighting with you guys because it had something to do with the blood fog, but now, that it's over, you're just going to get in the way of catching the virgin. The whole group was disheartened, because what he said was so true that they couldn't argue. Back, even though they were being told to their faces that they were useless. Suddenly, Jian pointed and nodded, telling the kid with the gelled hair to stay, which caused a chorus of envy around him. The guy was definitely an SS class, but only these two friends understood each other too well. They needed a guy to run errands with them like Ziwan did back then. Only then would they be able to act comfortably. Out of the blue, Jian asked why they had let Sung Che go back to Korea alone. Didn't they think it was dangerous? Tak Su jumped up immediately, only now realizing the seriousness of the problem. But his friend's smug face told him that he was prepared. Who is it? You've been dying to show off, haven't you? He held out two fingers with a coin between them, as if to say, take a good look. Before Sung Che left, Jian had tossed this into the kid's hand, saying simply that it was a gift from his uncle. But his eyes lit up at the skill of checking the level of loyalty, seeing that the kid worshipped the serpent bearer by 300%, which was enough to qualify him to preach by giving him a coin engraved with his own zodiac sign. So at that time, he had secretly accepted the kid as a disciple, and the system had given him a special task to receive a reward. Just then, Jian turned his back without explaining anything further only saying that he would use it when the time came. So the kid went back to Korea and still took it out to see how it worked. Walking through the hospital corridor, Sung Che flipped it over and over again, but couldn't see anything different about it. Suddenly, he heard the sound of a patient's parents calling out in the corridor next door. The scene of the blood fog victim's family being reunited was so touching that Sung Che was looking forward to the moment when he would meet his mother and Uncle Jian again. On the other side, he heard a loud bang and the sound of a door slamming shut. Someone's foot stepped on another person's neck. It was Tian Guan who exuded a power as if he were in a place where there were no people, and called out to the guy named Sung Che, saying, I've been looking for you for ages. Tian Guan's smiling face, as if he were very close, only made Sung Che irritable. Without a word, he launched an attack straight at the kid. Sung Che managed to block it for the time being, but the bouquet he had just bought flew out of his hand. The bastard laughed like he had never laughed before. He couldn't believe that an A-class apostle had blocked an S-class attack. But what Sung Che was more concerned about was what the hell this madman was doing in the hospital. The nurse, the patient, and the doctor quickly dodged out of the way of the two people arguing, listening intently as Tian Guan said, I know this place is full of people dying from the blood fog. I just don't want those guys to wake up and cause trouble. Just lie there and be quiet. Tian Guan seemed to be going crazy, punching Sung Che's shield with a fist full of fire causing him to grit his teeth and transfer all his possible defenses to resist. The two forces of power tore down the door of a hospital floor, shattering the glass windows and causing a huge shock. At the same time, at the headquarters of the disaster prevention plan, Joe C. had visited a few days ago to hear information about the blood fog. A bespectacled man who had received him the day before was now apologizing to someone on the phone for not being able to deal with the historian and Li Jian. The voice on the other end said calmly, Look on the bright side, this has really brought down the historian's reputation. Then the man's voice dropped, and he said, that thing is coming back, get ready. Right in the corridor of the headquarters, the sound of hurried footsteps in white boots came closer and closer. The owner of the white shoes opened the door as if it was his own house, and asked sharply what had happened, which scared the hell out of the other guy. The saint of the historian's palace, Kevin Oza, roared. Why was that Li Jian dealing with a disaster under the historian's jurisdiction? To talk about the Zodiac Star, the historian, who only appears in Chapter 55, he is the strongest swordsman in the world, with the symbol of a crescent moon and a layer of silver bones. People call the historian the commander-in-chief of the cold winds. Only those of noble lineage who have the noble silver-white hair color can develop the historian's abilities. Since Kevin Oza led the historian's Zodiac Star Society, he has brought about many illustrious and glorious victories, and the historian's scale and potential have grown larger and larger, to the point where they can rival the Libra, the largest and most powerful holy society in the world. 
Kevin was born with everything in his hands, from his terrifying appearance to his talent and the terrifying power within his striking appearance. But he was quite devastated when he encountered many storms that were enough to shatter the pride of someone who had everything in his hands, the most notable of which was the name Li Jian, which was being roared out loud at this moment. Why the hell did that son of a bitch invade my territory? Standing in front of his door, he shouted loudly, demanding that the office worker tell him why that bastard was looking for trouble with him. Kevin basically couldn't take it anymore, the reason was reasonable, no matter how you said it, but why did it have to be Li Jian? Couldn't they change to someone else? If only I had died in the demon tower and been hailed as a hero for 20 years like him, it would have been different. Why did the bastard suddenly come back and attract the attention of the whole world? The new subordinates were taken aback by the Star Lord's outburst, but the old ones were all too familiar with it. The historian Star Lord was known to have a deep and bitter grudge against Li Jian, because at first they seemed to be competing on equal terms, but then things gradually became more complicated. From the glory of defeating disasters, Kevin had no chance against Li Jian, and even in the center of interviews on major TV stations, despite his scarred appearance, blind eyes, and bald head, he was still invited to be the center of attention. Even if he practiced his voice, Kevin would still lose to Li Jian in karaoke, so now that he was screaming, he couldn't stand it anymore. The guy awkwardly bowed and asked the Star Lord to calm down, saying that his fellow Taoist was looking for Li Jian, but Kevin said no, as long as that scarred bastard still existed, he would go and find him. Twenty years ago he couldn't do it, but twenty years later he could easily do it. Kevin summoned a gust of icy wind that blew through the room, just thinking about that country bumpkin made him want to scream. The roar of just you wait, Li Jian made the nearsighted man realize that he had to intervene immediately, it was not good for this old man to go to Li Jian now, he needed to buy some more time. So just when the whole historian society was about to leave, the guy said that he had a list of potential places where Li Jian might go. His hand quietly reached for the box of contact lenses, and he deliberately said it for the other person on the line to hear, saying that he would lead the way for Kevin to join forces with the Inquisition in time. As soon as Purio hung up the phone, they had to act immediately before Kevin got to Li Jian before them. By then, they had already arrived at the temporary infirmary in the West Dome area, ready to meet Li Jian. A group rushed in and tore open the curtains on both sides, shouting, We are from the Inquisition of the Historian's Zodiac Star, everyone stand still. Unexpectedly, a scream came from inside, Hey, can you guys hear me? With a volume equal to 10 candy pulling speakers, blowing away the newly arrived audience. Taksu's face was flushed red as he held the microphone and shouted in an intoxicated voice, but he was met with enthusiasm from the crowd. Yay, we're here, we believe you 100%. That, Taksu swayed as if he were opening a real concert, asking the audience if they believed in him. Below, all the wounded soldiers were very strange, each of them screaming as if they were proving their absolute loyalty to the character, the three weak historians and the like. With that, Taksu began to play the song Beat City Boy, dazzling them with a penthouse tie on Delat, adding a secret to excite the crowd when they were drunk, the solar nebula circling around his head as if he were in a bar. The people below were in a state of excitement, screaming, Centaur, Centaur, show us your six-pack, brother. The new historians didn't know anything, but with Taksu's concert microphone, they were partying and destroying decadent cultural propaganda, which needed to be banned completely. The naive orange-haired girl wanted to sacrifice herself for the cause and jump into the six-pack content, but someone's fist came across and almost dislocated her jaw. That blow sent him flying into a corner, and the whole crowd was stunned and shouted, Lily Li Jian. With a bottle of wine in his hand, he warned that he was ready to go another round if any of the historian's apostles didn't know what was good for them. The crowd's faith was boosted to a climax by the centaur's brilliant performance, along with their faith in his talent as a coach, which Li Jian could not ignore. He cracked his knuckles and reminded these flies that his father's business was doing well and not to interfere. The guy who got punched had a swollen cheek, but he was tough, and as soon as he got up from the pile of rubble, he opened his mouth again, the Inquisition will never approve. He was foolish enough to take another punch to the other cheek, but this arm was strange, it wasn't his. Purio, his face covered as if he were a wizard, stepped forward and apologized to Li Jian, apologizing for his subordinate's rudeness, but he didn't know who this guy was, so he still raised his bottle of wine and thrust his chest out. I am Purio, head of the Inquisition under the historian's TriStar, and also one of the Holy Society leaders, let me get to the point. To be direct, we need your power, because we need to free ourselves from the tyranny of Kevin Eura. The white shoes ran hurriedly on the road, heading straight for the wooden door in front of them. Kevin slammed into it with an urgent look in his eyes, shouting, Are you here, Zian? Who is Zian? 
Do you know this is a tavern, man? The crowd stared blankly at the stranger who had rushed in as if he were hiding from someone, so they rushed in again next time. Kevin knew how to add the line sorry to bother you to his mouth, but there was still no Z in there. Kevin stood outside the street, stomping his feet, not understanding what the hell he was doing and why he kept getting lost even though he knew the location. Suddenly, he thought to himself, if he was right, he had been tricked. Kevin suddenly fell silent, listening to the office boy behind him sweetly wanting to take him away to find someone else. He turned back with a serious look, his eyes fixed on the man, and said resolutely, take off your glasses and let me see. Before Kevin could say what he meant, the man's contact lenses were cut in half right on his wide open pupils. It fell into four pieces, in exchange for a wet scream of pain. Oh my god, who takes off contact lenses like this? But what Kevin was interested in was the bulletin board that had just taken down the secret of wandering eyes, borrowed from the Scorpio Zodiac star. The subordinates were confused, wasn't that the skill to trap people and make them get lost? Did that guy hide the secret behind his contact lenses? Kevin looked at the bastard holding his eyes in pain, almost asking the man who was trying to stall for time to make him go in circles so that the Inquisition could find Lysian before or after. To share the truth, Kevin just wanted to know where the commission and the scarred bastard were right now. Now he didn't have time to play around anymore, so he should know how to confess. Depending on your answer, some parts will have to change places. Ice gradually spread to Kevin's outstretched sword, although it represented the cold wind of winter nights, but this star spirit was as cold as ice cream. The vast territory of the messenger of the star spirit under the blue sky exploded with a loud bang right in the main hall. The guards in green uniforms rushed out to aim at the guy who was destroying the village. But under Li Jian's sword, there was only a belt left to hand over. Han rushed back and forth like a real ninja, attacking and slashing at will from nowhere. The more he went crazy, the more experience points related to Jian's position were increased, and he also received high-quality cloth, so Han was very happy. The others were so calm that they treated Jian as if he was having a seizure. The thing is, if you compare him to his rank, Han is not inferior to Kevin, the holy master of the messenger, so no one dares to catch him. Just now, Purio had explained to Jian that the messenger of the star spirit was like a mess, and the followers were divided into two factions because the star spirit Kevin had lost their trust due to his dictatorial personality. As the head of the Inquisition, Purio had every reason to be determined to stop the star spirit's autocratic rule and needed Jian's help. It was convincing, but Gad felt something was wrong somewhere. To the point of having to ask for help from an outsider, the internal situation of the messenger of the star spirit must be very serious. Not to mention that Purio also offered the sky punishment as a reward to Lysian. In fact, the sky punishment was his most advanced weapon 20 years ago. It was supposed to be lost in the Devil's Falls because Lysian never came back. But the more he felt that the Gemini bastard said that his weapon was in the palace of the messenger of the star spirit seemed to be true. So Jian went straight to the warehouse where the messenger of the star spirit's sacred objects were kept after taking down all the noisy old guys outside. Hurio whispered when he saw Jian stop, behind this door is the sky punishment. But before he could open it, Kevin ran back to the place, shouting to pull Lysian's hand away. Kevin was surprised to lead his army running like they were being chased by a dog, panting but still very happy when he found Jian with a radiant face. As soon as they saw each other, both of them laughed. It was true that they didn't need to say anything to understand what the other was thinking. It had been 20 years since they had greeted each other. He ran through the lobby to Jian. It was hard to hide the excitement in his heart. Hugo Arthur was always by his side. But why did this guy's face look so strange? Realizing that Purio was standing beside him, Kevin asked without hesitation. Oh, there is a traitor who brought Lysian here to get rid of me. I was about to roar at you. I will kill you one by one when Kevin's eyes and the guards who had been beaten to a pulp on the left side were hit. But what are you talking about? Suddenly he was silent so everyone was silent and looked at him. Kevin roared. Who is it? Who made my temple like this? His screams pierced through the ears of Purio and Taksu, and they could vaguely understand what Kevin was saying. So all three of them pointed at him at the same time, saying, This is the culprit, you too. What a bunch of traitors. No wonder they let me destroy the messenger's mansion without stopping me. Once the target was identified, Kevin's fury rose to the sky, and he roared again, you've given me another reason to defeat you, take this. Kevin's bright sword light swept through the air, blowing out ice that overturned all the way from him to his opponent, and went straight outside, 
blowing up the wall behind the crowd. But strangely, in front of Kevin's eyes, there was a raging fire, which burned a big hole through his ice and dripped water. Haksu's drunken voice echoed, Hey, hey, Kevin, you, you're hurting me. Before fighting Jien, you're fighting me again. His body was bursting with flames, but his face was still immersed in drunkenness. At the critical moment, they demanded to fight a few more battles. The news that Hugo had regained his power had of course reached Kevin, but he was not afraid, he was even more aggressive. Oh, I'm so scared of you. My body sees something on your finger, you can have it for free. Taksu, in his drunken state, pulled out three huge divine artifacts, the Earth Axis arrows, from the armory at once. With his own inner strength, he looked like a real blacksmith. He did what he said, Taksu grabbed an Earth Axis arrow in his left hand and threw it straight at Kevin's face, trying to pin his white hair to the wall. Just as he was about to catch it, he raised his sword high and retorted arrogantly, Do you want to fight me with this? With just one swing of his sword, Kevin easily blew the Earth Axis arrow away, but Taksu had three divine artifacts. As soon as Kevin stopped, he saw the second one just a few centimeters from his face. The loud bang blinded Taksu, but it didn't wake him up from his drunken stupor. He clenched his fist and swung it, stirring his silver hair. He felt ashamed that his master looked like a drunkard in a tavern, who was aggressive to anyone he bumped into, but Jian thought it was very normal, so he stood there listening to the phone. I don't know who was on the other end of the line, but it seemed to be someone he knew, so Jian said that he was in front of his master's sacred object warehouse, and asked him to come quickly. Kevin was surprised, he was not so easy to defeat. He leaned his sword against the ground and stood in front of the scene that had been ravaged by the electric axis, with smoke billowing. In short, the startup was done. After successfully provoking him, Jian suddenly appeared and asked for a little bit of a role. And he who likes to divide two, and he who doesn't like to unify one, he arrogantly said, get out of the way, you guys. Kevin burst out laughing, not letting his subordinates follow him. He said, this is a battle for adults, children, just watch. Singing the old song that I have been waiting for the day to defeat you for 20 years, Kevin stomped his foot on the ground and rushed towards Jien on the other side. The two of them clashed directly with their weapons, emitting a dazzling light. I have to say that Jien paused for a moment when he realized that this silver-haired guy had blocked his attack. To answer his question, the system reminded him that it took a whole day to enhance his strength. Now it was only 76%. What was he expecting? Realizing that Li Jien was distracted for a second, Kevin smiled beneath his silver sword and asked, Why are you so hot, my friend? Let me cool you down. The cold air from his master suddenly filled the air, seeping through every hair, freezing Jien's S-class scissors, causing them to shatter into pieces, and he himself retreated. He then unleashed a new move with the speed of a shrine, but Jien, the eel lord, dodged it without blocking. How could he have resisted his dirty tricks? Kevin charged forward with his sword in hand. Somehow, he took a full-on double kick in the toilet in Belgium, and easily knocked away his master's ice sword, then dodged several rounds of sword strikes. When he could no longer avoid it, Jien stood there, pulling something out of his armpit, and met his master's charge with a kind smile. He swung the huge object down just as Kevin swung his sword, easily smashing his fist into the ground at his feet. Under the weight of the crafted hammer, Kevin's sword was reduced to a hilt. He was shocked to see this sacred object, thinking that it was in the hands of Tred X, but now it was in Jien's hands. Except for a second when he was punched and burned by the dirty player, he roared with laughter, thinking about what to eat tonight, baby. The master staggered, trying to keep his balance, but instead of a slap from Jien's leg, he gave a refreshing smile on his murderous face. That's the familiar dogly Jien, let's not warm up anymore. Dropping the useless sword from his hand, Kevin's eyes lit up with triumph as he pulled out something that glowed like a neon light. As soon as the cold ice sword was drawn, the wind swirled around it, howling madly. Even Tak Su woke up from his drunken stupor and muttered in awakening. Jien was delighted to see his master's real weapon. When he saw him using a sword earlier, he was amazed. It turned out that he was only bringing out the good stuff now. Aha! Kevin didn't deny it because this thing couldn't be taken out just because he wanted to. The royal artifact, the cold ice sword, appeared with a distinct transparency, adding to Kevin's imposing aura. He glided past Jien, sat down like a frog, and asked, Little boy, can you move? My cold sword not only freezes the air, but can also handle your sacred objects. His hands and feet were locked, just as Kevin wanted. He laughed out loud, being imprisoned for 20 years has turned you into a cripple. Take my cold ice sword and wake up. The sword's path pierced straight through the object in front of it, causing blood to splatter. The person let out a gasp, causing the two centaurs to cry out in surprise, not noticing that Jien had appeared behind them. The one who was stabbed by Kevin was definitely not Jien, 
who was coughing and choking in pain from taking a terrible ice sword blow from his own master. Jian seized the opportunity, and the astonished crowd grabbed the crafted hammer, roaring, I knew this guy was a fraud. At this moment, Puryo realized that Jian had somehow seen that his master's trust was only 3%, while his own Tao of balance was 97%. Get the hell out of here. Both master and servant, the master was knocked away by Jian's hammer, crashing into the ice that Kevin had cast earlier. His eyes sparkling, Jian realized that the two had knocked down the door to his master's warehouse, revealing a block of ice that was heavily chained. A block of ice gleamed in the light from outside, and Jian recognized it immediately as the heavenly punishment pond, his baby calling out to its master. Kevin got up on his hands and knees, and before he could even lift his head, he started cursing at Jian. You're all out of luck. Even Taksu had to leave. So what's so funny about you? You betrayed my friend in the demon tower and now you're being betrayed by your own subordinates. He looked up with a blank expression, as if to say, what's the matter, old man? When did I ever betray that crooked face? Scolding the master's face, Taksu said irritably, you were the one who set a trap for Li Jian and stabbed him in the demon tower. Oh, you dare to slander me? Kevin stood up abruptly, ready to have a fistfight with the centaur. The two sides argued for a long time, which made the master even more angry. In this world, the thing that made him the angriest was being humiliated by others, so those few words were enough to make Kevin go crazy, and he raised his fist to punch the centaur. But his movement suddenly stopped, and his arm holding the cold ice sword was suddenly locked by Purio with some strings. The guy behind him chuckled, this is exactly why we should have ended everything with the blood bone massacre. Obviously, the dazzling thing was the Libra's golden law skill. Kevin stared with wide eyes, not understanding how a master apostle could have this skill. As if to answer his question, Purio pulled out the Libra's sacred object, the scales of justice, and activated the symmetrical exchange skill. One side of the balance appeared right under Kevin's feet, and three chains rose up. Purio's voice was heard, praying to the saint, Master Kevin Oya. Red light shot down from the sky, and the master struggled but could not escape the vines, making the situation more and more tense. Covered in cold sweat, Kevin decisively cast the Ice Age, and used his left hand to hit his locked right hand hard. In an instant, blood splattered, before the astonished eyes of the traitorous apostle. Purio certainly did not expect the saint, the master, to cut off his own hand so decisively. The people below were shocked, and Kevin's subordinates rushed over to support their holy master, who was about to faint from the pain. Although he had escaped with his life, his arm was still enough to be a sacrifice on the scales, so Purio smiled with satisfaction. At least seeing the master's face contort when he cut off his own hand was enough to make him happy. Kevin immediately used the ice to cover his wound to stop the bleeding, and tried to retreat to where his subordinates were supporting him. The symmetrical exchange on the Libra's scales immediately treated his arm as a sacrifice, opening up a magical space that was swirling madly on the other scale. Purio wanted to use Kevin's entire body as a sacrifice, and kill the saint at the same time. But one arm was enough to be an offering, so there was no fear of wasting the cost of the offering. He raised his hammer high, and then all three of them fired three different attacks that flew straight to the Libra's scales, intending to destroy them. But unfortunately, they were too late. All the attacks fell into the magical space that had just been opened, and not a single bit of energy touched the cunning man. In front and behind, the cracks in space opened wider and wider, gradually connecting with each other, turning the surrounding scene into a barren area with a blood-red sky. On the ground, things that looked like demonic hands rose up, all pointing towards a temple with about 200 steps. The whirlwind above was filled with dense, shapeless debris. In an instant, all six people were no longer in the master's palace. It was a long time since Lysian had looked so pale and uneasy, because he recognized this uncomfortable and obscure atmosphere. While he was thinking, Purio stood on a high platform looking at the crowd, declaring that this hell was their mass grave. The master's female subordinates were very angry. The two of them pointed their swords at Purio and cursed, you bastard, you dare to cut off your master's hand. Now the swords formed a cross and emitted a silver light. The two of them swung their arms and fired a blast of northeast wind that was meant to cut through the man's flesh. Unexpectedly, all that could be seen was the thick smoke and dust from the execution of the technique. The wind did not even bother to move a single piece. The two of them looked confused, not understanding why their master's ultimate technique had not been activated. Behind them, Kevin groaned and covered his face, looking helpless as he said that he could not use his powers. His trembling hand tried to summon it again, but to no avail. 
The connection to the ultimate god had indeed been severed. Gat realized that the female master was right. Even Tak Su could not use any of the golden, radiant energy of the gods. He could not believe that an ordinary believer had the ability to cut off the connection to the gods. Very quickly, the monstrous hands behind the two of them shook as if they were warming up their joints, then slammed down on the ground causing the centaur master and servant to jump up and run away. Hurio witnessed the helplessness of the others and laughed with delight, saying, you won't be able to use that divine power you're so proud of here. His laughter became more and more unrestrained as the people below struggled to fight off the hands that were trying to capture them. In this place, there was no power. Even a saint was nothing more than a small human. In the midst of the chaos, there was one who was faster and managed to escape with the colorful creature on his back. Lysian took several steps at a time and jumped out of the rubble, suddenly appearing in front of Purio. The man pulled out the Libra's scales that he had borrowed from somewhere and commanded the magical hands to successfully block Lysian's path. Among the things that looked like skin, there were some red things that were half like gems and half like eyes. Lysian vaguely realized that these were not ordinary hands at all. Trying to resist was tiring enough, and the traitor below spoke in a soft, mocking voice. Why don't you say hello to your old friends? Don't tell me you've forgotten them. You were friends with them for 20 years. They're the ones who pushed you to the brink of death in that demonic waterfall, hero. Grasping the meaning of the bastard Purio's words, Lysian gradually figured out the connection. Sure enough, it had something to do with these guys. The space was gradually being separated by the black nailed hands that looked bloodthirsty. Very quickly, the evil hands crowded together and slipped inside to search for their prey. And according to Purio, he claimed that these were indeed the evil hands that had appeared in that demonic waterfall. Here, they had heard the name of this traitorous apostle who wanted to eat all of them again. At the Thousandth Heaven Hospital, the weather was sunny but the air was gloomy and filled with smoke and dust. Sung Che gritted his teeth and endured the pain of his swollen cheek cursing in his heart that the dog Taewon had blocked all of his attacks. He laughed and waved the vines that held the fire-scorching mage's fist. Full of self-satisfaction, Taewon mocked him, saying that the difference between an A rank and an S rank was obvious, even to the naked eye. He raised his fist again and muttered, You may have been able to eat the idiot Shiwan, but you have no chance against me. With a wide swing, he sent the fire-scorching mage's hand flying and punched Sung Che straight into the opposite wall causing a large section of it to break apart before he finally came to a stop. Struggling to get up and coughing with pain in his back, Sung Che was shocked to realize that he had been knocked into his mother's hospital room. He didn't know what to do, but Taewon's footsteps never stopped. He immediately realized that this was the redhead's mother's hospital room. Taewon held the grimoire in his hand and kicked Sung Che in the stomach without mercy, causing him to vomit blood. Seeing the little guy struggling like this, Taewon was delighted. He acted like an expert and held up the grimoire, mocking him. It's just a scroll about how to use magic power, little boy. With that stupid, stubborn head of yours that's hard to train, it's no wonder you'll always be a rank A. He used the book to beat Sung Che up badly. Taewon waved his hand and created a small ball of power, sending the redhead to the afterlife with his mother. The wall and floor shattered beneath Sung Che's feet. The terrible aftershock sent his mother and her hospital bed flying straight into the hole. He screamed at the top of his lungs. There was not a single ounce of magic power left in his body to save himself. Horrified, Sung Che could not allow himself to fall to his death like this. He thought of his generous uncle, his lovely but always loving sister, and his father, to whom he had never said a kind word. Is there no one to help him at this critical moment? Sung Che's mind was still working hard to find any way he could, even if it was just some useless words to himself. When he saw his mother, who had not opened her eyes for ten years, falling with him, Sung Che immediately hugged her, thinking about how his father had never given up, no matter what, during the blood fog. Holding his mother tightly in his arms, Sung Che told himself that he could not give up either. As soon as the words of his determination to protect his mother rang out, a notification popped up, congratulating the bearer of the indomitable spirit recognized by the serpent constellation. He had the qualifications to take the serpent constellation's test and receive the power to fight against his enemies. What time was it now that the words appeared so timely? Sung Che roared. I don't care what it is, I'll do anything. Just let me protect my mother this one time. As soon as the words of his plea left his mouth, Sung Che's entire body was enveloped in the light of the serpent. The strange sight was seen by the lizard, who frowned in annoyance, not understanding how the hell this little brat still had magic power. The powerful energy of the serpent constellation enveloped both Sung Che and his mother, 
helping him to land safely without any aftershocks. The master of the serpent constellation was fiercely resisting inside the four giant arms that were trying to crush him. The saint of the virgin, the centaur, and the apostles were all stuck in a similar situation. Purio laughed hysterically, it's finally over. Damn it, I'm almost exhausted from preparing for this day. The more the others provoked him, the more arrogantly Purio opened his mouth. What the hell are you saints? You're just worms struggling. If you're so good, then squirm around more. After cursing to his heart's content, he turned back to Li Jian and asked, What about you? Are you going to hold on or give up? It's better to give up. Maintaining his pose of tensing his muscles and clenching his butt, Jian laughed and said, Why is this guy talking so much? I'm getting tired. Who the hell are you telling to give up, you bastard? Even when I was fighting the red chain eyes alone, even when I was wandering around the demon's tower alone for 20 years, I never thought about giving up. Who the hell are you to tell me to give up here, in this situation? He lifted his face with his usual arrogant expression. You useless little brats actually think you can step on my head? How naive. The more Jian talked, the more excited he got, and he started laughing out loud. I told you to take it easy, but you inhaled too much and started hallucinating, you idiot. When Jian's attitude scared Barrio to death, he had to take out the golden scales again and order the Majir hands to crush him to feel at ease. He said that he would fulfill his desire to die, but in his heart, he just wanted him to die quickly so that he wouldn't feel scared. Coincidentally, in front of Yuan Tagoon was also the blue light of the serpent constellation. Sung Che flew up and threw a punch, hitting the damn dog right in the face and sending him flying far away. The blow dislocated the blonde's jaw, and he spat out a mouthful of blood, apparently breaking a few teeth. When he landed, his whole body was still filled with magic power. Sung Che told him not to even think about saying the words give up to him. I will never give up. I'm tired of being powerless. My mother is still here, Uncle Yuan is still here. I will protect everyone with my own hands. Sung Che's determined roar helped him pass the Serpent Constellation's identity test, officially becoming the first apostle under Lysian. In the virtual space, he also received the signal that the first apostle had opened a new chapter in the Lysian Bible. From now on, every step he took would be recorded by the power of the Serpent Constellation. The power radiating from Lysian pushed the calamities away from him. The light poured down from heaven like a waterfall onto the new apostle, who hadn't washed his hair in five years. Everyone present was illuminated by the light. They couldn't believe that this was Lysian's true power. The pillars of light pierced through the entire calamity hands, from the smallest to the largest, and pierced the barrier that had created this world. He had lost another pair of veteran apostles, and he stepped barefoot up the stairs to the terrified Purio. Zian's clothes were torn to shreds with each step he took. This was what it meant to use the recording power of the Bible to create his own legend. He strode up to Purio, who was now shirtless, but Zian had more important things to deal with than this indifferent guy. Suddenly, he remembered that the barrier was collapsing, revealing the real world. He glanced at the heavenly punishment behind him. Paying no attention to the annoying obstacle, Lysian pushed him away with a single shove and reached for the exquisite weapon. His five fingers gently grasped the hilt of the heavenly punishment, and he casually snapped all the annoying wires around it. Hurio began to shiver. He couldn't believe that Lysian had been able to pull it out with just his brute strength. He tightened his grip on the hilt and smiled. Oh, boy, it feels just as familiar as it did 20 years ago. Hefting it up and slamming it against his shoulder as a greeting, Lysian felt extremely gratified when the heavenly punishment finally returned to his hands after such a long time. It was one of the eight great relics in the world and Lysian's ultimate weapon, so it was no wonder that he missed it so much. As soon as he smiled and said, I haven't had a chance to stretch my muscles in 20 years, a huge hand appeared above his head and tried to grab him. He didn't even bother to turn around. He simply stabbed it into the heart of the calamity hand, causing it extreme pain. The cold eyes of the superior being swept across the star skin with disappointment. Are you saying that you've already stopped attacking? If one hand isn't enough fun, then let's use both hands to get the job done. He swung his sword and slashed straight at Purio. A light several dozen meters long shot out from where he stood, and the ground cracked open with a terrifying roar. The unfortunate people who were caught in the blast were thrown in all directions, but thanks to this move, they were able to escape successfully. Kevin's eyes seemed to freeze for a few seconds when he realized that Jien's attack had split the ground all the way down to the deep lava below not just plowed up the surface. The owner of the chaos was still smiling with delight. He asked Purio, who was writhing and struggling over there, if he wanted to see him do it again. Different from those Libra guys, you know. I don't like to give up. His heavenly sword looked like an antique that had been delayed by ten years. It slowly descended to where Purio was half kneeling and half sitting. Jien smiled arrogantly once more. 
Do you want to give up without saying a word? Grabbing the Libra relic like a life-saving straw, the guy shook it in his hand and roared in fear, everyone, charge. The hand-shaped eagle hands that were left all rushed towards Jien, only to be gathered together for him to deliver a simple blow. The slash caused them to shatter into unrecognizable pieces, and the entire surrounding space seemed to be torn apart by his sword strike. However, the one thing they didn't lack was numbers. As soon as Jien lifted his foot to jump up, there was one above and one below him, suddenly closing in on him and trapping him inside. Purio had just stood up and was about to scream when he saw the light of the serpent's technique shining through the cracks, lit up the entire area and then separated, revealing Jien, who was now standing tall and proud, looking very pleased. It was so gratifying. It had been 20 years since his weapon had tasted the blood of a calamity. The excitement made Jien look like the final boss of a horror movie. In order to salvage the righteous image of this story, Kevin stabbed his ice sword into the ground and cast the seven moon stars. Side by side with Tak 2, who was now a high-level player, he summoned the heavenly glory. The two of them created a magnificent wind that could both freeze movement and purify the filth of the calamities. The virtual space was destroyed, so the connection with the absolute god returned to normal. Both Apollo and the historian appeared in the sky above the five people, shouting the slogan, the star of the historian, the star of Sagittarius has been revived. Why are these guys always so dramatic? Do they think they're auditioning for the Power Rangers or something? He didn't have the support of the absolute god, so why was he so terrifying? Purio was so scared that he wanted to run away from this place because he couldn't believe that Li Jian could be so strong. But it wasn't that easy to escape. A piercing scream from Purio rang out as a silver-clad foot stomped down the stairs. Kevin jumped up and used his other hand to swing his sword, wanting to retaliate for the other side that had knocked his sword away. Purio had no way to avoid the earth-shattering slash. He could only watch as the slash cut across his face. Kevin couldn't believe that his power hadn't killed the bastard but had instead healed Purio causing something strange to burst out of him. Quickly pushing the person away to examine it, he vaguely realized that it was a form of skill, not blood. Those things flew into the air and gathered together to form a talking head, saying, I didn't want to meet you guys like this. Now that he had revealed himself, how could he still hide his identity? Kevin had already recognized the aura of the figure in front of him. It was none other than Jean-Louis Morin. After some perfunctory greetings, Morin leaned down and whispered to Purio, don't even think about running away. Don't you want to destroy all of them? Without waiting for an answer, Morin let out an excited laugh and gave him another chance. He used his power to roll Purio's flesh and blood into a pile of goo that flew straight up into the air, along with the pieces of his arms, legs, and ears that had been cut off earlier. Morin's deep, hoarse voice echoed through the space. He was offering Purio as a sacrifice to the gods to become a calamity and complete his mission. His mouth was covered, so he couldn't say anything to agree or disagree. With Morin using the Libra's equivalent exchange skill, there was no turning back once Purio was placed on the scale. Gene actually waited for the performance to finish. He whispered, Hey, is that silver-haired guy really named Purio? Kevin knew this guy's identity all too well. He was probably going to give him some more nasty nicknames. Pretty perceptive, huh? He asked the guy from the female country how he felt about calling him Purio the Colossus. He did look pretty colossal. Kevin was too tired to even speak. He didn't know how Hugo Arthurs normally put up with this crazy guy. The two of them burst out laughing. The poor otaku could only curse them out. There was nothing else he could do but accept it. Up above, Purio the Colossus was being strangled by the big and small hands, making choking noises as if he was suffocating. Jien was willing to wait for it to transform into whatever kind of 12-hole freak it wanted, because his body was continuing to strengthen and would allow him to use it once it passed the 80% threshold. Thinking back to how he had just waved his hand lightly and unleashed such powerful force, Jien wanted to test out how much of a difference his newfound strength would make, so he waited for the calamity Purio to finish transforming. He still raised his hand into the air and waved it lightly, but this time Jien put more force into it and struck down at the monster's head. Suddenly, his tiny hands stopped and he looked at the path of his slash in surprise. Outside, under the clear blue sky, Jin Meng, who had been summoned by Jien, was standing in front of a pile of ice and snow that was blocking the palace of the historian. He didn't understand why Jien had called him here when the temple was in this state. Surely it wasn't to watch him fight the holy lord of the historian again, was it? As soon as he finished speaking, the ground cracked open and a huge chest burst out, causing him to jump back in shock. Oh my god, I can't believe that the historian's temple could fly in here like this. A young girl's voice appeared next to Meng. 
She seemed to have arrived a little late and needed to ask him if the thing that had just exploded was the historian's temple. He was surprised to see her here. The two of them stopped talking and looked at the traitor who was lying on the ground, foaming at the mouth. A bare foot kicked out and a curse rang out. The enhancement was so strong that he couldn't even control his own strength. Jien's fingers were itching. He complained that the enhancement was only 85% complete and it was already like this. He wondered how fierce it would be when it reached 100%. He wasn't used to his body's new abilities yet, so he didn't care about anything else, but the owner of the historian sanctuary did. Kevin roared, you blew up my temple. The news of Purio's defeat made the criticism of Jin Morin more intense than ever. He hung his head and admitted his mistake, adding that he hadn't expected Lysian to bring those people with him. He heard criticism from above about why he had dared to show his face to them. He shrugged, as if it was only natural to catch Lysian. His answer was seven parts mocking and three parts irresponsible, and he received a flick for it. Jin Morin's entire body was bound by golden chains. He tried his best, but could only kneel on one leg. He lowered his voice and admitted his fault, only to receive a bland response from Libra. I hope that stern tone comes from the confidence that you will succeed in the future. The superior's face became even more obvious when she asked Morin, tell me, what will they do next? The flick of the hand made the chains even heavier, causing Morin to gasp for breath as he tried to answer. Kevin Urza will definitely claim his innocence, so the place to go is the Scorpio constellation. The two best friends looked at Kevin in confusion and asked if he was really saying that the person who hurt Jien was Scorpio. He tilted his head and confirmed that it was definitely that saint. Taksu rushed over, grabbed his shoulder, and shook his head violently, because he couldn't believe that Haley would never do such a thing. Trying to stay away from this crazy blonde, Kevin reminded Taksu not to be so foolish as to trust her just because she had helped to deal with the matter. Let me tell you, if I wanted to take down Jien, why would I have to sneak around in the demon tower? I'll stab that little bastard in front of everyone, so that everyone can see. Glancing at his subordinates, Kevin asked them to lead the way to the hidden vault of relics and left. Turning back to tell the other two, the knife that had stabbed Jien in the demon tower was nothing new to Kevin. The passage down to the secret storage was cleared, and the door leading down was still intact. Leading the other two down, Kevin said that he had been investigating in secret for a long time, because he wanted to find out who was really hiding among the gods. As soon as the door opened, Taksu's eyes were drawn to something glowing purple. These were all the things that Kevin said he had found while investigating the Scorpio constellation. They were all related to an unknown civilization. They would be the ones to threaten the first human civilization. That's not true. The sound of someone new's footsteps echoed on the stone stairs, causing the three of them to turn around and look. Kevin recognized her as the eldest daughter of the Sagittarius Saint, and asked her if what she had just said was not true. That's what he said. The Scorpio constellation is very dangerous. I just came here after returning from the Scorpio city. I was helped by Lady Haley, so I know for sure that she is a good person. So I think your judgment is a bit hasty. Hearing that the young woman had been to Scorpio city, Kevin eagerly asked her where it was. As tense as a bowstring, and Long's stomach in the other hole swelled up like a drum, causing the group to lose interest in exploring any further. They decided to go and get something to eat. Outside the cafe, there was a sound of breaking dishes. The staff and customers in the cafe all turned to look. Lysian had crushed another glass cup in his hand. He had broken several similar ones already. He was still muttering to himself, wondering why he couldn't control his strength again. The historian saint roared at him to stop playing around with his strength. He was crazy to sit in someone's restaurant and crush their dishes. Only Zohar thought his uncle was so cool. He could do anything, and he should keep doing it. His face was flushed and his words were soft. This was definitely a sign of being infatuated. Kevin shouted and asked how Sagittarius had taught his son, but he didn't dare to answer. Suddenly, the madman Lee Zian stopped crushing things and stared at him. Kevin felt uneasy. His hand reached out and grabbed his head, lifting it up easily. It was also because his body had been fully enhanced. Lee Zian's weak human body had been replaced by a first-level divine body, so he was just testing his strength. Taksu was delighted. He quickly told the white-haired man to sit still and stop messing around. Pulling out his whip, Zian grabbed the two of them by the head. Kevin saw the strength in his eyes turn into a joke. Who was it that said to sit still just now? Why could they say it but not do it? Seeing his uncle grab the two saints by the head and spin them around like grasshoppers, Zohar couldn't help but laugh. He thought it was so cool. After throwing the two noisy guys away, 
Zohar squeezed in and asked Lee if he had a message for Zian. Pushing the wooden pen, the golden truth was placed in a box with a cushion. The appraiser jumped up and shouted, Oh my god, this is one of the eight great relics. I didn't expect to see it here. As soon as he held it in his hand, the intelligence mission was completed. It was as if it was a secretary who specifically recorded the affairs of the Afiyukas constellation. Thinking back, Lee would always hide or run away whenever she saw Zian. But why did she give this to him? Zian thought she hated him very much. Putting aside the purple glowing things in Kevin's basement, Zian learned that they were indeed related to the scorpion. Kevin was thrown to the ground and shouted, Did you hear that? I told you so, didn't I? I told you that the scorpion woman was related to the unknown civilization. Getting more and more angry, Kevin blurted out, 20 years ago, I saw that little girl playing tricks on you. She took advantage of when you weren't paying attention and poured something strange into your food. I saw her do it with my own eyes, so I'm sure of it. It must be that woman who hurt Zian, no one else. Can you say something more convincing? What kind of purple stuff were you pouring into Zian's food? With a calm face, Kevin explained, this is a tonic. He told Zian that he always had to fight against those monsters with his mortal body, without the help of the gods. This is also the reason why Zian couldn't defeat me. Because he lacked strength, I, as a gentleman, added some medicine to his body to help him. Now that you know, there's no need to thank me. How kind of you, Taksu said suspiciously from behind. What's the difference between the tonic you put in his food and the poison that little girl put in his food? Ming interjected, do you want me to judge you? He was immediately met with Kevin's angry scolding, who asked you to mind your own business. The two Chinese guys started arguing about medicine, forgetting all about the experienced appraiser who was standing there, feeling like he was about to die of boredom. Never mind that immature young saint. He sighed and apologized for the fact that the leader of the heretic inquisition of the goddess was involved with another constellation. And someone mentioned that, Zian had already felt that something was wrong from the beginning. The guy with the great authority couldn't reconcile or control it, so he had to send out troops and ask an outsider for help. Who could believe that? Jin Myung nodded because Puryo had planned from the beginning to use Zian's side to eliminate each other. Talking about it made Zian very upset because all the information he had investigated so far had only pointed to the goddess. They must have planned this for a long time to make all the clues point to the goddess so logically. From the XBF jeep that had to be mentioned, to the woman Hair Eisen, they all gave the same answer, the goddess. It was so consistent that Zian had actually believed it for a while. In the demon prison 20 years ago, he couldn't remember if the person who stabbed him had silver hair or not. But if he was only going by hair color, then besides the goddess, there was still the Libra woman or any other saint with light-colored hair. Remembering Vin's righteous words, he wanted to publicly punch Zian in a crowded place. He didn't think the goddess was that person. So what do we do now, sir? He tilted his head to look at the little girl, keeping his answer the same, find the constellation after the scorpion. Although the clues were currently unclear, Haley was definitely involved in this matter to some extent. The fact that she had given the wooden pen to Roha made him even more suspicious. Suddenly, he said that he needed to meet his devout believer. Zohar was taken aback, and Taksu was pouring the tonic into Kevin's mouth. It sounded like Seth was hitting him sideways. He stammered and asked, My friend, what did you just say? Looking at his excited expression, he replied, My friend, your devout believer is my first follower. Taksu screamed, and even Zohar became a curious ghost and asked, Why is that, sir? Turning around, didn't the evil uncle accept that little boy instead of his nephew? Do you mean that you don't want to answer? Let me go and ask him. The little girl swiped her fingers on the screen, sending continuous messages to her brother to question him. Her murderous aura made Jien terrified. He didn't want to divide the sisters in order to gain followers. Unexpectedly, Sungchi never picked up the phone. This made Zohar even more furious. She increased the speed at which she called and sent messages until she felt sorry for the phone. It wasn't that her brother didn't want to answer. Sung Chi's phone was vibrating on the ground some distance away from him. He was gasping for breath at the moment. Finally, this madman Ion to one shut up. He was exhausted. He looked up and sighed. He didn't know that his sister had been calling him repeatedly. A gray suit appeared right outside. He praised Sung Chi for being so good, for defeating the Libra's S-class apostle. He was startled to see the nurse holding the magic book. She even thanked him for saving her the trouble of shocking it to one. Although she was disguised, when Sung Chi asked who it was, the person immediately dispelled the transformation skill borrowed from the Pisces constellation. The familiar square glasses appeared, along with the greeting, it's me, the commander of the Gemini constellation, Sung Hup, boy. Oh my god, why didn't you just appear normally? Do you like to cross-dress? Appearing in a grand manner only to be thought of as a pervert who likes to cross-dress, Hee Up was very upset. He said that he was here to take this magic book. Oh, my bad. 
If you want it, just take it. What's the problem? Sung Chi, the girl, didn't understand very well. At first, she had only planned to borrow it. She hadn't planned to take it. If someone asked for it, she would return it. He had obtained the book, but Sung Hup didn't leave. He smiled mysteriously and said that he still had many questions to ask, starting with what had happened to the Saint Ha Yijin. Using the magic power from the book, he summoned several teleportation circles to interrogate the Gemini trader. Legs stretched out from the circles, quickly forming a circle around Sung Chi. They wanted him to go with them to be interrogated. On the other side of the room, where the Gemini people were standing, Uncle Le Guan was breathing heavily. He didn't know if it was because his aluminum-bottomed nephew was in danger, but his eyes began to ache. Finally, he opened them and saw the hospital floor. Sung Chi stood in the middle of a circle of a dozen people with dark faces. He couldn't believe that the people he had once listened to in the auditorium were like this. From the moment he was just a selfish person who put his own interests first, got fat, and borrowed money from others or asked him to run to the supermarket to hide the truth, Sung Chi had vaguely realized that this guy was not a good person. Now that he was pointing fingers and cursing, the two sides had officially declared war and neither would give in. The apostles used the Gemini constellation's super soul skill. They combined their magic power to summon a huge teleportation gate above them. Sung Chi was not afraid of so many people bullying him alone. The power of the Afiyukas constellation surged through him, making him feel more confident. Suddenly, the power that had surrounded him was gone. Sung Chi felt like he had been blown away by a gust of wind. He looked up and saw that his power had been sucked away like the smell of food by an exhaust fan. But this was a technical error. The Gemini people had asked each other why the little boy's power had been sucked away, and Sung Chi had flown in. Suddenly, a hand shot out of the magic array in the sky, accompanied by a giggle. He he he, it's been a long time since I've seen such a powerful force. Always be that way, baby. A figure that looked like a human but was five times larger emerged from the magic array, to Sungi's extreme shock and horror. What the hell is this? We didn't summon this god. Although the result was wrong, he remembered seeing Ha Yiren holding her head and screaming in excitement. This was definitely something she had wanted to summon but couldn't. The strongest of the first generation of elf kings, Elysian, turned his old face to see who had summoned him. The apostles were asking each other in a panic if they had really summoned the elf king by combining their magic power. Could it be because of the forbidden power in Sungi's hand? In the end, no one knew why they had summoned Elysian, so he had to explain. The one who sent the summoning signal was indeed you, Gemini. But the one who really summoned me here is the power of this red hair. He turned to ask Sung Chi, who was still in a daze, where he had gotten such a powerful force. He even said bluntly that he wanted that power, even though it was under the protection of Gemini. Sung Chi stammered when he heard that the elf king wanted to leave the Gemini sanctuary, and shouted, how can that be? Why the hell not, you little brat? The connection with the Gemini saint has been cut off. What has the saint lord, who has been missing for so long, become? You're right, Sung Chi. I can't scratch it, but it's very itchy. We have to take advantage of the fact that Sung Chi and the old man are making a pact to keep the elf king in the sanctuary. Thinking this, he pointed straight at Sung Chi and demanded the boy's power. He braced himself and called upon the magic power of the Afiyukas constellation, mockingly provoking them to come at him. But to everyone's surprise, Sung Chi deflated like a balloon in a matter of minutes, completely drained of power. He looked at his hands and feet in confusion, unable to figure out where his power had gone. The old elf king hesitated and asked, I think I've drained all your magic power. Holy shit. Sung Chi yelled, Old man, save me. Are you just going to watch? Oh dear, we're not that close yet. We've only just met. We don't even have a pact yet. The old man's face turned as red as a young girl's, leaving Sung Chi speechless. Sun Gi was overjoyed. Just now, who was the one who was so smug? Why was he so quick to back down now? Ding. Go and follow Gemini back to your father for interrogation. The wall next to Sun Gi suddenly cracked. Then a black-haired guy with his head down ran over like a bull and headbutted the bespectacled guy. The ground and rocks shattered beneath his feet, and the dust flew up, but it couldn't stop Sung Chi from recognizing the figure. He looked familiar. He was wearing a hospital gown with the buttons flying off, but he looked incredibly strong. After punching the other guy, he asked aggressively, who threatened my nephew? Zhang Jun's face had just looked up when he heard Sung Chi exclaim in delight. It was true that Uncle Zhang Jun had just woken up and had dug a terrible path from the other side to this side, stepping on the face of the Gemini commander. A person who had been bedridden for 10 years couldn't even walk, let alone have this kind of strength. But Li Jian had injected Afiyukas energy into Zhang Jun's soul. So now he had the powerful regenerative ability of the Star-Lord. The two Gemini guys were still arguing with each other. Sung Chi said, 
I have one more person on my side. Two against one, you'll be crippled if you don't go blind. You have two people, but I have one more. Someone swung in like a monkey and landed right next to Sung Chi, making him jump. There were a few more people on his right, reinforcements had arrived. Sung Chi smiled happily and watched them raise their flaming bows to threaten the Gemini people, telling them to surrender quickly or they would have holes in their heads. Just when they were thinking, the space behind them distorted and a portal reappeared. A middle-aged face shouted for them to retreat. The operation to summon the forbidden book had failed. Before the subordinates could recover, the portal sucked in all the stunned people, even those who were yawning like Sungi, who hurried into it. They disappeared before they knew it. Sung Chi, who was no longer protected, finally dared to breathe a sigh of relief. It was finally over. Long time no see, Sung Chi. His voice was so familiar that it took him back to his childhood, when he was only as tall as Zhang Jun's waist. Now he was almost as tall as his uncle. Sung Chi was happy, but the Sagittarius team members were ten times happier. Finally, their leader had woken up. He even asked Chen Xian to give him a special highlight with a sunny smile. Lijian didn't join in the fun. His gaze fell on the book that the cowards had left behind on the floor as they ran away. In the midst of all the joy, a voice calling out his full name made Sung Chi jump in fright and turn around. The voice belonged to none other than his crazy sister, Zhao Hua. On the surface, she appeared normal, but her words were anything but. Who would ask if he was hiding something from her as soon as they appeared? As soon as she heard Sung Chi deny it, Zhao Hua said, Don't even try to lie to me. I know about Uncle Zhang Jun's apostles. Zhang Jun who didn't know anything, had to come out and save his nephew. He had been drunk and gambling, but he had woken up in time to successfully divert Zhao Hua's attention. It was the first time a Lijian had seen this red-haired guy act so strangely. He hadn't been afraid to fight earlier, but now he was. He whispered, if you wanna run away, make a pact with me. I'll move to the sanctuary through you and then take you away. That way, we both benefit. And so, the pact between the first elf king and Sung Chi was formed. He moved from Gemini to Afiyukas in one go giving the boy a little power to spread his wings before he was beaten to death by his sister. Zhao Hua turned around and called out to Sung Chi, but it was too late. The boy jumped down and teased her, Ha ha, you were born before me, but I'm Uncle Zhang Jun's first apostle. As he landed with a mischievous smile on his face, Sung Chi was about to run away when he suddenly froze. Zhao Hua was surprised to see this as she landed. Her eyes met two people in the corner of the wall on the other side, who had the same expression as her brother. Yeren looked happily at her mistress, who had recovered, and recognized the two children. Zheng Jun tilted his head and called out Sung Chi and Zhao Hua's names gently, are you two okay? Why are you in the hospital? It's less busy in the Virgo area. The group followed Kevin to an old-fashioned teleportation station and sat down to wait their turn, as it required a certain number of people to teleport. Kevin explained that it was less efficient and less common than Gemini's teleportation portal, but Li Xian waved his hand, not wanting to hear any more. Han Hao listened to his friend talking to his daughter on the phone. His mother had woken up healthy and well, with no strange symptoms. Tears of happiness streamed down Taksu's face. It had been a long time since he had cried so freely. Lo Oha took the opportunity to tell him about how the Gemini constellation had been chased away by Sung Chi and the Sagittarius group, and that Dan Khan Tae Jun had temporarily disappeared. Li Xian didn't know who that was, but Gat next to him reminded him that it was the eldest son of Libra. Taksu was right to be angry about that guy because 10 years ago, after the bloody incident, he had found out that the main culprits were the two noble sons of Libra. In the midst of his grief over losing his wife and his helplessness, Taksu had gone to Giselle in the rain to question her. He asked her if it was true that she had covered it up, and that he had all the documents that Giselle had hidden in his hands. The goods that were shipped to the airport were transported by Libra, and the two sons were on the passenger list. He had also investigated the surviving witnesses. Taksu had come to Libra to find out if it was true that her sons had caused the disaster. The sound of the rain outside made Giselle's voice so soft that he had to strain his ears to hear her but her calm demeanor was so obvious that he didn't need to look at her face. Her venomous eyes flashed as Giselle asked in return, what are you going to do about it, when you're just a man with a little bit of leftover power that's not even worthy of the name, Saint? Taksu tried to control his trembling as she said calmly, I apologize on behalf of my sons for causing such a tragedy. I will pay more attention to them in the future. It was the kind of textbook response that Taksu couldn't accept, 
and Giselle also asked sharply, isn't it true that you couldn't stop it? If Jian had been there, would such a great disaster have happened? Can't you see that you failed to protect the country that Jian entrusted to you? After twisting the knife in Taksu's wound, Giselle placed the Libra scales in front of him, forcing him to choose one of two paths. If you're confident enough, then reveal the truth to the outside world, or use your uselessness to handle the aftermath. You should let the children go, they don't know any better. You have children too, so you should understand, right? She smiled slyly and said, I still remember the names of those two, Sung Chi and Zoha. The way she called the names of the two young children made Taksu stiffen. His hands clenched into fists around the evidence. Giselle was threatening him blatantly, but he couldn't fight back. Torn between what he could and couldn't do, Taksu finally made a decision that would affect the present day. Because at that time, the Holy Master had given up his power for the safety of his two children, and had suffered a hundred times more. He had given up everything to find the whereabouts of the Scorpion brothers and put an end to this. Jian realized that this was why Taksu had sent his two children to different constellations, simply because the power of the Sagittarius constellation had weakened and could no longer protect them completely. Ever since Sung Chi had left Gemini to become his apostle, Jian had felt much more at ease. He opened the information panel curiously, wanting to know what duties the boy would have as an apostle. For someone who was just starting out with a holy order like Jian, the tasks were very clear. He needed to create a constellation badge and appoint a commander above SS rank. Just as he was thinking about who to appoint, his friend came over to brief him on the situation. Jian's brooding expression made Taksu nervous. He was afraid that he would grab his head and test his strength again, so he quickly backed away. Suddenly, the crazy Jian asked, Hey Taksu, do you want to come to my sanctuary and be an apostle? I'll make you the commander. Before he could answer, Apollo appeared with a menacing glare. He immediately launched into a tirade, warning the dog Jian not to even think about looking at someone who had already made a pact with him. Only when the two Sagittarius members greeted and bowed to Apollo did he leave with disdain. Kevin shouted, why didn't you invite me to the sanctuary? Did you hear Jian ask if you wanted to join? He had already raised his middle finger and laughed at him. Why would he believe the guy who had just screwed him over? Jian continued to kick the silver-haired bastard even though the announcement came that it was their turn to teleport. Taksu rolled his eyes in disgust. Why was it so noisy? Gad was immediately curious and asked the holy master, what's wrong? You don't usually behave like this. Because of what happened earlier, that girl was so mad that her younger brother was allowed to join the serpent's nest that she started banging on things. She couldn't contact Zohar, so she demanded to go back to South Korea right away to test her naughty brother's butt. She met Gad and whispered to him, blushing, that he had a way to get her back to South Korea quickly. He smiled broadly and said, why don't we go together? I'll take you there. Just as they were about to leave, Uncle Ming interrupted them with something even more interesting in the entire book of teleportation. Of course, Zohar accepted immediately, leaving Gad behind as the odd one out. The fox cursed her virginity and died. Before leaving, Zohar asked, is Uncle Jian going to the scorpions? She continued, the scorpions are in a separate location, blocked by the calamity to the east and west. The only way to get there is to go through America, where the Leo constellation reigns. The little girl teleported away to take care of her brother, promising to meet everyone in America and then teleport together to the scorpions. Before leaving, Zohar didn't forget to call out, father, uncle, and smiled sweetly, thanking them both for fighting. She had seen them fighting side by side in the bloody battle. Oh my, that face is so adorable. Jian had to compliment his friend for raising such a good daughter. Tak Su was excited to talk about his experience with having children, but his eyes suddenly met the face of Gad, who had been left out and was full of questions. He hadn't asked before, but now he had to. Hey, idiot, did you sign a contract with Zohar? Gad didn't dare to say, yes, I like your daughter, so Tak Su grabbed him by the neck and dragged him away. So, on the teleportation platform, the group of guests split into two pairs and started fighting each other, refusing to teleport. Finally, all four of them got to the gate and prepared to teleport. Taksu asked, why do you have to bring Kevin along? He's your friend? To prove how much he cares about me. Kevin's eyes sparkled when he talked about having to wait until the day he defeated Lysian. Anyone who tried to destroy him before him would be stopped. Meanwhile, the female knight laughed out loud, thinking about the beautiful prospect of her killing Lysian, as if he wasn't even there. The operator asked for the coordinates of their destination, and the group eagerly replied, 
Washington, D.C., USA, the sanctuary of the lion that would take them there. The information that Lysian's group was on their way to Washington, D.C., was soon discussed in the meeting of the lion sanctuary. They chuckled among themselves, saying that they had to prepare a great show to welcome the powerful Lysian. The next day, the Leo Constellation's parking lot in the United States was packed with people. In the center was Stephen, dressed in black and red, standing like a statue, the MC's voice echoing in his ear, announcing that the battle of the century between Stephen Marker and Lysian was about to begin. Stephen's ears were ringing from the deafening cheers of the audience. He didn't understand why he was here, let alone who he was. On the opposite side, a guy in a t-shirt walked over, yawning. Stephen really didn't understand why he had agreed to appear here. A few hours earlier, in the capital of the United States, Lysian's group had just arrived at the sanctuary and were immediately greeted by a statue of Stephen Marker, standing majestically on a lion, looking cool as a cucumber. The four of them huddled together and whispered. It was okay for this guy to be so arrogant, but wasn't he taking it too far? Little did they know that the white-haired guy behind them was trembling with excitement. He couldn't help but exclaim that it was so cool. When he returned to the sanctuary of the Virgin, he would have to do the same. Just as he was about to tell the kid that he couldn't learn anything good, suddenly, there was a loud noise. People were calling out to each other, look, it's Lysian. A group of people holding signs and flags that said welcome to Leo excitedly said that they had come to welcome Lysian and take him to Stephen Marker. Why were they only welcoming him when there were four of them? Kevin complained, but he was immediately choked by Taksu and forced off the stage. But how could he escape the gaze of those who had already begun to speculate? On the left was Kevin Yura, and on the right was Hugo Arthurs. Lysian knew that he couldn't defeat the Lord alone, so he invited his followers to join him. He kicked Gion's foot, which was full of dirt, and told him not to provoke him. These idiots must have been after his weapons. The other man ran over in a panic and handed him a letter with a wax seal that looked very official. He said that he had come to invite him to the Leo Constellation Arena. The arena he was talking about spanned the entire United States, with no rules regarding gender, nationality, or age. Anyone who wanted to could enter the arena and fight, and the strongest would be chosen. Silently ordering his subordinates to drag away the man who had been kicked unconscious, the other man did his best to introduce the pyramid scheme. The holy war was always packed with spectators because of the presence of the saints. The most recent battle had taken place 30 years ago and was also the only battle that had taken place between Stephen and Jien. They were here to make sure that the fighters would appear and recreate that classic battle once again. The Leo headquarters in the United States, which was equipped with all kinds of rooms and equipment, Stephen's surprised voice rang out. What do you mean, fight Li Jien? Who decided that? I just did a few dozen deadlifts and haven't even had a chance to drink my protein shake yet. He stopped short when he heard the shocking news. Who else but that Oliver guy? Now he has the nerve to tell the Lord to relax and let him handle the rest. He added another sentence to make sure that everyone knew about the time Stephen was thrown around by Li Jien in the Philippines. It was so embarrassing, so he had to take this opportunity to turn the tables. Stephen was bored listening to Oliver's nagging about remaking history from 30 years ago. He didn't even bother to respond. Yes, Stephen had been declared the winner at that time, but he didn't want to talk about it again. Oliver kept whispering in his ear that Li Jien had agreed to fight. Lord, we've invited many politicians. As an economist, he didn't notice the look of terror on Stephen's face. The more he listened, the more frightened he became. Finally, he screamed as if he had seen a snake in the bathroom. Just like that, the historic battle was about to take place, with Stephen sitting in a corner, wrapped in a towel, as if he was repenting. He didn't say a word, just let Oliver talk his head off, it was truly a great fight. Turning around, he pointed at himself with authority and encouragement, but Stephen couldn't help but feel that there was something fishy about this guy. He wondered if he was looking for an excuse to get revenge on him. Unable to bear it any longer, Stephen stood up and left. Where else would he go? He was so angry that he turned around and said, Can I go pee? Are you coming? Oliver muttered, thinking that he was running away. But when the Lord's shadow disappeared down the corridor, a cunning smile spread across his lips, as if everything had been part of his plan. Stephen did go to the bathroom, and after washing his hands under the faucet for a while, he suddenly saw Lizzie Ann's tall, frowning figure appear behind him in the mirror. Just seeing Lizzie Ann standing next to him was enough to scare Stephen to death. He must have known, so he called her loudly, his voice slow enough to make Stephen's hair stand on end. What's the conspiracy? Do you think you can handle this battle? He was about to scream. But then he realized that he should look at this from a different perspective, so he smiled and said gently, your death 20 years ago was hard to bear. What do you mean, bringing that up all of a sudden? Lizzie Ann asked, puzzled. At that time, you were the symbol and spiritual pillar of humanity, 
making them believe that they could win. The news that you had died in the demon tower really shocked them. That year, I didn't believe it, but I had to accept it in my grief. Wait, wait, stop talking nonsense. Lizzie Ann was not moved by the sight of Stephen mourning for himself, but to Stephen, it was the truth. Because his philosophy was that he must never let humans see the saints show any signs of collapse. Looking at himself in the mirror, Stephen clenched his fists and admitted to himself that he was the necessary villain in every movie. There was no need to pretend to be noble and pure. His clenched fists would support humanity. Because nothing worried Stephen more than humanity falling into despair, so it didn't matter if he was scolded as useless. Suddenly, Stephen's smile turned into a gentle, helpless one. He said that he was willing to bear any burden, as long as the vultures disappeared. This kind of enthusiasm was so easy to see through. Lizzie Ann wanted to skip that part and hear what this yellow-haired cat had to say. Oh my god, this guy still didn't understand after hearing so much. Stephen had no choice but to get straight to the point and said awkwardly, can you just watch this match for entertainment? Ignoring Lizzie Ann's desire to punch him, he tried to explain that these three matches were just a formality to select a fighter to fight against the vultures. The drier Stephen's lips became, the more obvious the anger on Lizzie Ann's face became. She was bored and didn't want to listen anymore. She said, I'm really upset. It's not fun anymore. Let's all go home. Stephen stopped and realized that this was the end. His eyes wide with panic, he turned around and asked indifferently, is it really that hard to ask for a draw, my friend? That was before the two of them faced each other in the lion arena. The loudspeaker kept ringing in his ears, and Stephen kept breathing in and out, trying to calm himself down. Glancing back, he saw the crowd waiting. Stephen tried to believe that Zian would keep his promise to cooperate with him. Ladies and gentlemen, the announcer's voice rang out, announcing that Zian had requested to fight all the fighters at once, so that everyone would have a chance to show off their arrogance. Stephen felt lucky that Zian had agreed to a simple condition, to bring those who were worthy of fighting the vultures. He agreed immediately, but he didn't have any. However, he thought that Lee Zian was cunning and would definitely want to use numbers to fool the audience. From there, he would use a little trick to turn it into a match where everyone who participated would be happy to win, focusing on the action rather than the result. In this way, both Zian and Steven would benefit. They could freely use their strength and contribute to an exciting match. All they had to do was please the fans. But unexpectedly, the MC suddenly announced that the footage of the fight between Lee Zian and Steven 30 years ago would be broadcast on TV right now to warm up the atmosphere. As soon as it started, it showed the lion punching Zian in the face, sending him flying across the big screen. Steven was embarrassed and startled. He explained, oh, oh, you have to believe me. I didn't tell them to show this. It's a technical error. Looking at Lee Zian's face, did he look like he believed him? His expression was gloomy, as if a winter wind had swept by, and he said softly, you know how to make me feel disgusted. Oh no, this is really bad. Steven felt the lion inside him collapse. This time, he was really in trouble, and the screen kept showing Zian being defeated over and over again. So he pointed at Steven and roared, why do you keep playing this over and over again, when I lost on purpose to get the money? Steven, who was also furious, roared back, what's so funny about you? I don't have the right to replay it even if I paid five billion dollars. Damn it, everyone has heard it now. They're gossiping about five billion behind our backs. Steven panicked and shouted like a madman, start the match, everyone, go. So everyone aimed at Lee Zian and attacked him together, but unfortunately, they couldn't even touch his toenails. Zian jumped away with his hands still in his pockets and started the battle, but the argument just now had been heard by the audience. Taksu had never heard of buying a match from a lion, but he must have gone to beg for money as well. But Kevin, who was also there, couldn't accept it. He roared, what the hell? Pulling out his ice sword, the Valkyrie roared, why does that dog Zian like to fight with these guys and not with me? If you want money, just tell me and I'll give it to you. Retracting his sword, Kevin jumped down into the arena, ignoring the centaurs who were shouting and trying to hold him back. So Taksu and Gat, one on each side, ran after him, preventing the white-haired man from causing chaos on the battlefield. In the eyes of the Lion Guild, they had become Lysian's accomplices, who were afraid of losing and had charged up together to fight to the death. They shouted that they must rush forward to stop them, which led the audience to bet on the game and roar. Who allowed you to rush into the battlefield? The entire competition area became a chaotic market. It was a rare situation where all the girls who knew how to fight rushed in. Whoever ran faster was immediately kicked in the face by a strange foot. It was Kevin who was very angry. He didn't care about his image as a saintly Valkyrie and beat up anyone who got in his way and prevented 
prevented him from fighting Lysian. The audience in the live stream comments were in an uproar. Damn it, when the saintly Valkyrie appears, who dares to stop her? Let's just fight. In an instant, the entire arena was in chaos, with one side fighting the other, and neither side willing to give up. In the VIP room, they had a clear view of the situation. They were about to turn around and ask Commander Oliver what to do, but he was nowhere to be found. Oliver walked out into the hallway alone, muttering to himself, Damn it, why is everything so complicated? Just as he decided to proceed with the next step, Zohar, who had been waiting there for a long time, suddenly asked, what are you going to do? Oliver was startled, like a dog thief caught red-handed by the owner. He called out, Vice Sect Master, where have you been during such an important event? Zohar narrowed her eyes at the idiot in front of her and asked back, where I go and what I do, you know best. Why do you ask so strangely? Why are you asking me about the task you gave me? Oh my, how confusing. It's as if I've really forgotten. Zohar concluded, making it clear to both of them, since when has Oliver spoken so politely to me? It definitely isn't the real Oliver, because he never says anything without cursing at me. Zohar strode over aggressively and asked in a low voice, who are you? In the arena, the battle was now a chaotic mess, as fierce as two gangs fighting at the docks. The situation became more and more tense, and no one seemed willing to stop. Stephen gasped and called out the name of that damn Oliver. What kind of choreography was this? The battle had turned into a pigsty. Suddenly, more than a dozen people rushed in to attack at the same time, making a loud noise and knocking everyone away. Lysian's punches hit everyone, and he immediately collected information on their dodging skills. So he fought harder and harder, and within seconds he had kicked a dozen people back towards the lions. He fought so hard that his hands were smoking. He looked at Steven with satisfaction and thanked the sponsor for helping him collect a lot of very useful data. Steven's long hair was drenched in sweat. Since Lysian had no more opponents to fight, he would definitely come after him. Using the excuse that the damn video had been released and could not be ignored, Steven gritted his teeth and asked, Did you start the fight just to collect data? Of course, Lysian waved his hand and threw the guy he had just grabbed, saying with a smile, That video was just an excuse. It turned out that he had been teasing him like a cricket in the palm of his hand from the beginning. Steven tensed his muscles and flew into a rage. He threw his body like a dream and decided to fight Lysian. Unexpectedly, his nostrils were hit by his direct punch, and his face was deformed. Steven was knocked back into the wall of the arena and rolled around for a while before he stopped. As soon as he opened his eyes and looked up, he saw Gion's punch coming at him. Steven had no time to react, he could only dodge it because it was so fast. One punch is a drunken punch, two punches are a drunken punch, three punches are an airplane, and four punches are eating shit. Steven tried to brace himself under the continuous rain of punches, gritting his teeth and cursing. He never thought he would have to endure such a thing. But what could he do if he didn't endure it? Lysian knew that Steven needed time to transform into a saint, so he kept punching him non-stop. As they were fighting, they heard the white-haired man shout. Kevin gasped, holding the sword in his hand and roaring, Hey, let me fight too. But before he could run over, two figures jumped down from the upper floor and crashed through the tiles. Kevin recognized the familiar figures, and of course the other two recognized them as well. It was the commander and the vice commander fighting a fierce battle in public. Zohar's punch on Oliver cracked the ground under her red power blowing away the curious crowd so that she could interrogate the monster and make it show its true form before it was torn apart by the Inquisition. Sure enough, Oliver immediately disappeared due to the Pisces transformation skill being dispelled, revealing the green-haired sulfur monosulfide class Pisces member Sylvia. The stupid Leo men roared when they saw this, oh my god, Captain Oliver is actually a girl? How could they not see it? Zohar became even angrier and kicked the woman even harder. Kevin, who was standing behind her, got up and trembled with embarrassment. Every time he fought with Jien, he was always interrupted in such a ridiculous way. Not this time. He drew his sword and was about to rush over to Li Jien when he suddenly noticed that the ground looked strange. It turned out that the ice sword had somehow stabbed into the chest of a young man. For a moment, Kevin didn't know what to say. The image of him stabbing someone in the chest was broadcast everywhere, becoming violent content that was banned for children under 18. Social media exploded with the phrase saintly Valkyrie kills people, and the entire battlefield, which had been in a fierce battle, suddenly froze. Kevin was like a child who had been ostracized and tried to explain, oh my god, I didn't do it. The person next to him said sarcastically, how could you be so perceptive? The white-haired man was so scared that he almost turned pale. He slowly looked over and saw the corpse continue to speak. Hello, Kevin Ora, 
you have a very sharp eye. The light from the corpse was dazzling to those who were nearsighted. Then, the energy of the Libra constellation radiated from it, somehow resurrecting the corpse that had been stabbed by the Virgin. There were sounds of astonishment all around. Could it be that there was a Libra spy within the Leo? Jien gritted his teeth when he heard the voice. Why was there a Libra in every fucking place? It was none other than Giselle, who smiled and said, Hee hee, hello, Lysian. Long time no see. After the pleasantries, she turned to Kevin and praised him. In the midst of chaos, you were able to guess that I was hiding in this body. As expected of my opponent, the holy saint, Kevin Ora. All eyes were on the holy saint virgin. He knew that he was being watched by many people. He was sure that no one knew that he had accidentally stabbed the wrong person just now, because he didn't know that there was a Libra inside. Kevin Ora could only open his mouth and smile, admitting that he had done it on purpose. Killing two birds with one stone, he escaped the accusation of murder and was praised for his keen eye. Even though it was a lucky shot, it was better than nothing. Oh, back to Lysian. He asked curiously, how the hell did he survive the devil's waterfall? This exchange of greetings was not pleasant. He had recently told him to shut the fuck up, because he always played dirty tricks that were unlike anyone else. Giselle was scolded but didn't feel it. Well, she didn't expect to see Lysian, but she had to admit that he was really strong. She glared at Kevin and said, oh, what are you going to do now? I thought you were going to stab Lysian in the heart. His face turned pale. Why are you dragging me into this? But then he quickly realized that his reputation was at stake, so he shouted, Who are you colluding with to set me up? The puppet in Giselle's hand laughed wildly. It's obvious how you acted when you killed Lysian. Everyone knows about it, so why are you denying it now? Shut the fuck up. A terrible pillar of fire suddenly fell on the Libra puppet, and the terrifying vortex made Kevin panic and scream. Don't make so much noise. You know what Libra is like, so why do you listen to her? Still intact and unharmed by the centaur's attack, Giselle turned to him and laughed terribly. Your power is amazing, but that's not enough fire to burn this body. The female Kevin's sword had already noticed him charging at her from her right side, and she directly took the sword because she was prepared which shocked the female warrior. His sword pierced the Libra-shaped shield, and he continued to listen to the woman's insults, saying that he was so thick-skinned for stabbing Jian in the back 20 years ago, and now he was fighting alongside him, which was ridiculous. She tried to push the sword forward, but Kevin was powerless. She didn't understand why the guy, who was just a puppet of the saint, had such great power. As if to answer the centaur's thoughts, the puppet turned its foot, which glowed with the Libra sign, and confidently showed him the divine court seal on its foot. The divine court seal was a special holy mark that the gods bestowed upon those they loved. With it, the apostle was granted the power to connect with the saint and use their power. This meant that Giselle's puppet had the same power as the real one, who had appeared here to use her skills. Right behind Kevin, Jien's unhappy voice told him to back away. He grabbed the heaven's punishment and jumped up, preparing to give the guy a blow. But even he couldn't touch a hair on its head because the Libra shield had immediately been erected above it to block his attack. The puppet looked up at him and laughed gleefully. With the divine court seal, it was as if it was being protected by the gods themselves, and those who were not gods could not break it. But even though he had just snapped a few of the shield's strings, they were quickly patched up before his eyes. It was Jien's turn to laugh gleefully. Are you scared now? That's the expression you should have, little Libra. His sword slashed across the puppet with great force, cutting the magic shield in half and splitting the figure in two, revealing Giselle, who was coming out of the body. Atta, who had been disconnected, was still sitting on his throne in the Libra sanctuary, muttering, the divine court seal is broken. I didn't expect that, but it's interesting. Giselle was laughing gleefully, and a man's dark foot appeared in front of her. He asked, it seems that bringing Jien into the lion's arena wasn't a good idea. Oh, it's not surprising that the newcomer doesn't know. I'll explain it briefly. Kevin Ora found out, otherwise it would have been successful. Giselle glanced at the blonde man with the short hair and asked him with satisfaction, how do you feel? Should I call you the future saint of Leo from now on? The noise in the Leo constellation arena temporarily disappeared, leaving only smoke gradually dissipating in the wind. Looking at the system notification that he had acquired the Libra skill divine court seal, Jien put on a disappointed face. What kind of saint can't even catch a puppet? At his feet, on one side was the charred corpse of the puppet, and on the other was Selvia, who had been knocked to the ground. Apart from Kenzo Ha, who had discovered that Oliver was an imposter, 
none of the other saints here had been of any use. Kevin asked if he was a god, since he could destroy the divine court seal of another saint, but he was immediately refuted. Even Taksu couldn't believe it. The divine court seal is bestowed directly by the gods. Even saints have no way of destroying it. Lysian pretended not to know or care, wanting to drop the matter altogether. There's something more important here, he said, pointing to Stephen, who was lying on the ground as if dead. Does everyone agree that he won this battle? Someone from the centaur side objected, blaming the appearance of Libra and the chaos caused by the audience, saying that it was not yet known who had won. Damn it, I've given you face, but you don't know what's good for you, Lysian threatened. Try saying that again and see if I don't cut your beak off. The centaurs were immediately terrified, and they turned to whisper to each other, what do we do now? They didn't dare to speak up, since their saint lord had already fainted, and the commander Oliver was nowhere to be seen. So, all of you Quasaroa with the greatest authority here want me to decide whether to acknowledge Lysian's victory or not? Asking the right person, Zian gently called out to Zohar, what do you think, my dear? Uncle, you know very well what I'm going to say, but you still ask, of course Zohar declared to everyone, Zian has won. Damn, that's great, Zian was overjoyed, but only those loyal to Leo felt sad for their saint lord. Standing at a distance, watching people cheering for Horian, Kevin whispered to Taksu, isn't he mistaken? He didn't have a divine guardian 20 years ago, did he? Isn't that strange? Lysian was able to destroy the divine court seal with his own power, without any divine blessing. Not to mention his own inner strength is already terrifying. Taksu knew about these things, but he didn't understand what Kevin was trying to say, so he tilted his head and asked a very serious question. Could it be that Zian is the absolute god of the new Star Lord? Look at his blank face when people cheer for Horian, he looks quite similar. A moment later, the arena echoed with Lysian's cry of bye-bye, ordering the defeated lions to bring their spoils to his piggy bank suck it up. A few lion cubs who had been crowing earlier were forced by Zian to sign a contract to transfer to the constellation of Ophiuchus. As long as I can increase the number of apostles to collect more taxes, anyone who is unwilling will be put on a temporary list. Looking at his triumphant face and the little girl who was looting and plundering, Kevin suddenly felt that his hypothesis might come true, and the earth would surely weep. He let go of the leader, the best at pissing off the lions, and made him gag to show him who was boss. Kevin was held under the armpits by the centaur, trying to analyze whether this guy Lysian really had the potential to be an absolute god. You said he can summon the gatekeeper god easily, when normally they don't listen so easily. And why don't you think about why he's so strong but doesn't have any absolute god's blessing? Yapping and cursing, the lion made Kevin shut up, saying that humans are humans, how can they become gods? Both sides' children's words reached Lysian's ears, but he didn't come out to correct them. He was now thinking about the Libra who knew where he had been stabbed. It was as if Giselle had actually witnessed him being stabbed in the demon tower. Lysian quickly came to the conclusion that this woman was related to the trap that year. Thinking back, Giselle had always had a close connection with the absolute gods. Could it be that the saints had participated in the conspiracy to silence him that day? While thinking, Lysian's gaze and the bulletin board of the baptism mission for the apostles appeared. The new members of the Ophiuchus group needed to be given holy names and to awaken skills that were different from those who did not have this privilege. It was time to meet his beloved nephew, his first follower. Lysian glanced at the two young men behind him and said, hurry up and pack your things, let's go. Thinking that there were still many things to be solved here, Taksu stopped asking and saw his friend holding a copper coin from the Ophiuchus constellation. He said that since his wife and subordinates woke up, he hadn't returned to South Korea. That's why Taksu didn't need to see Sung Che very much. In Canada, Open Bones where the Scorpio Sanctuary is located, the news of Zohar announcing Lysian's victory was clearly displayed on the magic mirror for Haley to see. As she sipped her tea, she muttered that the Leo constellation was not her home, because there was no door to Lysian. Leaning forward to get a better look at the person in the mirror, Haley suddenly became bold and lunged at the handsome face of the winner, reaching out her hand to enjoy it. Just then, a subordinate from the gate sect ran in and shouted warm up, SOS Saint Lord, the hospital in South Korea is under constant attack. After shouting, the little girl realized that her Saint Lord looked strange, but no matter how she asked, he wouldn't say anything. Beating the drum over the matter, she asked her father about the cup upside down on his head 
but Haley wanted to hear about the hospital. She had just said that it was relatively stable there because of the centaurs, when a subordinate reported that the astronomical observatory had seen the 13th constellation, which was none other than Lysian. Thanks to Sung Che, he was also the first follower of this constellation. This was information that Haley paid great attention to because the 12 zodiac signs had created a special astronomical observatory to record any changes in the constellations. The forces that had to be shared with the 12 zodiac signs, certainly none of them would be pleased to know that a 13th zodiac had come out of nowhere. Once the first follower had appeared, the other saints would surely try to prevent Lysian from expanding his power. Stopping her head up, she asked if the hospital attack was because other followers had attacked to eliminate Sung Che? If that's the case, we need to send someone to protect the kid. The subordinate was shocked. Lysian had already left, which made Haley very scared. That little kid hadn't even received the order yet, he had already jumped from Canada to South Korea. Soon, from afar, Lysian saw a huge explosion in the hospital area. It had been plowed into a mess and become flat ground, not just simply torn apart like before. But the attack was not from the apostles of other constellations, but from the three gatekeeper gods and the fire bitch who were determined not to let those who were quite suspicious enter and harm Sung Che. Seeing this violent return, who would dare to jump up again? Just pulling out a string of warrior kings and saying a word would sweep their swords across and make them get lost. Even Sung Che, who was hiding under the bushes and watching, felt chilled. The old demon king whispered and praised this kid for being smart. He knew that two people couldn't beat him, so he played big and called the gatekeeper gods to come. Speaking of which, Sung Che still felt very happy. Earlier, those gods still wanted to smash him to pieces, but now they were listening to him and beating those guys. At first, the gatekeeper gods who were summoned were very arrogant. It was just a little kid who was favored by the Saint Lord and wanted to give orders to them. But in the end, Sung Che also had three big bodyguards who were better than water. His mother had already been rescued by the centaurs in the mountains, so it would be nice to find a way to sneak out of here. Suddenly, Zhu Jin appeared right behind him, asking him directly, Are you Sung Che? Why are you appearing out of nowhere like a lost soul? Sung Che jumped out like a frog, dropping the Afiyukas copper coin that Li Jian had given him. As he was about to jump over to pick it up, a loud argument suddenly rang out from it, and then whoosh, Sung Che's father's pot fell right in front of him. It seemed that the old man's landing had made this son lose his rhythm. Tak Su held his head in pain and said that Li Jian was busy and had gone elsewhere. What kind of child sees his father but not his uncle and shows a disgusted face? Fortunately, there are many times when the father wants to say it, but hasn't said it yet, my son. Seeing the hospital in ruins and smoking before his eyes, Tak Su was about to ask his son about it, when Zhu Jin suddenly walked over. With his father's protection, Sung Che pointed at and told on him, saying that this was the assassin who was trying to kill him. As soon as Tak Su heard it, he cursed immediately, causing Zhu Jin to speak up to defend his innocence. Both father and son Tak Su refused to believe it, saying that the fact that he had appeared suddenly behind him must have been with bad intentions. Suddenly, the sky shone down with a familiar orange-yellow light. It was Apollo appearing with a tall and meaningful look at Zhu Jin. Even Tak Su didn't know why his god had suddenly appeared, but Zhu Jin seemed to know something. He turned his face and cursed him, but the gods just came in unexpectedly. His eyes glanced up and began the skill of reading the scriptures of the centaurs. He saw the book turning over in front of him. Zhu Jin's hand gathered something like a pen from the space in front of him. He chose a rather long passage and edited it according to his wishes, saying that the light disappeared into the dark night, and humans were no longer blessed. As soon as that sentence was written down, Tak Su immediately felt a strange feeling surging in his body. As soon as he stopped looking up, Apollo disappeared suddenly in the same way as he appeared. Just as Zhu Jin had edited it, the sun could not appear in the dark night. Only to himself, with a look of pleasure, Zhu Jin confidently concluded that he had eliminated a god. The centaur's supreme god could not come in anymore. It's not over yet. He still wanted to see how far Tak Su would dare to challenge him. He opened the centaur's scripture and picked out another passage at random and intervened in it. This time was directly related to Tak Su. He coughed up and vomited a painful sound, and the whole ground cracked. Sung Che was very shocked, but didn't know what to do. He only knew that Zhu Jin had just read a passage in the centaur scripture. But how can he edit the scriptures when only the supreme god can read it? But the content of this brat is too different. Tak Su's head was aching like a hammer, but he still came up with a crazy thought. Could Zhu Jin edit the scriptures? The scriptures record the achievements and events of the supreme gods who have come to the stars. From the way of being born, 
their achievements have all been recorded and become legends and myths. From then on, they were worshipped by people, and created faith that became the source of power for the supreme gods in the stars that they worshipped. Apart from the supreme gods, there is only one entity capable of viewing and changing the scriptures, called the teacher of scripture. In the past, the supreme gods had eliminated all those who possessed the ability of the teacher of scripture and the subordinate gods, because their arrogant nature did not allow them to ignore those humans who acted blasphemously towards the gods. Now Tak Su understood why Apollo had suddenly appeared just now. Zhu Jin laughed heartily when he saw the arrogant attitude of the centaur saint now turn into a face covered in sweat. He was still planning to brag some more, but under the bright moonlight, Li Jian appeared from nowhere and aimed at the green-capped head and landed with a bang. As soon as he breathed out, Jian criticized his friend. Before you knew it, he had already been beaten up badly. Why don't you deal with him quickly and go back to help my father? What are you doing here for nothing? That year, the entities sent by the gods destroyed the teachers of scripture and the subordinate gods and swept through many places, wanting to kill all those who could interfere with the power of the gods. An entire village was massacred by the people of the clans who had the ability to give birth to the aforementioned different humans. Zhu Jin was not yet 10 years old that year. He witnessed the scene of killing without flinching in his own village. He only dared to hold his stomach and not utter a cry. A few days later, the little boy was bandaged and treated. He suddenly opened his eyes on the hospital bed. He sat up, and beside him, someone had already spoken, as if they had been waiting for a long time. Haley simply asked the little boy how he felt, but Zhu Jin was too scared and his face was full of alertness. Until she closed the book and her face showed a gentle expression. She said, this is my city, it's very safe, rest assured. Zhu Jin's groan in his dream of his childhood resounded in the middle of the empty park near Scorpion Hospital. He was hit hard by something elastic and pink. In his coma, he kept calling Ms. Haley. The group of centaurs saw Zhu Jin open his eyes and immediately ran over to check on the situation, and unexpectedly, the thing that had hit him was Limi, who could change her shape into anything. So no matter how much they clamored, they were still hit hard. As soon as he heard his subordinate report that he had woken up, Tak Su shouted in surprise, Ji Hu Ah, and then ran like flying towards his wife. On the other side, Ji Hu also shouted in response, Oh, my dear and then the two of them rushed into each other's arms. They hugged each other happily, as if they had never been separated. The excited look in the eyes of the centaurs was really beautiful, but in fact, the subtext was telling the brat to wake up. Where is the lady? Jian noticed Zhu Jin, so he walked over there first. He asked the young man with interest, your ability is very interesting, isn't it? Are you a teacher of scripture? Zhu Jin tried to deny it vehemently, but Jian's glancing eyes used the skill of the god's eyes and then left no room for denial. Knowing that the teacher of scripture could not conceal information, Zhu Jin immediately activated the skill of shadow shift of the scorpion clan. He turned his body into a red liquid substance, stepped on a few columns, and shot out of the reach of humans. He flew over the couple who were embracing each other intimately. Zhu Jin reached out his hand to grab Zhe Guang as a hostage and escape out. But the hand of the strong man was faster. He pushed Tak Su away from Zhe Guang and caught her. He rushed out of the reach of the brat Zhu Jin. Needless to say, the boy was very angry. He thought his speed was unmatched, but he was still overwhelmed by Li Jian. He immediately chased after and grabbed Zhe Guang from him, but no matter what he did, he could not catch her. One person yawned and the other howled with delight. Zhu Jin was driven mad. Now, forgetting Guarihu, he only wanted to punch Jian hard once. Zheng Che did not understand why his mother was laughing so much. Only Le Guin was willing to tell him that the lady was a die-hard fan of Li Jian. Being hugged by her idol made her so excited, while her father was petrified and then roared with anger, quickly let go of my wife. You teacher of scripture, why don't you run away? Why do you keep harassing my wife? Do you want Jian to hold her and fly everywhere? Zhu Jin wanted to escape very much, but he was too angry. He had to punch Jian once before he could feel at ease and leave. Unexpectedly, Ji Hu was too excited. She laughed and said, Honey, wait a little longer. When else will you have the chance to be hugged by Mr. Jian? Fatally, Tak Su was so angry that he coughed up a mouthful of blood and then hugged the ground and cried in anger. Even Zheng Che felt sorry for his father. Jealousy is not right at any time. Why would you bring a sense of failure like that? Zhu Jin flew over and came back in such a hurry. But the group of people still had time to talk. He was so angry that he opened the Bible of the constellation. Jian intended to dip his hand into it. Unexpectedly, a series of error messages appeared. The sanctuary has no records, and the Bible has no readable entries. While he was surprised, he realized that this was a new constellation. Jia's hand had already pressed down from above and directly stuck the brat, giving him no way to escape. Who would have thought that the
the doorkeeper god would appear at this moment. They broke through the house, reached in, and looked inside. The endless chase came to an end. He still did not let go of Ji Hu. Jian asked coldly, just now, you wanted to open my Bible? As soon as he finished asking, the system popped up and informed him that Yu Jin Trishan was the target of the final wisdom challenge. He did not forget to instruct this person that he could threaten the safety of the constellation. Therefore, even though he did not like it very much, Jian still opened his mouth and said, I want you to become the teacher of scripture of the constellation of Ophiuchus. Of course, he was not willing. He trembled with anger but firmly disagreed. He even raised his middle finger and cursed Jian to go to hell. He was not a patient person. He tried to persuade him, but this rude attitude was even more annoying. So he tilted his head slightly and snapped his fingers. The ancestral sword of his god family, ZL, immediately descended onto Yu Jin's head, but it did not stab him. The boy was wrapped around by a red scorpion's tail, which held him tightly and did not allow ZL to attack. Something like blood gushed out from under Yu Jin's body, but it could gather and float in front of him. Realizing that it was the sacred beast of the constellation of Scorpio protecting him, Yu Jin still could not believe that it would appear here at this time. The scorpion's tail dripped red drops onto the ground at a super fast speed. They gathered together quickly and turned into the lower body of the sacred beast, and standing in front of it was a figure that was very familiar to Yu Jin. The holy master and the scorpion, Haley, had appeared. As soon as she appeared, she sighed. Fortunately, she arrived in time, or the little boy would have lost his head. Why did you act arbitrarily without my instruction? I have already instructed you not to act carelessly. I wanted to interrogate the boy further. Suddenly, behind Haley, Li Jian's greeting sounded, which made her stiffen. He stared at her. Get to the point. If you don't want to be killed by me unintentionally, then answer quickly. Out of the blue, Haley froze for a long while. She stared at Jian without blinking, as if she was looking at a creature that she had discovered for the first time. She did not speak for a long time. The sacred beast roared in front of her. Haley finally came to her senses and turned her damn head around. She was so dizzy that she felt like her head was spinning. Of course, everyone around did not know why she was like this. She could even turn her head 360 degrees. She was really amazing. Du Ding looked up at the holy master who was high and mighty. He suddenly knelt down and prostrated himself on the ground, trembling violently. Above, the three gods and the two sacred beasts watched the drama until they held their breath. When the sacred beast hurriedly ran over to see what had happened to her, Haley was already running on all fours. She was not wearing anything. She just wanted to walk on all fours. She had no idea that Li Jian was here from the beginning. I heard that he was in Lion City. Why was he in Korea now? Haley covered her mouth and tried to calm herself in order to breathe deeply. She turned around and looked at Jian calmly. But in Haley's eyes, Jian was like a male god who had passed through ten beauty filters. He was extremely handsome and asked what he was doing here. Oh my, she couldn't take it anymore. Her heart was beating like a drum in a school assembly. She couldn't stand his aura. She just covered her mouth and wanted to hide somewhere. Why were so many people behaving so strangely today? He had not spoken for a long time. His attitude was even more strange. Jian suppressed his anger and finally could not bear it anymore. He reached out and grabbed Haley's shoulder. He shouted at her to wake up. This made her face and nose turn red. Oh my. Li Jian had touched her. She screamed as if he were a snake. There was no trace of the coldness of the saint of the constellation of Scorpio. Even the sacred beast had to speak up to prevent Li Jian from taking his hand away. The holy master was very excited now. Please don't make her even more embarrassed. He sighed. It was obvious that Haley hated him very much, which was why she behaved like this. The saint of Scorpio in his hand was so hot that he felt like he was going to faint. With no other choice, Jian turned and called for Sung Che, while one of his hands was still holding Haley. The boy had just finished kneeling and asked him what he needed to do. His hand had already touched the red hair on his head. He simply told him to accept the baptism. Do you mean to hold a ceremony to meet the holy master and be recognized as an official apostle? When he heard him say yes, Sung Che wanted to jump up. Such an important ritual. Why is it being carried out in such a hurry here? Jian didn't care. He didn't have any of those useless things. He emitted a blue light and started the ritual without giving the boy time to resist. When he opened his eyes again, Sung Che had been sent to a dark space. He tried to look around in the dark, but he couldn't see anything. Sung Che was wondering why the abyssal god had not appeared yet when a line of text appeared above him. Do you want to become the first believer of the constellation of Ophiuchus? After a few seconds, he accepted. It was clear that after reading Jian's name, Sung Che believed in the constellation of Ophiuchus and was ready. The text disappeared. Behind him, there was a bright light that shone on his back, 
causing Sung Che to turn around and look immediately. A crack opened in the dark space, and then the figure of the abyss god, which looked very much like a human, flew out of it, dazzling his eyes. Trying to get a better look at the shape of the abyss god through his two arms, Sung Che suddenly felt that this image was so familiar. The snake's mouth opened wide and emitted light again, keeping the shape of two arrows, one in front and one behind, aimed at Sung Che, who was still in a daze, and pierced him straight through. Sung Che screamed in pain as he suddenly received power and skills, and then he gasped for breath for a long time until he finally came to his senses. Taking his hand away from his nephew's aluminum head, Jian smiled and asked him how it felt. Sung Che had stopped being in pain and was now feeling good. The baptism was over and he had skills. He felt like he had to open his mouth and praise him in the amazing woodshop. The boy held his head in disbelief. His uncle was actually the abyss god of the constellation Ophiuchus. The boy was much smarter than the other two idiots combined, who had been arguing all day without knowing the truth. Sung Che was howling with joy, and Haley was staggering over from the other side to congratulate him. Just then, Jien received the skill of a believer. The high level of belief gave him the effect of a 13th sense, and he immediately burst out with a surge of power to test it out. Jien flicked his hand towards Haley, intending to grab her neck. At the same time, the doorkeeper god discovered the scorpion's tail rushing towards it and tried to stop it, but the former king's powerful arm moved even faster than the hour hand, successfully blocking the tail's path. Jien's hand stopped right at Haley's neck, but he did not grab it. He asked her with interest why she did not dodge. She simply knew that he would not harm her, so she asked him what he wanted to ask her earlier. His thirteenth sense was working very well, so the first thing Jien asked was, Explain to me, why is there a trace of the mysterious civilization on you? To be more precise, it's in Haley's eye, which she covered with the part of her neck that Jien was trying to squeeze. Sung Che listened very clearly and understood. Uncle Jien meant that Haley was actually an eagle's ear. He smiled as if he were the only one who knew the truth. Gale did not expect that even the abyss gods could be easily fooled by her. The sacred beast behind her roared and cursed at Jien for daring to lay a hand on the princess. It would risk its life to kill him, but Jien had long since become an earth rank. In fact, these subordinates were just eagle ears disguised as sacred beasts. After all, there was no sacred beast in the world that would dare to listen to the words of a saint. And to call her a princess, how sweet. It never expected that the person it was trying to protect would admit that he was from that mysterious civilization. Raising her head, Haley told him that although she was from that background, she considered herself a human being, and her eyes did not waver when she said that she was on the same side as him. That's a good line, Jian said with a smile. You have to prove what you say to be believable. He had a way to prove it. He glanced at Limey, who had already spit out a piece of paper with two simple questions for Haley to answer. What do you think of Jian, and what kind of relationship do you want to have with Jian in the future? Taking the pen and writing without hesitation, Haley handed it back to him. At this moment, for some reason, she smiled slyly like a merchant who had just cheated a naive customer. On the paper, Haley wrote that she thought Jien was a comrade and wanted to have a strategic cooperative relationship with him. She thought that she had already expressed her sincerity by saying it herself. Writing it down was just a formality. Jien nodded in agreement and then pulled out the pen of truth, which Haley was familiar with but which also terrified her. He was making her use this to write down what was in her heart to see if she was being sincere. But the first question was what do you think of Jien? Wasn't that a dead giveaway? How could Haley write I love you to death? You're so amazing that I betrayed the mysterious civilization and came here? Seeing Haley's strange behavior, he looked back at the questionnaire to see if there was anything wrong with it. No, it was fine. She could write the second question first. What kind of relationship do you want to have with Jien? Haley made up her mind. Even if she had to die here today, she had to snatch back the pen before everything went to hell. Looking at the answer Haley had written down, Jien could only sigh. This pen must be broken. It had written such strange words. But the others who read it did not think so, especially Sung Chai, who was so excited that he screamed and ran off to find his sister. This is an emergency, sister. Brother Jien's reputation is being threatened. Jien looked back at the paper, not understanding anything. Haley did not dare to stand up and face him either. Let the sacred beast explain it to you. Don't you understand yet, you god behind him? As a princess, we chose humans, so we turned our backs on our own civilization. That's why we chose to sacrifice ourselves for that person, Li Jian. Haley roared and covered its mouth. Her face was as red as a ripe tomato. She was afraid that if it said one more word, she would faint again. Just as he was about to leave, Jian stopped him and asked one more question. 
Pointing at the dagger hovering above his head, Jian wanted to know about the weapons of the mysterious civilization. He said that this was the weapon that had stabbed him in the ghost tower. With an embarrassed expression on her face, Haley explained that it was a weapon that contained the power of a monarch. By the way, she said that a monarch was the highest rank in the mysterious civilization. The weapons from that place contained the power of a monarch, and they were so powerful that they could even threaten a saint. According to the sacred beast, Haley tried to stand up and said that even he would not be able to resist that weapon. Because it's a dangerous item, I've already recalled it and sealed it, as you can see. Thinking back to what Kevin had said about the warehouse where items from the human civilization were stored, Jian concluded that this must be the reason why White Hair had found these weapons in the scorpion's lair. They were all shocked and could not believe that that civilization had its own leader, since they had already dealt with the red-eyed chain 20 years ago. Unfortunately, the red-eyed chain was not the strongest, and there were at least three others like it. The truth from Haley's mouth surprised everyone and made them break out in a cold sweat, even Otaku, who was pretending to be dead in his wife's arms. They could not believe that the red-eyed chain, which humanity had invested all its efforts and abilities into, was not the strongest. And there were three more like it. Just hearing about it made them terrified. Jian was silent as he digested the information he had just heard. Of course, he was not happy, but on second thought, he found it quite reasonable. Inside the ghost tower, the manager there had said something to him. I'm surprised that you caught one of humanity's famous pets. It's quite a good one to play with. Haksu pulled him out of his thoughts in a panic. Fortunately, she heard her say that there were not three more monsters like the red-eyed chain. Smiling confidently at Lime, Jian said confidently, I'm going to fight. I'll take on all comers and face them head on. That was just Jian reassuring his friend, but deep down, he knew that he had to become stronger. To do that, Jian approached Haley and pointed in that direction, asking her to prove that she was on his side. It was none other than the little boy Zujin, who was bewildered and could not believe that he was being offered in exchange. He tried to squeeze and squeeze, and he was not joking, and wanted to open his mouth to scold Jian. Haley agreed to the proposal. It was Jian's turn to open his mouth and laugh. He liked these quick and efficient deals very much. Mrs. Haley, who was fascinated by men, would not forget the sunny smile of the ugly Zujin. He made the little boy want to fall into the abyss of disappointment, grief, and disappointment when he saw his idol selling himself out in front of the victim without feeling any guilt. The next day was a rare day of clear blue sky, and Li Jian had a peaceful day, enjoying a cup of morning coffee with lime on his shoulder. As he sipped, he told lime that he should seize the opportunity to enjoy the peaceful moment and that he had just realized how much he needed it. Unexpectedly, the moment ended so easily. Zujin's terrible cry was like a neighborhood loudspeaker called calling everyone to get up and exercise at 5 o'clock in the morning. Li Jian basically didn't pay any attention. He even regretted that the little boy couldn't enjoy the relaxing moment. Zujin crawled on the ground, and his hands kept cursing. He kept asking why he had to do this hard labor here. What else could it be other than the fact that the scorpions had sold Zujin to Li Jian for nothing? He had to squeeze him dry like a real capitalist to achieve this. The more Zujin wrote, the more he cried. He shook his head and cursed. Don't tell me this guy thinks that I'll escape and work here until I die. Opening the corner of the Bible, Zujin wanted to see if anything had changed. He was synchronized with the real Bible, but how come the fifth achievement was that a teacher who refused to become a believer had become a slave of the Afiyukas constellation? Not understanding how this could be written as a separate achievement chapter, Zujin waved his hand and smiled happily. He had to change the content from the word slave to master. Seeing that he had really changed it, Zujin laughed out loud and knelt at Li Jian's feet. Then he ate a punch from him that made his head go numb. Who else would dare to hit Zujin besides Jian? He mumbled and said, what the hell are you doing? He made him hug a lump, not understanding why he had changed it but it didn't come true. He grabbed the little boy's head again and threw him to the corner. Life is not always going to go your way, kid. Only then did he realize that the two words he had changed had returned to slave, very clearly and distinctly. The girl on the other side was the one who had changed it, but could she also be a teacher? Zujin smiled in confusion. Am I doing something wrong? The Libra constellation has the largest sanctuary in the world, with more than 2 billion believers, so this zodiac sign is not an easy opponent. Not to mention that Giselle is not simply a representative of her own god, but she is so powerful that she is considered an avatar of the god himself. Therefore, facing her is no different from declaring war on a god. 
But in order to confront a god or a monarch of that mysterious civilization, Lysian needed a teacher to record her achievements and increase her power. And right before Zujin's eyes was a teacher who could change the Bible of the Afiyukas constellation like that. He couldn't believe his eyes. He didn't expect that a teacher who was already rare would appear here. Even Haley had to sigh that Jien was really a guy who was blessed by heaven with good luck. So he had two teachers in his hands, even though Zujin was not very willing. Thanks to this, the intelligence test was completed, and all the tasks that needed to be done were finished. Jien was rewarded with all his skills, including the war god instinct, which had also been unlocked. The headquarters of the Libra Sanctuary was built magnificently and stood tall under the blue sky. Soon, the news reached Zizzle, who was hiding in the bath. At present, Jien had Sagittarius, Libra, and Scorpio, as well as a teacher, so his subordinate needed to ask her for advice. Unexpectedly, Scorpio finally came to help because of the love that she had kept in her heart for 20 years. She covered her mouth and sneered at that kind of pure and disgusting love. In Zizzle's eyes, Haley was nothing more than a stupid girl. She didn't worry about how many more people were by his side because they were all just stupid saints. But the teacher was different. She raised the glass to her lips and then shook it in her hand, full of calculations. Zizzle needed to make sure to get rid of them. She crushed the glass, and the Libra's eyes showed a sly gleam as she looked at the red liquid flowing on her hand. Even if Jien were not here, she could not let those who had power beyond the gods survive. The subordinate beside her still bowed his head, whispering that he could not understand what those who had unrealistic hopes for Li Jian wanted. But Zizzle knew that there were only two types of people who faced him. One was to follow orders and act, or the other was to hate him bitterly. Standing up and rubbing her neck, Zizzle wanted to know if there were any subordinates from the Libra faction beside Jien. Unexpectedly, she heard the name of the youngest son who was following Jien on the orders of the Western Army. Oh my god, it's useless. She thought of the little girl named Callie. If only she were here, things would definitely go her way more easily. But there was no more time to choose. Quickly tell Zizzle to target the teacher. It didn't matter if she was kidnapped or killed. On the same day, at the construction site near Scorpio's residence, the three constellations were discussing Zihu joining Li Jian's team. As soon as he heard his friend say that he would let his beloved wife stay in the Afiyukas sanctuary like Haley kept the teacher inside the Scorpio sanctuary, Haksu went crazy. He didn't choose anything, but he had to choose the one that his idol wife liked. Zian snapped his fingers, repeating what Taksu had once told him, that Vihu was not suited to cultivate in any sanctuary, so only his could be tried. Haley added that it would be better if both teachers were protected by him. After all, he would be the one facing Libra in the near future. Zian blinked his eyes and made a multi-level marketing gesture. He accepted a long list of conditions that the thief promised to his friend that he would treat his wife as best as he could because she was his friend's wife. In addition to not being included in the official list of believers and often being sent to the Sagittarius Sanctuary, what else could be rejected with such a good deal? Sign it, my friend. After that, Haley turned to the topic of Taksu's eldest daughter, who had come to her sanctuary the other day to check on the condition of her arm. Although she had used her magic to save her life, Haley still had to report that the situation was very serious. Although she had tried to restrain herself in every way, she was gradually reaching her limit. Looking at Taksu's panic-stricken face, Zian realized that the two of them were talking about something terrible that he didn't know about. He turned around abruptly, wanting to know more about his niece Zohar. While the three of them were talking, Jihu was writing some papers inside the construction site. She excitedly said that she had finished copying all of this. Did Zujin need her help to sort it out? The little guy sat in the middle of two piles of towering paper, looking like he didn't know what to do. Earlier, Zian had thrown a pen right into the middle of his forehead, leaving a huge hole, just because he refused to work for him. Zujin was so angry that he couldn't stand it. Zian not only forced him to sign a slave contract, but also played a game of torture. He glanced down at his arm, which was constantly moving, and he cursed bitterly at this bastard. The almighty pen was writing the truth because it had possessed Zian's seal and taken blood from the teacher Zujin's leg, so it had blocked him from being the master. Those two things had been refined together to become an object with spirituality. Now it was laughing, using the force from his hand to write quickly on several pages of white paper. Zujin was so angry that he threw it away to relieve his itchiness. Unexpectedly, it hit the wall and bounced back at the little guy's head because it was angry that its master dared to throw it away. Zihu thought that Zujin was trying to kill himself and cried out loudly, not noticing that someone was hiding behind the door. 
The black-haired man gritted his teeth, knowing that he had come here on his mother's orders, but what did she expect him to do when his brother was still being beaten up? But after thinking about it again, Zigun still had to do it. After the failure of the blood incident, this was the only chance to prove to his mother that he was not useless. Glancing inside, Zigun determined that the little guy was from the Scorpio constellation and seemed difficult to deal with, so he left him for later. The woman looked easier to handle and could be used to threaten him. Because he was so focused, he didn't notice the heavy footsteps outside and the sound of the door being knocked down. Now he just hoped to finish quickly and go home. Unexpectedly, Kevin rushed in and kicked the door open at Lysian. He stomped on the door and cursed, How dare you leave me in the Leo constellation? I won't let you go. Zujin was shocked to see the familiar figure. He stood up with Zihu and wondered why the historian saint had appeared here. But at this moment, the little boy realized that Lysian was not here. But then he and the centaur and the scorpion appeared behind him. He was about to continue cursing when he found that Haley was also there. All four of them looked at each other with displeasure. At this point, the centaur realized that there was an eighth person in the room. The blonde head peeking out from under the broken door was none other than Rosiwan. Everyone blamed Kevin for bringing this guy here, but how could he have known? Jian had just realized that this was the brat who had bullied him so much that he had beaten him to a pulp. His friend turned around and cursed at the son of Libra for coming here. It was only then that Jian realized that this was one of the two culprits in the bone blindness incident that he had heard about. The brat Jian fell to the ground, and the cage was lifted up and stepped on by Lysian's foot without mercy. He grumbled and grumbled, wanting to vent his anger on the dog who had caused his friend and his two nephews to suffer for ten years. Meeting the person who had beaten him up would definitely not be fun. Not to mention that Lysian was even stronger now and clearly had a hostile attitude towards the young master. Behind him, Taksu lost his temper and roared, What are you doing here, Shiwan? Thinking of how he had come to destroy his family again, Taksu's eyes immediately flared up and he transformed into a demigod, ready to fight him. Ailey stood beside him coldly. It was clear that this guy's mother knew about Lysian and the teacher. Exuding a powerful aura, she wanted to know if it was true that Giselle had ordered the teacher to be killed. Another person drew his sword because he had a deep grudge against Libra. Because Kevin had later heard that she had ordered the bloodbath that had destroyed the historian's court, he was very angry. And she won, right? Let me see how much you've grown. He was very pleased that everyone around him wanted to beat this brat to a pulp. Lysian pressed his foot down harder, revealing a sinister smile. Are you about to die, my son? Adding a few more angry sentences to his words, Lysian wanted to know how everyone planned to deal with this brat. Or should he just keep stomping on him until his head exploded and his brain spilled out? Shiwan was terrified under Lysian's foot. In this situation, he couldn't even protect his own life, let alone complete his mission. Summoning a beast with a loud cry, Shiwan told it to quickly take him to the secret base. Lysian kicked his foot away as soon as a golden light flashed and countless vines symbolizing Libra wrapped around the young master. He smiled happily, finally able to escape successfully. But strangely, Lysian's image was reflected in Shiwan's eyes, also smiling happily. In an instant, Shiwan disappeared before the eyes of everyone present. Thinking that he had escaped successfully, Taksu asked angrily why they had let him get away. But in fact, Lysian had done it on purpose. If he had caught him and beaten him up, wouldn't it have been a bit boring? On the other side of the world, in Hawaii, Honolulu, where the luxurious resort of the Libra constellation is located, Taiwan immersed himself in a pool with the five spirit beasts of Libra to treat the wounds that Sung Che had inflicted on him. He was now cursing the little red-haired boy, wishing he could tear him limb from limb and make him live a life worse than death. Taiwan was lost in thought, thinking that it was Sung Che's scream that he had imagined would make him suffer in the future. Unexpectedly, it was his younger brother who had fallen head over heels into the pool and landed on top of Taiwan. As soon as he learned that Jian had discovered that Libra wanted to kill the teacher, Taiwan continued to curse his younger brother mercilessly. Shiwan didn't dare to fight back, just holding his head in fear that his brother would hit him on the head with a stone. No matter how much Taiwan cursed him now, he had to bear it because it was thanks to him that he had been able to come here. Now the most important thing was to stop Li Jian. When he got there, Taiwan led his brother into a room with a closet full of stones neatly arranged on the shelves. Taiwan briefly explained that each stone could be exchanged for something invincible. Taiwan picked out a purple one, which looked the most dangerous. He said that these were made from the scraps of calamities that had been processed in the Demon Tower. Knowing that Shiwan was worried that the two brothers would not be able to handle them when they were first summoned, Taiwan showed him the Libra seed to reassure him. The important thing now was to deal with Li Jian first, so he did not hesitate to use the equivalent exchange skill. A beam of light from the sky pierced through the roof of the mansion 
causing Taiwan to scream with delight. This would definitely be a super powerful calamity that would make Li Jian suffer. Unexpectedly, the beam of light turned from gold to turquoise and then it gradually swallowed it, not blood as it was supposed to. More precisely, it pushed the golden beam of light back into the sky and completely replaced it. This feeling of power was so familiar that Shi Wan instinctively ducked to avoid it without having time to tell Taewon. He was immediately hit in the head by Li Jian's beam of light, which gave his brother a bloody nose. Shi Wan, the snake god, had just managed to avoid it and laughed three times. Familiar trick, don't think I'll fall for it again. But when he saw that Li Jian had chased him all the way there, clutching a bird with golden feathers in his hand, he screamed in terror. I picked it up on the way here because you left your beast behind and ran off. The bird thought that the one holding it was a calamity, so it screamed and successfully summoned it, making Shiwan gasp in amazement. Li Jian didn't bother arguing, he just threw it backwards, scaring Shiwan so much that he peed his pants. He stepped back and cursed the beast for leading Li Jian to him. Knowing that he would be beaten up badly, Shiwan tried to salvage the situation by bowing his head and saying that he would go to the Sagittarius Palace himself to apologize for what he had done. In return, Li Jian smiled contemptuously. Even now, you still don't understand the problem? He snorted, and another beam of light fell right in front of Li Jian. The heavenly punishment stood tall between the two of them as Li Jian said with a dark face, it seems that you have forgotten the most important thing. When you see me here, you have to pay the price. He uttered two simple words, but to Shi Wan it was like the god of death was standing by his ear. The words death, 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 death kept popping into his head. Stepping back in horror, Shi Wan tried to think of a way to save himself. Suddenly, his eyes widened when he saw what he had just stepped on. Li Jian blew on his wounds and, seeing that his hands were empty, turned to call his younger brother to find the rosary. Taekwon was horrified to realize that it was already in Shi Wan's hands. He had activated it, exchanging it for something. He didn't know what it was, but he smiled and said to his brother, you're right, I'm really useless. But luckily for me, you're very useful. The Libra's equivalent exchange skill caused the ring to light up, and the object of the exchange was Taekwon. His whole body was enveloped in a bright light, and then his body grew the disgusting scales of a calamity, signaling that the exchange was complete. Taekwon tried to resist the magic in pain, but to no avail. Soon, he transformed into an ugly and disgusting calamity on the Libra scales. Jian was no stranger to such heartless tricks. He looked up at the sky and laughed out loud. He had never expected his younger brother to turn his own brother into a sacrifice to the gods. How depraved could he be? This altar was really strange. He had never seen anyone use this trick before. The soles of his feet lit up with the power of the Afiyukas constellation, and he stomped it hard on the ground, forming a rampart. Chi Wan finally knew what disappointment looked like. He stared at what was happening before his eyes and muttered, impossible. Part of the calamity that had once been his brother Taekwon crashed to the ground. The entire Libra bow staff and the zodiac skill that had just been cast were crushed by the Afiyukas rampart. Li Jian laughed and explained to the young and inexperienced boy that the bigger his rampart grew, the stronger the barrier would be. Inside it, no one could use the power of another constellation. Therefore, the power of Libra was completely cut off, and the process of summoning the exchange object was terminated prematurely. It was a masterpiece so ugly that even demons would despise it. The elder brother, who had not been of much use, had become a pile of rubbish before Lysian's eyes. He covered his face and laughed as if he was about to go crazy. How is it? Don't you find it funny? He asked. Now it was his turn to attack. Searching through the scriptures of the Afiyukas constellation, Lysian picked out the second event. The Sagittarius saint did not submit to the master of the Afiyukas constellation, and thus opened up the possibility of using the power of the Sagittarius constellation. Lysian's eyes were suddenly engulfed by the flames of the sun, and he used the Sagittarius skill, eyes of insight. He stepped forward and asked, do you have any last words? Normally, people atone for their sins before they die. I'll give you three seconds. If you have anything you want to confess, say it quickly. His eyes flashed with fire, and he carried the heavenly punishment on his shoulder. His words were soft, but they carried a strong sense of threat. If you have any last words, choose them carefully and speak them, you bastard. Shi Yuan gritted his teeth, his body trembling as if he were having an epileptic fit. He was so scared of him that his body froze, and even the curses that came out of his mouth were broken and incoherent. Finally, he could bear it no longer and hugged his head and screamed. 
just like my father asked you, who are you, who are you, who are you that keeps bullying me, is it because of what I summoned in the blood of the blind ten years ago, but I was too young then to make a mistake, have you never done anything wrong when you were young, or is it because I controlled the blood of the blind in Europe, or attacked the Scorpio hospital, but I was forced to do those things by my superiors, anyway, you dealt with the defect, didn't you, all those who were thought to have died ten years ago were saved, so why make a big deal out of it, isn't it all resolved, do you know who I am, his eyes looked dull and he said in a dignified manner, I am Joe Siegel, the son of Giselle Lawrence, the saint of the Libra constellation, he played his last card and brought up his parents, Siegel clearly asked, if you touch me, will my mother let you go, after he finished speaking, he had to stop for a few seconds, unable to believe his eyes, was Gian falling asleep while they were talking, oh my god, are you finished talking, he just opened his eyes and asked, is there anything else you wanna say, he yawned a few times, making the little boy even more embarrassed, did he hear anything interesting in his life that made him talk nonsense, seeing Seagull trembling and pointing at him in disbelief, could it be that he hadn't heard anything he had said just now, but in fact, Gian had heard everything, even though he had just fallen asleep, it wasn't just him who needed to hear it, but the Sagittarius skill had captured all of Seagull's vivid images, showing the whole world, it was only then that Seagull realized in horror that he had just revealed to the whole world who was behind those terrible disasters, from the people on the street to those in the mountains without cell phone reception, to those far out at sea, everyone saw the sharp 4K image of Lai Chim. The Sagittarius constellation's eyes of insight were also known as Yang Jian's Thousand Mile Eye, which had once helped Tak Su see through the floor and see the buck-toothed guy being beaten up below. Zigun's stupid remarks were transmitted all over the world by this skill, and of course, they were also broadcast to the Libra constellation's territory. They were all in a panic, wanting to find the location of Zigun and Jian and put an end to this shameless act, but there was no news yet. The entire Libra constellation was in chaos. They had to find the two people and salvage the image of the constellation. Suddenly, someone pointed to the hall. Angry citizens were pouring in, demanding an explanation from Libra. The more followers there were, the more people were outraged after hearing the news. They wanted to know if it was true that the son of Libra was the one who had caused those incidents. Was it true that Libra had caused those bloody events? Everyone had something to say, and the crowd became increasingly agitated and hateful. If Li Jian hadn't appeared in time, wouldn't thousands of people have died? The Libra bastards must also be punished in the same way. Zigan must be eliminated. These were the words of outrage that received widespread public support. On the upper floor, sitting on the roof of a 10-story building was a figure in a trench coat, who couldn't help but chuckle when he saw the chaotic scene of the people. Callie's lips curled into a smug smile. With the situation like this, there was no other way but to do as the people wished. Next, Zigan, besides being beaten up by your older brother, that's it. Zigan, on the other hand, also felt the boiling anger of the people who were aggressively demanding his death at the Libra headquarters. Their hatred was so terrifying that Zigan couldn't bear it and hugged his head, screaming like he was having an epileptic fit. At first, Jian was not moved by this sight. On the contrary, he felt very happy. Congratulations to the young master for turning back into a rat, becoming someone that the whole world wanted to kill. The heavenly sword not only lit up, scaring Zigan to death, but the only sounds in the space were the sound of the ground beneath their feet and Jian's indifferent voice. Do you know why I told you not to deny your crimes? Because you should have apologized instead of making excuses. He put the sword to the boy's neck. Time to play, Jian said in a low voice, giving you one last chance to beg for mercy from everyone in the world, but you chose to throw it away. Now, neither I nor they will give you another chance. The image of Jian putting the heavenly sword to Zigun's neck was of course broadcast live causing the Libra forces to scream in horror. This had greatly diminished the people's faith in Libra, and the trust of its supporters had also plummeted. The more people hated Libra, the more their position declined, and the more sympathy there was for Ophiuchus. These things were made public to all the believers, so all the Libra troops were worried and reported to the saint to attack quickly. Giselle responded to the noise with silence. Of course, she would not stand idly by and watch her son die, and as the world's leading zodiac saint, she would not let anyone take away her rice bowl. On the other side, Jian was carrying the goods up and was about to finish Shiwan off when the familiar golden beam of light shone right behind him. It was the divine beast carrying Giselle's message directly to him, telling him to stop immediately and not to think that she would sit idly by. Shiwan saw his mother appear like a savior and cried out happily, but she paid no attention to her useless son. 
Giselle's cold voice made it impossible to tell if she was praising or scolding him. She just didn't expect him to be so determined to do such a crazy thing. As soon as he appeared, he started talking nonsense. He asked her if she thought it was a small thing to release the scourge and destroy the city. Of course, Giselle didn't mention that, but said that she would take her son away immediately. I know you're trying to provoke me, but don't you think this method is a bit despicable? She snorted to show her attitude. Why don't you talk about the innocent child? She glared at Shiwan again and then pointed the punishment spike at An's face. Jian told her that if she was not satisfied with his way of educating, she could do it herself. Putting his hand on the hilt of his sword, Jian gave her two choices. One was to clarify all the atrocities that Libra had committed and pay the price for them. The other was to fight everything that fought against him, and of course, to spit out the name of the dog who had stabbed him in the tower. Both options made Giselle very angry, and she muttered and cursed Li Jian. But this woman would not let herself be defeated. She had to choose between the two. She aggressively asked him back why she should listen to him first. And that was it. That sentence was no different from a refusal to save her son. Chi Wan cried out for his mother while Jian laughed heartily cutting off his golden head with a flick of his hand. The divine beast let out a scream of Giselle's voice, her voice trembling in disbelief that Jian would do such a thing in front of her. Repeating the threat, she thought he would let it go, made Jian even more excited. He was already angry, and he could do much more interesting things. Reaching out his hand, the blue power of the Afiyukas constellation shone. Jian flicked his hand behind Shiwan's body, and Giselle vaguely realized what he was trying to do. Glaring behind him, he smiled cruelly, and right before the horrified and disbelieving eyes of Libra, he brought his son, who had just been beheaded, back to life. Shiwan hugged his face and trembled. He fumbled for his neck, which still felt painful, and wondered why. I was clearly dead. Jian slashed again at the boy who was crying his eyes out. The slash was so sharp that it burst open a second later, blood splattering everywhere. It was a fatal blow, so Jian used his regeneration skill on Shiwan again. The influence of the regeneration skill within the Afiyuka's stronghold was fast and accurate, healing Shiwan's wounds and bringing him back to life. He screamed in horror. What had just happened? Li Jian's sword had once again cut off his noisy head. Three times in a row, her son was killed right before her eyes, driving Ji Seo mad. What do you want to do? Reaching for the body, Jian continued to revive it, grinning and asking Ji Seo if she didn't see it. Killing him once was not enough for him? The boys panting behind him made Jian very happy. Killing him once was not enough to make up for the others who had suffered, while the son had done more than one evil thing. Waving the heavenly sword again, Jian decided to slash Shiwan with the same number of painful times that the young master had caused, or he could end his own life. He was here to help. Shiwan felt like he had fallen into hell. Jian's shadow loomed over his face as the heavenly sword fell once more, causing him endless pain. Before the pain could end, Jian continued to revive him, all before the eyes of the people who were watching with bated breath. No one said a word, but Jian's smile and the speed of his swings increased. He slashed Shiwan in every way possible, but all of them were fatal. As soon as he died, he would call him back to life to receive more blows. Inside the hospital, the taxi drivers also witnessed it firsthand, but no one seemed to feel sorry for Shiwan when they heard his pleas for mercy. There were times when he was slashed three times at once. Death was truly painful, and it haunted the Libra forces, who had no choice but to watch. The screams of the man who had to live and die over and over again were horrifying. Shiwan had already experienced more than 20 times of pain, and Jian still showed no sign of stopping. My son, Giselle couldn't bear it anymore and cursed out loud. Is this guy really testing her patience? In response to the futile question, Queen Larry's instant movement skill and the royal attendant's absolute coordinate skill were used at the same time. The Libra Palace appeared, and the giant barrier dropped something huge to the ground, causing it to explode with a loud bang that shook the heavens and the earth. Blood from it splashed onto Giselle's face, making her instantly cold. As she stepped closer, she realized that it seemed to be the remains of a huge scourge. But Giselle's eyes met a floating head in the left corner. She couldn't mistake it. The bright golden hair and the horrified expression of her eldest son. Ah, she realized what had happened immediately. Her whole body trembled, and she gritted her lower lip, full of hatred. The expression caught Jian's eye and only made him more excited. He asked, why are you standing there like a statue? His cruel lips parted wide, as if he were mad. Your beloved eldest son has returned. Say some loving words to him and hold him in your arms. His left eye turned a dark color, and blue veins popped out on his face with each surge of anger. Squeezing her hands together, Giselle only said, Lone, you will pay the price for provoking me. But no one had ever threatened him and gotten away with it. Jian grabbed the Libra's divine beast and held his face close to it, smiling wickedly. How have I provoked you? 
You wretched woman, I am only responding to your choice. Anyone who gets in my way will end up like this. He ignored his son, who was covered in healed slash wounds. He whispered to the Libra that no matter who was chosen by the absolute god or the mysterious civilization, he would crush them. Even if it's a god, it's nothing. He wanted Giselle to hear these words. So when she was furious, Jien threw the divine beast high into the air. Sayonara, you demon. He smiled a victor's smile and told her, prepare your neck for my blade, Giselle Lorenzer. The flick of his wrist, Jien slashed down, blowing up the divine beast and completely cutting off communication with the Libra. He also destroyed his own transcontinental bird calling platform. The remaining Libra forces hesitated and called out to their leader, only to be met with a terrifying surge of power from where Giselle had been standing. Lysian's roar echoed with extreme anger, causing the entire city to tremble as if an earthquake were approaching. Giselle didn't care about the people. She screamed, I will tear apart anyone who dares to insult me, them and their troubles. With each scream, the city shook more violently, as if it were about to collapse. Giselle called out his name for a long time, full of hatred. After a while, Shiwan suddenly opened his eyes in fear. It was as if he had just woken up from a nightmare, but the nightmare god had already descended from the sky and was breathing down his neck. Lysian let the boy recover from his pain and wake up on his own to continue what he had been doing. Suddenly, he forgot what number he had counted to, so he started over to be sure. His mathematically challenged brain made a mistake. He counted the total number of injured people as about 5,000, added the number of people in the Scorpion Hospital, and then calculated the time that his Otaku Subin family had suffered. How much would that be in installments? Shiwan knelt on the ground and begged for another chance to explain, but he didn't listen. He resolutely raised the Book of Heaven and prepared to continue slashing him 10,000 more times to cover both the principle and the interest. No matter how many tears Shiwan shed, it wouldn't be enough. Hell had only just begun when the number one escaped Lysian's mouth. A few days later, in the Lion Palace arena, someone fell heavily to the ground, while Zohar was declared the victor by the referee. The cheers of the audience didn't make her smile. Zohar's gloomy face didn't escape the notice of the apostles. They couldn't help but wonder what was wrong with her. Everyone could see that something was different. Unlike her usual cold demeanor, the deputy commander seemed absent-minded and strange. It was mainly because after watching Lysian's performance that was broadcast worldwide, everyone, including Zohar, was shocked. But for some reason, she now had a dazed expression on her face. It looked as if she had lost her love. Perhaps the image of Sigourn dying and coming back to life had touched a nerve, but that scene had made many people happy. The Libra forces were always arrogant and self-righteous, so they deserved their comeuppance. In the arena, the MC was so excited that he didn't notice Zohar's expression. He kept shoving the microphone in her face, asking her to share her thoughts on her incredible winning streak. I've decided. Zohar suddenly uttered those words, and still with a dazed expression, she said that she had decided to leave the Lion Temple. Before the crowd could react, she continued, saying that she would join Uncle Zian's temple. Her cold expression was broadcast everywhere, including on the TV in the hospital room where Stephen was being treated. Oliver had just entered the hospital room when he heard the distraught voices of the apostles trying to wake Stephen up. He felt irritated. Both the leader and the deputy commander were disgracing the temple. The loyal followers still tried to rouse Stephen, but after being publicly humiliated by both Zian and his niece, he didn't want to wake up at all. The TV switched to another news story about a high-level meeting of human leaders. As soon as it started, someone stood up to criticize the Libra for deceiving the world. Atta had hidden the truth with a blood mist and the centaur's mistake. Another council member immediately objected, saying that there was no convincing evidence and that the Libra's position had not yet been verified, so no conclusions could be drawn. Moreover, it was clear that Lysian had set a trap for the Libra and then broadcast it widely. The arrogant gods claim that this was a common tactic among the constellations only made the council member angrier. How could he say that when two of the Libra's sons had died? The situation was so serious, and yet the Libra remained silent and offered no defense. Wasn't that strange? The other side responded to the anger with mockery, saying that perhaps the Libra were still trying to come up with a slow-witted excuse. After watching the news for a while, Haley had to compliment Kevin on his impressive media manipulation skills. He smiled proudly. It's simple. It's not like someone who lives in the Canadian wilderness would understand. And for the record, I didn't put poison in Jian's food. I put it in Lysian's food. Got it, the scorpion? It was an antidote to the stuff you put in Lysian's food. Haley retorted immediately. My medicine counteracts the poison you put in. It took me a lot of effort to make the antidote. It's all your fault that I wasted my time. The two of them argued back and forth for a while, looking like children in the eyes of the centaur. 
Did they think no one knew that they were both interested in Jian and were just putting on a show? Suddenly, Kevin turned to the taxi and asked where the founder of the constellation was. Hadn't he come back yet? Was he still busy? He was indeed busy. The Libra's former base in Hawaii was now being marked with a large construction sign as trucks came to remove everything. Nearby, Lysian was rolling up his iron sleeves and eating enthusiastically, surrounded by fast food and chill music. His feet was a pile of empty food containers. As he chewed, he checked to see if he could build something for himself with the stuff he had destroyed from the Libra. In addition to the bonus, he found the core of the disaster, the crystal stones created from the essence of the disaster that Lysian had destroyed in the Demon Tower before. Thinking back, it seemed like the day before, they had planned to summon a disaster using the stones he had created, so the stupid bird had said that it had successfully helped when he followed it. Throwing away the hamburger wrapper and standing up, Lysian the handyman's break was over. It was time to get to work. Looking up at his masterpiece, he thought with satisfaction that he was about to have a new home. And then there was the gift for that stupid crane. He wondered if it had arrived yet. The gift that Maria had mentioned was the head of her second son, placed face down in the middle of an elaborately decorated wreath, which was then attached to a decorative pillar in the Libra Palace. Giselle was so furious when she saw it that she increased the gravity on everyone in the foyer, making them kneel behind her. Shaking with rage, the crane knew that the bastard had sent this to humiliate her, and that bastard Kevin had humiliated the Libra on live television. A lip turned to the people behind him and asked coldly if they had no plan to deal with this. They looked at the ground several meters below their feet, which was cracking with every surge of their leader's anger, but the apostles could only watch helplessly. The maidens had acted too quickly and broadcast it live, so no one had been able to intervene in time. Thinking about how the insolent servant of the goddess of history had dared to provoke her to this extent, Giselle was so furious that she couldn't let those who followed Gian live. Quickly gather our forces. When she speaks, the gravity will disappear. Giselle had made up her mind, even though her face was still bowed. She couldn't sit still after being treated like this. She had to attack with full force. Waving her hand behind her to give orders to her followers, Giselle needed to contact the allied temples and all the branches around the world to gather their forces and find every way to defeat Lysian. Finally receiving their orders, the group rushed out of the foyer to prepare for the attack, taking the opportunity to avenge their young masters. The red carpet was deserted and empty. Giselle then called out for someone to appear. The pieces of the decorative tree in the hall flew up and reassembled into one right behind her. The disaster-fighting crow had summoned the army of the mysterious civilization, all of whom were awaiting orders. Finally, something good had happened. Giselle praised it, then extended her hand and sent a burst of power to lift it up. A globe was summoned, with dense black dots indicating the areas occupied by the disaster. It gradually grew to the size of an adult human. It hovered within Giselle's reach as she exerted her power. With just a flick of her finger, all the black and red dots on the surface of the globe blinked and gathered in one corner. In the Pacific Ocean, the black level territory of the mysterious civilization that she had just used her power on the globe to attack was filled with storms and incessant lightning. The disasters there seemed to receive a signal and stopped making noise. They spread their wings and flew up in response to the order, their mouths open in loud noises. The entire number in the area took off and flew up, with different shapes and sizes, numbering in the thousands and tens of thousands. Among them, one stood out from the rest, riding on the back of a bone horse that had also been summoned. It waited silently until the two words, it's here, rang out. In front of them, swarms of disasters flapped their wings and flew to gather. The lightning in the sky was blinding, and the riders flying above counted the number of disasters on foot, along with the winged creatures. Soon, they had gathered into a mighty army, waiting silently for orders. Giselle inserted her finger into the ocean area on the globe, causing the image of a real hand to appear there, stirring up the waves. The black and red mass representing the number of disasters surged out violently like vines grasped by her hand. Soon, they gathered into a bright red pile in Giselle's hand. She watched it swirl in her hand and open a blood-red eye, determined to defeat Gian's group. The eye was just like the one on her face when she howled, I will make you all utterly despair. The black territory lit up with a bloodthirsty eye, indicating that there were only 65 hours left before humanity would be under a full-scale attack. 